Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 1 He became an orphan very early in his life due to a calamitous tragedy. Barely at the tender age of seven, when it would only be normal to look for his mom's guidance whenever something vexed him, he had to go to an orphanage because none of his relatives wanted to take him in. The orphanage's director wasn't a human trash that treated children like dirt but at the same time, wasn't a sparkling example of how to be a nice person either. Wanting to leave such an orphanage as soon as possible, he found a job and started working right after graduating from the elementary school. While resembling a very thin stick, thanks to his tall for his age height, convincingly lying about how old he actually was proved to be rather easy. Of course, on that one occasion his lies were exposed, he got chased away from the workplace without receiving a paycheck, but well, that was to be expected. Regardless, he continued to work tirelessly during the night and slept in the middle school during the daytime and this was how he lived his early life. Around this time, he stopped utilizing the bed in the orphanage as well. Honestly, he found it more comfortable to sleep in the school's infirmary, or among the wary gazes of the homeless occupying the subway station. He couldn't be sure, but maybe the reason for his height remaining the same from sixth grade in elementary school probably had something to do with this unhealthy lifestyle. Whatever the case may have been, through all the rough and tumble, he succeeded in becoming completely independent upon turning 18. For years of backbreaking labor after that netted a total of 8,750 which sort of enabled him to rent out a single room for himself. Other people might have found this space a seriously tight fit, but for him, it was the safest and most comfortable place to put his feet up and take it easy. And within this comfortable environment, his own home, he allowed himself to have a dream of a better future. If it was under any other normal circumstances, he would have surely achieved that idyllic life he had dreamt of in the near future. Innate trait progression, 100% complete. Change in species due to host's innate trait progression, human monster. Name, Kim S. A. E. Jean. Age, roughly 22 years old. Height, 172 centimeters weight, 65 kilograms. Status. Physical strength 13. Endurance 12. Agility 16. Energy manipulation 6 raw said key strength, which didn't make much sense to me, so I changed it. Mana affinity 1. Magic strength 1. Luck 3. Trait, monster. Rank, rare. Trait level, 1. Species changed from human to monster. Once per 24 hours, the host can maintain the human form for 60 minutes that is calculated from the numerical value of energy manipulation stat. Stats of the monster forms will be reduced during the human form. Currently maintaining the brown wolf form. Currently available monster forms, orc, wolf, goblin. Forms, living as a chosen monster. When certain conditions are satisfied, monster's rank will rise. Example, Orc Orc Warrior Great Orc Chieftain. Brown Wolf, strength and defense increase by 3, agility increases by 6. When in human form, the effects will be reduced by. That was until this fking trait ambushed him out of nowhere. Chapter, 2. For the first week after unlocking his trait, Kim Sae Jean lived in isolation like a mental patient. It was totally understandable as, for 23 out of 24 hours in a day, he suddenly had to exist as a monster. The bosses at his part-time jobs sent him various messages and phone calls, but they all entered in one ear and left through the other without really registering in his brain. Two of them showed concern, but the other one threw verbal abuse like there's no tomorrow. But then again, it was understandable where they were coming from. The only thing S.A.E. Jean couldn't get a grip on, was the absurdity of his current situation. And after another week passed by, the small, meticulously kept room which he took great pride in, became a messy cesspool of untidiness. It was par for the course, really. The effing claws on his paws would leave behind unsightly scars all over the place no matter how softly and gently he walked around. Like this, where a living couldn't really be called a living anymore, another four days went by. Only then, did S.A.E. Jean finally come to accept his predicament. A body length of around 2 m, a shoulder height of around 1. 
2M, a tail length of around 50 centimeters, a body weight definitely exceeding 90 kilograms. And a coat of brown fur. At a glance, they might sound like the specks of a still growing tiger, but unfortunately, those numbers belong to him. SAE Jean was actually a brown wolf now. A monster that was considered as the weakest prey there was, always targeted by those conceited idiots who proudly label themselves as the knights, mercenaries, or hunters. Also, too ambiguous to be called a true, bona fide monster striding the imperceptible boundary between a beast and that of a full fledged monster, it was not easy to categorize this creature. On top of being the newbie's preferred choice of hunting material, a wolf was usually massacred on sight without mercy because of the following traits. 1. There were plentiful of them like a mob. 2. They were slightly troublesome for regular citizens to deal with. That was SAE Jean's form, currently. He found it difficult to accept this initially for obvious reasons. And after finally coming to terms with it, he then realized that wasn't the end of his troubles, no. Now, he had to madly formulate plans to safely live. His desires to continue breathing was a lot stronger than he expected. At least there was the cushion of 3,500 in his bank account, which he was definitely thankful for. SAE Jean quickly decided to maximize his human form during the precious one hour window. For his food, SAE Jean bought easy to prepare TV dinners from a convenience store five minutes away and always ate them while in his human form. His pride as a human being wouldn't have it any other way. And he made sure to leave himself a 30 minute breathing space in case of an unforeseen emergency. Then he practiced controlling the strength of the brown wolf form in order to perfectly mimic the creature. After four days of concerted effort, he even figured out how to retract his sharp claws. Meanwhile, whenever there was a chance, he changed into a goblin form and began cleaning the mess in his home. A 140 cm, tall goblin might have a small stature but it possessed a surprisingly supple pair of hands for a kind of jobs that demanded precise craftsmanship, which was perfect for taking care of the household chores. Those ugly claw marks remained here and there, but before long, SAE Jean's room regained its former spotless, clean appearance. But the biggest issue still had to be solved, living expenses. Without paying the monthly rent, he was surely living on a borrowed time here. That's why he used the bracelet computer, something that was discarded into a corner of the room a while ago. SAE Jean was going to search for how to start earning from home. But then, stopped. As a high school dropout, with only a middle school graduation certificate, he just knew it would be impossible to find someone willing to let him work from home. He gazed at the hologram display projected in the air with a tinge of regret, slowly stroking it. Then a thought suddenly came to him, and SAE Jean searched for topics regarding the monsters. That's how he accidentally found a hint that could potentially save his life. Seeing the topic of the discussion, a powerful glare of bright light burned dangerously in both of his eyes. Question Does the lycanthrope, the top dog in the wolf type monster pecking order, really exist? A. According to the first generation Suin's TL, literally humanoid beast man in Korean who crossed over the world's rift, they did exist in the legends. Able to seamlessly change their shapes unrestricted from a fearsome bipedal wolf to a perfect appearance of a tailless human, one could say that they share some similar racial traits with Suin's. In truth, though, the class of incredible power they wielded was on another scale altogether, apparently, and couldn't even be compared at all. But owing to their unique trait of violent nature, they ended up going extinct and have become the creatures of legends instead. The Lycanthrope It was a mythical monster SAE Jean had heard about at least once from somewhere. An unfathomable existence, that could freely become a flawless human despite being a monster and vice versa. It was different from the Suins who could alternate between an animal and a humanoid form. More than anything, the human form assumed by a lycanthrope didn't leave behind a tail. What if? Definitely, the effing trait told him that when certain conditions are satisfied, the ranks of monsters will rise. He intuitively understood then. The only way for him to exist was to exploit this rule. Didn't matter what the conditions were, he had to quickly complete them in order to evolve over and over again. There was a chance that his evolution could go down the wrong path but this was the only avenue left for him in the end. He promptly stood up. The things he had to do were already set in stone. 
The mountainous regions of Kangwon province had been designated as the monster's territory for a very long time. Low-tier monsters such as wolves, orcs, and goblins, mid-tier monsters such as trolls and gargoyles, and finally, high-tier monsters like ogres and wyverns, occupied this territory and called it as their home. One of the world's most diverse monster ecosystems existed within the borders of Kangwon province in the Republic of Korea. Naturally, monster hunting knights and hunters flocked here, aiming for this perfect place to earn money in the home of monsters. Hey! Stay with me! However, it was only possible for the knights possessing at least the ranks of mid to high tier to delude themselves into mistaking this place as nothing more than an easy gold mine. Most people saw the mountains as hell on earth, where ferocious monsters engaged in brutal conflict against each other, and to those who bet their lives in order to earn a living by catching these rampaging creatures. All of them wished to abandon this horrible killing field and never to return here as soon as they got their exit passports. You are almost there, don't you faint on me, now. Stand up. One could receive the much-needed aid from the military at the borders of Kangwon province. A low-tier hunter named Kim Taejo couldn't spare a thought to wipe the streaming blood off his forehead. He was too busy slapping the cheeks of his comrade, who was lying sprawled on the ground, unmoving. I can't go on. Tejo's comrade could only mutter out dispiriting words. This man's eyes were deeply closed, the flames of life ready to extinguish, one of his legs missing. It was a gruesome sight if one took a closer look. Even a quick glance could tell these two hunters had went through a terrible ordeal at the hands of a vicious beast judging from the deep teeth marks on the wound. In the beginning, their party consisted of three low-tier and two mid-tier hunters but they ran into a monsterized great tiger. Their luck was really bad. Monsterized great tigers lived in the deeper parts of the mountains, existing to compete against more powerful monsters up there. In other words, they never bothered to come down to the lower grounds near the borders at all. But the party did meet a great tiger, which was akin to getting struck by a stray lightning in broad daylight while out on a stroll. It was simply unheard of. Hey! Stand you! Kim Taejo couldn't finish what he wanted to say. Because, from somewhere nearby, he could hear the guttural krr growling of a beast. Holding his breath, Taejo slightly tilted his head towards the direction of the sound, and found a lone wolf, its fur shining brown and clearly starving from a prolonged hunger. It was just a pile of skin and bones, its eyes bloodshot, attesting to how famished it was. SHT. A brown wolf was the weakest monster out there. Normally, three low-tier hunters could take it down no, if it was weakened by as much as this creature, then only two should be enough to hunt it down. But the current situation was the worst. His comrade was missing a leg, and by dragging the grievously wounded man all the way here by himself, Taejo was near his own physical limit as well. Go away. Away, I say. Taejo desperately shouted. But overcome by avarice, the lone brown wolf continued to drool non-stop and slowly advanced towards him. It looked as if the wolf was cautiously assessing the situation of the meal that took too long time in coming. Oh, God dn it. There was no other choice. Taejo had to abandon his comrade and make a run for it. However. Krng. The exhaustion from pushing himself to the limit and the brown wolf's fear-inducing growl conspired to freeze his legs they wouldn't budge. And also, no matter how starved, Taejo realized that the famished wolf was still faster than him, and it wouldn't let one of the free meals run away just like that. This this son of a bitch. I caught hundreds of bastards like you until now. Taejo swore in resignation, knowing well that his number was up. He grabbed the shotgun that no longer had any mana bullets in it. If the Lady Luck smiled on him, then he could land a hit in the head of the wolf and knock it out. That was his hope. Taejo swallowed his spit loudly. That, became the signal. The brown wolf disregarded everything and kicked the ground, crazily dashing in towards him. Scared, he could no longer dare to watch and squeezed his eyes shut, and swung the stock of the hunting rifle hard. Kwajiek. The noise he heard was slightly different to what he was expecting a dull sound from a blunt impact. Rather, it was similar to a neck snapping. Taejo carefully opened his eyes after hearing that strange sound. 
stronger bout of despair slammed into him as soon as he did that. Ha! Huh. There was another brown wolf in front of him. But this one was a giant a tiger. Its huge body was like that of a tiger just before going through a monsterization. This massive brown wolf had its fangs deeply buried in the neck of the unlucky wolf aiming for Tejo's and his comrades' lives. The size differences between these two wolves made calling them the same type of monster a laughable notion. Of course, the famished wolf was atypically smaller than normal, but still, Tejo had never ever seen nor heard of a brown wolf this massive before. God dn it. Tejo couldn't help but to mutter out swearing again, being on the receiving end of such a huge brown wolf's gazes. The incredibly sharp eyes of the wolf burned in the flames of pure, unadulterated and much-deserved confidence. Being stared at by such powerful, and somehow, courageous eyes, Tejo felt indescribable pressure weighing down on him. He had to accept the reality of his situation. So, this is it. Looks like this is where I meet my maker. Meeting a monsterized great tiger, then this tiger-sized brown wolf. My luck's finally become pretty dn good isn't it? Yep, it's so effing good today, it has turned into my last bloody day on earth. Fool. Completely resigned to his fate, Tejo could only sigh and close his eyes again. Heavy rustling of paw steps teased his eardrums like a distant hammer being struck. However. No matter how long he waited, the expected agony of death didn't materialize. Confused, Tejo ever so carefully reopened his eyes. Eek! Right in front of his nose, stood the brown wolf. But it was the strangest thing, ever. The wolf was inserting its sharp fangs between the gaps of his fallen comrade's armor and was in the process of lifting him up. What what the hell? Tejo briefly entertained the idea of this wolf playing around with its food but had to kick that thought to the curbside on the double by the next gobsmacking actions of the creature. The brown wolf gestured with its sizable head as if it wanted Tejo to follow it, and begun carrying the wounded comrade in its mouth towards the direction of the military base to the west. Chapter, 3 He's following well, thought Kim Saejim as he took a glance at the overly cautious male hunter behind him. It was a bit of a waste to leave behind the carcass of that dead brown wolf, but Saejim figured that little guy wouldn't be worth much as a material seeing how weak and famished it was. At most, the Korean government's reimbursement would be worth less than 440 US. He would have to derive satisfaction from knowing that he was able to help these two hunters today instead. After walking for an unknown amount of time, the exit from the mountainous region's border could be seen in the distance. A signboard near it said, from here on, the number of monster encounters will increase. Confirming their location, Sae Jean lowered the unconscious hunter, who had a faint pulse, to the ground and glanced back. Hop! The hunter following Sae Jean made a funny noise as he hurriedly held his breath in fear. Feeling rather mischievous after seeing that nervous appearance, Sae Jean decided to pull a prank at the scared man. KRNG! Eek! Sae Jean found the panicky reaction of the hunter falling on his BT absolutely priceless. Have a less dangerous life, mister. The funny reaction caused Sae Jean's lips to twist upwards. He then lightly patted the shoulder of the sacred and sweaty hunter with his front paw, and stepping past, he leisurely headed back towards the forest. Left alone, Kim Tejo remained there utterly dazed for a long time. The massive brown wolf had long disappeared into the thicket, but he failed to understand what had just happened. This maddeningly weird experience. Somehow recovering from the shock, he recounted the events from several moments ago. That big brown wolf. That monster. It rescued him. Unsure of whether he was dreaming or not, Tejo sharply slapped his face. Ouch. It hurt. Therefore, it was definitely not a dream. Still dazed, Tejo stares fixed on the direction where the mystery brown wolf had gone off to. Cough, cough. Ah, Sang Yun. Can you hear me? The wounded comrade, Sang Yun, coughed weakly, breaking Tejo's dazed state. He quickly shouldered the fellow hunter and stood up. He, over here. Tejo shouted out aloud and soon, he could see some sort of stirring by the guard post building over yonder by the exit. Please help. 
After determining the location of the desperate voice, soldiers hurriedly ran towards his direction. A relieved smile broke out on Tejo's face as he realized that he'd be able to live for another day, all the while momentarily forgetting about the dreamlike event of a wolf saving him. A spirit beast? That's right. That's the only fitting explanation for what happened. That massive size, that display of human-like intelligence. Once more, Tejo's expression became profoundly moved after recalling the event as he sipped some warm tea. But, can a monster evolve into a spirit beast? A soldier manning the border exit guard post tilted his head in puzzlement and asked, unconvinced. Spirit beasts were creatures seemingly blessed by divine spirits. They were unfathomably mysterious beings their physical abilities and mental prowess were greatly enhanced as they accepted the aura of Mother Nature. They were essentially different from the vicious beasts with mana that ran amok, and so, were treated differently as well. If it's a wolf, then there's a good possibility. Right now, wolves are treated like monsters because of their vicious nature but, originally, they were wild animals to begin with. If that's true, then, wow that's some mystery. The soldier couldn't fully believe Tejo's words. That was because, a spirit beast wasn't some common existence. For instance, the legendary creature, Nine-Tailed Fox, was included in a category of spirit beasts. Facing the skeptical attitude of the soldier, Tejo creased his forehead while opening his mouth. There is no ifs. It's the honest truth. I really did encounter Ah, that's right. Suddenly remembering something really important, Tejo shouted out and shot up from his seats. The recording lens. I was wearing the recording lens at the time. A recording lens did what its name implied it recorded images reflected on the retina. Dirt poor hunters like Tejo, who could only survive day to day by earning his keep the hard way, wore this lens every now and then when going out on a monster hunt. It was for that off chance of seeing a rare monster that could be worth something. That, or if there happened to be a particularly detailed recording of a hunt, he could sell it off to make extra cash on the side, calling it educational material. Eh. Just wait a dang moment. I'll definitely show you. The soldier worried about seeing blood pour out for a moment as Tejo hurriedly began digging into his eyeball, fishing out a single lens. Here, here, take a good look. A chew. Around the same time, in a nearby cavern Kim Sae Jean in his goblin form suddenly sneezed out during the middle of dismantling a monster corpse. Sniff. He wiped his itchy nose with the bloodied hand and finished organizing the extracted monster materials before putting them away, then took a seat on a stone chair. Kyuheng. One of the goblin's traits was unable to stay still. It was practically impossible to remain still in the goblin form as a result. Blowing his nose, rubbing his hands for no reason, making weird noises they were instinctual habits and SAE Jean ended up doing them involuntarily. SAE Jean deeply hated this side of the goblin form so he promptly changed back into the brown wolf form. Lying snugly on the flat stone bed, he willed the status window to appear before him. Trait Monster Rank, Rare Trait Level, 3 Species changed from human to monster once per 24 hours the host can maintain the human form for 70 minutes, calculated from the numerical value of energy manipulation stat. Stats of the monster forms will be reduced during the human form. Desire to sleep has been lost. Currently maintaining the brown wolf form. Status. Physical strength 16. Endurance 15. Agility 19. Energy manipulation 7. Mana Affinity 1. Magic Strength 1. Luck 3. Brown Wolf, Strength and Defense increase by 5, Agility increases by 8. During the human form, the effects will be reduced by. The results of a month's effort was his trait level increasing by a whopping 2. KRNG. SAE Gene growled. He was dissatisfied and angry at the slow rate of his progress. It was almost a month ago when he resolved to become a lycanthrope. He packed all his meager belongings together and set off to the Kongwan province. It was like doing a time attack in a video game his previous home in the suburbs of Songpagu was 30 minutes away from the mountains of Kongwan, a feat impossible if it weren't for the advent of the mana trains. 
Songpagu is a suburb in the capital Seoul and its depot much further than 30 minutes from Kangwon. Cutting it fairly close, SAE Jin cautiously evaded the eyes of the military and the Knights' orders, and successfully sneaked past the borders of the mountain region undetected. At first, he had no idea what he should do. Suddenly barging into the land of monsters, SAE Jin had to repeatedly suffer through confusion and chaos. And when monsters challenged him, he fought them off by turning into either the orc form or the wolf form and survived. It was a painful experience. The smell of raw flesh stuck between his teeth nauseated him, the unpleasant sensation of pummeling the life out of his victims with a blunt weapon all these experiences were something he just couldn't really get used to. He even cried himself to sleep every night thanks to the anxiety of steadily losing his humanity gnawing at him. But the feeling of disgust lessened as time passed, and even though he couldn't readily accept them, just like that, SAE Jean was progressing step by step towards achieving his goal. The first thing he did after entering the mountains was to find and secure a nice cave that couldn't be located by the hunters. He turned it into his base of operations. Then naturally, he started living there for good. Utilizing the goblin form's surprisingly deft hands, he remodeled the interior of the cave, and to withstand the cold weather, he lined up the fur of several monsters around the place. There was a stream nearby so that was drinking water taken care of he also roasted the meat of wild animals he caught for sustenance. After that, all he did was a non-stop hunting. When he was at a level 1, pretty much every single monster he fought posed a serious threat to his life. That was even including the other, common variety brown wolves. So he used his head a little. SAE Jean only picked on those poor wolves that were rejected from its own pack or were too dull-witted, and by relying the orc form's much greater physical strength over that of his victims, he smashed their skulls in. After smashing ten heads, his trade had its very first level up. But the changes he went through were slightly different than expectation. Sure, both the bodies of the orc form and the brown wolf form became a lot bigger and his stats became just that stronger, but weirdly, the goblin form stayed the same. However, what he wanted wasn't this type of growth. What he came here for was to evolve. Such as to become the higher ranked monster in the wolf species after the brown wolf, the grey wolf. For the orc form, it was the orc warrior. For the goblin form. Uh, whatever was higher up. Instead of the evolving, his forms remained the same and only the stats improved. SAE Gene didn't lose heart though, and just poured in more effort. He thought that maybe he just needed to level up once more. It was disappointing but at least the hunting became easier with his trait level being 2 now. Even if he fought against other brown wolves, he was over 1. 5 times larger, and it was evident that the disparity in strength was greater still. In other words, he became the top predator in this neighborhood almost in an instant. But leveling up became increasingly difficult. From level 1 to level 2, he only had to spend 3 days and kill 10 preys. However, for level 3, even nearly 30 days and 100 kills proved to be insufficient. Frustrated, SAE Jean thought about heading to a hunting ground with higher tier monsters only to give up on that idea. That was because, in the world of monsters, the difference in power between two tiers was like heaven and earth. It was actually that enormous. The easiest example was to compare a brown wolf to a grey wolf. The brown wolves were ranked lowest tier, and the grey wolves were also ranked as a low tier, just one place above them. That was it. But if brown wolves wanted to hunt down one grey wolf, then at least a single pack consisting of over twelve individuals were needed. That's why, without any other choice he had to repeatedly grind away like crazy in this lowest level hunting ground for the past thirty-one days. Finally, he was able to level up one more time. But perhaps inevitably, what awaited for him was the growth of his stats and not the evolution of his forms his size and overall power might have grown to a point where he could rival a grey wolf. A creature that could easily contend with a full-size tiger, but in the end, he still couldn't become a one. Just what is it that I need to do? An unexpectedly cute sound escaped his nostrils as he sighed in his wolf form. None of the hapless hunters would have thought he was cute though as they would be too busy running away like scalded cats after encountering his massive brown wolf form. As he was sinking deeper into his worries, suddenly, strange texts popped out in front of his eyes. Condition complete, minimum reputation. 
the minimum of 100 people have engraved the existence of the brown wolf into their minds. All stats rise by one. The gray wolf form is available for host instead of the brown wolf. All stats related to the wolf form will be adjusted accordingly. The gray wolf sense of smell will be available during human form. Active skill. Physical strength 22. Endurance 21. Agility 28. Energy manipulation 8. Mana affinity 2. Magic strength 2. Luck 4. Gray wolf, strength and defense increase by 10, agility increases by 16. During the human form, the effects will be reduced by Fewing This inexplicable change was so out of nowhere, SAE Jean was momentarily at a loss for words. But after recovering quickly, using the pair of inquisitive, excessively round eyes he ascertained the condition of his new body. Definitely, he had changed. His previously doggy brown fur had completely morphed into a new shiny, gray coat. Chapter, 4 a monster's remains could be either useful or useless for several purposes. If a monster's bones were sturdy and its skin tough, then they could be recycled as base materials for making weapons to fight against other monsters. And if the mana accumulated into the heart and became a mana stone, then that monster's carcass would be used up as the basis for creating magic and miracles. Miracles, because scientifically unexplainable magical effects could be given to people and items they wield by the so-called enchanting effect. The one tasked with the disposal of the monster remains was the government. This arrangement came about because those in power wanted to correctly gauge the situation within the monster territory and to provide the adequate response if needed and also to prevent the greedy and money-craving private entities from potentially defrauding the knights or the hunters. But though the monster remains disposal through Public Enterprises Act couldn't be found anywhere else except only in South Korea. That was why this country was called a heaven for people making a living off monster remains and consequently, there was a higher ratio of knights, mercenaries and hunters among the Korean population. Two brown wolves. Here's the government reimbursement of 880 as well as your new low-tier hunter license. Congratulations on your promotion of rank, sir. Currently, SAE Jean was inside the government-run monster store where the remains were disposed off. This was the place where the remains could be sold, the various equipment bought and at the same time, get the administrative works done. And that was to determine the ranking of the hunters. This was directly tied to his or her current results, while the said results could be calculated via the number of monsters hunted down and killed. So, the hunter's union handed over the full responsibility of assigning the hunter's rank to the monster store a long time ago. The rest of the remuneration amount should be deposited into the account number you have provided us with, after the final calculations are carried out. Anyways, isn't your dismantling skill really great? And the achievements you have piled up so far is also amazing. It's scarcely imaginable that you've been a hunter for only a month now. The female government worker smiled as she spoke up to here. Is that right? Wasn't aware of it. Maintaining his expressionless face, SAE Jean just grabbed his new hunter license and turned on his heels to leave. SAE Jean received the title of lowest tier hunter around 30 days ago. The registering process was really simple and easy. All he had to do was to catch a single monster and bring it in, thus becoming a hunter from then onwards. After becoming a registered hunter, SAE Jean decided to sell around 23 portions of monster materials every four days or so. More than that, it'd be too eye-catching and he might be seen as someone suspicious, and due to his current condition, he'd rather avoid such kind of attention with all his might. Obviously, SAE Jean wasn't the only person in the entire world to possess a trait but, nobody in their right minds would believe the crazy talk of a trait changing a person from a human to a monster. It'd be more believable, instead, to claim that a monster was posing as a human. Actually, there was an incident like that not too long ago, and the new term Monster Man was coined from that very incident. Forty minutes left. This store was the closest to the monster field but to someone like S.A.E. Jean whose very life was directly linked to the ticking clock, he still had to leave quickly. Yesterday afternoon, around seven o'clock. At the mountain regions of Kangwon province, a strange incident occurred in the so-called monster field. S.A.E. Jean's footsteps were halted by the sounds drifting from a television. 
The interior of the monster store was configured similarly to that of a modern bank and for those waiting in queue, a hologram TV with absurd clarity was installed here. This was an incident in which one brown wolf rescued hunters from the dangers of getting eaten alive by another brown wolf. Recorded by the low-tier hunter Mr. Kim Tae-jo using a recording lens, these images were uploaded to social networking sites and were widely shared by many people. Shall we take a look? The anchor stopped here, and the projection changed to the playback of a blurry recording. Out of mana bullets and his stamina depleted, stranded in a life-or-death situation, Mr. Tae-jo runs into a starving brown wolf. Unable to abandon his grievously wounded comrade, Mr. Tejo resolves to meet the wolf head-on and he grabs the shotgun with both of his hands. The ugly shape of the starving wolf threateningly growling was the first image seen on the projection. He swings the rifle with all his might but as if he has given up, Mr. Tejo closes his eyes. Then the projection blacked out for a moment. When nothing happens after a passage of time, confused Mr. Tejo ever so carefully reopens his eyes. Now visible in sight was an image of another brown wolf, much bigger than the one before. The neck of the starving wolf that threatened the hunters was pierced by the fangs of this creature. This giant brown wolf suddenly appeared and bit to death the other wolf attacking Mr. Tejo. However, Mr. Tejo still couldn't escape the feeling of despair. Because he thought this giant brown wolf would surely kill him now. But, this wolf was different. Instead of attacking, the brown wolf picked up the as-good-as-dead fellow hunter in its mouth before trotting off to somewhere in a relaxed manner. Seemingly making a gesture with its head to follow it, the wolf carries the fainted fellow hunter and begins to head off to an unknown place. Mr. Tejo watches on dazedly for a moment before hurriedly getting up, cautiously following the creature. Walking for a while, the blurry images of the distant border post finally appeared on the projection. Then the wolf put down the hunter in its mouth and returned to the forest. After seeing the border post that can help the injured hunter, this wolf lowers the man and coolly walks away. The final shots were of the wolf's rear end, leisurely sauntering away. That was cool. Right now, this recording has gained incredible fame in portal sites, social networking sites and various community chat rooms after being uploaded to Mr. Tejo's own SNS profile. The netizens are showing hot reactions at the recording, saying why does that wolf have such a handsome face? I want to keep him, no, I want him to keep me, I might fall in love even if it's a monster, I nearly fainted at the broad, dependable back in the final frame. Hugh him. SAE Jean's back straightened in pride for some reason. Was it that cool? After studying this strange incident, the experts are cautiously theorizing that the wolf might be the growth-type monster or a spirit beast. A growth-type monster. There were a number of them in the past but they have gone extinct for some time now. As the name implies, it's a type of monster that could grow. If it's a wolf, then it'll grow from brown to gray, from gray to ebony. It seemed that the expert's words always get cut off in the middle. Yes, it's a really puzzling incident. If it's a monster like that, even I'm tempted by the prospect of being protected by it at least once. And now, moving on to the next item. This morning. At the words of the beautiful anchor, S.A.E. Jean's face reddened somewhat and he even coughed in embarrassment. Oh ho, how mysterious. I was out catching wolves yesterday, now I feel a little bit regretful. But wasn't that an ebony wolf? Still. Aren't they all wolves? From somewhere, the conversations of hunters waiting in line could be heard. S.A.E. Jean took a glance at the direction of the voices, and thought that their outwardly aura was no joke. On their backs, they were carrying bazookas. Feeling somewhat intimidated, S.A.E. Jean left the monster store in a hurry. Exiting the store, he caught sight of the road packed with throngs of people busy coming and going. He couldn't help but wonder whether this was humans being ignorant to the inherent risk posed by the monsters. Right next to their doorsteps were the mountains of Kanwan province, the so-called monster field, yet he couldn't see a speck of worry in the faces of the passing crowd, or from the skyscrapers tall enough to stab the blue sky above. Of course, the tallest building of them all was called the Eden and it was considered the holy land of the knights. And the fair number of the crowd walking around should be either knights or hunters that could single-handedly kill a monster, so, well. Fool. S.A.E. Jean grandly sighed out. 
he just wanted to vent his frustration out. He felt wrong that all these people were living their everyday normal lives yet why only he had to go through such an unfair torment all alone. Unfortunately, he didn't have a lot of time remaining to lament on his troubles. He only had 30 minutes of human form left. But I'm okay with it. SAE Jean was trying to return to the monster field but the sound from an outdoor advertisement shown on a billboard display entered his ear. His sense of hearing had sharpened up considerably after receiving his trait and he instinctively turned his head towards the direction. Even if the injury is grave, even if all my limbs are broken until I can't use them anymore, I'll fight on. I'm not doing it for wealth and honor, but for the people out there. The images were from an interview with a knight, blood all over his body, seemingly having prevented an attack from the monsters just now. A pair of earnest-looking eyes, a manly jawline, hair dyed in blonde even S.A.E. Jean knew of this particular night. Treated as the hottest commodity and appearing just about everywhere in mass media and countless talk shows, and possessing a trait called the savior of the light, Knight Kim In-Soo. My name is Kim In-Soo, a mid-tier knight from the Gabiak Knights Order. Gabiak means Genesis. Left as it is because, well, Genesis sounded too foreign. The advertisement promoting the Knight's Order ended with the images of Kim in Su's face superimposed on top of the Order's crest. Staring at the ad wordlessly, S.A.E. Jean's chest tightened with equal parts of indescribable bitterness and emptiness. It's also a trait but it's so different. S.A.E. Jean could only try to appease his aching heart and the deep sadness dwelling within with a grand sigh, before pitifully shuffling away. His destination was the lonely and distant, impressive mountain peak, slightly hidden from the view by the drifting fog and clouds the monster field. It might have been incredibly dangerous there, but it was also a paradoxical place where S.A.E. Jean of now could feel most at home. Chapter, 5 Quickly shaking away the negative emotions that would always invade his mind whenever he went outside, S.A.E. Jean returned to his cave, one that resembled a respectable dwelling more or less. He then set about formulating a new plan. Now that he was a gray wolf, he could go a bit further away to hunt. The issue was. It was still undoubtedly dangerous. Even though his trait level was at three and had advanced from the brown wolf to a gray one, the monsters in the low-tier hunting ground remained a tough challenge. Besides the gray wolves within the low-tier hunting ground, there roamed monsters such as orc warriors, skeleton soldiers, and trolls, each of them possessing powers greater than that of a gray wolf. The reason why these wolves were acknowledged as low-tier creatures and could survive in this hunting ground was simply because they formed large hunting packs. It would have been nicer still if the orc form evolved as well. Judging by how only the brown wolf form evolved, all three of his forms orc, wolf, goblin must have had different criteria, specific conditions assigned for each of them. If his orc form evolved into an orc warrior, then it wouldn't be a problem to continue using the same hunting pattern for catching brown wolves, but unfortunately for him, that wasn't the case. Right now, his grey wolf form possessed higher physical strength stat than that of the orc form. It means I must hunt in the wolf form. S.A.E. Jean emptied all the complicated worries out of his head and stood up to leave sitting here racking his brain cells wasn't going to give him answers. For now, he'd go out there and take a look-see first. He moved all four of his feet and left the cave. K.R.N.G. As expected, the laws of low-tier hunting ground was far more dangerous than that of the lowest-tier areas. The viciously growling gray wolves with feral eyes couldn't be compared to that of the lowly brown wolves at all. If it was just comparing the body sizes, then S.A.E. Jean's current gray wolf form was one. Five times larger than the normal ones, but. Qual. Qual. The spectacle of six ferocious gray wolves pouncing on a patrolling orc warrior and ripping it to shreds, was something he didn't find enjoyable or impressive to witness. Pure rung. Losing his motivation, S.A.E. Jean turned around and went another way. From his back, noises that eerily sounded similar to dogs voraciously chewing on a toy in a desperate, pain scream could be heard. Knowing that he wasn't on the menu for those wolves today could only give him a small sense of relief. He then headed towards the outer area of the low-tier hunting ground. This was after rolling his head around for a bit. Numerous monsters inevitably gathered around a drinking water source such as rivers and lakes, which could create a potential killing field of sorts. 
Because of this reason, most of the physically weak low-tier monsters that lived in groups settled down in outer areas that were as far away as possible from the said water sources. For instance monsters such as goblins. KRNG. SAE Gene's thoughts proved to be correct. His eyes sharpened abruptly, a deeply sinister grin plastered on his lips. In the distance, he saw a bonfire burning brightly, illuminating a quaint little village consisting of several primitive huts. S.A.E. Jean slowly approached there. It was quite likely that he had found a village of goblins nestling in this low-tier hunting ground that practiced in medicine and witchcraft. These monsters possessed pathetic physical strength. The things he had to be wary of were, if it was a goblin practicing medicine, then he needed to look out for poisons if a goblin dabbled in witchcraft, then he had to be cautious against curses. However, it wasn't easy to defend against such attacks, so if a goblin's rank was higher than low tier, then regardless of their own ranks, hunters and knights would see it as the number one monster to avoid like a plague. Krang Kang Kang S.A.E. Jean spotted two green-skinned goblins. One of them had tattoos plastered all over its body. Must have been the so-called elite goblin. They are medicine types, thought S.A.E. Jean. He used his nose to make sure. The super-sensitive olfactory sense of the gray wolf caught the unmistakable whiff of herbs, confirming his thoughts. Krang. Two goblins performed some sort of a farewell ritual and parted ways. Seeing this, S.A.E. Jean quickly lowered his body and hid in the tall grasses. The one with lots of tattoos on its body, began walking towards where he was hiding. Judging by the binocular-like object as well as a pair of shoes the creature held in hand and wore on its feet, it seemed like this goblin was heading out either to scout or to gather medicinal herbs. S.A.E. Jean's heart beat faster and faster the closer the elite goblin got. One footstep, two footsteps. Unaware of the danger lurking in the bushes, the prey unhurriedly walked closer to the trap, and seeing this scene, S.A.E. Jean's muscles tightened in dreadful anticipation, unconsciously salivating. As the time to pounce neared, he slowly rose up halfway, his ears flattening to reduce air drag as much as possible. However, goblins were clever and alert monsters to begin with, and an elite goblin was even more so. In order to catch one, he had to exercise utmost discretion and maximum wariness. KHRNG As expected of a perceptive creature, the elite goblin stopped just short of the trap, sensing the aura of uneasiness permeating in the air. But S.A.E. Jean didn't wait and kicked the ground, pouncing on his prey. Ignoring the distance, the terrifying beast rushed towards his target like a crashing wave of a tsunami. It's far. It turned out, the goblin was just out of the initial reach. To make the matters worse, the creature had regained most of its composure as well. As a matter of fact, the DN thing had pulled out a primitive blowgun and was trying to shoot it at S.A.E. Jean's direction. As befitting of the moniker elite, there was not a single shred of fear showing in its calm demeanor. All those tattoos weren't just for a show, indeed. Son of a bitch. But S.A.E. Jean was far more desperate than the goblin. His desperation, fueled by the emotions of heartache and fear, pushed him past the physical limit of the wolf's four limbs. And like grey-coloured tempest winds, the grey wolf stormed in and sunk his fangs into the neck of the goblin before it could mount a counterattack. Almost at the same time, an alert window popped up as if it was a message of his victory. Complete, breaking past the limit while running active skill whirlwind dash has been acquired. Instantly raises the dashing speed. Can be used in human form. Calculated from the numerical value of the current agility stat, the skill can be safely activated two times per day exceeding this amount will put strain on the body. Quajik. S.A.E. Jean broke the neck of the elite goblin while reading the pop-up notice. The dead monster's blood seeped into his mouth, past his fangs. Then another notice window popped up into his view. Complete, traditions of goblins, inheritance of memories. Drank the blood of a goblin specializing in medicine. Now, while in either the goblin form or the human form, the host can freely activate the elite goblin's medicinal knowledge and concoction skill. S.A.E. Jean tilted his head slightly. Was this a good thing? But since he was as good as in the middle of enemy encampment, he wasn't able to afford time to ponder this new development. Krang Kang. 
The hullabaloo raised by a beast's hunt roused a pack of goblins and they were busy heading this way. Sensing the overwhelming killing intent, S.A.E. Jean didn't even look back once as he fled the scene. The countless poison darts, obviously fired by the irate goblins, inundated the air behind him, but a grey wolf's running speed was far greater and rapid than they were. The sight of a grey wolf excitedly shaking its hips with a booty of an elite goblin dangling in his mouth while walking back to his home in the lowest tier hunting ground could easily be described as endearingly humorous, somewhat. But in the middle of this trot, S.A.E. Jean suddenly caught a faint but pained whimpering from somewhere. After carefully lowering the goblin down, his ears stood up sharply to listen. Ha, ah. So weak, it might die out any second, but it was there for sure. It was a moaning of a person in trouble. There was no need to think too deeply when a human wanted to help out another human being. S.A.E. Jean picked up the dead goblin again and quickly dashed towards the direction of the dying person. After running full speed for a minute or so, he found a gravely injured figure lying on a thick grass. The injury on this person was terrible enough to make him turn his head away. He could see intestines within the torn abdomen, crimson blood spilling out, and intermittently, the whimpers managed to escape from the lips in between the bubbling red stuff clogging her mouth. Even though it was an incredibly serious wound that would have killed a person instantly, this person, a female, was still clinging on desperately. Her consciousness had abandoned her, but she kept on moaning in pain while both her hands were rolled in tight fists, as if she could not accept the fate of her impending doom. K.H.R.N.G. S.A.E. Jean knew who this woman was. Her race was an elf-like human, her profession a knight. The daughter of the master of the Raven Knight's Order, reputedly the strongest knight's order in South Korea. And only a step away from accomplishing the feat of the youngest ever knight ranked highest tier in the history some even going as far as uttering that she could be the representative of the whole nation and some outright admitting that she was the most beautiful female knight in the nation Kim Yurin. Me, another Kim. There are other surnames in Korea, BTW. Also, not 100% sure of how to classify these rankings just yet. We'll revise if more context is provided in the future. The claims of being the most outstanding beauty wasn't all empty talk, tough. Even while precariously striding on the boundaries of death, Yurin's beauty still wasn't going anywhere. But the description of her stunning beauty and admiration for her personality had to wait for now. All the honor and glory could only be maintained if one managed to live. Putting down the dead elite goblin, S.A.E. Jean quickly assumed the orc form. As a giant orc, this slender woman felt lighter than a feather. So, he even hoisted the goblin carcass he was planning to discard over his other shoulder and hurriedly ran towards his base of operations. He just hoped that he could make it in time. S.A.E. Jean placed the woman down on the stone bed and changed to the goblin form. Thanks to his short height, he had to climb up on the bed to diagnose all of her wounds. And just like that, like a lie, he could tell exactly what potion he needed to make, and the ingredients necessary to make the said potion. A dream-inducing grass, jijung liquid, a scorpion grass, and a single low-grade mana stone. I've no idea what this jijung is. Left as is. S.A.E. Jean began rummaging through the belongings of the dead elite goblin. Thankfully, he found all the necessary ingredients as mentioned as well as a mortar and pestle inside the small rucksack it carried on the back. And the most important item in concocting the medicine, the low-grade mana stone, he just happened to have a couple on hand, so that was that taken care of. S.A.E. Jean began implementing the steps to create a potion as engraved in his brain. Dividing the ingredients in equal measure, he poured all his efforts grinding them in the mortar. When the herbs were powderized to a certain degree, he then added the mana stone and resumed grinding away. That's when the miracle happened. The solid mana stone melted into a liquid that emitted a clear blue light, as soon as it interacted with the rest of the ingredients. It didn't look any different from other emergency medicine on sale in the stores, but the effects would be heaven and earth indifference. Using the knowledge of herbs now firmly rooted in his head, S.A.E. Jean could ascertain the comparative advantage. It seemed like he made a mid-grade potion. If the widely available emergency medicine could only heal the surface wounds, then his own miraculous potion would not only mend the deep injuries but also replenish the lost blood as well. S.A.E. Jean applied some of the liquid on the woman's wounds and poured the rest down her throat. 
And then, the miracle began. The frightening injury on her abdomen, with the internal organs on show, slowly but surely started to regenerate by itself, and her pale complexion that seemed to indicate that death was just around the corner, regained some of the lost colors. Phew. S.A.E. Jean breathed out a sigh of relief, seeing the recovery of the woman below. Suddenly, several message windows popped up and obscured his view. Condition cleared, a goblin's kindness. Must administer a necessary aid to at least one human being. All stats rise by one. The host can now assume the medical goblin form instead of goblin form. All stats related to the goblin form will be adjusted accordingly. Acquired the passive skill goblin's craftsmanship. The host will receive bonus attributes when performing all jobs related to craftsmanship. Manufacturing, cooking, cleaning, healing, etc. The skill's effectiveness will be reduced during the human form. Eh. Not only did the goblin form evolve, he even ended up getting a skill to boot. S.A.E. Jean toiled hard for the whole month, hunted like crazy until it felt like his back would snap into two, and still, he couldn't even get a sniff of a skill during all that time, but here he was, getting three of them in one day. Was this emotion that he was feeling right now one of profound happiness, unbridled panic, or inescapable emptiness? Whatever it was, S.A.E. Jean just sat there, unmoving, and stared at the message windows. Meanwhile, without a fanfare, a single modest tattoo manifested on his forehead, just like that. Chapter, 6 The rain started to fall. At first, the drops were light and fleeting, but soon intensified and flooded the small streams flowing down the mountains, as well as rapidly filling up all the basins here. Looks like it'll last a while. S.A.E. Jean finally let out a sigh after gazing at the rain for a long time. He was worried. What could he say to the resting woman behind him? What excuses sound plausible enough to prevent her from murdering him? For a highly ranked knight like her who was aiming to become a person of the highest tier, it'd only take a single punch to erase any and all hints of the existence of a single low-tier ranked goblin. Moan. But he couldn't continue worrying and agonizing for any longer. Even though it hadn't been an hour since the treatment, Kim Yurin let out soft moans as if she'd regain her consciousness any time now. The pitiful goblin nearly jumped out of his skin from the sudden moaning and hurriedly ran towards the side of the woman. Are you Al? A sudden thought popping out in his head stopped his words from coming out. A goblin isn't supposed to talk in a human tongue. Having thought about it for a bit, he knew it just couldn't be helped. Really, a regular goblin wasn't supposed to save a human. The usually starving goblins wouldn't be picky when it came to the matters of filling up their bellies, after all. Hmm. Tossing this way and that, fighting the various pains and aches, Kim Yurin finally opened her eyes. She could see a stone ceiling through the heavy, sleepy eyelids. Silently observing the unfamiliar ceiling for a short moment, she then suddenly sat up like a lightning bolt. Yuck. Unfortunately for her, her action caused the still healing body to scream out in pain. Her face crumpled in agony, she caressed the abdomen that was torn to bits just over thirty minutes ago. But it was rather odd. It was definitely true that the claws of a saber-toothed tiger gouged a chunk out of her tummy. The horrible residual pain felt very real too. Yet, her abdomen felt just fine to her touch as if nothing was wrong. How are you feeling? Out of nowhere, she heard a voice of a man. Yurin let out a breath of relief and turned towards the source of the voice. In the critical moment, she used the extra teleport scroll which she packed just in case, seeing that the others weren't working for some reason, but even that ended up sending her to a wrong place, so she thought she was going to die. But fortunately, a passerby happened to. Ah, I'm. A goblin stood there. Not only that, it spoke a human language. In Korean, no less. She was going to get up and offer a bow of gratitude to her benefactor but right now, it felt like her head was flickering into a total blankness. The goblin in front of her continued to yap on about something, but she couldn't hear any of it. No, her brain actively denied it. What what the hell? Thinking that she must be still suffering from the aftereffects of trauma, she deeply closed her eyes and reopened them. But it was the same as before. She rubbed her eyes and stared again. Ah. 
No matter what, the situation remained the same. What the hell? Am I going crazy? Unable to hold it in, she dazedly spat out the words. Nope, I'm real. S.A.E. Jean was also somewhat frustrated. That was because goblins had really poor abilities to string together a decent sentence, unfortunately. Even the most unwanted, useless traits were beginning to mirror the real thing, it seemed. Wah, it really spoke. Maybe I've died already? Yurin covered her face with both her hands and lied back down on the stone bed. It took quite a long time before she could come to accept her current situation. S.A.E. Jean did his best in trying to convince Yurin while facing down her disbelieving gazes. One mistake, and he'd be a dead meat in seconds, that's why. S.A.E. Jean's story was simple but plausible. His story was that, he was different and cleverer than other goblins ever since his birth, and after growing disillusioned from the deceitful ways of goblins. He ran away, then he met a hunter and although imperfect, learned to speak the language and the mannerisms of humans. Of course, the hunter met his end in an unfortunate incident some time later. It wasn't the most detailed and watertight setting or a plot, but thankfully, Kim Yurin didn't suspect his words too much. Her openness was partly because whether it was a goblin or not, he was still her savior, and also because not much was known about how various monsters lived day to day. After all, if there was a monster capable of taking on a human shape, then surely, there must be a monster that could speak a human language. So that's what happened. Regardless, thanks for saving me. With a more relaxed manner, Yurin gently rubbed his head while smiling weakly. Even though it was gentle gesture, S.A.E. Jean's body went rigid. Finding this funny, Yurin lightly giggled out. Haha you're a strange fellow Yuk. Her body condition still didn't allow her to leisurely laugh out, and she had to grab her abdomen while her face crumpled from the stabbing pain. S.A.E. Jean quickly gave her another batch of the pre-made potion that suppressed pain and healed the wounds. Should I drink this? Seeing S.A.E. Jean nod his head, Yurin smiled and took a big gulp of the potion. Wah! Yurin let out a gasp of pleasant surprise almost right away. Like a miracle, all of her pain simply disappeared as if it was all but a lie. You got some sick skills, don't you? She smiled brightly and resumed rubbing the head of the goblin in front of her. It looked like the little guy enjoyed her gesture, she figured. Thanks. Really, really, thank you. I made it because of you. To knights who constantly clashed against monsters, goblins were nothing more than a lump of bad memories they'd rather soon forget. Poisons and curses were two of the most difficult elements to deal with for the human knights that lacked the resistance to them. And of course, the ugly outer appearances of goblins only added more to that negative impression. But right now, for Kim Yurin, the fact that a life form known as a goblin was standing in front of her didn't matter one bit. This goblin that possessed intelligence was unexpectedly kind and she found it rather cute as well. Ah. As she absentmindedly rubbed the goblin's head, the bracelet tightly wrapped around her arm suddenly started vibrating. It seemed like the order was calling her, at a quick glance. It was likely that they were trying to contact her after she failed to return long past the end of her assignment. That's right, my assignment. Her assignment. Was unfortunately, a failure. On top of that, she could have suffered the fate of an indescribably gory death, too. But thanks to her heaven-defying luck, she met this goblin and was able to overcome her fate. And now, this encounter had given her a chance instead. An investigation will find the evidence left behind by those who tempered with the teleport scrolls, and the two knights that shoved me into a sure death situation before escaping by themselves. Yu Zhangyun and Kim Sarang know, it's safe to assume the entirety of the second team are involved here. In just over two years, Kim Yurin's father, Kim Hyun Suk would have to step down from the position of the Knights Order Master, after his term of office comes to an end. And the favorite to fill the position was not the current Vice Master of the Order, Oh Jong Hyuk, but was, in fact, Kim Yurin. The current situation was at point where two opposing sides, one supporting Yurin and the other the dissatisfied Vice Master, were engaged in shadowy struggles for power, and what had happened to her today could be best described as a result arising from the said struggles. Was it necessary to stoop so low like animals just because they felt like the time was running out, 
with her rank advancement ceremony being next month, she angrily mused. Yurin ended up gritting her teeth. Those six bastards that abandoned her right in front of the cave of a forty-year-old saber-toothed tiger. A creature so tough that a highly ranked knight would find it difficult to fight against it alone and the mysterious identities of the ones responsible for making seven teleport scrolls, her mana-enhanced armor, and even her weapons malfunction at the critical moment. Thanks. Because of you, looks like now I can pull out all the weeds in one go. Lit. Said, hit them all in one go. She had no choice but to cool her boiling anger for another day in the future. Kim Yurin gently smiled and continued to rub the head of the goblin, before slowly speaking up towards the bracelet. Upper tier night, Kim Yurin, will return. Yurin then stopped and took a quick glance at the goblin, before breaking out in another soft smile and changed the contents of her message. No, I shall return in about three hours' time. It's raining too hard. And because of heavy rainfall, a landslide blocked the exit of the cave I'm in. S.A.E. Jean and Yurin talked a lot during those three hours. Rather than a conversation, though, it was clear which role belonged to who. Since it was difficult to form a proper sentence as a goblin, S.A.E. Jean naturally ended up in the role of a listener and Yurin as the talker. Ha, how could it be possible that I never got to enjoy a romantic relationship once in all twenty-seven years of my life? Ah, but it's not a problem unique to me, nope. Why is she so lively like this? She sounded so cold and unapproachable in TV interviews. S.A.E. Jean found it wondrous just how easygoing and talkative Yurin was, which was totally out of his expectations. When he saw her on TV, she seemed more calculating and cold rather than someone easy to talk to. Honestly, I really adore gifts like plain and cute dolls, you know. But the boys only see the night side of me and end up giving me only the useless presents like knives and swords and magic armaments, so how can I go out on a date with knuckleheads like them? And also, when I kick them to the curve because of their mistakes, they spread around rumors of me having high standards and try to make me look weird. But S.A.E. Jean was satisfied right now. Who would be able to listen to the private grumblings pouring out from the Korea's most famous female knight like this? He listened to her complaints for the next three hours all the while suitably responding at the right moments and pretending to not understand when difficult words came by. Actually, he was busy observing her face. Even after spending three hours staring at it, he simply couldn't get enough of her beauty that easily transcended past every praise laid down before her. Finally, like a sign, the rain stopped falling and the sunlight brightened the sky just as the end of the promised three hours came. When I have the time, I'll come and visit again. It may be a little late. But I promise to definitely repay you properly then. In the face of the imminent end to their short meeting, Yurin hesitated somewhat, turning to look at him several times. It seemed like she wasn't happy with the level of gratitude shown to her savior and felt apologetic about it. But S.A.E. Jean didn't feel that way. Instead, he was so thankful, he might even go mad from the excitement. Yurin gave him a fong of the saber-toothed tiger as a compensation. Befitting a knight of her caliber, she didn't just single-sidedly lose to the monster but actually managed to successfully break one of its fangs. If it weren't for the recently acquired knowledge of the goblins, he'd have treated this fong as nothing more than some expensive japtam, but now, it was a different story altogether. The fong itself was a mana stone and at the same time, an ingredient in concocting medicine. If he carefully added other ingredients to it, then he could make ten bottles or more worth of potions with various effects and properties. A hurried, cursory recollection of the potential uses revealed that he could make a potion to drastically increase his constitution and thus show a tremendous prowess during a hunt. Or concoct something like the one he made Kim Yurin drink just now and sell it to the public the possibilities were truly endless. As an added bonus, he didn't have worried too much about gathering attention if he started making and selling potions. Normally, it was possible to sell, once cleared of having side effects and approved for consumption, the privately brewed potions even while maintaining a relative anonymity. In other words, I can make a profit of a minimum of 440k. As long as there was a healing effect, even the lowly emergency medicine that wasn't treated as a proper potion was worth 175 per bottle. 
He also remembered seeing in a news segment that, in a test performed on medicines concocted by a human, a dark elf and a goblin using the same ingredients, the stuff made by the goblin turned out to be the best of them all. And I happen to be a goblin. A great goblin, no less. With this, he could earn enough money to buy equipment and also buy himself a nice house in Kanwan province. Thank you. Take care of yourself. S.A.E. Jean bid Kim Yurin farewell with a pair of very happy eyes. Right on cue, a clear sunlight descended down between them. It was especially a nice weather to say goodbyes. Re, right. You take care of yourself as well. Don't go to dangerous areas. Yurin's voice was trembling slightly, wet with heavy emotions. She felt a tad sad seeing the bright expression of the goblin after all, she had opened up her heart to it for the past three hours and in the process she grew closer to this creature. But she couldn't delay matters any longer. Yurin hardened her face and turned around, commanding her heavy feet to move. Yeah. You too. Hearing that somewhat ordinary voice, she was pretty sure the short time she shared with the intelligent and kind creature would remain etched in her memories for the rest of her life. Chapter, 7 A week after the unexpected meeting with Kim Yurin. First, from the fong she gave to him as a present, S.A.E. Jean was able to create four batches of potions. One potion for strengthening the constitution of its drinker, and the other three, healing and regenerative effects. He'd stashed the former for himself when he went out on a hunt, but the rest, he decided to sell them off. He was already getting fed up with this living in a cave lifestyle, plus with the energy manipulation stat now at 8. Which made it possible to maintain the human form for at least 80 minutes every day, S.A.E. Jean decided it was high time he bought a house near the Kanwan province. Of course, as expected of a place called the paradise for the monster-related industry, the exorbitant land price here was second only to the capital city. So, ensuring that even if he started working to his bones starting now, it'd still take a long, long while before he could afford one. Lit set a mecca for the monster-related industry. Changed for obvious reasons. Whatever the case may have been, currently S.A.E. Jean was standing in front of a building called an alchemy house that reeked of a bitter aroma of the herbs and was filled with the bubbling sounds of chemicals boiling in their pots. While there were less than three alchemy houses existing in any given large metropolis, these exceedingly rare organizations were the only place where the administration of the verification process which assigned the grades as well as handled the distribution of the potions created by the alchemists, could be done. But, even though it was true they were hard to find, for someone like S.A.E. Jean who literally lived inside the borders of Kanwan province. Seeking out one of these so-called homes of an alchemist proved to be rather simple, with their continued survival intrinsically linked to that of the monster's existences. Had to change quite a lot in this paragraph. This author sure loves to torment me with indecipherable spaghetti soup of words. Hmm. Even though he wore the robe supposedly favored by alchemists, and had the hood pulled right up to match the outer appearance. S.A.E. Jean's actions of curiously surveying the surroundings easily revealed his status as a complete noob at these sort of things. Is there something I can assist you with, perhaps? An employee came in closer and politely inquired after noticing him meandering. I'm here to sell some potions I've created. But I haven't sold one before, nor have I any prior fame. Is it still possible? Lit. Battle records. I mean, what? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Would you follow me this way, please? Didn't matter what territory or nation, the number of alchemists were always much lower than that of magicians, and consequently, they were treated as one of the most valuable human resources out there. And, even though there was this whiff of a new bee coming off of S.A.E. Jean, his word and posture were undoubtedly that of a real alchemist, so the male employee made sure to remain courteous while guiding him. S.A.E. Jean promptly found and sat down on a nearest office chair, and nervously waited as he kept an eye on the watch but soon enough, the male employee sat on the opposite side with a document of some kind. This is the application form. The verification process will commence after you write down the name of the potion and its effects here. When the product's been verified to be free of any side effects and its medicinal efficacy ascertained, a grade will be assigned according to its medicinal strengths, and afterwards, the potion can be sold on the market. 
potions brewed by the skilled hands of alchemists enjoyed a far greater demand than the supply could ever meet. Those commonly available emergency potions sold in monster stores, mass manufactured with 10th grade mana stones, couldn't even begin to compare in performance and overall quality. And the popularity enjoyed by the potions brewed by a well-known alchemist was such that potential buyers had to reserve their share very much in advance in order to purchase one. Strangely enough, it wasn't the alchemist's name that garnered the attention, but the potions themselves instead. It was because, alchemists loved anonymity and believed hiding one's true identity from the public was a matter of professional virtue, so the only avenue available to truly flaunt their abilities was through their potion craft. It was a given, then, the alchemists painstakingly chose suitable names for their creations and didn't hesitate to pour every fiber of their beings and every ounce of their talents into bettering the potions they made. Of course, the rumor on the street was, that for those famed alchemists who had already achieved great acclaim and were well known throughout the world. They could afford to just deal directly with the masters of the knight's orders and the CEOs of the corporate worlds. If you wish to keep your identity hidden, please check that box labeled anonymous over here. S.A.E. Jean unhurriedly jotted the words down on the application form. For the potion's effects. Healing and regeneration. All of a sudden, the body of the male employee trembled noticeably from the shock as he took a sideways glance at the contents S.A.E. Jean was writing down. When S.A.E. Jean glared at him questioningly, the employee scratched the back of his neck and sheepishly made an excuse. Ah, my apologies. It's because regeneration is quite a rare effect to clarify, did you mean regenerative recovery of the wounds, instead? Usually, a potion will be graded lower mid-tier even if the regenerative effects prove to be minor. And on top of that, there is also a healing effect as well. Ha ha ha. As long as there are no side effects, this potion will be graded as high, surely. Many knights orders and hospitals were getting concerned at the shortage of high-grade items lately so this is great news. S.A.E. Jean lightly smirked at the employee. He knew there wouldn't be any side effects with the potion. Since a word like perfection was not nearly enough to describe the skills of an elite goblin capable of combining the ingredients and the powder of the saber-toothed tiger's fong down to a nanogram accuracy. I've completed the form. Ah, thank you. Just in case, have you brought along a sample of the potion? The employee asked S.A.E. Jean as he handed over the form. Well, rather than what you'd call a sample, I've got the finished product here with me. S.A.E. Jean produced a glass bottle containing the potion from the robe's pocket. A clear blue light emitted from the liquid inside and the small area around the bottle glowed softly as a result. In that moment, the male employee became completely speechless. After a lengthy deliberation brought on by the indescribable beauty of the potion, the only thing he could do was to swallow back his saliva, hard. There was just no way a novice alchemist could concoct a medicine that had both the effects of healing and regeneration. But there could be no doubt as to what this clear blue liquid emitting the brilliant glow was. Even without testing, even without assigning it a grade, this could only be the healing and regeneration potion. This. Please, wait a moment. The male employee quickly recognized it as an item he was not qualified to handle. A value of a potion with healing effects was higher than other variety of potions. Obviously, people with jobs fighting back the tides of monsters, hunters and knights, as well as the civilians occupying regular positions would have found such potions quite a necessity. Sorry, but I don't have much time. Unfortunately, he just couldn't afford to delay any longer, so S.A.E. Jean stood up to leave seeing this, the employee went into a full-on panic mode and he quickly grabbed S.A.E. Jean's shoulders and made him sit back down. Wait, wait, wait a moment, please. Just one moment. The manager will. The employee was desperate in his plea. In reality, the alchemy houses were actually high-stress organizations dyed in the colors of cutthroat competition and the pursuit of the robust bottom lines. To be in a better position to receive the financial assistance, the twenty-odd alchemy houses spread throughout the country were engaged in a bloody war of results. And the matter of which potion came out of which house located in which province played the most important role in achieving the best results. In the situation where a quality potion came up for sale. Then the house would occupy a more favorable position when the inevitable petty squabbles should break out between the knight's orders and various other institutions that wanted the potion for themselves. 
That was why the employee was adamant about keeping SAE Gene here, but he was firm with his reply. You don't need more than a few drops for the verification purposes, so I shall leave behind three. There shouldn't be a problem for me to return at a later date after the testing process is finished. Ye, yes, that is true, but wait, the stamp. Did you already stamp your jijang on the form? A jijang is literally a finger stamp. Can't think of an English equivalent and it's not really leaving a fingerprint, so. The alchemists wishing to stay anonymous were specially managed through their jijangs. So, while most employees didn't know of the name nor the face of an alchemist, they could still tell which potions were brewed by that particular person. Yes, I did. I saw the blue-colored number 30437 spreading out on the form. That number meant that his application was 30,437th for this particular alchemy house. Seeing that there were less than 1,000 variety of potions on the market, there was no real need to ask just how many aspiring alchemists out there had to taste despair during the grading and verification processes. Yes in that case please promise me to come and visit us later on. That you'll return to us. The employee bowed down and shouted out aloud. It was loud enough to reverberate around the interior and cause the surrounding gazes to focus here, but to those familiar with how the alchemy houses operated behind the scenes, it was only at the level of yet another day at work. Ah, uh, yes. Well, do you have a preparatory bottle for the samples at hand? At his words, the employee hurriedly moved to find a sample bottle, and SAE Jean left the alchemy house after leaving behind precisely three drops worth of his potion inside of that tiny little glass bottle. The downtown of the city was filled with all sorts of sounds. Conversations from the passing traffic of people tumbled around one another, mixed with the various noises of the city SAE Jean found it hard to adjust after getting used to the stillness of the mountains. But even among this jumble of sounds, there was this one voice that attracted his ears especially so. Night Kim Yurin, there are only two weeks left until your highest tier night ascension ceremony. How are you feeling right now? The sound was coming from a wrist-mounted hologram TV displayed in the electronics store, the projection showing an interview performed by a reporter with Kim Yurin. Not too bad. Yes. Ah, ha ha. Ah ha 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 ha. Is that so? Of course ha ha ha. It wouldn't be bad at all, ha ha ha. The reporter could only just about diffuse the tricky situation the uncomfortably short answer brought on with several awkward laughters. S.A.E. Jean smirked lightly as he watched. He knew why she acted that way, after all something about the phobia of being in front of cameras or something like that. So, so then let's proceed to the next question. Ah, uh, yes, after being voted no. One is the most beautiful night by the male counterparts, can you please tell us how you feel? The reporter forgot the rest of his question momentarily after he got properly sucked in by the infinitely clear gazes of Yurin staring at his face. It might have been an ordinary gaze in truth, but her beautiful face made it seem much more extraordinary than it really was. Obviously, it's not bad, as well, no. Ah, uh, no, wait, that's what was it again. The reporter finally managed to open his mouth and sprouted nonsense for a second or two, before his professional mentality brought back his game face back on and he quickly changed to another question. Ah, uh, that's right. Can Miss Yurin enlighten us to what your ideal man entails? It's just that, several hotly trending male knights have all chosen Miss Yurin as their ideal partner, you see. An ideal man. Yes, yes. Yurin thought deeply for a moment, before breaking out in a grin. It was short, but stunningly beautiful enough to dye not only the projection but the entire grey street surrounding the store with brightness. The reporter was lost for words again while Yurin replied with that dazzling smile still on her face. I prefer a man that's like a goblin. Yes. What do you mean by that? Except that he'd have to be intelligent and kind. In other words, a goblin that's both kind and skilled. Ah. The reporter ended up interpreting her words that sounded unrealistic as something like no ideal man for me out there, or such. Ye, yes, of course. Thank you for your candid replies. As expected of the youngest ever highest tier knight, the qualities for your ideal partner are indeed very unique. But SAE Jean was different. He stood there staring at the image of Kim Yurin for a long while with a huge smile on his face, 
before entering the shop properly. Welcome. Ah, uh, yeah, how much for that wrist hologram TV? Oh, wait, will it work even deep inside a cave up in the mountains? While the employees of the alchemy houses were mostly the specialists who gave up walking the paths of alchemy midway, the roles of managers could only be filled by the actual alchemists. An alchemist had to register a minimum of three potions in the bestseller list in order to either open up an alchemy house or to sit in the apprentice position of a master. The dark elf alchemist Hazeline, who rose to the alchemy house manager's seat at a young age of 31, was currently making an unreadable expression on her face as she examined the sample potion left behind by the mysterious visitor earlier today. Hey, why am I even looking at this? Hell, this doesn't even need to get verified, either. At the very least, it's a mid-grade. And at most, a high-grade. It's been a while since I saw a potion this bright and clear. And like a schmuck, you sent away the guy who brewed this by saying that you needed to test it? My apologies I have no excuses. Oh well, at least, with him leaving the sample behind here, the possibility of us doing business together is rather high, so no need to apologize. Anyhow, what's it called? Ah, that is it's a little strange. The male employee hesitantly checked the application form SAE Jean wrote, but in the end, stutteringly read aloud what was written on the paper. A goblin's kindness. That's the name of the potion. So, a confession time. The author keeps saying high, mid, low and stuff like that while describing the tiers rankings of the knights and hunters, potions, and monsters, but hasn't really provided a context to go with them so far. I did a quick google and lo and behold, the word used to describe what Kim Yurin's ranking was, which literally means highest superior knight, actually was the Korean TL term for the Protoss High Templar from the Starcraft games. You know, that one Koreans all go mad over. So, uh. Should I rename all of the knight rankings to that of Protoss system? What about that of the hunters? And monsters? Hmm. Chapter, 8. It was an ordinary afternoon. And just like any other day, SAE Jean came to the monster store to unload the monster materials when, out of the blue, the lady government official demanded to see his hunter license. Here, please take this newly issued hunter license. After the official did this and that with the new card, he noticed that there were new and different words from before added to the front of it. The heavenly gifted hunter. What is this? S.A.E. Jean asked, his head tilting slightly. Ah, that is what you call a title. It's just a nice, simplified way to describe your current set of abilities. Eh. Didn't you bring in monster carcasses worth 23 creatures within your first month as a hunter, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean? Because you satisfied the conditions, a prefix was added to your job description. Overflowing with a great talent, that's what the title Heavenly Gifted means. It's really a rare and wonderful title, you know. You can't receive it if you've been a hunter for over six months, and also, the Knight's Orders actually do prefer this title over the likes of the seasoned pro or the distinguished individual. The latter one was something called I've no idea what this is, and Google was no help either, so, I made stuff up. Oh well. The government official explained with ardent fervor and zeal, but SAE Jean showed little interest as he lightly nodded his head. After all, this wasn't a very helpful tale for someone like him who could only maintain his human form for 80 minutes a day. Thanks, I guess. Ah. Wait. When SAE Jean turned around to leave, the government official shot up from her seat and lightly held onto his sleeve. As he frowned and stared at the official with questioning eyes, she quickly pushed forward a paper at him while her cheeks reddened in a bashful manner. This please take a look at this. Ha. Huh. A government official's trying to sell me something. Even though SAE Jean was slightly speechless, he ended up finding the shy female official twisting her body in embarrassment, objectively speaking, rather adorable in his eyes. There was still 66 minutes left. What am I reading here? He asked out aloud as he checked out the writings on the paper. The large words Public Recruitment for Hunters by Pabak Knight's Order were written on top, and below that were some fine prints detailing what's what. Pabak is a government-owned Knight's Order with its headquarters located in our neck of the woods, and currently, they are looking to hire capable hunters. 
Of course, it's true that only the ranks of mid-tier or higher can possibly apply, but I'm sure that Mr. S.A.E. Jean's title will receive a favorable consideration in this case. Besides, the plan was to upgrade your ranking to low mid-tier or higher as soon as Mr. S.A.E. Jean satisfied the required amount of hunting experience, you see. To clarify, the widely accepted definition for a low mid-tier hunter was can hunt a low-tier monster if three people with similar skill sets gather. And for a low mid-tier knight, it was the exact opposite can deal with more than three low-tier monsters at the same time, alone. That's why S.A.E. Jean's existence was a little, no, very special to the eyes of this lady official. In most cases, hunters formed parties of three or more when moving about, yet here was a man that always came in alone, and always left by himself as well. Well, are you interested in taking this opportunity? If you want, it's possible to apply right here and now. Mr. S.A.E. Jean will be accepted right away when you submit your application, I'm sure of it. In the past, Hunters with the title Heavenly Gifted all got scouted by the famous knight's orders even before they've been active for less than a year. Heck, some even went and converted their professions and became knights in the end, you know. She became slightly desperate and her grip on S.A.E. Jean's sleeve got a little stronger. He was going to decline right away, but then, he found it a bit regretful too, looking at the lady official's round, clear and sparkling eyes. It was a sight of a woman actively pursuing him, something he had never experienced before in his life yet. A man's worth was indeed judged by his abilities, thought S.A.E. Jean. To see a cute woman, a well-paid government employee to boot, acting so aggressive like this. It was indeed a mystical yet somewhat difficult new world for him to tread in. If it weren't for his trade of being a monster he wouldn't even have a chance to do so, but at the same time, he couldn't really go around boasting his achievements either, precisely because of his condition as a monster. Is that so? When S.A.E. Jean's lips wiggled and formed an indecipherable smile, she mistakenly thought the talk was proceeding swimmingly, and so she smiled happily and added a bit more to the sales pitch. Yes, of course. Hee hee by the way, there's a favor I'd really, really love to ask you related to this. It was right at this moment. S.A.E. Jean swallowed that mysterious smile back down. His intuition, forcibly cultivated by being subjected to many painful things at a young age, went off like an alarm bell in his head. It said, don't listen to the rest, just leave as soon as possible. So when you are recruited, please, would you mention my name, Kim Hai Jin, as the person who recommended you? What the, wait a second. Please, just a second. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Another Kim? I'm telling you right now, there are other surnames in Korea, too. Before she could finish her sentence, S.A.E. Jean was already leaving the monster store at a walking speed that bordered on a full-on sprint. Hunting became a lot easier, after his goblin form morphed from being what he previously thought of as a useless burden to one of the most valuable assets in a single day. That was all thanks to, of course, the body-strengthening potion and its effects. After doping, the orc form now exhibited strength that equaled an orc warrior's. But as S.A.E. Jean went around with a steel mace bought from the local monster store, when it came to the matters of overall destructive power, he could easily overwhelm an orc warrior that only knew how to wield a crude weapon. His doped grey wolf form might have displayed a similar level of increased destructive prowess, but unfortunately, the wolf's limbs strengthened so much that he couldn't fully control the resulting speed boost so. For now, until he got more familiar with the changes, he had to hunt in a form that most resembled a humanoid shape and orc. Gwahaha. WTF. And the war cry he made just now before the battle, was completely instinctual. When in the middle of the battle, the rapidly boiling fighting spirit made him feel like he was an invincible warrior from some legends of the distant past, and it became harder to endure the rapidly mutating madness without roaring out aloud. Jesus on a pogo stick, this sentence was so chokeful of tough Hanja characters my brain actually imploded trying to TL this SHT up. WTF, indeed. But his opponent didn't respond at all. Par for the course, really. Its entire body made up of bleached bones, this BD was not much different from a corpse reanimated by a lich using mana. Kwahang. A dull-bladed scimitar collided with a steel mace. There was no need to even confirm the end result. 
The forest shook violently from the explosion of noise and the shockwave from the collision, while the skull and the scimitar of the skeleton soldier were literally blown into smithereens. Standing proudly amidst the broken white bones scattering in the air, an orc was busy enjoying the wonderful taste of his victory. Condition complete, required experience points attained. Trait level now increased to 4. All stats rise by 1, and all stats related to forms will be adjusted accordingly. And his happiness could only double while silently observing the message window popping up into his view. His elation couldn't last for long, though. The tall grasses shook, and there were sounds of feet leaving traces on the ground. He had sensed people's presence nearby. They weren't close, but neither could they be described as far, so S.A.E. Jean quickly assumed his human form. His survival depended on it. In truth, the most dangerous element for S.A.E. Jean in the monster field wasn't monsters but fellow humans. With the notable exception of trolls, he could more or less contend with the rest of the monsters found in this low-tier hunting ground. But then, there were the existences called the knights whose powers were just too ridiculously beyond the realm of the common sense. One mistake, and if he got spotted by one of them, then it'd be curtains for him, just like that. That's why he always maintained all five of his senses at the highest possible state of awareness. The clothings he wore during his monster forms were different from when he was in the human form, and thankfully, when he changed, the clothes changed along with him like magic, making it possible to pull the ruse off rather splendidly. Huh, it was just a person. Just in time, as S.A.E. Jean was relaxedly reaching down to grab the mana stone from the fallen skeleton's remains, a party of hunters emerged from the bushes. This four-person party carefully studied S.A.E. Jean's apparels for a bit before offering greetings when they saw the mace in his hands. Ah, hello there. Hunters were not friendly with mana, and as a result, their bodies weren't as powerful, so they couldn't utilize close-range combat weapons. The only remaining weapon of choice for them was the type of guns that fired mana bullets. That's why these hunters mistook S.A.E. Jean as a knight instead. Plus, there was that deafening noise earlier, so they assumed his knight rank was, at least, a low tier. Huh, what a coincidence. It's quite a rare thing to run into other humans in a monster field, see. A guy who seemed to be the leader of the party approached S.A.E. Jean while carrying a disarming smile. But when S.A.E. Jean showed no reaction and simply stared back at him, this hunter promptly produced a business card from his inner pocket and handed it over. We're hunting Team 1, from the Terung Knights Order. My name is Kim Ji Han, a upper mid-tier ranked hunter, and these guys are well, it doesn't really matter. They are just still young hatchlings, after all. OMG. Another Kim. I swear, this author hates other surnames. Has to be it. On the face of this rather expensive-looking business card, the letters upper mid-tier were embroidered in gold ink. It seemed like that a veteran hunter employed by the Knight's Order brought along a bunch of promising eggs on a demonstration hunt for the express purpose of educating the young UNS. Is that right? Yeah, ha ha ha. These guys here somehow managed to hit the rankings of lower mid-tier within two years, but the fact they are still clueless hatchlings. That haven't changed at all oh, if it's not much trouble, may I inquire which knight's order you're affiliated with? Kim Ji Han asked in a friendly voice. He figured that making a friendly connection with a knight would never be a bad thing and only prove advantageous for him in the long run. Of course, that was only if S.A.E. Jean was a knight in the first place. Ah, I think you're mistaken about something here I'm not a knight. S.A.E. Jean replied while pocketing the business card. At the unexpected answer, Kim Ji Han's head tilted slightly while carrying a confused expression on his face. Then his gaze drifted towards the scattered remains of the skeleton soldier on the ground. To utterly annihilate a skeleton like this single handedly, and to claim he wasn't a knight. So that means. Ah, uh, I'm also a hunter. Good to make your acquaintance. My rank is a low tier. Ignoring the flabbergasted expression of Kim Ji Han, S.A.E. Jean offered his hand for a shake while smiling amiably. Somehow grabbing hold of the offered hand, Kim Ji Han continued his disbelieving expressions. Ah well, that was a joke right? Huh, well, your sense of humor is pretty good, I must say. But, you know it's not permitted, right? 
A low-tier hunter isn't permitted to hunt in the low-tier hunting ground alone. I mean, if a low-tier rank can chase down a monster alone, then why stay as a hunter and not become a knight instead, right? Ahahaha. <laughs> Haha is that so? But it's the truth. Sae Jean could now maintain his human form for 90 minutes thanks to his level up just now, but that was still not enough. He quickly pulled out his hunter license and showed it to Kim Ji Han. Ah. Uh, this is a real hunter license. Eh. Ji Han's eyes and mouth widened as he discovered something incredulous on the card after he examined it back to front. The heavenly gifted. Could this be? Ji Han momentarily stopped talking and simply studied the man in front of him. The heavenly gifted this was one of the greatest titles available among the hunters, only granted to those who could, within the space of half a year from the beginning of one's career as a hunter, kill over twenty monsters in a month. Those possessing this title were all invariably got scouted by the biggest knight's orders and it was a common occurrence to see many of them switching their profession to that of a knight instead. At the back of the license, there was Sae Jean's hunting record, and as expected, it was quite a remarkable thing. Maybe it was all down to the difference in talent. Twenty-three monsters in a month, and to top it off, all self-dismantled and disposed of. This record was so overbearing that, even though Kim Ji Han knew this guy's ranking was two tiers lower than his, he found it impossible to say anything about it. This. As Kim Ji Han studied the license some more, his eyes lit up brightly all of a sudden. He finally noticed the space for affiliation was blank. Regular hunters hunted in either one of two ways. One was to form a temporary party with other hunters, and the other was, like Kim Ji Han here, to become a hunter employed by a knight's order and hunt in a designated team. But it wasn't a given that the former was a worse choice than the latter, and that the latter option wasn't always a better of the two. There were enough hunters out there choosing the first option simply because they didn't enjoy being in a strict group environment and all its accompanying rules and regulations. Even though they possessed enough skills and abilities to enter a knight's order. You're not affiliated with anyone yet. Ah, uh, yeah. Somehow, it's like that, but I like moving solo. I'm not thinking of joining anyone. Sae Jean was adamant, but Kim Ji Han thought that he was clearly the latter case. So, with a smile on his face, he presented Sae Jean with another business card. This time, it was for the Terung Knight's Order. Chapter, 9 Kim Ji Han handed over the Terung Knight's Order's business card to Sae Jean. As I mentioned before. I know. The thing is, though, human minds can change at any time, no? Honestly speaking, trying to tough it out alone, especially in our profession as hunters where we already enjoy a pretty short life expectancy, isn't going to work out in the long run. Of course, I'm sure there are pluses to going solo. But hell, don't you agree that being unable to participate in the fisher exploration is too big a missed opportunity? In this world, there existed a separate dimension called the fissure. A place that existed between dimensions, a world between worlds that was a fissure. There were numerous, countless monsters infesting a fissure, and the only way to erase one was to kill every single monster residing within it. And there was the matter of pure, hard net profit that could be earned when erasing a fissure which was at minimum, over 890k, or, as much over 9 million. It didn't matter if you were a hunter or a knight, participating even once in a fisher exploration was a surefire way to earn not only great fame and acclaim, but a healthier bank balance as well. Give it another consideration. When paired together with a knight, a heavenly gifted hunter can shine even more, you see. Ah, right. Before that did you take down that skeleton soldier using that mace? Kim Ji Han asked in a tone of voice that implied he couldn't understand how it was done. It was just plainly impossible for a regular person to defeat a low-tier monster alone, after all. Yes. It's a quality weapon for sure but my family members all had inherited strong constitutions. Oh. If you say so. In today's world there the abilities mana utilization and mana affinity were strictly divided into two distinct categories. The normal remained within the bounds of the common sense but there was no longer any limits applicable for the ones deemed exceptional. Those with good mana affinity didn't need any special teachings to accumulate mana other than to just breathe, and in time. 
they could become the proverbial supermen that were fundamentally different from the likes of normal citizens out there. Although few in number, these superman types did exist among the hunters. They were existences that fell just short of becoming a true, full-on knight as even though they possessed enough affinity with mana, they still lacked the necessary mana utilization, so most of them ended up eking out a living as hunters. Of course, it was still a special power that the regular, powerless people wished they could have it too. All right, I'll think about it. Now then, excuse me, I'm running out of time. There were still around 10 minutes left in the clock, but S.A.E. Jean felt it was slightly burdensome to deal with people right now. Right. Well, if you change your mind, we'd appreciate it greatly if you give us a call first. Our Terran Knights Order is famous for treating all its members very well, regardless of whether it's a knight or a hunter, you see. Maybe it was in consideration of a grey wolf's supposed strengths, the agility, his overall size didn't increase even after the the trait level hitting four but, his ferocious, dangerous aura now easily equaled that of a great tiger. And hunting became quite easier too in the wolf form without resorting to doping now. Most of the low-tier monsters died after a single surprise attack from S.A.E. Jean. He'd saunter into a thicket to hide and wait for a prey, and in that moment when one entered the killing zone with a shocking explosion of speed that didn't even leave behind a blur. His fangs would sink deep into the necks of his victims if one was tempted to describe this hunting method, it'd be one hit, one kill. S.A.E. Jean abused the newly acquired active skill Whirlwind Dash which made catching at least two monsters in a day a lot easier than before. Even today, S.A.E. Jean was leisurely drifting around searching for prey in his wolf form. Its sensitive nose was truly outstanding. Plus, this sense of smell wasn't some abstract, ambiguous nonsense that was like, it smelled heavy so it's close by, or it smelled faint, so it's far. Nope. Southeastward, 680 meters, humans, three presences. Yep, that's how this system worked. By receiving this wonderful assistance of the cheat system, he was able to hunt over ten monsters in the period of past three days. Humans again. There were more people hunting in the low-tier ground than compared to the lowest tier, so it was a common occurrence to run into other humans. Carrying a dissatisfied expression, the wolf slowly began to vacate the current position. Today's luck is good. Out of the blue, a voice of another person entered S.A.E. Jean's ears as he began wading into the tall grass. It was really close. Strangely, there weren't any scents in the air so, while panicking, he quickly scanned the surrounding area. About 200 meters from where he was, he felt a presence. Could he run away? He thought about it, but deemed it too dangerous. Immediately deciding what to do, he changed into the human form right away. It's a human. Fortunately, thanks to his deft timing, he was safe. S.A.E. Jean calmed his heart and turned to look at the owner of the voice. It was, weirdly enough, a party of two. One was a girl young enough to be under the legal voting age, and the other was a huge dude wearing a formal three-piece suit that seemed totally out of place here. Well, hello there. The girl studied the lone S.A.E. Jean in curiosity for a bit before greeting him with a little nod of the head and slowly got closer. My name is USA Young, a low-tier knight. The bob-cut hair that came down around her neck, a straight nose and a pair of intelligent eyes she should definitely be a teenage girl when considering only her young face. But the slick, urbane aura she gave off made her seem much older and experienced. Ah, hello. Unwillingly shaking her hand, S.A.E. Jean reaffirmed that he had made the correct decision. Since she was a knight, even if he assumed a monster form and hoofed it, the whole thing might have turned into one tiring mess. Meeting face to face once and parting ways smoothly was a hundred times more preferable. And this here is a low tier ranked hunter, Yun Du Han. How do you do? It's nice to make your acquaintance. I'm named Yun Du Han, a low tier hunter. As the man bowed his head, S.A.E. Jean's face dropped slightly in amazement. Yun Du Han's looks and the get up all made him look like a highly ranked knight or some such but in the end, he turned out to be some measly little low-tier hunter, of all things. Were you in the middle of a hunt? Your stealth skill is seriously incredible. And I don't see any special equipment on you, even. USAE Young scanned SAE Jean from top to bottom, and sent him a compliment in a soft voice. 
Nowadays, networking making connections in a hunting field were seen as more important than the whole graduated from the same school, came from the same neighborhood shtick, which USAE Young was acutely aware of. Of course, there was that unwritten rule of how the potential persons making connections needing to possess outstanding abilities first, but here, unknown to himself, SAE Jean had passed this young girl's initial test. Yeah. It's better to erase all traces of yourself when tracking a prey. Like the way you have erased your sense. Ah. As soon as SAE Jean eyed her bracelet and spoke, she let out a soft cry. You've got a pretty sharp eye, there. By the way, I still haven't caught your name as yet. Ah, uh, my name is Kim Asayi Jean. A low-tier hunter. As soon as he finished speaking, her body shook for a very brief moment. And then, with her head slightly tilted in uncertainty, she began questioning him with a voice that was a degree colder than before. Is it okay for a low-tier to move alone like this? I'm still alive, so yeah, it's okay. The initial interest she showed, had completely deserted her after his short reply, and so, she gave him a curt little nod. Obviously, she too had mistook as him as a knight, just like others had so far. Yes, well. Whatever do carry on with whatever you've been doing until now. Seems to work for you, so. She derisively snorted once and turned around. And seeing that cold demeanor, S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but to frown a little. Seriously now, just how old was she to live her life so cold and calculating? S.A.E. Jean shook his head in disapproval before heading towards the opposite direction. But his feet became ensnared by the message window popping up in front of his view. Eastward, 500 meters. A troll in a ravenous state. Oh, F.C.K. A monster with a face that resembled a withered, cracked bark of a tree, and a body size that could reach well over three meters tall when fully grown and capable of making shrewd movements that contradicted its giant body. A kind of monster that made people automatically swear out, that was a troll in a nutshell. Didn't matter whether it was a low tier, a mid-low tier, a mid-tier, or a upper mid-tier. All of this monster's characteristics were equally applicable to every tier there was. Of course, since it resided in the low-tier hunting ground, this troll was weaker than the others in different areas. But the real trouble was that ravenous state warning. Trolls were unique in that they rarely displayed what could be seen as the common species-specific behavioral patterns and habits. That's why monster researchers preferred to study trolls, and they were sometimes called the only monsters to possess individual personalities. In the middle of those individual personalities, ravenous state was the rarest and also happened to be the most concerning one, too. As the title implied, it really, really craved for food. What differentiated this state from the others was, trolls suffering this infliction grew stronger the more monsters they digested. To make matters worse, the troll in the ravenous state would see unprecedented growth potential in this place, the low-tier hunting ground. After all, it was the most powerful monster roaming this area and there was literally nothing here that could oppose or threaten its growth, so a troll would soon grow strong enough to rival a mid-tier creature in terms of pure strength. Wait. After hesitating for a moment or two, S.A.E. Jean quickly ran towards U.S.A.E. Young on the other direction and grabbed her shoulder. Even if her conducts were uncool, it was still the right thing to do to warn her of the impending dangers, after all. What the, hey, what gives? Totally unaware of the approaching disaster, U.S.A.E. Young slapped his hand off her shoulder in irritation. What is your problem? The guy next to her also butted in. Even though he was pretty well built, since he revealed his rank as a low tier hunter earlier, SAE Jean didn't really feel scared of this man. And as if he could understand his own shortcomings, he withdrew behind you SAE Young with a slight fake cough when SAE Jean glared at him. Hey, mister. What the hell are you trying to? There's a monster up ahead. We better evacuate. No matter how urgent S.A.E. Jean appeared and sounded, she just disregarded him coldly before letting off yet another derisive snort. Foo. Only a trashy low-tier hunter like you would think of running away from a low-tier monster. Unfortunately for her, she couldn't get to finish her hostile words of clear ridicule. Gur. Strangely enough, a troll's growl sounded rather similar to that of a common wild beast. 
There it was, approaching them so fast with its huge three-meter frame, and a face that seemed to be half burnt by the ghostly flames of the underworld. Outwardly resembling a craggy hill, this troll stopped in its tracks and surveyed the meals that were discovered coincidentally with a pair of greedy, oppressive eyes. Affected by the terrifying visage of the troll, S.A.E. Jean's eyes widened in shock and stark fear, and at the same time, U.S.A. Young very slowly turned her head to see what was behind her. Ah, F.C.K. When that evil face filled up her view, she reacted similarly to how S.A.E. Jean did a bit earlier. Waking up from the fear-induced daze thanks to her swearing, S.A.E. Jean offhandedly thought that only now she was acting like a real teenager. Do Han Appa. Do Han Appa. Appa, a term of endearment for an older male used by a younger female. Also lit. Means older brother. Ah ah. Ah, I got it. She hurriedly called out the name of the dazed Yun Du Han while drawing her weapon, a sword, hanging from her hips. It was then when Du Han suddenly took on the posture to start running. But we're in the low tier ground, though. The distance between this hunting ground and a military base with a knight capable of dealing with this kind of threat was quite considerable. He's different from a trashy hunter like you so don't worry about him. And you'll get in my way, so please, back off to the side, will you? Was it the ambitiousness of a youth, or knave bravery? USAE Young prepared to engage the troll alone and raised her blade straight. And at the same time. Taeyang. Yun Du Han ran off at near the speed of sound. S.A.E. Jean didn't need to ask to figure out what happened. That kind of improbable movement could only be explained away with the involvement of a trait. Gur. The troll got annoyed as one of its meals, Yun Du Han, managed to disappear, and it began to growl even more aggressively than before. Fu. She took one deep breath. As U.S.A. Young concentrated, Azure-colored mana began to infuse with the blade of her nice sword. That was one of the most famous mana utilization skills employed by the knights, the mana blade. That isn't going to work. S.A.E. Jean knew that was not enough for this monster. And he noticed that the girl's slender arms holding the sword were trembling ever so slightly. It was a sign that she was already affected by the fear of the enemy even before the battle, and soon, that would lead her to an inevitable defeat. Even though he wanted to lend a hand here, without a weapon it was just impossible for him to intervene. The steel mace he praised so much was currently nicely asleep in the corner of his cave at the moment, as he was planning to hunt as a wolf today. Time to run. Out of ideas, S.A.E. Jean was about to run with his tail firmly between his legs when. Condition complete, encountering an overwhelmingly stronger monster. The host has encountered a monster with near zero percentage of victory. All stats will rise one. The orc warrior form is available for the host instead of the orc form. All stats for monster forms will be adjusted accordingly. The skill warrior of reversal has been unlocked. This skill name isn't final. Couldn't really come up with an appropriate TL term. Until I do, it'll remain so. Active skill warrior of reversal current skill level, F. Available during all monster forms. For 5 minutes, strength increases by 200%, endurance increases by 100% and resistance to pain increases. During human form, the time is reduced to 1 minute. When activating this skill in human form, the stats will be based off on the orc warrior form. Calculated from the current strength and endurance stat, the skill can be activated for one time during a 24-hour period. Just like that, Another one of those evolution message windows rose up before him. Chapter, 10. S.A.E. Jean's eyeballs busily rolled around, trying to take in all the words appearing on the various message windows. At a cursory glance, they all sounded pretty dang great. However, what was up with this seriously bad timing right now, he couldn't even let out an exclamation of happiness for this unexpected evolution. That's not a bad skill at all. The fact that the orc form evolved into the orc warrior form was great, but his attention was currently with the new skill warrior of reversal. It was truly a wonderful skill since he could use it even in the human form. And just as its suggestive name implied, the skill could change the outcome of any situation. In other words a situation exactly like this one here. Now, what should I do about this girl, really? 
he looked at USA Young with complicated eyes. Even though she was facing the troll with outwardly overflowing confidence, she probably knew better than anyone that it was nothing but a false bravado. Really, anyone with eyes could tell that this troll was in the ravenous state, what with its appearance of falling gobs of drool from the lips and all. Plus, this monster was most likely a low mid-tier threat now, judging by its huge size and the tyrannical aura oozing off from it. Nominally, a low-tier knight should be able to deal with a low-tier monster alone. To be ranked a low tier at that young age, her talents were something to be really proud about, but unfortunately, it was still way too much for her to fight a low mid tier monster by herself. Sigh. S.A.E. Jean let out a grand sigh. It'd take at least one minute for that other dude to arrive at the nearest knight's order base, judging from his running speed. However, what about the time needed for the help, in the form of high ranked knights, to arrive here? Quang. Taking time to think things through was an unaffordable luxury at the moment. USAE Young's mana infused sword clashed with the troll's fist, and the resulting explosive shock waves, along with a roar, violently shook the lands they were standing on. She somehow avoided getting knocked out in a single punch by the skin of her teeth, but that was it, that was her limit. Vuwung TL, sorry, this is the best I could do with the mana onomatopoeia. Her face was now full of panic quite unlike five minutes ago when it was still full of arrogance and relaxed demeanor. But trolls knew no such thing as mercy. The huge fists of troll created a dark shade as they rained down on top of her head like a torrential rainfall. S.A.E. Jean clenched his teeth. He still felt fearful no matter how his burning emotions egged him on to face the BD. He wondered if this was what the firefighters felt when trying to step into a maelstrom of an inferno. Fkwang. While he was hesitating, USAE Young's body got struck by the troll's fist and was flung away like a thrown baseball. Her fine sword got disintegrated into equally fine powder, and her cool overcoat-like battle armor became an ugly, twisted wreck, losing all its effectiveness in the process. Kung, Kung. The troll made a huge racket as it advanced forward. And when it got near the downed USAE Young, the BD raised its huge hand up. What the? Quietly and weakly staring at this unfolding spectacle, USAE Young couldn't even think about closing her eyes anymore. She just couldn't believe that this was happening for real. This crazy situation, this incredible pain that didn't even allow her to voice out how much it hurt, all of them felt like a bad dream to her. She just wanted to run away from this terrible nightmare. Only if she could wake up from this dream right away. The troll's huge hand slowly descended. It was a trick of her mind, the slowing down of the time itself. Every thought fled from her head, leaving it completely blank. It was at this very moment. Quang. A man causing a whirlwind to kick up appeared out of nowhere and blocked the fist of the troll. Only with his body, nothing more than his two pairs of arms and legs, and strangely no emission of mana coming out of him at all. This guy had stopped the troll's advances simply with his own physical prowess and nothing else. His clothing got torn apart due to the troll exerting a massive, awesome pressure and the ground supporting him caved in, but his stance didn't crumble one bit. He was truly taking the troll head on. USAE Young observed this improbable spectacle completely speechless. This was an unreal scene that flew in the face of common sense. Since it was more dreamlike than an actual dream itself, she somehow managed to convince herself that this was indeed reality and that it was indeed happening right before her eyes. Go. The guy hurriedly shouted at the stupefied USAE Young. But, perhaps due to the prior impact, she was suffering from dizzying tinnitus in her ears and couldn't hear him well. She shook her head hard several times and only then could she get what he was shouting at her about. Get the hell away from here, you DN idiot. Right now, SAE Jean felt like dying. The weight of this effing troll was, simply put, completely, utterly insane. His bones felt like turning into smithereens from the cruel pain. But, he had no choice but to endure. He had to, since the reason for this all effort of buying time, the girl, still seemed out of it and was simply there spectating this scene. Maybe him mixing in insults woke her up, she finally seemed to get the gravity of the situation and began dragging her broken leg, somehow gaining a distance away from him. When she was well out of the danger, S.A.E. Jean quickly rolled his body out of the way. Huang. 
With an earth-shaking explosion, a crater in the shape of a troll's fist was carved right on the ground where S.A.E. Jean had been standing just now. K.R. Seemingly pissed off at the sudden, unwelcome entrance of a hindrance, the troll snorted out in anger and faced towards S.A.E. Jean's direction. And at the same time, strength deserted S.A.E. Jean's body. Indeed, one minute was a really short amount of time. Weirdly, though he didn't feel any pain, even after the skill had ended. Most likely, bones in both of his arms, as well as the nerve endings, got badly damaged in the encounter. He couldn't feel his arms at all as if they weren't there in the first place. Miss you. That son of a bitch. Hey. Stop right there. But, like the timely blessings from the heavens, a booming, powerful and manly voice resounded from a distance. When the troll heard that domineering lion-like roar, it showed signs of pure panic and hurriedly turned its head. You foul creature. A baldy exploded out like a bullet from the tall grasses, splitting the air with his mighty sword that gleamed with a sharp metallic sheen. Then, towards the troll, he shot forward a crescent-shaped sword aura that was keen enough to tear out the sky. The supersonic aura didn't even give the monster any time to take evasive actions, and it penetrated the torso of the creature unopposed, and soon after, the troll's body split in half and fell in a heap as if it was nothing to begin with. S.A. Young, are you okay? The knight that made all of S.A.E. Jean's death-defying efforts look meaningless by killing the troll in one shot, hurriedly ran towards you S.A.E. Young, who was lying sprawled on the ground with broken legs and her body utterly incapacitated. S.A. Young. This can't be. How did your beautiful face get so? The man raised a huge fuss and gently hugged S.A.E. Young's body. My body won't move. Out of the blue, S.A.E. Young coughed out a clot of blood. Oh, my God. What the hell? S.A. Young. S.A. Young. The man's face turned red and pale all at once as he cried while fussing over her, but at the moment, S.A.E. Young's thoughts were focused on something else, so what this guy was doing only ended up bothering her. Her face had become swollen up in the meantime and it was difficult to keep her eyes open. But she still forcibly pried her lashes open to take look at one specific person, a man. His clothes were torn to shreds, revealing the hidden ripped, hard muscles like that of a Greek statue underneath. The limp arms on his sides were darkly discolored beyond the purplish hue his legs shaking uncontrollably as if he'd falter at any moment. The man who had saved her, she didn't even know his name. But it seemed like he did mention it before she must have forgotten it. She found herself pathetic, realizing this. She should have remembered it. It was then, the man gazed at her direction briefly, before turning to walk away to a destination unknown. USAE Young wanted to reach out her hands to the man walking unsteadily on his legs, seemingly only seconds away from collapsing on the ground. But her body would not move. She just wanted to ask him to wait for a second. But she seemed to have lost all feelings in her mouth, too. So, the only thing she could do for now, was to engrave the back of the man as her heavy eyelids slowly closed down on her. Fighting the urge to give up and fall down, he continued to push his body hard. Finding his bloodied and damaged body bothersome, S.A.E. Jean promptly changed into the wolf form as soon as he couldn't sense the presence of people. The wounds and the weakening consciousness remained the same, however. But he forced the two okay limbs to run as if his life depended on it. To lose his consciousness in the monster field was the same thing as dying, after all. He ran without a rest until he finally arrived at the cave changing back to his human form, he hurriedly drank the potions he brewed earlier on. His arms couldn't move, so he had to pop the lid of the bottle open with his lips, but fortunately, his wounds recovered almost right away, so that was that. But it was another matter altogether for his wavering consciousness. It seemed like this was one of the backlashes of using that skill. S.A.E. Jean passed out on the ground and fell into a deep slumber. The greatest knight order in Korea was, nominally, the Raven Knight Order, but if the knight's orders were grouped separately into the privately run entities and the government-owned ones, then the story became slightly more murkier to tell. Of course, the raven remained as the example for other knight's orders to strive for. But when discussing the private knight orders, the matters became complicated somewhat. There were two orders considered to be in the top flight, nine orders in the mid-tier, and further twelve smaller orders out there, 
with all these numerous organizations busy competing against each other. One of those two top dogs were called Sabyuk Knight's Order, which was in turn, owned by a very powerful global conglomerate Sabyuktal. When the order opened its doors, people regularly disparaged it for being a lowest-ranked order with only a wealthy patron supporting it like a personal plaything. But thanks to the rapid development brought on by that absolutely enormous wealth, the popular consensus had reversed and they were now treated as the very models of modern miracle. If the question of who the top knights orders were came up, the names of the raven, Goryeo and Saibyuk would have been mentioned. And of course, Saibyuk orders financial treatment was incomparably better than all its competition. Saibyuk literally means a dawn, Sabyuktal is a moon appearing at dawn. Goryeo was a name for an ancient Korean kingdom. It was not the fault of Uncle Hyano. So, please stop apologizing. It's actually all my fault. And USA Young just so happened to be the granddaughter of Sabyuktal's chairman, one of the world's biggest corporations, as well as the daughter of the current master of the Saibyuk Knight Order. She was an incredibly giant existence, a child born with an unobtainium spoon firmly stuck in her mouth, and was important enough to make a famous high-tier ranked knight like Park Hyano to fret over her like this. No, that's not it. Whatever the case may have been, I should have been right there, watching out for you. Not only her background was very impressive, her talents were just as perfect, however, as she received the official government acknowledgement as a low-tier knight at the young age of only 17 years and 45 days. This was only a month off from what Kim Yurin had achieved a low-tier knight at 17 years and 6 days which only served to showcase USA Young's amazing talents that were basically without equal among her peers. Enough with the self-pity, seriously, and I hope you have already uncovered the information I asked you about. Eh. Oh, that? The very first thing USA Young asked for after waking up from the two-day-long coma was about the identity of a certain man. A mystery man that Park Hyano couldn't recall as he was far too focused on saving USA Young at that time but she insisted that this mystery guy was the one who saved her life. Wait a minute, you haven't even bothered to check, have you? USA Young's eyes grew sharp enough to give chills at the sight of Park Hyano's hesitating appearance. No, no way. Honestly, even I thought it was unlikely. I seriously thought that maybe you were seeing things. I mean, it's plainly impossible for a low-tier hunter to stop a troll all alone. However. He stopped speaking for a second as he began rummaging through his pockets, before he fished out a bronze-colored hunter license. Here it is, for real. Even I was surprised, you know. Found it among all the shredded clothing on the ground. Since USA Young couldn't move her body due to the paralysis, Park Hyano had to bring the license card right before her eyes. A heavenly gifted hunter, Kim Sae Jean. Wait a minute, a heavenly gifted? Yeah. That's right. It's been a long time since I saw one of those titles, but hell, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, all the hunters with that crazy title were a bit abnormal, weren't they? You can find him, right? Of course. Already began looking for him. It's only a matter of time before he's standing right in front of you. Oh, right, before that, you are not. Suddenly, Park Hyano narrowed his eyes and intensely stared at USA Young. Unlike her age, her actions were very grown up but in the end, she was still a child. She was at an age where it wouldn't be strange to find her head full of unrealistic fantasies and useless ideas of romance. So, what if, in that dangerous life or death situation, she had developed a crush on the man that rescued her? Foot. No freaking way. That's not it. Me, I'm not a child. It's just that it's like what Grandpa always have said. If it's a favor, repay it as soon as possible, and if it's a grudge, grind it out as long as possible. I've deeply engraved that teaching into my heart, is all. USA Young carried an assured smile of denial, before she remembered something important, and asked with her brows raised high. That's that taken care of, but more importantly, can I be fully healed? I've heard by accident that my current paralysis is pretty serious. Park Hyano stiffened up momentarily. You heard that? I thought you were asleep. Yeah, you guys did say it's really serious. Only ten years ago, Paralysis like USA Young's would have been a very painful and incurable condition, 
but that wasn't the case anymore. With the advent of alchemy and its continued research and development, nowadays it only took a single potion to cure it. But her paralysis was more severe than the usual case, so it was determined that a powerful potion with an upper mid-grade or higher was needed to heal her. Don't you worry about that. I just got a news that there's an alchemy house in Kongwan with a supply of upper mid-grade potions that can heal and regenerate. The effects of Kongwan's output has always been good, and since the chairman made that very generous deal under the table with the house, we'll get the first dibs when they get the stuff. Is that so? That's a relief. USAE Young nodded her head without showing much interest. What's the name of the potion though? Is it a product from one of the workshops on the eastern seaboard? I did hear they were still on strike. But did they end it? Nope. They are still doing that industrial action thing. This is a new product. And I do mean, like brand spanking new. I hear it's from a totally unknown personage, who just appeared out of nowhere, and left a seriously incredible product behind, just like that. The people handling the stuff apparently raised a huge ruckus saying that a new genius has appeared or some such. Okay, fine. Just tell me the name, will you? Well, yeah, the thing is it's something of an untrustworthy name, you see. Park Hyano hesitated somewhat to say the name out aloud, but under the sharp gazes of impatient USAE Young, he finally relented and stuttered out the name. I did ask a few times if it was real well, the potion is called a goblin's kindness. Chapter, 11. A goblin's kindness? What kind of a name is that? USAE Young frowned a little as she spoke. It was just too weird a name to place her full trust in. You think so too? The credibility was everything to a potion, and so, it would be named accordingly to reflect the assigned grades and its medicinal effects. Take the reputable, widely recognized Drent series of potions for example for the shallow exterior wounds such as cuts and bruises, there was the potion called Drent's emergency treatment for the job. But if you were looking to cure something more substantial, say, like a serious disease, then there was the upper mid-grade potion named the Miracle of Drent. On a side note, the Drent was the name of the legendary tree of life from the elven myths that could supposedly revive even a dead person with an elixir concocted with only a single leaf. But, there was this insurmountable gap between the credibility and that of a goblin. Instead, it'd be hundred times more correct to argue that there was a deep mistrust and hostility between the two. Despite all that, the alchemist still chose to stick with Goblin as the name of his potion. I was thinking the same thing initially, but when I heard the explanations, it all kind of makes sense. I mean, Goblin's abilities to make potions are something else, right? Seriously, there are idiots crazy enough to raid a village of Goblin specializing in medical concoction, never minding all that poisonous gases and hazardous material just for a chance to pilfer some potions, you know. And I hear it's been registered in the registry of the naming series already. I guess there is a lot of expectation riding on this potion. A naming series was a type of a registered brand trademark. When the anonymity is valued to such degree in the world of alchemy, the only avenue left to determine the credibility and the apparent effects of a potion was through its name it could be confusing to the potential customers if another alchemist came up with a different potion but named it similarly. Not to mention create distrust towards the makers of the potions themselves, so this trademark scheme was vigorously upheld as one of the absolute laws in the alchemist society. Really? So the effects have been confirmed for real? Obviously. Come on, honestly, would our chairman and the order master try to buy something that's shady? And also. Park Hyano stopped his words, quickly scanned the surroundings, and suddenly leaned his face closer to USAE Young's ear to whisper the rest of his sentence. The manager, the dark elf Hazeline, already has given her affirmative, so you don't have to worry. There was no real need to whisper in this single-person VVIP hospital room, but well, he was treating her as a royalty here so it was only natural for him to act this way. The actual reason why the alchemists thought of anonymity as a virtue was that currently, almost half of all active alchemists were from the race of the dark elf. They were the type of people that hated exposing their outer appearances and always concealed their bodies with thick robes. Many people assumed that the Dark Elves were incredibly beautiful since they were called Elves and all, but as they hated bright places with lots of humans with mad zeal. 
The number of witnesses who had seen a Dark Elf's real appearance was extremely low, as well as no records to speak of either. Heck, there was even a sinister rumor floating around, which was now accepted by some circles as truth in it the person who uploaded a very first picture of a Dark Elf online was hunted down and murdered by the very same elf. Hazeline she did. Then, it should be alright. So, when is the product expected to definitely come in? Huh. Well, she did say it won't be too long. Wait, let me quickly pop out and make the call, and ask her. Please wait for just a bit longer. Soon it'll be here, surely. Hazili. No, Manager Hazeline, what is the meaning of your sentence at the end? Feels like you're deliberately trying to obfuscate. You're mistaken. Fuhu. Manager Hazeline. Our little miss is a knight of only seventeen years young. She should be out there training and enjoying her life, not confined to a sick bed and doing nothing. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Just as I have told you before, please just wait for a bit longer. The dark elf Hazeline ended the call in irritation and chucked the mobile phone on the desk. It was easy to tell that she was not in a particularly good mood, judging from her exaggerated heavy breathing, deeply shut eyes and fast massaging of her temples. Ayak just when is that guy coming here? Didn't he say he got the completed potions already? Her ultra-sharp eyes were immediately directed towards the waiting alchemy house employee. The poor guy was already in a state of high stress before and now, he was sweating profusely as he barely managed to open his mouth. Ah, yes, I'm not really he did mention that he had three completed potions in his possession we did call him on the phone number he wrote down but so far there were no answers. Ha. DN it all, this is pissing me off. Seriously, I swear these human idiots must think that potions are hammered out in a single day. The reason for all this shortage of potions is because the alchemists are sick and tired of all this bloody nagging by the thoughtless sons of idiots. But instead of fixing the error of their ways, these sons of bitches. Oh woo, this f***ing sht. I've tl'd this part as faithfully as possible, so, yep, she's got a mouth on her, this one. As the steam of her fury reached the proverbial top of the head, she rolled her fist tightly before slamming it down on the desk. Tuong. Quite unlike all the explosive anger she had displayed just now, the resulting sound was rather adorably small the door to her office flew open right at the exact same time. He, he's here, Manager Hazeline. That alchemist from before, he has arrived. At the hurried yell of the employee, Hazeline's eyes went round, her body shooting right up from the seat. There were two types of alchemists out there. The first was the commonly known types that did the transmutation and the reconfiguration, while the second of the lot spent their entire lives trying to understand the mysterious liquid called potions. Some anally retentive experts would call these two alchemists with separate terms, the former retaining the alchemist moniker while the latter, potion crafter. TL, this bit is by the author, not me. Even though their main skill sets used for their craft were different, the alchemists all still possessed one habit that was the same. And that common habit was, their preference towards the darkness. Do you find the coffee to your liking? In this dark but surprisingly ungloomy room, where even the sunlight failed to reach, the only thing brightening the place was Hazeline's dazzling smile. Yes. S.A.E. Jean, to the best of his abilities, played it cool and lowered the cup nonchalantly but he found it rather torturous to look at the face of the elf in front of him. That was because, she was one of the most stunning women in the world, as befitting the race of beautiful people, the elf. The shiny alabaster skin that didn't seem a right fit for a dark elf. With an indigo-colored straight, long hair, and the finely crafted, beautifully harmonious facial features where there simply wasn't adequate enough a word to describe how gorgeous she was. Now that the introductions are done, should we get straight to the main topic, Sir Alchemist. Hazeline the Dark Elf had revealed her face, her name and her race openly to S.A.E. Jean. He had to wonder whether she was mistaking him as one of her own race, as her open demeanor was quite a departure from all the rumors he had heard before. Easily reading into his confusion, she quickly moved to clarify her position, saying that she was trying to show some courtesy towards him. It's fine. We're talking about the potion I've brewed, yes. I'm also well aware of how good my potion is. It is my life's greatest achievement, after all. 
Even though he spoke with such confidence, he knew very well that he was sprouting bullshit right now. The elite goblin's knowledge base was full of compounding methods that easily exceeded the methods of top alchemists, and on top of this, SAE Gene possessed the top ingredient, the fangs of a saber toothed tiger, so instead of a life's greatest achievement, he just needed around seven days to brew this potion. And that seven days were actually for fermenting the contents, which was an unavoidable process in making this potion, so. Of course, we are also well aware of the difficulties. In order to create a potion this effective, you must have struggled and toiled hard for many years. As a fellow alchemist, I understand it all too well. Saeg nearly spat out the coffee percolating in his mouth after seeing how grave she sounded and how serious her face looked. He still somehow managed to maintain his poker face, wiping his lips as if to get rid of hot coffee and nodded his head. It's good that you understand. Indeed. Since it's such a good potion a few customers, having heard of the news, are wishing to purchase the goods even before it's on sale. And these here are the letters sincerely requesting you to sell it to them. Hazeline pushed forward five stiff papers towards him. On them, there were instantly recognizable names of knights' orders, big corporations and famous wealthy individual written in large fonts. How many zeros are there 360k, 440k, S 623k. And the numbers written below each name was the kind of amount SAE Gene wouldn't even dream of seeing in his lifetime. These are the legally approved sales commissions. There's a policy allowing an alchemist to deal directly with private individuals or entities provided the amount of product sold is less than half of your current stock. Of course, the government takes the cut in the tune of 48% as sales tax but since the potential customers add something a little extra on top of the market price when buying the product, in the end, it just doesn't matter at all. Sounds good. When SAEG nodded his head in satisfaction, Hazeline who was observing his reactions carefully continued with her words. The thing is, though. In order to secure commissions like this, not only the efficacy of a potion but the role of the alchemy house is also very important, so we would be obligated to take a certain percentage as well. If a house with no connections receive goods like this, they would just put it up for sale in the markets without thinking too deeply about other matters. That is why. Hazeline slowly swallowed her saliva. Even though this was a normally accepted part of the alchemy house's modus operandi, she was feeling nervous at the moment because of the incredible potion this person had brought in. In a sales commission like this, the house usually takes about half of the agreed amount. We are prepared to lower that to 40%, no, make that 35%, specially for you. Any lower, then, even other alchemy houses will find it difficult to match. If you don't believe me, you can ask others. It's a pre-tax deductio. Fine. It's all good. SAEG nodded his head, having no other opinion regarding this matter. Whether it was a dark elf, a regular elf or a high elf, he had not heard of instances where elves defrauded the other party, and on top of that, the stuff she said matched with what he found online. For obvious reasons, relying only on the information gathered on internet for something of this much importance would be foolish and undeniably pathetic. But that kind of thought was applicable only if when one didn't know of the Dark Elves and Alchemists' natures. They all pursued anonymity. Once that was secured, these people communicated and acted more lively than before. And let's not forget, the internet was the perfect place to communicate anonymously. Stories of half the alchemists being gaming addicts didn't just come to life out of nowhere, after all. Eh. When the conclusion came so easily, Hazeline couldn't help but stare dumbfoundedly. But like a pro, she quickly regained her wits, and before SAE Jean could potentially change his mind, moved to put the finishing touch to the deal. If, if that's the case, then all you have to do is to stamp your jijang on the sales request form with the highest amount written on it. The corporation Subyuktal is offering the highest amount with 623,000 US ah, wait, where did the stamping ink disappear to? As she raised a royal ruckus while fetching the ink pad, SAE Jean watched her and floated a mysterious smile. It was a deeply satisfying sight to behold, to see another person losing their marbles over him, something a socially underprivileged like him wouldn't get to experience under normal circumstances. Here it is. When Hazeline hurriedly handed over the ink pad, 
SAE Jean leisurely studied the contents of the form once more before stamping his jijang on it. Phew oh, by any chance, do you have the finished products with you at the moment? You did mention that you have three bottles back then, yes. We need the minimum of two. The law says we must put the half of the stock on the open market, so the other can be sold through the sales commission. Oh well, I have brought all of them here with me. Hazeline's eyes shone as she stared at the sight of S.A.E. Jean rummaging through his bag. A total of four bottles. All with the same medicinal effects. Oh, oh. Finally. The four bottles of potion emitting the exact same brilliant light as the samples revealed themselves to the world, and on Hazeline's face an uncontrollable, wild grin broke loose. But remembering her stations as the manager of the alchemy house, she quickly erased the ungainly smile right off her face. Of course, by then it was already too late though. It's perfect. All four of them. What a relief. She couldn't prevent her sentence stretching out at the end from the unbridled happiness, however. Hazeline picked up one of the bottles, then she shook it, smelled it, studied it from several angles before putting it down, nodding her head in satisfaction afterwards. We don't need to test them. Oh yes. They are perfect. Perfect. She then asked S.A.E. Jean very cautiously while staring at one part of him that wasn't covered up by his robe his lips. Wheel, there is something I'm slightly curious about. Just from where did you study this level of alchemy? If it were any other normal alchemist, they would usually send an incomplete potions as examples to get a verdict on. It's your first time and the product itself is beyond reproach, so even though I know I'm out of line, I still wish to inquire you. Hmm. At her inquiry, S.A.E. Jean briefly showed hesitation but he already had thought of a suitable story before coming here so he told her that. My master once taught me this. If there was even a fragment of doubt existing in your thoughts, then you are in the wrong, so throw away all useless ideas and devote yourself completely to the craft until you reach the true pinnacle. I am just following this teaching to the letter. Alchemists and wizards valued their master and apprentice relationship far, far greatly than any other professions out there in comparison, and because of this fact Hazeline nodded her head as if she was convinced. You have a truly wonderful master. I'm sure he's feeling quite proud of you as we speak. After all, his apprentice has become a great alchemist in his own right. Ah. Yes. It's just that, it's regretful that he had to pass away before seeing me succeed. Although he knew she wouldn't ask him for the master's name, but S.A.E. Jean still felt anxiousness creeping in up his legs, so to make sure, he hammered in the final nail in the coffin. Plus, technically speaking, he wasn't telling a totally C.K. and Bull story anyways. He did have a master that passed on all the knowledge and technique, after all. Even though he bit that guy to death. Oh, how unfortunate. Hazeline, who didn't know the actual truth, bitterly accepted his version of the story and showed a heavy, sorrowful expression. Well then, if that is all. I'm running short on time. In the blink of an eye, thirty minutes flew past, so unable to dilly-dally any longer, S.A.E. Jean stood up first to leave Hazeline followed him and also stood up, and reached out with her hand for a shake while carrying a content smile. For you Sir Alchemist who chose us, will definitely make the Goblin series known as the best potion brand in the world. You can place you trust in us. I'm planning to hold a press conference right after this meeting is done. Nowadays, playing up the mass media is an important marketing strategy, you know. Ah ha Well, thank you. S.A.E. Jean faced her gorgeous smile and shook her hand firmly. Chapter, 12 As soon as S.A.E. Jean left the alchemy house, Hazeline grabbed her phone and called a certain someone. Hello, Sir Knight. Hello, Miss Manager. I'd like to apologize for my earlier behavior. I just happened to see the poor little miss lying in the hospital bed before the call, so I just ended up losing my cool for a moment. His voice wasn't all that apologetic but never minding that, Hazeline spoke in a rather leisurely fashion. Oh, no. It's fine. You see, the product came in just now. Oh. Really? Right away there was a loud yell. She could already imagine the sight of Park Hyuno shooting up from his seat, his eyes bulging and yelling at the top of his lungs on the other side of the line. 
A slight sneer formed on Hazeline's lips. Foot. Yes. However, as I've mentioned just now, the product has only arrived here recently, so even though I'm planning to give it the highest grade myself, the Central Association must test it too in order to issue the sales permit for us. Ah, there's no need. What kind of a fool would question Miss Hazeline's discerning eyes? In any case, I shall be there shortly. Please wait for me. Fut. All right. Please be careful on your way. Disconnecting the call, Hazeline let out a breath of satisfaction and leaned her body against the back of the chair. For her, it's been three years already since she took a step back from the world of alchemy after feeling intense dislike at the effing corporations and the foolish men and women of the Knight's Orders. Of course, even though she was no longer on the front lines, the overconfident bastards still continued to harass her, but right in this moment, she felt good enough to soar high up in the sky. A brief moment when the dynamic between the moneyed halves and those who serve gets turned on its head, like when perfectly concocting a potion, or a well-made potion coming in through her doors. Since he said shortly so maybe he'll take five minutes tops. The high-ranked knights of the Saib Yuk order could utilize private jets that burned mana stones as fuel source. It was indeed a clear waste of resources to fly a supersonic jet to come to Kongwan province from the capital city of Seoul since this wasn't an emergency situation. But taking into account the identity of the patient, he probably couldn't delay the matter any longer. To greet the incoming guest, Hazeline put on the previously discarded robe and pulled up her hood. But I won't hand it over that easily. The idiots weren't aware of the fact that the alchemist had already left his jijang on their sales request letter. If that's the case, then. She'd wring them out for all they're worth, and make their innards boil with anxiety until they had melted into nothingness. This was the kind of a light revenge only she could do, but when seen from the perspectives of those on the receiving end, it was probably the cruelest, evilest form of habit there was. Ah. That's right. She nearly forgot to do something else before all that. Hazeline hurriedly grabbed her mobile phone and called another person. Hello there, reporter Yun Hui Zhang. It's been a while. Oh, it's nothing special. It's just that a noteworthy potion is finally available here after a really long while. Hmm. Oh, we've got to quit. EA stock. For bottles. It's amazing, yes. Even for me, handling four bottles of a potion this incredible is a first. Yep. Oh my, thank you so much. I shall send over someone with all the necessary info. I'm expecting to receive the sales permit in three days, so when the time comes, please write up a nice piece for me. The very first output of a genius that appeared like a meteor, the high-grade potion, a goblin's kindness hits the market. From Gabiuk Daily, written by Yun Hui Zhang, a staff reporter. 8 o'clock this morning. A potion with a unique name called the Goblin's Kindness, brewed by a certain alchemist, was issued with the sales permit from the Central Alchemist Association. The very first thing that grabs the attention is, of course, that name. It is said that the reason for the alchemist who brewed this potion borrowing the goblin moniker, which could be seen as a minus, was because of a simple. Yet hard to imagine hypothetical case of what would happen if goblins showed kindness towards humans and used their potion-making skills. And to surprise us even more. His potion was deemed to possess perfect healing and regenerative properties by the association and was assigned the high grade as if to imply that the alchemist must have had perfectly replicated the craftsmanship of a real goblin. What's more, this potion, a goblin's kindness, just happens to be this alchemist's very first creation. This potion will go on auction which is scheduled to commence at 12 o'clock 8 days from now, on the premise of Yosian Alchemy House located in the city of Wanju, Kanwan Province. With this potion, a goblin's kindness, appearing like a sweet relieving rain in the times of seemingly unending drought. This reporter hopes that this event can perhaps inject some sense of life, even if it's small, to the market that has fallen into doldrums of late. The mood in the headquarters of the Raven Knights Order located in the suburbs of John Grow, Seoul, was in somewhat heightened state with the appearance of a high-grade potion after more than a half a year of shortage. The Raven Knights Order that set its sights beyond the borders of Korea and competed for the top spot in the global stage. Regularly battled the rare monsters ranked upper mid-tier or above, or those bastards that suddenly appeared and started attacking without a warning. 
The thing was, these upper mid-tier monsters each possessed unique special powers, making them true walking disasters and when confronting these creatures, the knight's abilities proved to be rather inadequate most of the time. In all honesty, rather than calling it inadequate, it'd be far more correct to say fear had crippled them. After the unchecked, uncontrolled development of the Earth's environment, the healing magic had currently all died away, leaving the treatment of injuries caused by the monsters to potions and the modern medicine. However, even though the modern medicine could reconnect severed limbs, it was not possible to regenerate what was lost, so the knights ended up trusting and depending on potions over that of the modern medical technology. But for the past half year, the supply of upper mid-grade potions that allowed the knights to battle higher tier monsters without hesitation had dried up. Not only the potions with healing, regenerative capabilities, but also elixirs that boosted the physical strength for a brief period of time had vanished, too. So, when the news of the appearance of a higher tier monster spread around, the situation had devolved into a point where knights couldn't relaxly choose to go out and hunt them anymore. Did you hear the rumors? Yeah. Got a weird name, though. But, uh, can our order secure it? Come on, why not? And I hear it's 40 milliliters per bottle, too. On top of that, two bottles for sale in one go. 40 milliliters should be enough for six people. With that, maybe, we can now finally hunt down that newly hatched basilisk, right? The interest shown by the Knights of the Raven Order towards this high-grade potion that had appeared out of nowhere was rather understandable. Hmm. In the front lobby of the Knights Order, Kim Yurin was sighing out while reading the information sheet delivered from the Alchemy House for the new potion's effects and the expected prices. Even though there should be a lot of competition to secure this potion brought on by the long absence of one, she knew that if it was the Raven Order, there would be no problem acquiring the product at the end of the day. Two bottles. That means another two was sold through private commissions already. Kim Yurin was crumpling her face in dissatisfaction. The alchemy houses gave out information first to those entities holding a favorable relationship with them in this kind of private sales commissions. In other words, the raven order that hadn't received the heads up wasn't enjoying a cordial relationship with this particular house. If it's Yosian alchemy house, then it must be Hazeline's doing. Kim Yurin slowly massaged her aching temples as the mug of Hazeline floated up in her mind. Hazeline and Kim Yurin these two shared a bond that was thicker than blood of siblings, stretching back for almost twenty years. However, that powerful friendship became twisted real fast thanks to a certain single incident. Which happened to be a stupidly, unbelievably simple misunderstanding. But more misunderstandings continued to pile up on top of another, turning the situation far worse, and once the relationship began to break down, the downward momentum couldn't be stopped anymore. Their fast deteriorating relationship finally came to a head three years ago that resulted in a very serious event. Hazeline had poisoned Kim Yurin's potion, and when Yurin managed to survive after fighting desperately for her life, she cut Hazeline's arm clean off. This ugly event remained a secret until now, only known to these two after they silently made an agreement, which led to either one not laying blames on each other nor telling anyone else regarding this matter. And now, a few years had passed since both of them stopped caring about each other and lived their own separate lives. During that time, Kim Yurin had fought hard and successfully claimed the prestigious title of the youngest ever highest tier knight. And Hazeline had created an elixir called a fairy's liquor to regenerate her lost arm and in the process had climbed up to the position of the alchemy house manager. Like this, they both had firmly grasped the futures that were far brighter than their past but in the end, could only become the worst of the worst enemies possible. And now, the sporadically recalled good memories they once shared together had lost their luster a long time ago. Miss Highest Tier Knight Kim Yurin. TL, OMG. Sounds so wrong. Should I start using Korean honorifics instead? Please comment below. While she was swimming in the recollections of the past, someone had walked up closer and started chatting her up. When she turned her head to see who it was, she saw quite a number of knights gathered there. Ah. Uh, what seems to be the problem? When she replied in her usual deadpan expression, the group of knights consisting of five men and three women smiled brightly and presented a simple square box to her. It's a congratulatory gift for you, Miss Yurin. Congratulations on your ascension to the highest tier. 
Acting as the representative of the group, a male knight with a cute enough face spoke. He was Kim Sujayam, a junior knight that served as a direct apprentice working under Yurin for two years while she was still a mid-tier knight. Oh, right. Thank you, everyone. Yurin lightly patted the head of the male knight that was as tall as her and received the gift. Kim Sujayam acted shyly at her touch and swallowed his saliva. Please open it. Their strangely flushed expressions seemed to indicate that the present inside this box must have been a very nice stuff indeed. Seeing their excitement, Yurin's own expectations rose as well as she opened the lid of the box. She already knew it was useless to expect much, though. Surprise! Yurin confirmed the contents of the box and observed the faces of the knights in front of her with the corner of her eyes. Theirs were full of expectations. She didn't want to disappoint them. Oh, oh. This, I really needed this. Thank you so much, everyone. Befitting her reputation, she didn't jump up and down in joy but instead, just made an expression that displayed her gratitude. Thanks to her prior experiences, her acting skills were rather exceptional. No, in reality, it shouldn't even be called acting. She would have been happy with just the sincere words of the fellow knights congratulating her. I'm really sorry about this. If it's a product of Zenobis, then it must have been really expensive. She spoke apologetically as she picked up the pair of gauntlets painted jet black. They were light but incredibly sturdy pair of armored gloves, with the brand Zenobis stylishly carved on the sides. Since Zenobis was an exclusive workshop that only dealt with rare, high-grade metals as the bare minimum requirement, the price of these gauntlets must have easily exceeded hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, no, not at all. We're just sorry that we couldn't get something better to show how grateful we're regarding everything you've done for us until now. I haven't done much, though. Ah, right. By the way. Yurin carefully observed the reactions of the knights before asking them in a cautious manner. Did they only have the color black? Eh. Ah. No, no way. They had only the bright colors for the ladies' use. So we specially requested for a custom paint job and had gauntlets painted in black. The color definitely won't fade, so you don't have to worry. Ah, uh, oh. Yurin thought that the bright colors would have been better. But she couldn't make a retort at the smiling face of Sujayam and instead, ended up weakly smiling as well. Kim Yurin, in her 27 years of life. Every single gift she had ever received in her life was all battle equipment, exactly like this. Around the same time, SAE Jean came to the monster store to unload the materials but was now staring at the TV projection with a deeply satisfied expression. It's been half a year but finally, a high-grade potion is available for purchase in the market. Named a goblin's kindness and coming in 40 milliliters bottles, the price for this potion has been set to around the 350,000 which is on the upper side of the range. But regardless, the influx of requests for purchase has been coming not only from the local Korean organizations but from international entities as well. And ever since the Yosian Alchemy House registered the brand trademark Goblin, people have been eagerly waiting to see if there would be other potions with different medical effects than the Goblin's kindness that appeared in the market. Excuse me. Excuse me. I said, excuse me. The government worker became fed up with SAE Jean who was concentrating only on the TV and ended up raising his voice at him. Oh, sorry. My bad. Here, please take this. Mr. Kim SAE Jean has successfully increased his rank from a low tier to a mid-low tier, after accumulating over 60 days worth of hunting experience. SAE Jean couldn't focus on the procedure for long and his entire attention returned back to the sound coming from the TV. And when it became known that this was the alchemist's first product, a huge amount of attention from the Korean and international community chatrooms has been solely focused on him. Going as so far as to nickname the mystery alchemist as the goblin alchemist or even the genius of alchemy. But the alchemy house responsible for the circulation of the potion, Yosian, has strongly suggested to curb the excessive attention focused on the mystery alchemist as they worry this sudden unwarranted scrutiny placed on the person in question might negatively affect him. Also, thinking about changing Raven Knight's order back to its original Korean name, Chilhook. Chapter, 13. Will it really remain as a series of potions? 
It kind of looked like our honored genius alchemist is working alone without a workshop. Ah, but how could he meticulously craft this kind of potion all by himself? Looking at things like this, you can really feel that geniuses do exist in this world for real. Right now, they were taking a short break from answering the endless deluge of phone calls. When the employee spoke in admiration, Hazeline let out a sigh and leered at him. A few. What will I do, when even you start referring him as a genius? That's just an empty shell of a praise tacked on the guy to make the mass media and the knight's orders sweat extra hard for a bit. So, what do you mean, he's a genius? Just give it a rest, already. A genius, a greatest, a maestro, a virtuoso none of those words should mix up with our profession, and neither should we try to use them. EII, but it's all coming from the community chat room sites first. Right now, even the Alchemy Cafe is in an upheaval. They are asking if they could meet him TL, a cafe is not a physical coffee shop but an internet forum a la Discord or Reddit. Just your everyday Korean slang term. Feeling good in the knowledge that this great sales result would lead to fat bonuses for everyone, the male employee was chatting away in a high enough spirit, but he calmed right down the moment he came in contact with inexplicably icy gazes. He had stepped onto a potential land mine without realizing it. Seeing the sight of Hazeline lightly biting her lower lip with the corner of his eyes, the employee's forehead broke out in drops of sweat. Hey, you. Are you still looking at those? Didn't I repeatedly tell you not to waste your time in those DN gossip sites? Because that's where the fked up bastards hiding behind the veil of anonymity spread around vile, baseless rumors. I'm truly sorry. The employee apologized in earnest as he knew the manager deeply hated excuses and hasty explanations. For no need to apologize, instead, just go and do your job. I'll make sure to ask what our genius alchemist's deepest thoughts are or what the plans of his future happen to be. Yes. The employee left her side and as soon as all signs of people around her were gone for good, Hazeline grabbed her mobile phone. She was acting complete opposite to how she'd been coldly treating her subordinate just now, her demeanor currently full of respect. Ring, ring. She waited for a while, but in the end, all she got was the person you dialed is busy. He said he's got only a home number so why isn't he picking it up? Hazeline cocked an eyebrow in dissatisfaction. She's been calling the number ten times already, but for some reason she couldn't even get a single answer. Pi. Please leave a message after the tone. Hello. Sir Alchemist. This is Hazeline speaking. I'm the only person who knows this number so please relax. The reason for me calling you this time, is I was wondering if you'd like to have a work-related dinner with me sometime. Thanks to Alchemy, his worries over money had been solved. The reserve price for his potion per bottle was 450k US. On top of that, he had already sold two through the sales commissions, one for over 620k, and the other for over 530k. Even after deducting the sales tax and the Alchemy House's cut, he would still end up pocketing well over 1. 3 million US. This was an amount he'd never even dreamt of having in his life. However, he also couldn't have imagined seeing this amount leave him in one go, either. The minimum cost of a single, unattached house located the closest to Kanwan Province's monster field easily exceeded one. Three million. At first, when he heard the amount he just couldn't believe it but after hearing the explanations, he understood the reasoning, just a little. The house he looked at had a garden the size of 60 Pyeong, nearly 200 square meters an underground bunker equipped with a generator. And had been insured with a knight's order for a prioritized protection in case of monster's appearance and to top that all off, the whole building was reinforced with magic engineering to withstand assaults from monsters of mid-tier or lower. Hearing about all these points, even SAE Jean ended up thinking that one. Three million was on the cheaper side. He returned to the cave, thinking that spending all that money at once seemed wasteful but he couldn't chance it in an apartment complex with his condition as was. And also the issue with the time reared its ugly head while considering locations further than this, so he decided to settle in that house as soon as the money came in from the completed sale of the potions. Well, that's that, but I wonder when I'll evolve again. The worries and fears he had certainly lessened with the promised income but couldn't completely be assuaged. The core issue he had, can I live on as a human? 
was still there. Now, he could maintain his human form for 100 minutes but really, that didn't exactly qualify as being a human, after all. The condition needed for the evolution of the brown wolf to the grey was the minimum reputation. He evolved together with the message that said about 100 people became aware of his existence. If the rest of the evolution was tied to this concept then that meant he had to deliberately expose his grey wolf form to as many people as possible. Fool. However, that was easier said than done most would try to hunt him down the moment he showed up. S.A.E. Jean could only sigh out grandly. But there wouldn't be any changes if he stayed put like this. He'd be able to find even a sliver of hope only when he started moving his body and hit the wall head on. Well, let's avoid the knights for now, and show up only in front of the hunters. Can we do it? No problem, no problem no need to worry so much. It's just a low-tier creature with a slightly bigger body. Other hunters are just exaggerating the truth. One was a mid-tier, another a low mid-tier, and lastly, another low mid-tier. This temporary party of three hunters consisted of one woman and two men. The woman was full of high spirits and took the lead but the following two men had their shoulders slumped. It was as if they were being dragged along by the woman in front. When three hunters gather, we can bring down any monster. Isn't that what you guys have said? That's why we became companions, right? TL, the last line said something about being step-siblings, and it didn't make much sense to me, so companions it is until someone can suggest a better alternative. OG. Oh, hey, that story is already 15 years old. And back then, we were knights, not hunters. TL. This line also greatly confused me. Not sure if this guy was saying they were knights 15 years ago, which seemed quite unlikely as you will see in the next chapter. Or the woman saying about three hunters the previous paragraph was actually supposed to be three knights instead and he was pointing that out. Whatever, dude. Why are you guys acting so down, anyways? If it's a wolf the size of a tiger, then the remains would fetch quite a nice price and if we find a mid-rank mana stone in its heart. You know what that means, right? She spoke loudly and happily while making the round coin gesture with her fingers but the dark shadows on the men's faces showed no signs of alleviating. There was a rumor floating around the low-tier hunting ground of late. The insidious rumor spoke of a unique monster prowling the area, the unique grey wolf. The number of hunters witnessing this tiger-sized grey wolf had already surpassed high tens, and after earning its nickname Unique Grey Wolf, the various stories related to this creature had appended the mood of the hunter's cafe. In fact, the mood had almost reached a point where TV stations might send people to investigate it. TL, again, the cafe here is not an actual shop, but an internet forum. But quite unlike any other hunters who would have prioritized their safety first, this woman had dragged these two guys along while raising a fuss. I said, no problem, no problem at all. The unique monster, or possibly a mutated one. The term referred to creatures that had went through changes induced by an inborn condition or acquiring something along the line, and began growing in an unnatural way until it became far stronger than all of its peers. The famous examples included the saber-toothed tigers, the manticores a monster with a human head, a lion's body, and wings of a bat and the dragon turtles. These were top-tier monsters that even a party full of high-tier knights would find difficult to hunt. And these creatures were usually found in the unreachably high and remote parts of the Kongwans mountains where they would continue their lonely but battle-filled existences. But to think, there was a unique monster roaming around freely in the low-tier hunting ground? This woman was thinking that this was simply a stupid, unrealistic rumor that even the resident knights tasked with combating the non-standard monsters had found utterly laughable. But the two men thought differently. A grey wolf with the size of a tiger. They definitely saw its bright and fearsome eyes. Not personally, of course, but online in the hunter's cafe. Its amazing figure standing proudly and staring at the hunters with the full moon serving as its backdrop made them stunned at its gorgeousness rather than stunned into fear, made them sense its nobleness rather than its savagery. You also saw that, right? I did, but so what? I'm telling you it's not a unique monster. If it was one, then the knights would have mobilized by now. And if this BD was strong, then why the heck are there so many witnesses? They all would have been dead already. 
what she said was true. Unlike the regular, garden variety monsters, those labeled as unique were capable of unleashing special attacks based around magic, which would create equally unique signatures. If that signature was felt, then the resident knights would be swarming the low tier hunting ground, busy patrolling the place high and low. Plus, the testimonies of the eyewitnesses were a bit weird as well. They said that the huge wolf just appeared like a ghost and blocked their paths until the hunters chose to retreat. They did add that they got scared of its intense eyes and its size, and were too busy running away with tails between their legs, but it meant that this creature didn't come out to hurt people. It's just a slightly bigger wolf. And we know that all bigger monsters have mana stones in their hearts. Sure, it should be as strong as it looks, but... Hell, as a mid-tier hunter, I didn't bring this bad boy just for a show. She pulled out a handgun from her back pocket. Called KM-758, it was an expensive gun designed to chamber and fire rounds of armor-plated mana bullets that were especially effective against the beast-type monsters. Eh. Where did you get that from? This mid-tier ranked lady is on another dimension from you guys. I bought it from the cash I earned by participating in hunting with various other parties. With this bad boy, as soon as we find this wolf, it's as good as a dead meat. At the entrance of the weapon that was far more trustworthy than her words, the men began to regain some of their former courage. A wool. However, as soon as they gained some confidence, a powerful fear assaulted them right away. The howl of the wolf piercing the night sky easily swallowed up the budding seeds of courage in their hearts. What, what was that? Grey wolves never howled. It was because not only their vocal cords were deformed. The tactic of hiding in the shadows then stealthily assaulting their prey was their most preferred method to hunt and also the reason why these creatures could still live in the low-tier hunting ground. In other words, they wouldn't deliberately make a noise to spoil their hunting opportunity. If that's the case, then just what was making that howl? All three of the hunters, even the woman who was so full of bravado, ended up sticking very close to each other, their bodies shaking like leaves. A wool. The fear that struck them once more came from a lot closer than before. In the end, all three hunters fell on their butts while holding hands and their bodies planted against each other's. Even though it was simply a cry of a wolf, they just couldn't recover from the assault of the fear on their senses that made their bodies go numb. These poor fellas could never ever had posited that there was a magical effect applied in the howl itself. I, I, I've already low, low, loaded the gun so, no nay, me to a, worry. She grasped the gun with her shaking hands. At the same time, the shivering men recalled with some difficulty the rules of hunters. They must never surrender to the encroaching fear. The moment they fear the monster, their lives would be forfeit. One man brought out a rifle, the other a shotgun. With the sounds of firing pins being cocked, all three of them finished equipping their weapons. Russell. They heard the sounds of grasses covered in descending darkness being disturbed. The tightening, dreadful anticipation suppressed the fear and terror, and the three briefly regained their cool-headed hunter's appearances. They placed their index fingers on the triggers and took aim towards the direction of the sound. A minute that felt like ten passed by, and finally, the monster revealed its face. But the hunters couldn't find the right reaction to this totally unexpected appearance. Growling. The sight of a green skin, a crude metallic weapon held in one hand, and a bone necklace hung around its neck, stopped their mouths from operating. Was this an orc warrior? No, it couldn't be. An orc warrior lacked enough self-awareness to decorate itself. The creature that overtly showed off its body and busy sending combative gaze over at the hunters. It was an orc jaguar. A confrontational individual that possessed strength surpassing an orc warrior, it was a low mid-tier monster that loved bloody battles. TL, yep, the raw definitely said a jaguar. A low mid-tier creature. Something that shouldn't even be here in the low-tier hunting ground. I think, maybe the machine dividing up the tiers is malfunctioning again. Because of its natural inclinations towards combat, orc jaguars went around searching for enemies to fight, but one of them coming down to the low-tier hunting ground was extremely rare. There was a machine installed between the low-mid-tier and the low-tier hunting grounds that was designed to stop monsters from getting all mixed up. 
but it could only lead the monsters to behave a certain way and was not what one would call a foolproof system, so every now and then, there were accidents like these. I'm really sorry. We came to catch a wolf but something f***ing worse showed up instead. We ain't dead yet. And didn't I tell you to fix the way you speak? How come for the rest of your life? Guoa. Their conversation got interrupted by the orc jaguar's roar. The three hunters exchanged several knowing looks. If two of them bought time, then one would be able to survive. So, you wanna live? Nope. What about you? I don't want to. As expected, the camaraderie built up over the past fifteen years was unshakable. All three of them said no and just grinned. And finally, they decided to just work together. TL, so this fifteen years bit is here again. I wonder maybe I read wrong. Hmm. Bang. The male hunter with the rifle took aim at the orc jaguar's neck and pulled the trigger first. But the mana bullet designed for the low-tier monsters couldn't pierce the thick skin of the target. The monster got enraged by the attack that managed to tickle it and pounced towards the hunters. Next was the hunter with the shotgun. BLAM. The scattering mana buckshots struck all over the body of the orc jaguar. But again, there was no effect. Finally, only the handgun was left. But she knew. This orc wasn't a beast type. This gun was them just struggling uselessly. Rather than her own death, her eyes teared up in apology at the thoughts of dragging her friends to their end here. And in that moment when she squeezed the trigger of her gun in regret. Bang! The movement of the orc stopped. The three hunters stared in panic at the orc that was literally a stone's throw away from them. But it wasn't that the orc had stopped. Instead, it was busy looking at the right arm that held the crude weapon. The eyes of the hunters also followed the line of the sight. And there was a lone wolf busy chewing on the arm of this orc, having appeared out of absolutely nowhere. It was a grey wolf. And it was the very creature the hunters were looking for, the grey wolf with a tiger-sized body. Chapter, 14. At first, S.A.E. Jean howled in order to warn them of the incoming danger. There was an orc jaguar heading towards the three hunters, after all. Unfortunately, it seemed there was an unexpected effect of a skill attached to his howl. Condition complete, drove a minimum of one person to the state of terror with the wolf's howl passive skill howling acquired. While in the wolf form, the host can affect the emotional state of targeted individuals with his howling. Example, fear, terror, mysteriousness, etc. What the hell? Instead of running away, the hunters that heard his cry fell on their asses after their legs gave up on them. And the orc jaguar was slowly approaching those poor suckers. A short time later the hunters and the orc clashed. The trio had fallen into a state of panic but somehow recovered just in time and started firing their guns. Blam! S.A.E. Jean dashed towards the scene as he listened to the sound of the gunshot. He just couldn't sit back and watch, knowing that he was partially responsible for this mess, even though he didn't plan things to happen this way. Fortunately, S.A.E. Jean arrived in the nick of time. Moving fast enough to cause a storm of winds, the wolf opened wide its maws and bit down hard on the right arm of the orc jaguar. Quajik. But what he got was a sensation of blockage, the lack of the satisfying penetration. It was not possible even for the incredible biting strength of a grey wolf to pierce the tough and thick skin of an orc jaguar. When the orc looked at his way indifferently, S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but busily move his eyes and take a glance at the creature. The orc roared in irritation and swung its arm hard, throwing S.A.E. Jean off it. He quickly regained his footing after being thrown off and took some distance, but the explosive speed of the orc jaguar was much faster than his expectations. As befitting of the moniker, Jaguar. Its speed didn't lose out to that of a grey wolf at all. It seemed to take only a couple of steps, but it had arrived at S.A.E. Jean's location and slammed down its weapon at him. Kong. S.A.E. Jean just about dodged the strike by twisting his body. Gwar. Annoyed by the agile movement of the wolf, the orc Jaguar began pounding away like crazy with its blunt weapon. The accuracy was pretty dn low but the destructive power behind each strike was no laughing matter. S.A.E. Jean twisted around like a snake and avoided the crazed attacks. 
but the ground below could not withstand the aimless poundings and became overturned like a crop field ready for seeds to be planted, while numerous debris pebbles, soil, weeds flew up in the air. Meanwhile, the three Stooges hunters sat there and stared at this scene in a total daze. It was like they were stuck inside a dream. It had to be a dream since this event they were seeing couldn't be reality, as the low-tier monster Grey Wolf was fighting tooth and nail with an orc jaguar that was considered to be one of the strongest even in the low-mid-tier rankings. As they watched the proceedings in a daze, the woman suddenly raised her gun towards the battle. Hey, hey, what are you doing? One of the men panicked and tried to stop her. The other guy did the same. The two of them thought that instead of trying to agitate the two monsters, it would be a far smarter choice to escape during this time of reprieve. An orc jaguar is known as an obsessive monster. It's got a good nose too, and it will never let a prey it found escape like that. To know if that wolf intervened in order to buy us time to run, but it's the correct choice to help it out right now. What if the wolf targets us next after the orc jaguar is dead? The male hunter couldn't spit his words out. If it weren't for that wolf, they would have died already, and if that wolf couldn't defeat the orc, then they would still die anyway. Aim mainly at the eyes, between the eyebrows, mouth, and under the arm. They had received the ranks of low mid and mid tier at the age of 23, meaning all three of them had enough skills to roll around in this rough world by themselves. They quickly reloaded their guns and took aim at the battle of a wolf and an orc. Even though the orc exposed a lot of openings because of its lack of palpable intelligence, all of them proved to be useless in the end. The hunters had to aim at those weak spots where there wasn't much covering of thick skin, or where there weren't any to begin with. Kwong. The orc pounded hard once more, but it was yet another miss. It ended up destroying the poor ground again, so it widened its eyes in anger and searched for the slippery wolf. And when it stopped its movement for a brief moment, an oval-shaped object with a pointy tip sliced past the wind and and struck one of the orc's eyes. Core. It was a mana bullet. As the bullet that was densely infused with mana came in contact with the orc's retina, it exploded and the hulking creature spouted blood as it stumbled backwards just a little. Blam 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 blam. As the flurry of bullets flew at it aiming for the weak spots, the orc raised its arm and easily swatted them away. With one of its eyes gone, the focus of the orc jaguar's fury switched its target from the wolf to the three hunters. Its anger boiled so much that it'd pounce on the three humans at any moment. It's coming. Separate, now. When the orc unwisely started moving towards the hunters while ignoring the wolf, S.A.E. Jean's chance had come. He activated the skill warrior of reversal. Almost immediately, his muscles grew at an incredible speed and vitality filled his body. When the fighting spirit that could not be doused burned powerfully inside him, S.A.E. Jean decided to relieve this feeling with him ripping out the back of the orc's neck. The wolf, with its body completely transformed, assaulted the back of the orc like a raging, crashing storm wave. He only needed two full steps. Wind gathered below his paws and using the propulsion from them, he charged into the orc's back. S.A.E. Jean finally succeeded in piercing through the skin. But, it still wasn't a fatal enough wound. So, he shook his head around in order to further tear open a larger chunk of the wound. Core. The orc screamed in pain and tried to pry the wolf off from its back. But S.A.E. Jean's temporarily enhanced jaw strength could ignore the creature's desperate shakings. While biting deeper into the neck of the orc, he sent out signals with his eyes at the hunters. It was their turn to shine, now. Breathing heavily. The woman hunter aimed the handgun with her imperceptibly trembling hands. The target was the orc's left eye. The orc raged around powerfully, but she didn't hesitate one bit as she squeezed the trigger. The steel-encased mana bullet drew a clear trajectory as it flew towards the orc. Literally, it was clear to see. Its speed wasn't of a regular bullet. As if it was a flower petal blowing around in the wind, the mana bullet slowly approached the orc. It was a built-in feature of this high-priced firearm designed to maximize accuracy. The damage from the speed of the bullet would lessen but since it was going to explode once entering the target, the design of a steel-encased mana bullet was also focused solely on achieving high accuracy. She manipulated her mana and guided the trajectory and the direction of the bullet in real time. 
the bullet constantly changed its aim as the orc violently struggled until finally, it struck the creature's eye. A small explosion followed right after. A fountain of blood poured out from the orc's eye. Phew. It was a bull's eye. She breathed out a sigh of relief. Even though the orc had become completely blind, the wolf remained biting into the neck for a few more seconds before separating from the creature. Quo, ku. The back of the neck chewed out by the wolf looked as if it had split apart in any second, and from the eyes damaged by the bullet's blood poured out like a fountain. The orc jaguar let out a weird whimper and threw its two arms around, but even that didn't last long. The creature fell on top of the grass and stopped moving shortly thereafter. Ha! When the battle ended, the three hunters fell on their asses again as the strength abandoned their legs. S.A.E. Jean was breathing heavily as he spat out the blood pooled in his mouth. And before long, a new message window popped into his view. Condition cleared, a cooperative hunting. Succeeded in a cooperative hunting with at least the minimum of one human. It's now possible to change into the ebony wolf form instead of a gray wolf. All stats related to the forms will be adjusted accordingly. The skill the scent of a wolf will apply even while in human form. Passive skill, the scent of a wolf level, F. The strong odor of the ebony wolf. Depending on the gender, race, characteristics and tendencies, the effects will vary. This skill will also remain active during the human form. It was a joyous message no matter how many times he looked at it. But just like before, he couldn't shout out in happiness as the timing proved to be a bit wrong as well. Hey, hey. Look at that. The woman hunter suddenly raised a ruckus as she began pointing at S.A.E. Jean. Actually, he had no idea what the process of his evolution looked like. All he could derive from the dazed, mouths wide open appearances of the three hunters were that, maybe, it must have been rather mysterious or somewhat bizarre to look at. S.A.E. Jean remained standing proudly for a bit and gazed at them, before rapidly dashing away. And the only ones left behind were the three dazed hunters still acting like they were swimming inside a dream. Hey, did you see that? Yup. Its fur changed while brightly shining and all that, right? Yup. When the wolf's body was enveloped in the mysterious azure light, the previously grey coat became dyed in jet black color. This was a kind of an incredibly rare event that couldn't be seen again even in a dream. It was at night. With a full moon looming large, a huge crowd of people had camped into the monster field's low-tier hunting ground. But it wasn't just people only. There were also numerous trucks, antennae, cameras, and mics that couldn't normally be seen in a place like this in other words, they were news crews and their accompanying vehicles. Under the curious gazes of one or two onlookers, the reporters were all in the midst of busy reporting on something while being protected by the knights. Can you tell me what is going on here? S.A.E. Jean cautiously approached one of the knights on duty and asked. He assumed the human form and ran all the way out here, after suddenly catching the whiff of so many people and getting surprised by that. It's to film a report. You probably have heard of the rumor, too, right? They say it's a spirit beast or something obviously it's all nonsense. But nowadays, what with folks being emotionally dried up and all, stuff like this. TSK, TSK. The knight who was normally stationed around these parts clicked his tongue in annoyance as if he didn't like getting called out in the middle of the night. There was this hot news story tossing around on the internet as well as on various newspapers. It was about a certain grey wolf that morphed into an ebony wolf a story of a spirit beast. This story came to life after three hunters gave a clear, concise eyewitness testimony as well as uploading the photos of the orc jaguar's remains to the hunter's cafe. The hunters all spoke of the event where, after the grey wolf aided them in defeating the orc jaguar, its body suddenly became dyed in the azure light, then all of its fur turned black in color. The eyewitnesses guessed that this wolf was one of those growth-type monsters, but as the story spread out like a wildfire, people, including the so-called experts, concluded from the creature's actions that it must be a spirit beast instead. The reason was simple. Monsters tried to devour humans, but this particular wolf helped them out. And after the part about its fur changing colors were emphasized, a certain persuasive speculation gained traction where people wondered if this wolf was the same one that saved the hunter Kim Tae-jo way back then. 
What will happen if this wolf shows up? SAE Jean carefully asked again. Probably nothing more than getting shot at by the cameras. Huh so it's not going to get hunted down. Foot. Hey, Mr. Diligent Hunter, I get your dedication to your work, but if we try anything here, the public will crucify all of us. Ah. But man, between us, aren't these news reporter people dumb as hell? I mean, a wolf is a very skittish creature, so why raise so much fuss as a group? The knight stopped talking and looked around. The hunter he was talking to just now had suddenly vanished. Where did he go? He just dropped the matter and switched his focus back to the guarding duty. Five minutes passed, and then ten minutes flowed by. The original aim was to film the approximate location where the spirit beast had appeared while expecting nothing much to happen, so when that was all done, the reporters got ready to pack up and leave. But it was at this very moment. A woo. A cry of a wolf resounded loudly in the air. The cameraman busy loading the van with the equipment and the lady reporter climbing aboard the passenger seat all stopped in utter shock and quickly turned their heads towards the origin of that sound. And they saw a lone wolf, framed by the full moon on its back atop the nearby mountain peak, gazing back at them. The dignified stance that couldn't have possibly belonged to a wolf, the majestic body overflowing with confidence. The black fur coat that seemed to shine softly under the moonlight, and a pair of golden eyes that burned brightly. And finally, a mysterious howl that could shake their souls. A wolf was not a tiger, but everyone gathered here could definitely feel the same thing. The wolf that was proudly surveying the ground here was definitely the sand gun. TL, it's a Hanja word that means a few things 1, meaning the guardian of the mountains, 2, literally a fierce tiger, and the MC from a neighbor webtoon. Brother Tiger Bar Khan. I thought the author meant the first two, so left as is. Hey, wake up. Start filming already. The dazed members of the press began to move in a hurry. They hefted the cameras and began hunting for the best angle to capture the view of that proud creature. Ha! Huh. The knight who sneered in contempt just now was left speechless as he stared at the distant wolf. He scoffed and said there was no such thing as a spirit beast but even he couldn't call that creature a monster. Certainly, not after seeing this unexplainable aura of divinity wrapped around the wolf. H, hey! What the hell? There was a sudden collective cry of shock. Not content with just the appearance alone, there were several blue-colored blobs of mana rising all around the wolf like the ghostly flames of the underworld. D, D, did you get that? Hey, I said, did you film that SHT? It'd be a huge scoop if captured on film. A guy that looked like a producer or a director yelled loudly while making a shocked expression. At this shout, the cameraman nodded his still dazed face but at the same time. Hey, where did it go? As if the previous event was nothing but a passing dream, the wolf's presence had disappeared completely. A spirit beast, the divine wolf too thin. Chapter, 15. What the? Hey, did you get that? Oh I I. I said, did you film that SHT? The loud shouts of the TV crew could be heard. Were you able to witness that? Around the wolf, several strange ghost lights have started appearing one by one, as if the creature can manipulate mana huh? Next it was the turn of the reporter to shout out aloud beyond the scope of the camera lens. But not minding that, the wolf turned around and lightly hopped down from the mountain top. The camera hurriedly chased after it, but by then, it was gone without a trace. Hmm. Hazeline frowned slightly as she watched the hologram display projected from her mobile phone. A spirit beast, the divine creature. A being of mystery that a person may or may not get to see even once in his or her entire lifetime. When she was 25, she got to see a spirit beast, the black turtle. Even though it was massive, because of its laid-back nature, it didn't enjoy moving around too much. Found originally in eastern China, it was a creature that would have lived its days in a lazy stupor and barely moving one of its legs. But in the end it was murdered because of a child of some wealthy personage from the Middle East who suffered from a deadly illness. The child suffered from the mana overflow. To cure this worst kind of man-related inflictions that couldn't be cured by any known potion to man and subjected its sufferers to a hellish torment before killing them. 
The black turtle that had lived for 400 years or more in various worlds out there was turned into a medical ingredient in a single day. Knock knock. The sound of knocking on the door brought Hazeline back to the present from the reminiscence of the past and she took a glance at the watch to confirm the time. It was now 11.50. It was also the time for the appointment with that alchemist after finally getting one phone call through to him. Please come in. The figure entering through the gap between the smoothly opening doors was a robe-wearing man. Welcome back. Yes, it's good to see you again. The two shared a handshake and sat down on their seats while gazing at each other. Have you been well? You. Hazeline tilted her head in confusion. Something was different about him. Soon, she was able to figure what that difference was after she sniffed the air. I see you bought a perfume. The subtle yet pleasant scent coming off of S.A.E. Jean tickled her nose. Not too light, nor too gaudy, the odor settled in the air rather wonderfully. She ended up unconsciously closing her eyes and savored this scent before regaining her senses, and made a fake cough. Hum. It's nice. If it's not much trouble, can I inquire as to where you purchased this perfume? Hazeline possessed a very sensitive nose making her very interested and knowledgeable towards the topic of perfumes. It'd be difficult for her to ignore this wonderful new scent at all. She just had to have it ready in her home or she'd never be satisfied. I didn't use one. It's all natural. S.A.E. Jean just smiled and shook his head. Hazeline's brows wiggled a tiny bit. There definitely wasn't a scent like this the first time they met. At the time, he had no body odor. So why was he trying to sell such an unconvincing lie? Ah, is that so you have a very nice natural odor? But Hazeline could only perform the capitalist smile for now. As he currently held all the cards in this transaction, she just could not afford to make him unhappy. TL, this is the second time I encounter the phrase which as far as I know there isn't a direct translation available. So ended up changing it to mean roughly the same thing. Sorry. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean swallowed his saliva while feeling complicated, and replied to her. He could pretty much tell what she was thinking right now. She probably thought that he was lying through his teeth. But he was helpless to fix this misunderstanding. The scent of a wolf was a passive skill that couldn't be switched on and off at will. Huh, well then, is it okay if we end the prologue here? When S.A.E. Jean nodded in agreement, Hazeline pulled out a paper from one of the drawers in the desk. It was a regular A4 paper with nothing on it. This is. As I've mentioned over the phone yesterday. Hazeline spoke as she handed over a pen. On a side note, it was only yesterday that S.A.E. Jean belatedly realized he could actually receive phone calls directed to his home via his bracelet TV. Please write down all the ingredients you'd like to acquire. We'll source them for you. As long as it's not something like a heart of a person or a fong of a saber-toothed tiger, it's possible to procure them within a month. One of the roles the alchemy houses perform is the circulation of medical ingredients, you know. Ah, you don't have to feel burdened about this. It's not a free service so you'll have to purchase them from us. But we'll be able to sell you at cost. It'll probably be about half of what you'd pay for in the open market. Oh, right. Thank you. S.A.E. Jean picked up the pen and thought hard about what to write when his eyes inadvertently caught the images floating up from the hologram display above her desk. It was the scene of the ebony wolf framed by a full moon, the one where he deliberately showed up for the TV cameras as a bit of a service. At the time, it was one of those nights that made his emotions go a bit hot-headed, so he ended up creating this mess. But now that he got to see his actions in the broad daylight, his face got all reddened up. Ah, spirit beasts are a no-go. Misunderstanding the reasons for his gazes, Hazeline raised her index finger and waved it side to side while making a serious face. Hunting down a spirit beast is morally and legally prohibited, you see. We have no idea if the spirit beast has a direct influence in the area it resides in. There might be a big disaster like a landslide occurring if we hunted down that wolf. That was what happened back when the black turtle was killed. As soon as it died, the mana dwelling deep within the ocean floor that lost the focal point overflowed and resulted in a massive tsunami wave sweeping up the entire eastern seaboard of China. 
Right. No, definitely not. We should never kill such a cool wolf. He swallowed the rising laughter back down and genially spoke in a natural manner. While obviously unaware of Kim Sae Jean being that very wolf, Hazeline looked at the display and continued with her speech. Yes, well. It is a cool creature, what with its somewhat dependable appearance, and also its personality of helping people out, too. But most of all, I love those eyes that resemble the full moon. It's really understandable why all the girls are going crazy in the social networking sites nowadays. Honestly, even I shared a couple of posts on the profile book. Oh, by any chance, do you also do profile book? Hughup no, no. I don't do social media. Seeing Hazeline giggle like that, even SAE Jean ended up leaking out a mysterious smile. She looked at him with eyes full of questions but he pretended that nothing was wrong and started writing down on the paper. A goblin's kindness was impossible without the fangs of the saber-toothed tiger, so he wrote down ingredients for other potions. He even thought of their names in advance. The potion to strengthen the stats of the drinker would be called the goblin's rage, and, and. If you can find these, I'll be grateful. When he handed over the paper, she studied every word in detail, even though she was acting disinterested by the contents. It was a normal list of ingredients that didn't seem to differ from what other alchemists would have asked for. All right. As soon as we procure them, I'll give you a call. Oh, and if it's okay with you, will you be partnering us on your next batch of potions as well? Yes, let's. S.A.E. Jean spoke without a hint of hesitation. In all honesty, he couldn't really go anywhere else anyway, because he could only remain as a human for two hours a day. Wah, really? You truly are wonderfully decisive, sir. Normally, other alchemists would be reluctant to choose but Sir Alchemist doesn't. It's Kim S.A.E. Jean. He told her while studying her eyes. He could see the surprise in her jewel-like eyes at his sudden self-introduction. And my race is human. S.A.E. Jean reached out with his hand. Hazeline stared at the hand for a moment in a daze, before breaking out in a smile and shaking it. Yes, Sir Alchemist Kim S.A.E. Jean. I'll do my utmost best to make sure you won't regret choosing Yosian Alchemy House. As the handshake ended, the two stood up from their seats. It's just about lunch time, but have you eaten yet? Yes, I have already. If that's the case, why don't we, together eh? At S.A.E. Jean's reply, Hazeline tilted her head in confusion, wondering if she'd heard wrong. An elf like her was not at all accustomed with rejection such as this. And from a man, no less. It was obviously the first time in her life. Even if it was a gentle no. I already had lunch. But, but it's only now twelve. Ah, uh, I usually eat my meals a bit early. My apologies. Of course, he had his own unfortunate reasons for doing this, but the deeply shocked Hazeline could only nod her head after blinking repeatedly in disbelief for a while. Ah, uh, yes, well, yes, well. Of course. Of course it is, of course it has to be. Yes. Well, when we have the time later. Then, please excuse me. His last words landed the decisive blow. Hazeline's mouth hung loose. She just could not figure out this situation no matter what. He said when we have the time later, but she was the one saying that, usually. She was not the one on the receiving end. It was a kind of unwelcome shock to her system that she could never, ever grow to understand. She watched the back of S.A.E. Jean leaving her office in a daze and totally crumbled into her seats right after. And she remained in that position for ten minutes, looking like as if her soul had been sucked out. Sniff, sniff. By sheer accident, she ended up smelling the air around her. The scent was gone now. She felt a bit regretful. She thought that she had become a Suin beast man but it really could not be helped. There was a trace of that scent lingering inside her nose, making her miss it even more now. Even though it had been only ten minutes. I should have just asked. If it could make someone miss another with only its scent, then it was without a doubt, an excellent perfume. If it was at this level, then she should have found out what it was even at the risk of annoying him. She muttered slowly, her face full of regret. 
She continued to sniff the air for a while, before finding herself browsing the internet for men's perfumes. S.A.E. Jean could often overhear people talking about the spirit wolf beast everywhere as he walked. Students, knights, even magicians it seemed like every resident living near or on Kongwan province had talked about the wolf at least once. And more flesh was getting added to the story of the spirit wolf beast, just like that. Since now he could remain a bit longer as a human, S.A.E. Jean chose to walk into the monster field the official way, through the reception area by the entrance. This was the place where the hunters and knights could take a short respite before going on a hunt or after completing it. It wasn't originally a quiet place to begin with, but now, with the numerous reporters mixed in, trying to get more stories on the spirit beast, it was a lot more chaotic than usual. Ah, uh, now that I think about it, that thing's cry was like, there's a monster up ahead, so don't go that's what that meant, right? It was a real smart thing to turn back then, after feeling uneasy of that howl. Does that mean you Mr. Hunter also got to see this spirit wolf beast? Eh. Ah well, no. But, but, I really did hear it with these two ears of mine, I did. It was going a wool and everything. You also know well, that wolves in the monster field never cry, right? Seriously, when I was thinking, did I go in too deep? This wolf cries out and I got so surprised, I just bolted right out of there. Does that mean, this spirit wolf beast has helped people out before? Yep, that's right. I'm telling you right now, you really can't see a cleverer creature than that guy. Oi. That man over there, that's the hunter who got help from that brown wolf hey, hey Mr. Kim tae -jo. Come over here. This reporter wants to ask you something. S.A.E. Jean smiled in satisfaction while hearing all these conversations. To him, it looked like the momentum of the story would continue to gather for a while longer as those people wanting some attention ended up telling tall tales and outright lies. Chapter, 16 On top of the cold stone floor, S.A.E. Jean opened his eyes. He could see hunters in the faraway forest, while the noisy chirping of birds disorientated him. A wolf could look a little further away, and hear a little bit more. He got up from the spot, his four black legs moved. Before he knew it, it felt like he had completely adapted to using four legs instead of two. Because of this, a whole bunch of swear words suddenly rushed out of his mouth. The amount of time available for the human form was two hours a day. If he could be a human for only two hours then maybe he wasn't a human anymore. At the growing disquiet, he got straight up and changed into his human form. S.A.E. Jean stared at his legs with his own two eyes, then touched his face with his own two hands. They were all exact the same as before. He was truly relieved. Tears welled up at the corners of his eyes. It was especially difficult in the mornings after nights of sleep. He always suspected if the him now was stuck inside of a dream. Oftentimes, he wished he was, as a dream would have been better. It was very painful living as a monster. The taste of blood and flesh was still stuck between his teeth, the sensation of ripping away lives whole with a mace he just couldn't get used to them. If anything, all those things just served to wear him down to his bones. Sigh. S.A.E. Jean let out a deep sigh. But his tight chest and ominous feelings wouldn't just go away like that. And the unusually drab, grey morning sky was making him feel even more depressed than before. At least to somehow cheer himself up, he switched on the micro TV. With a soft whir, a hologram projection spread its light on a wall of the cave. Pant, pant, pant. An orc jaguar was on the run from something. A creature like the orc jaguar possessing such a deep desire for battle and victory was on the run. That was simply nonsensical. But right now, this very orc was beset with terror even from the sound of rustling grass behind it. The smell of a wolf, the odor of a predator, was making this once brave orc scared out of its wits. The orc's eyes hurriedly searched behind its back. It couldn't see anything back there. But that accursed smell was still lingering there. So the orc spared no efforts and put strength in its legs to run away. A wool. A howling dipped in magical power tore through the sky and grabbed hold of this fleeing orc's legs. It felt like all the muscles on its body were going numb from the sheer terror. The orc intuitively sensed the encroaching death and as it turned its head around a huge shadow of a jet-black wolf rapidly descended down on it. 
quick. With its throat grabbed tight, the orc couldn't even let out any particular scream, only a small whimper, before its life was snuffed out. KHRNNG After clearing its nose, the wolf pierced into the heart of the orc with its razor-sharp claw. When the hard tip of the claw penetrated past the soft tissues of the heart and touched something solid, the wolf closed his eyes. Then, something mysterious happened. An azure aura slowly rose up like a smoldering veil and began covering the wolf from the claw buried in the heart of the dead orc to the rest of its black body in a thin, nearly imperceptible layer. This blue light lingered around for a moment before entering the creature, causing him to open his eyes in satisfaction. You have absorbed the low-grade mana stone of an orc jaguar. Physical strength and endurance rise by zero. 5. Agility rises by zero. 2. Energy manipulation rises by zero. 0. 5. If more stones are absorbed, the native skill of the orc jaguar can be acquired. That's quite a lot. Was it because I got an orc jaguar, even though it was still a juvenile? S.A.E. Gene, now in his ebony wolf form, grinned slyly. He discovered this way of utilizing mana stones rather coincidentally. It truly was through a completely lucky chance. Around ten days ago, S.A.E. Gene watched a documentary on his TV inside the cave and in this particular documentary. The makers were explaining why the predatory monsters, such as a troll in ravenous state or a two-headed ogre, became stronger after eating other monsters. At the end of the program, the experts concluded that these monsters possessed special digestive system that could absorb mana stones. Those words ended up rousing his curiosity, so S.A.E. Gene picked up a lowest grade mana stone he planned to sell later on and promptly swallowed it. Just like that, an alert window popped up into view at the same time. Condition complete, absorb a mana stone. The passive skill A growth type monster has been acquired. Skill proficiency level. F. When coming in contact with the mana stone of a monster, the host can now absorb a minute percentage of its abilities. A greater percentage of the monster's abilities shall be absorbed when the skill proficiency level increases. He felt like he just hit the jackpot. S.A.E. Gene then quickly went and ate all ten mana stones stored in a cave all stats ended up rising by around six, but unfortunately, the most important one of them all, the energy manipulation, only rose by a paltry zero. 6. But he wasn't disappointed at all. He did find a new way to increase that important stat, that was why. He then really focused on hunting afterwards. He would kill at least 7 to 8 monsters in a day and absorb their mana stones. The stronger the monster, the higher his stats rose as to which stat rose when, that depended on the monsters he hunted down. Following the traits of monsters, if it was an orc, then his physical strength increased if it was a wolf, then his agility rose if it was a goblin, then the increase centered around mana affinity and magic strength. After focusing solely on hunting for 10 days. Status. Physical strength 49. Endurance 48. Agility 63. Energy manipulation 14. Mana affinity 9. Magic strength 9. Luck 8. Ebony wolf. Strength and defense increase by 26, agility increases by 40. During the human form, the effects will be reduced by. Finally, SAE gene grew strong enough to easily bring down an orc jaguar. Of course, it wasn't a fully grown individual but just a runt young enough to call it an orc student, but still. All that's left to do is to evolve. SAE gene sighed out. It came out as a pre young from the maws of the wolf. As far as he knew, or for that matter the rest of the world, the ebony wolves were the strongest species of the wolf-type monster in the monster field. In other words, if he could evolve just one more time, he could very well become either a lycanthrope, or a werewolf. On a side note, the differences between a lycanthrope and a werewolf were quite clear to see, up to a point. A werewolf was purely a beast. However, a lycanthrope was considered a person, just like vampires, humans, suins, and elves. A werewolf possessed a skill to morph into a human, but in the end, its nature was still that of a vicious beast. A lycanthrope possessed a skill to change into a wolfman, but at its core, it was a human being. 
Looking at things this way, then S.A.E. Jean was closer to being a werewolf rather than a lycanthrope. That was because of his trait changing his species from human to monster. But a werewolf was incomparably weaker than a lycanthrope. One could understand this point when seeing that, while the latter became a legend, the former remained at the level of a rare monster. But he didn't really care which one he'd evolve into. As long as he could spend the day as human while not worrying about that damnable time limit. Even with just that, he'd be happy enough. Tadak, Tadak. While making similar noises to what a puppy would make when running on a stone surface, S.A.E. Jean returned to his cave. Changing back to the human form, he brought out the micro-TV, placed it on a nice spot and lied down on the stone bed. Lately, this was his only method of relaxation. After finishing the hunt, he'd watch TV for the rest of the day with his tired and aching body. Since this was the only human-like hobby he could do, he kept on watching it until bedtime even if all of the programs on were extremely boring. Today afternoon, the president. This wasn't interesting, so he changed the channel. Ha! Seriously, isn't there any talented people in the Gabiuk Knights Order? Can't you even properly cook rice? I I am sorry. I'm not used to doing this. A program about trying to survive on some remote island somewhere, came on. Famed for his icy good looks, the superstar E. C. and J., who didn't look at all his age of mid-forties, was busy berating a mid-tier knight named Kim C. O. L. T. L., the author literally said it was a program about making three meals a day on a remote island. But hey, what does a knight's order do nowadays? Haven't we not have an incident of monsters raiding cities for the past five years? Yes, well. That's true. We are focusing on clearing out the fissures. Is that so? But seeing how you have come all the way out here, you probably didn't have much to do in the first place. The chemistry between stupid-faced Kim C.O.L. who couldn't do anything properly and E. C. and J. who continued to score with barbed comments was fun to watch. S.A.E. Jean even giggled at several moments, too. I wonder, can I also make an appearance on TV? A strange thought suddenly bloomed in S.A.E. Jean's head as he continued to watch the TV and chuckle. No matter how effed up it was, he still received a superpower, so such a thought inevitably had to spring up in his mind, seeing that he lived as an orphan with no hope and prospects for 21 years of his life. And that thought, was about being loved by many people out there. Nowadays, the gap between a hunter or a knight, and that of a celebrity was quite small. There were even TV shows dedicated to hunters and knights only, so it was possible to become famous by killing enough monsters to raise one's rank to a mid-tier if one was a knight, or high-tier if one was a hunter. As if. Not too long after, S.A.E. Jean returned to reality and vigorously shook his head to disperse the unrealistic dream out of his mind. And then, he changed the channel right away. Three o'clock this afternoon, a werewolf was witnessed coming out from a fissure in Gangbaku. Krong. S.A.E. Jean's body shot up from the bed the moment he heard the news. Slightly resembling the legendary lycanthrope, but quite different in nature, the werewolf is a rare monster that hadn't been seen for past thirty years. After cleaning up the fissure in Gangbaku, the Raven Knight's Order has announced plans to craft equipment from the remains of the werewolf, as well as to auction off the recovered mana stone. Grung. As soon as he heard the words mana stone, S.A.E. Jean nearly pounced into the hologram projection. The auction containing the werewolf's mana stone as well as other loot recovered from the fissure will be held at Hyenwall Auction House located on the island of Sebet next week, Tuesday, 1 p.m. The werewolf's mana stone has been rated at only a upper mid-grade, but its selling price is expected to be, at minimum, 1. 76 million US, to the maximum of 3. 5 million US, due to a high number of collectors desiring this rare item. No o. Why the FCK is it so expensive? S.A.E. Jean became so emotional, he inadvertently changed back to the human form and yelled out loudly. T.L. I thought the dude was in the human form already while watching the telly. Ha. Huh. Must have changed to the wolf because of the time limit. Money. Money. Truly out of the blue, he found himself needing a lot of money. Of course, the chances were, he'd go through no changes whatsoever even after absorbing that mana stone. But there was a possibility. 
even if it was minute, for S.A.E. Jean who was in the deepest bowels of despair it was worth betting everything he had. Money. He yelled out even louder and stood up from his position. S.A.E. Jean anxiously paced around the interior of the cave for ten minutes while biting his fingernails. The voice of the anchor continued to reverberate in his head. The expected price of one. Seventy-six million minimum, the maximum of three. Five million. The expected price of one. Seventy-six million minimum, the maximum of three. Five million TL, yes, the same line is repeated in the raw. I don't have enough money. S.A.E. Jean bit his lower lip, hard. Then, he spotted the micro-TV's call function. There was only one number showing up in the list of the recent calls Hazeline. They only saw each other twice now. And the amount he needed to borrow was, at least, one. Seventy-six million. Any sane person would know not to make that call. But for a guy with a pair of bloodshot eyes and his thoughts stuck in despair, such a thing as sanity had imploded a long time ago. Ring, ring. His breathing became harsher every time there was a ring. He didn't want to miss this opportunity. The werewolf's mana stone from a rare monster that had not been seen in the past thirty years. If he missed this chance, then there may never be a next time for him. Hello, this is the manager of Yosian Alchemy House. Miss Hazeline. This is Kim S.A.E. Jean speaking. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly shouted out her name in an urgent voice, causing Hazeline to answer in panic. Ah, hello, Sir Kim S.A.E. Jean. Is there something wrong? I need to apologize to you beforehand, but may I ask you for an important but selfish favor? Why yes? Why so suddenly ah, uh, yes, it's possible. If it's you, Sir Alchemist. Hazeline made a calm reply. She was probably thinking that it couldn't be something big. Or, even if it truly wasn't something big as she suspected, she could have figured that having S.A.E. Jean in her debt may prove beneficial in the further development of their business relationship. Can you borrow me some money? I will definitely, definitely, without a doubt, work hard and repay you with my potions. It just so happened to be that she was right. And he dearly wished to get into an enormous debt with Hazeline. Eh. A short sound of incredulous shock leaked out from the receiver of the phone. The Mana Stone of a Beast One. Chapter, 17. What are you talking about, out of the blue? First, please calm down, take a deep breath, and then talk to me. I'm not going anywhere. Hazeline carefully admonished him. She wasn't sure of what happened, but the alchemist seemed to be in a lot of hurry and was thirsty for something, unlike last time they met. Fortunately, S.A.E. Jean was able to follow her advice. Hoo woo. For about a minute, the sound of deep breathing came out of the receiver, and his relatively calmer voice followed soon after. An item I must procure right away has become available. I'm well aware that the proceeds from the sale of the potions haven't come in yet. However, right now, I have ten bottles of potions finished and in stock. I won't ask money for them, but can you help them? Huh. You already have ten in stock. S.A.E. Jean was in a serious hurry but Hazeline's thoughts were focused elsewhere. How long has it been since he was here before last, but he already brewed ten more. Of course, she didn't expect every single one of them to be a high-grade potion like before. If that was the case, then he'd be the alchemy personified. But, to have created ten potions in less than a month if they were around mid-rank in grade or lower, then well, it was comparable to the level of an alchemy workshop. It was an utter nonsensical joke no one would believe if a lone alchemist, a human at that, managed to match a workshop's output. Yes, I have ten bottles. I can guarantee their efficacy. One potion can greatly increase the constitution, another is an inferior version of a goblin's kindness that has recovery effects, while the other one increases resistance towards elements. Eh, eh. Hold on, what did you say just now? Hazeline shot up from her seat in shock. Now, it was her turn to feel restless. Not only she couldn't figure out how he had brewed ten potions so quickly, but she also heard the increase's resistance towards elements bit. That, was a serious problem. Because, that kind of potion no longer existed. Or more correctly, 
the recipes for those potions were all long forgotten. Around sixty years ago, among the first alchemists to cross the world's rift and settle down on earth was a certain household named Rhodes. Often referred to as the Rhodes family, their alchemy skills were truly peerless, and it was not wrong to say their alchemic legacy became the forefather of the modern alchemy. And just like the modern-day alchemists, the Rhodes family was very secretive and never shared their formula with anyone. As a consequence, there were numerous potions only they could make, and amongst those, one of them happened to be the element resistance potion. But around thirty years ago, the Rhodes family suddenly disappeared without a trace as if they didn't exist in the first place. So, all the recipes and formulas for the Rhodes family potions also vanished along with them. Not only the Rhodes family left behind an indelible mark on the world of alchemy, they also left behind a mystery that could not be solved by the current level of modern-day alchemists. They were seen as a source of inspiration, as idols for adulation, and a great motivational factor for many alchemists, thus becoming a legend in the process. And now, this one guy was busy saying that he had created a potion that only a Rhodes could have made. W, W, wait a minute. What potion did you say it was? Elemental resistance. Yes, I did. At his composed reply, Hazeline nearly fainted on the spot. She so badly wanted to go to where he was and confirm the truth of this potion for herself. B, but how? No, wait where are you now? I'll come and see you. No, that's a little inconvenient for me. S.A.E. Jean replied carefully at her strangely excited reactions. But Hazeline was feeling really, madly frustrated right now. This conversation was now at a level well past the realm of strange and into something completely crazy. So, so many, countless alchemists, including Hazeline, formed research groups in order to challenge the mystery of element resistance. The reasoning for the great alchemy conference that occurred five years ago was precisely that to recreate all the potions that had vanished along with the disappearance of the Rhodes family. They focused on five items back then, and one of them was this element resistance potion. But this gathering, organized by the Knights' Orders and led by them instead of alchemists, dissolved after not only failing to discover the recipes, they couldn't even figure out the ingredients used for the potions. Deep mistrust ended up developing between each alchemist that had participated, and towards the Knights, as a result. Ah, uh, no. Well if Sir S.A.E. Jean really brewed a resistance potion. We need to meet first. We should talk about this only after we meet personally. I, I will go to you. Where are you? That very same day, two of them met in the Yosian Alchemy House. A mid-grade. It should be around the mid-grade. Hazeline spoke while examining the scarlet-colored liquid contained in a potion bottle. Her breathing was rising up rapidly. Using her seventeen years of alchemy experience, she confirmed it. This looked exactly the same as the illustrations of Rhodes' element resistance potion she had seen. It was really the element resistance potion. Even though it was rated at a rather lowly mid-grade, there was little doubt Knight's orders would go mad with desire for this potion. The elemental attacks of the monsters rated upper mid-tier or higher were very difficult to deal with, after all. The physical damage could be negated with armors, but these armors couldn't protect the body underneath against the attacks of flames and ice spewed out by, say, a dragon turtle or a wyvern, so the knights had to defend using only the mana barriers. But unless one was a high-tier knight, it was difficult to endure the incredibly high mana expenditure. Even those amazing highest-tier knights didn't dare to casually engage monsters that used innate elemental attacks without a recovery potion. However, the story changed a great deal with the element resistance potion in the picture. This was a potion used exclusively for the subjugation of the top-ranked monsters. Following the standard set by the Rhodes family, a mid-grade could negate as much as half of the damage from the innate element attacks. That meant a high-tier knight would have a far easier time fighting the monster as the amount of mana devoted to maintaining the barrier would decrease. This potion. Did you make it alone? Yes. It was difficult to brew them so I could only brew two bottles worth. S.A.E. Jean nodded his head. This element resistance potion had a painstakingly exacting compounding requirements. Not only did it require over 20 different types of ingredients, it also required him to be very careful when combining the said ingredients. 
Hell, even with the goblin's craftsmanship skill, he ended up failing numerous times. Actually, the reason why he made this potion was to increase his proficiency with that very skill. The thing was, he received more skill proficiency points when he failed making potions, compared to when he was successful. At this very moment in time, the two people gazing at this potion were thinking two very different things. Hazeline was momentarily speechless after hearing him say could only brew two bottles. She became hopelessly curious to the identity of the man in front of her. How could he drag the recipe of a potion now long forgotten back out of the abyss all alone? Just how could he? Maybe, it was his master. That was when a light bulb went off in Hazeline's head. The Rhodes family hid away from the view. Some said they were murdered by other jealous alchemists, some said they simply had returned to their original world. But they were all just theories. The only real fact remaining, was that they just vanished into thin air like blowing dust. What if, the reason why they disappeared was because they felt sick and tired of alchemy? It made a certain amount of sense. Great things were expected of the Rhodes family and thus they received huge product orders compared to other alchemists, and the burden and the enormous pressure created by those demands would be like an axe hanging over their heads. When a famous alchemist had enough of all things alchemy, there were two avenues left to tread for this person. Either he or she start raising a successor, or like Hazeline here, become a manager of an alchemy house. But a Rhodes would never, ever choose the latter. Hmm. Never mind that, what is this favor you want to ask me? Hazeline worked hard to maintain a poker face while asking him, as things began falling into their logical her logic place rather quickly. Alchemists highly valued the master and apprentice relationship above all else. There was no need to ask about an uncertain matter and potentially sour their current relationship, after all. By any chance, have you already heard of the werewolf's mana stone? The story came out this morning. S.A.E. Jean too did his best to maintain his poker face. The minimum expected price may have been one. Seventy-six million, but it was expected to be sold at the max amount of three. Five million. Even if he used up the remaining half of the saber-toothed tiger's fong and concoct more high-grade potions to sell immediately, the proceeds from the sale would only come in after at least a month's time. So, Hazeline's assistance was a necessity if he wanted to buy the werewolf's mana stone. Although this was only their third time meeting like this, S.A.E. Jean didn't really have anyone else to rely on besides her. Plus, he was feeling confident, as well. He could create potions on the same level of goblins, so who can refuse him outright? Ah, that. Yes, I saw it. But why would you perhaps? Yes. I truly wish to purchase that mana stone. But the problem is. I don't have the money. S.A.E. Jean just couldn't say that out loud. So, he pushed forward the potions that were as good as money towards her. Hazeline was busy punching the numbers on the calculator in her head as she gazed at those potions. The Element Resistance Potion. Nominally, since it was rated a mid-grade it'd be priced around 45,000 US at most on the market, but through a sales commission, she should be able to extract as much as 350,000 US. It was a shocking amount of money considering that only one person could drink this potion. The other potions were also quite useful as well. But taking into account the sales tax, the total would not go over 530,000 US. Adding the proceeds from the sales of a goblin's kindness potions, too. 47 million after tax. The mana stone of the werewolf was expected to go for 3. 5 million. So, there was a shortage of another one million or so. However there was something far more valuable than a million dollars to consider here. It was the future relationship between these two people, Hazeline and Kim S.A.E. Jean. If this man was indeed the successor to the Rhodes family legacy, or even if he wasn't, there was a need to maintain a good relationship with the talent of the century like him. I can't afford to let him go. She was already half convinced anyways. This man had to be the god of alchemy, Rhodes' apprentice. Without that explanation, there was just no freaking way he'd be able to perfectly replicate a potion that had been lost to the world for almost thirty years. Hmm. Hazeline was feeling relieved that she had met this man only recently. 
If it was in the past, when she was still full of pride in her own alchemy skills if she met him then, who knows what kind of mess she'd have created out of jealousy and pettiness. I will definitely procure it, that much I can promise you. Please be rest assured. I've earned quite a bit of money up until now. Even though I look like this, I was quite a famous alchemist and a wizard in the past, I'll have you know. Hazeline smiled brightly as she spoke, and that caused S.A.E. Jean to break out into a deep grin of his own as well. In the empty manager's office, after S.A.E. Jean had left. Hazeline logged on to the alchemist's cafe after three years of absence. It was a type of specific job-related forum where only the current or former alchemists could join. She stayed away due to various reasons but today, she became curious if there was any new information regarding Rhodes' family and so, here she was. It sure is lively here. She muttered to herself. Even though it had been thirty years since the disappearance of the Rhodes family, it seemed that there was still a lot to talk about. There was a dedicated thread for all topics Rhodes related, and the last message was posted only about ten minutes ago. Out of all the stuff that piled up during the last three years, she compiled only the posts that required a VVIP clearance to read and carefully went through them. But, very little contained anything useful to her, if any. TSK, my eyes rotted for no reason. Hazeline logged off, after finding nothing useful. I've had to change a bit with the element resistance potion's name. The raw kept on saying which literally means innate natural resistance and I was planning to go with that. Then I read a bit further and there was the mention of fire ice based attacks and this potion raises resistance towards those, so I figured calling it element resistance sounded a bit better, a bit more game why, if you will. Chapter, 18 Located on the island of Sebit, the famous Hyenwall auction house was considered as one of the world's best and consequently, the auctioned items were of equally high quality as well. They only dealt with rare loot dropped by the monsters defeated by the knight's orders based around Seoul they also selected only the uniquely named branded goods out of all the equipment submitted by various smithies around the country. TL, the author used the term in this sentence. Lit. Means named products luxury goods, etc. Thinking back to Zenobi's gauntlet from one of the previous chapters, I decided to go with branded goods until I can come up with a better alternative. Which remains to be seen oh well. It had been five years since Hazeline's last visit to this Hyenwall auction house. She didn't feel all that much different, however. If anything, she felt like swearing out aloud thinking about how she'd have to tolerate all these people and all that noise they would make. It's still the same useless showing off of wealth. TL, author lit. Said useless money party. Just like a party on a boat, there were plenty of colorful lights brightening up the night sky up above the auction house building built on the island. We welcome you to Hyenwall Auction House. An employee bent his back to greet Hazeline. Every employee working in the Hyenwall Auction House possessed quick wits, fast enough to easily determine the high value of the robe Hazeline was wearing. As soon as Hazeline handed over her VIP ticket, she received a mini computer and a numbered card from an employee behind the counter. The number on it was 77. It was a number that made her feel somewhat confident. Happy at this lucky occurrence, she walked into the auction premise. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Can you hear me? She spoke softly to S.A.E. Jean who was listening from somewhere via the bracelet on her left wrist. Ten seconds of silence later, he replied back. Yes, I can hear you well. I've just arrived at the auction house. The auction itself should end in about three to four hours, and the exchange of ownership will take place tomorrow I will give you the certificate of transfer as you need to come in person to collect the item. As we've spoke before, that is something I can't do. The werewolf's mana stone was the item put forth by the Raven Knight's order. Even if Hyenwall was commissioned to hold the auction for the items, during the transfer of ownership, the seller sometimes a representative and the buyer had to meet face to face. And she could easily guess who the Raven Knight's order will send out as their representative. One of only 41 highest tier ranked knights in South Korea, Kim Yurin. Hazeline would rather kill herself if it meant seeing that woman's face. No, scratch that, if the two of them did meet, then one of them would die, for sure. Although she wanted to help Asae Jean out, they've only met three times. She wasn't willing to brave that kind of danger for him. 
The time the process won't take long, yes. Yes. It'll take an hour, max. Since I'll make the payment today, you can simply pitch up in two days' time and fetch the item. At Heinwall Auction House, if one wanted to bid for an item, then that person must possess, on their persons, at least half of the bidding amount, and also must make the full payment within four days of the successful bidding attempt. It was a quite strict policy, but it couldn't be helped as Heinwall placed trust and speedy resolutions as their utmost priority. Understood. Hazeline could sense the hidden unhappiness in S.A.E. Jean's voice even from here. She was curious as to why he put so much emphasis on time but in the end, she simply told him to wait for her and ended the call. Humph. Hazeline carefully minded her robe from folding up and sat down on her designated VIP seat. Soon after, people wearing luxurious formal suits or clothing-style armors noisily entered and rapidly filled up the interior. The auction finally commenced just as Hazeline's head was getting dizzy from all the people present here. Ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you. The announcer with a chiseled good looks greeted the participating audience. Then he lightly introduced the lot on offer for today and without further ado, commenced with the auction proper. Introducing our first item the Dominique's necklace. This is a wonderful necklace said to help with the wearer's mana circulation. TL, I swear, I didn't misspell the name on purpose. Normally, when a piece of equipment has its maker's name attached to it, or have its own unique name, then that item was considered as branded goods. The naming of an equipment was actually set in stone by law and had to follow a certain guideline. Didn't matter whether it was handmade or mass manufactured, if the government agency didn't acknowledge it, then the equipment's name had to include its base material and its category. For example SAE Jean's weapon, the steel mace. If the smith improved his or her skill and became an apprentice, then he or she could add modifiers to the names of the items such as, unbreakable or strong. Next up was the artisan. At the level of an artisan, the government would allow more leeway when naming the items so, an artisan could attach his or her name to the items, just like the Dominique's necklace from before. And finally, master. After climbing the summit of equipment refinement and manufacture, he or she would receive the title of a master craftsman from the government. And could also grab hold of the greatest honor of legally being allowed to name their items any way they see fit. The master craftsman, with this honor bestowed onto them, faced no restrictions in naming their products, so stuff made by these people often came with names that had basically nothing to do with their intended purposes. Examples included things like Call of the Tybeek or the Ideal of Rhodes. With naming senses like these, it was no wonder that there was a rumor floating around, of masters burdened by peer pressure frequenting certain consultancies specializing in finding the perfect names. That's a good item. Necklaces that aided the mana circulation were hard to come by. It was quite likely the maker, Dominique, would rise from the position of an artisan to a master in the near future. However, that was of no concern to Hazeline right now. She spent the time fighting off her heavy eyelids, while yawning sporadically. And this lot is the item brought to us by Korea's best knight's order, Raven the Werewolf's Mana Crystal. TL, the author suddenly started calling the mana stone a crystal here. Hmm, a typo. Finally. The item she was waiting for had made its entrance. A mana stone that was shaped like a wolf walking on four legs, and colored in the shade of deep gray. Mana stones rated upper mid-tier had such defining characteristics. Mana stones accumulated in the hearts of the monsters resembled the appearances of their hosts. A werewolf is well known as a rare monster, and it is believed this was the very first time it had appeared in South Korea. The auctioneer broke the ice with a well-known fact. Several collectors got ready to place their bids, their eyes focusing on the jewel-like mana stone. Hazeline also took a glance at her personal bank balance and checked the amount there. After quitting the life of a wizard and an alchemist, she kept most of her assets as hard cash, so she did have enough of an arsenal for this task 5. 4 million US. Fool. He will pay it back, right? Even though she promised to help him out a week ago, but now, at the thought of spending this hard-earned wealth of hers, uncertainty and worries invaded her mind ever so slightly. He wouldn't skip town after getting the mana stone now, would he? The opening bid is set at 45,000, US. 
the bid increments will be fixed at 1,000. Ah. First, the gentleman bidder, number 30. 46,000. The bidding had begun. An overweight human, a Sioux with a pair of animal ears on top of his head, even an elf wizard holding a magic staff. All these people, and more, began the intense bidding war just for the privilege of taking this man a stone home. 450,000, 900,000, 1 million, 1. 3 million, 2. 6 million. The bidding price instantly shot up towards the expected maximum amount without taking a single break. Number 48, the beautiful elf wizard has put forward for. 1 million. The mana stone could give her inspirations when practicing magic, so it's an excellent choice. And so, the final plateau had come. The elf wizard that called the amount of four. One million carried a victorious expression on her face. Is there any other competing bids? The werewolf's mana stone with near unlimited potential uses. You may never know, you could gain enormous power of the werewolf from it. The auctioneer spouted a load of bull CP. Hazeline could only chuckle at his audacity. She was still feeling somewhat regretful at the fact that she had to spend more than half of her wealth to buy a totally worthless trinket. But for the sake of a personal connection, it had to be done. Three times, I shall call for three more times. Four. One million. As soon as those words came out, Hazeline got ready to submit the bid of four. Two million. Four. One million. Is there no other bids? This is the final call. But she changed her mind at the last second. Oh, oh. Number 77, a mysterious lady with four. Five million. The auction hall grew noisy, and Hazeline grinned deeply. I've got my pride as an elf, so how can I waste time raising my bid by only 100,000? I've deposited the money. Yes, thank you very much. We've confirmed the payment. Behind the auction stage, Hazeline was conversing with the agent from the auction house regarding the item she had bought. Two days. Please set the schedule for two days later. Oh, and also provide me with a certificate of transfer as well. A certificate of transfer? Yes. It's a gift for someone. Hazeline spoke as if it was nothing much. Although it was a debt and not a gift, but still, calling it as such made her appear more wealthy. A woman making a four. Five million gift, what a cool person. Oh of course. We understand. The agent nodded his head and summoned the employees. S.A.E. Jean wetted his dried lips as he exited the Seoul station under the bright glare of the sunny afternoon and climbed aboard the pre-booked taxi. From the Seoul station to Sebet Island, ten minutes of ride in the high-class taxi that burned mana as fuel. As soon as he disembarked in front of the Hyenwall auction house, the security guards there blocked the robe-wearing S.A.E. Jean's path after thinking that he was a suspicious person. I'm here to collect the item bought in the auction. The promise time was 1.10 p.m. Currently, it was 1.05 p.m. After checking out his certificate of transfer, the security guards guided S.A.E. Jean in a respectful manner. He was brought to the front of an elevator used exclusively by VIPs, and as he waited, a sales agent approached his side and while smiling she entered the lift alongside him. Are you an alchemist? Wizards usually didn't hide their faces with robes. She asked him out of respect, but S.A.E. Jean didn't reply back. He simply waited stiffly for the elevator to take him to his destination as quickly as possible. When he coldly didn't react to her, she became abashed and her ears and tail stood straight up. A tail, because she was a canine-type Suin. T.L., a Suin is a beast man. Today's weather is nice, yes. It's the middle of a winter but it's like an early summer day. I wonder if something's going to happen. She bravely continued to chat him up despite the risk of offending him. The sole reason for her behavior was that, she was a canine type Suin. The ideal type of mates for a canine type Suin who possessed a powerful sense of smell, was a man with a nice body odor. And with his passive skill active, the scent spreading out from S.A.E. Jean's body was as incomparably manly as it could get. It's really nice. A wolf. Yes, it was a scent of a wolf. 
making sure she wasn't seen, she sniffed the air and her face softly reddened at the seductive aroma. Ting. But the cruel elevator had arrived at the top floor for the VIP guests already. The sales agent regretfully watched SAE Jean's back as he walked away. Wow. The spotless, polished marble floor till lights reflected off the expansive view out the window showing the Han River and the beauty of soul and azure shade dyeing the interior blue to confuse the senses as if one was walking in the sky this stunning space was the VIP-only sky lounge of the Hyenwall Auction House. Where no regular folk could ever hope to enter in their entire lifetimes. Looks like you've arrived. As SAE Jean stepped on the marble floor with a dazed face, having forgotten about his urgent lack of time, a soft yet righteous voice came to him from somewhere. Hello there. I'm Kim Yurin, a knight ranked highest tier, from the Raven Knights Order. It was Kim Yurin. Completely opposite of when she was talking to the goblin version of SAE Jean, she maintained a cold, expressionless face as she offered her hand. Ah. Yes, how do you do? For SAE Jean, it was their second meeting. But for Yurin, it was her first. Whatever the case may have been, the two people faced each other and shook hands. Chapter, 19 Please confirm that it is the right item. Kim Yurin was still beautiful. Subtly different from back when she was lively and refreshing though, he still found her current robotic and cold mannerisms just as alluring as before. Here it is. Kim Yurin handed the briefcase containing the mana crystal over to SAE Jean. From the slight opening, the light shone from the mana stone. SAE Jean spoke while giving her the certificate of transfer. TL, no, I didn't make a mistake here. The author again said mana crystal in the raw, then reverted back to stone in the very next sentence. Thank you very much. One more handshake followed that. Their business-like conduct really suited the claim of this meeting being their very first. Their focus was solely on getting the official business completed, leaving a very little gap for anyone else to be in. Still, Kim Yurin found the attitude of SAE Jean quite agreeable as he showed no ulterior motives towards her. Ah. Well then, you two. Shall we go somewhere and have a nice meal together? Suddenly, the Hyenwall Auction House's director spoke after observing the duo for a while. His suggestion wasn't really a necessary procedure to follow, where the auction house's director takes both the seller and the bidder out for a meal after a successful transaction. Most of the time, it was requested by the buyer, and seller refusing the invitation would be seen as being disrespectful. One could argue that truthfully, the chance to have this meal was one of the reasons why the final hammer price of the mana crystal exceeded the maximum expected amount of 3. 5 million. A chance of having a meal together with Kim Yurin would be of quite a worth, after all. If that's the case, shall we go? I know a good restaurant frequented by our knight's order. At this suggestion, Kim Yurin assumed a polite smile and tried to guide SAE Jean. But, against all expectation, SAE Jean shook his head. Is it possible to delay the meal for a later date? I'm currently running short on time. Kim Yurin's body stopped dead still in her trek towards the elevator. S.A.E. Jean couldn't see it, but her face was strangely distorted at that moment. A profession that was busier than a highest-tier knight would be rather difficult to find. She worked hard to straighten her face and turned around to stare at the lower half of his face before opening her mouth. Because of the robe's hood pulled low, she could only see his face's lower half. I apologize, but if it's not today, then I won't have enough time as well. Another date is a little. If that's the case, then let us forget about the meal. Apologies, for my lack of time. S.A.E. Jean was adamant in his position. In that moment as she was opening her mouth to say something, S.A.E. Jean had already walked past her and was entering the elevator. W. Wait a moment. As she was being flustered after receiving this strange indifference for the very first time in her life, the elevator doors were already closing. Wow. Miss Yurin, you just got rejected, right? The junior knights around her spoke in a shocked tone. They weren't mocking her, but rather, they seemed to be genuinely surprised as well. But Yurin dazedly watched for a long time the elevator that had now arrived back down to the first floor, unable to even make a retort. Take me to the Seoul station. 
SAE Jean checked the remaining time after he boarded a taxi. Around 70 minutes. Thankfully, there was enough breathing room left. Sighing out in relief, he again confirmed that the mana stone was carefully housed inside the briefcase. A thick smile automatically spread on his lips. As soon as he arrives back at the cave in Kongwan province, he'd absorb this mana stone and wait in leisure for the evolution to occur. But that kind of relaxed thought couldn't last for long. Kwa Heng. First, there was an ear-busting explosion of noise, and right after, an enormous vibration shook the car's frame. This unidentifiable event made SAE Jean's body float up, and when he came to, he found himself thrown out of the taxi. Oh, SHT. Through the hazy view, he could see cruelly twisted wrecks of cars and debris littering the asphalt. Suppressing the pain from his head and ribs, SAE Jean confirmed the status of the item in his arms fortunately, the mana stone was intact. Kayahak Kayahak Kayahak. A wicked cackle dominated his ringing ears. He followed the sound back to its origin, and looked past the twisted wreckage of the car. Wings of a bat on its back, its looks reminiscent of a miniature devil, a monster called Gargoyle was there. This BD mindlessly slammed its body against a poor taxi and totally crushed it. Cook. SAE Jean's body trembled as he stood up. As he began to think why on earth a gargoyle had shown up in the middle of a city, a completely unrealistic sight a hundred times worse than that was unfolding before his eyes. And that was the countless hordes of monsters. There were monsters in the sky and on the streets. From the ragtag groups of monsters such as orcs and skeleton soldiers, to a wyvern slicing up the air and blocking the sunlight with its massive body, and even ogres that violently shook the earth every time they took a step forward. All of this was unfolding in less than three minutes. Unable to differentiate whether this was still the capital of Korea, Seoul, or a monster field from this unfolding spectacle, SAE Jean momentarily stood there, his mouth hanging loose in a daze. A monster outbreak, first level alert. All citizens must evacuate the area. The knight's orders will arrive shortly. SAE Jean woke up from his stupor thanks to the automated alert coming from somewhere. Only then, did he realize that the gargoyle was staring daggers at him. With those full moon-like gray eyes. He didn't show any further reaction, but slid his hand slowly inside the briefcase. A gargoyle was a shrewd and cruel monster. He heard that due to its abundant curiosity, this monster was known to play around with its human victims. Kaya. S. Save me. Mommy. At the sudden outbreak of these monsters' assault, the surroundings had rapidly deteriorated past the level of purgatory, and now resembled hell. Wrecked cars exploded and flames rose up from the spot, dyeing the world crimson. Buildings were collapsing, and a child was crying out in terror after losing the sight of its parents. Kiruek. But the gargoyle focused its stares only on SAE Jean. Seeing its slightly crooked leer, he could tell it was now regarding him as it's a plaything. A gargoyle was a mid-tier ranked monster. Although it wasn't because of its physical strength, but rather, due to its sneaky characteristics that favored setting up traps and such, but gargoyles participating in an outbreak would have its stats boosted to one level higher. It was hopelessly impossible for SAE Jean of now to defeat this thing. SAE Jean's hand that was soaked in sweat blindly stumbled around inside the case until he could feel what he was looking for. It was hard and cold the werewolf's mana stone. Will you absorb the mana stone of a upper mid-tier werewolf? Yes no warning, currently, this monster is much stronger than the host. Weeek. At the same as the message window popped up into his view, the gargoyle flapped its wings and took flight. There was that warning, but he couldn't think too deeply about it. Gritting his teeth, he pressed yes. Synchronizing with the ebony wolf form, the absorption of the werewolf's mana stone has commenced. During the process of absorption, it is not possible to change to other forms. And in that moment, SAE Jean could only open his eyes abruptly. Kirk. An incredible pain. From all over his body, bones began growing uncontrollably, tearing his flesh and internal organs apart. This indescribable pain, comparable to being pierced by a steel pipe dozens of times in a single second. Tears of blood dripped out from the corners of his reddened eyes and the mixture of spit and blood spewed out from his loosely hanging mouth. 
Keek. At the sight of a man that looked like he was committing suicide, the gargoyle tilted its head and came in closer. Guttural groan in pain. All over his body, bones repeatedly stretched then tore out of his flesh before retracting back. The sight of him vomiting out a bucket of blood with a pained whimper every time that happened was enough to make the gargoyle break out in a grin. Keek keek keek. The gargoyle slowly flew up and landed on S.A.E. Jean's back after he collapsed on the asphalt. It poked his head with its finger for a moment or two, then as if it found this amusing, the monster cackled again. Keek keek keek. Unfortunately, a gargoyle was a type of monster that got bored rather easily. The ugly creature raised its sharp claws with a smile on its face after having instantly lost all interest in him. The claw that could easily rip apart a person's body like cutting a radish gleamed icily. The BD's weapon was raised high in the air. And S.A.E. Jean's head would soon be split clean open by those ugly claws. The absorption has been partially completed. From now on, Beast Mode can be utilized. Beast Mode will automatically activate and the host's life is in danger. It was also at this time when S.A.E. Jean's eyes glowed in deep yellow. Right when the claw reflecting the sunlight descended down on his head. The claw seemed very slow. Also, it looked weak, as if it just might break into pieces after he shook it around a couple of times. Maybe, this was what a predator must have felt looking at its prey. S.A.E. Jean lightly swung one of his arms and threw the creature away. Massive noise of destruction. But the end result couldn't be called light at all. The claws of Gargoyle did break apart and scattered in the air, and its body was flung away into distance with a loud, explosive noise as if it was exploding drum barrel. Heavy breathing. Only then, did the flow of time restore back to normal S.A.E. Jean tried to grasp his boiling heart as he heavily breathed in and out. Unfortunately for him, the idea of feeling relieved was as distant as it could possibly get. What the? His hands had become larger and sharper like that of a beast, and his body was being covered in fur. A tail was coming out of his rear, his jaws were extending, and his teeth were becoming more horrifying. S.A.E. Jean dazedly stared at his hand, now covered in black fur. This was the appearance of the werewolf in the beast mode. He hurriedly scanned his surroundings. Fortunately, in this hellhole there wasn't anyone with enough leeway to pay attention to his sudden transformation. The human form. Why can't I change back to the human form? That was his first question. Why was he now in the form of bipedal beast, instead of a human? Thankfully, the friendly system solved that quandary for him. Until the mana stone absorption is completed, the human form will not be available to the host. Right after that message, countless other alert windows swarmed in front of his eyes, enough to block the entirety of his view. Condition complete, the heart of a beast. The host has absorbed the mana stone of the mighty werewolf into his heart. All stats rise by 15. When the absorption reaches 100%, in the ebony wolf form the host can activate deactivate either the beast mode or the human mode. Not possible to change to other forms until the absorption is complete. Acquired Passive Skills Flesh of a Beast, High Strength Claws and Predator Passive Skill Flesh of a Beast Skill Proficiency Level, F The flesh is strengthened, and small amount of damage from magic is negated. The wounds on the body heal rapidly through the body's excellent resilience. The host can freely manipulate the flow of his blood as well as a target's. However, a part of the host's body, such as claws or fangs, must be in contact with the target's bloodstream. During the human form, the effects of the skill will be decreased. Passive Skill High Strength Wolf's Claws Skill Proficiency Level, F. The claws of a wolf that boast the strength and hardness of steel. When the skill level is raised, the corporeal, incorporeal and even aura can be exterminated. Passive Skill Predator Skill Proficiency Level, F. The host will grow stronger the more enemies the host eliminates. When a stronger enemy is killed, the rate of growth will be greater. The prey can feel fear towards the predator and could surrender wish to submit under the rule of the host. Too bad, there just wasn't enough time for him to sit down and properly go through all these messages. Take the ogre first. Leave the wyvern to the highest tier knight. Knights were already approaching this place. 
S.A.E. Jean hid from their eyes and moved as stealthily as possible. Chapter 20 The only difference between an ebony wolf and a werewolf, not taking into account the gap in strength, was that a werewolf could assume either a beast's appearance or that of a human being. Although nominally he was still in his ebony wolf form, but on the outer appearance alone, it'd be more correct to call him a werewolf now, instead. The absorption is still in progress. Impossible to change to a beast form. S.A.E. Jean gritted his teeth hard. His current form, a bipedal wolf beast, werewolf, was just too DNI catching. That's why he wanted to change into something that moved on four legs but even that was impossible. Make one mistake, and I'm dead. Right now, he was without a doubt, a monster. He was the no. One target for extermination by the knights or even the hunters. S.A.E. Jean lowered his body as much as possible and also used his arms as well to move. Thankfully, his exemplary sense of smell helped him to find back alleys with no knights or hunters present. Plus, an ebony wolf was very much specialized in being stealthy. No matter how stuck he was in this beast mode, the people busy fleeing the scene couldn't sense his movements that had blended into the shadows. Breaths a sigh of relief, animal style. After walking for a while, S.A.E. Jean sensed that he had escaped the initial bloody battlefield between monsters and knights and let out a breath of relief. But the surrounding situation still wasn't really safe just because there weren't any knights nearby. Low-tier and mid-tier monsters were attacking buildings, or were busy killing citizens while mowing down the boardwalks. A monster fell on top of a car parked inside a damaged building, and the flames erupted from the exploding car. A child fell over as the explosion nearly engulfed her. But S.A.E. Jean couldn't do a thing. For his own survival, he had to disregard everything and run. In other words, he had to disregard the child's cries entering his ears. Mommy. S. Suyong. At the child's cries, the mother's voice called back. The face of a woman who must have been the mother was dyed black. And there were debris from the building falling on top of this child who was collapsed on the street with her legs bruised. He didn't hesitate for long. His legs moved first. He used the whirlwind dash. Covering the distance of more than 500 meters in a single breath, S.A.E. Jean hugged the child in a protective embrace. Immediately after, a terrifying amount of building materials and steel beams crashed down on them. The mother's tear-soaked scream tore through the air. Doesn't hurt. As expected, the body of the ebony wolf in beast mode was sturdy. He couldn't see because of being under a tone of rubble, but otherwise, he could feel zero pain. He quickly confirmed the safety of the sniffling child within his embrace. Then, he deeply extended an arm and powerfully swung it. Quahang. The hill of rubble weighing down on the beast's back was scattered into the air. Su Yung Eek. The first person he saw was the child's mother. She was holding a baby in one hand while approaching closer to save her other kid. Unfortunately, there was a single beast that completely filled up her sight. A big body that easily exceeded two meters in height and a wolf's head that proudly displayed its scary fangs. Although it was covered in black fur, that fur couldn't hide all those intimidating muscles of the beast. The woman retreated back from the fear-inducing form before falling down on her BT. But within the arms of that horrifying beast was her daughter. She found a sliver of courage and tried very hard to stand up on her two trembling legs. KRNNG. Hayak. However, the beast moved first. The woman screamed out in fright but the beast simply walked in a thumping footsteps and put the girl down in front of her. Unable to figure out what just happened, she glanced back and forth at her child and at the beast before finally understanding the situation, then she hugged little girl tightly. 500 meters, northward. Numerous strong humans. S.A.E. Jean couldn't just watch this scene of reunion relaxedly. Knights that had quickly subjugated the monsters were moving out from the origin of the outbreak and were starting to sweep the outer perimeters of Seoul. He rolled his legs and rapidly vacated out of there. This eh? The woman raised her head wondering whether she should thank the strange beast or not, but like a mirage on a summer day, the wolf beast was already long gone. The military cordoned off a section of Seoul in order to mitigate the damage from the monster outbreak. 
S.A.E. Jean could understand this fact without much difficulty by the faint whiff of firearms in the air, and so, instead of trying to leave Seoul, he decided to hide somewhere until the absorption of the mana stone was completed. As he was stealthily roaming around the city of Seoul, he found the entrance to the sewers by chance and hid himself in there. I feel like dying. S.A.E. Jean lied down on the wet stone floor and breathed heavily. He could more or less tolerate the depressing atmosphere draped in darkness and the eerie, moist air. But he just couldn't handle the rotting smell. And maybe because of the side effects of the absorption, the strangely cold temperature was also proving to be rather difficult to tolerate. His eyes closed bit by bit. It was dangerous to fall asleep as someone could find him. But the sleepiness, caused by the side effects of the absorption, easily defeated his worries. Since they are too busy exterminating monsters, so hopefully they wouldn't think of coming down to the sewers. Hoping this was true, S.A.E. Jean slowly fell into slumber. A fissure appearing near a nameless church located in the suburbs of Banpo burst open before it could be erased, and this event caused a great disturbance in Seoul. As the credit rating of the Republic of Korea is expected to suffer from the first monster outbreak in five years. The citizens are bitterly voicing out whether the Knight's orders, who were caught unprepared by the fissure bursting open, are to be blamed for this. Pay no attention to that. Right now, after subduing the monster outbreak to some degree, tired and injured knights were taking breaks by lying or sitting down on the grounds. The highest tier knight Kim Yurin consoled a worried subordinate knight as he was watching the news. It's always the same story after monsters attack a city, right? Even though it might be tough this time, don't get too discouraged as it's not our fault anyway. It's not our fault but the private security corporations that neglected the repairs and maintenance of the fissure detection equipment, added Yurin in her head, her face crumpled in irritation at these thoughts. Originally, it was left to Knight's orders to monitor the monsters and possible appearances of the fissures. However, the government took away and handed the responsibilities over to several private security companies after someone argued nonsensically that the burden placed on Knight's orders trying to manage such a high-tech department as well would be too much for them to handle. Truthfully, it was responsibilities only in name, as, in all honesty, it was all very unfair type of a deal where they only cared about profits and the real responsibilities were dumped on the Knight's Order's doorsteps. Since it was the Knight's Orders that got blamed if monsters rampaged around, like today, even though it was those f***ing bastards that were getting paid to monitor the fissures. Yes. She left behind the still depressed subordinate and headed towards the temporary medical facility set up to house the injured people. But the mood in that place was weird. Of course, there being no horrific injuries like someone losing a limb or something similar like that played a part, but at the moment. Knights were huddled together in one spot and were busy making strange faces while watching the hologram projection from a mobile phone. Their expressions were full of surprise and riddle. What are you all doing? Many people lost their lives and the amount of property damage was difficult to quantify. Of course, that didn't mean everyone should observe the sorrowful mood religiously, but still, that kind of behavior was unfitting of the current situation. Huh. Oh, hello there. The knights hurriedly switched off the projection and greeted her after recognizing her face. The knights gathered here were not from the same orders but would unite under one banner, the country, and act together in case of an emergency. So every knight with lower ranking than Yurin had to show her respect even if they were not from the same order. You don't have to bow your waist that much since you're injured. I'm simply asking you because I'm curious. What were you all watching just now? At Yurin's words, the instigator who showed the projections to other knights, a male mid-tier knight from the Raven Order, Yi Suhan answered back hesitantly. There was a strange news coming out during the evacuation of civilians, so. What news? Ah, uh, well, it's just that. Um, Miss Yurin. I'm asking this just in case but we really did kill that werewolf, didn't we? Yurin's face crumpled. What the hell was this guy even saying? Of course. Where did that werewolf's mana stone come from, otherwise? Right? But, the thing is looks like there's another werewolf out there. A citizen took a picture. Even if it's an emergency situation, there's always someone out there filming stuff. Somehow, we convinced him not to upload the footage to SNS for the time being, but please take a look. 
Yi Su Han continued with his words as the hologram was projected from the mobile phone. Here's the images of the werewolf but seriously, it's really unbelievable. A werewolf is supposedly a rare monster, right? But the thing's even more strange this time around. The first image shown was the fallen rubble from a building piled up on the ground while a woman was screaming her head out in front of it. Kim Yurin saw this horrifying scene and angrily admonished the subordinate knight for having a poor taste, but Yi Su Han, while sweating heavily, pleaded with her to check out the following image. Ha! Huh. It was as he said before. The next image was so unrealistic, she had to wonder whether it was photoshopped or something. With a loud explosion, the rubble flew up in the air, and from there two life forms appeared. One was a beast, while the other was small child with her eyes squeezed shut in its arms. It's strange, right? It looks like the werewolf was protecting the child. There's an even clearer recording, too. Since this area was a bit farther away from the original monster outbreak spot, a few CCTV cameras managed to survive the chaos. Yi Su Han then played the recordings from the CCTV cameras, and Kim Yurin watched them all with a totally dazed expression. The falling building material on top of the kid. A black life form moving so fast, leaving only an indistinct blur on the footage. It was for certain. That werewolf definitely jumped in among the falling rubble with an intention to save. I showed this to a handful of Suin knights, and their reactions aren't no laughing matter. They are raising a ruckus, saying this could be the legendary lycanthrope. Obviously, it's all empty bitchings, though. Ah, I wasn't swearing it was really a bitch. They were canine-type suins. TL, this guy here made a pun, which is somewhat lost in translation. I tried my best to preserve the attempted joke but oh, well. At his words, Yurin nodded her head in agreement. Lycanthropes didn't migrate to Earth. Back on the other world, they were the race that received treatments ranging from being shunned to even being subjected to extermination. And now, they would remain simply as creatures of legends, or even from a myth. It is rather strange, sure. But now isn't the time to watch something like this. Before I confiscate that phone, put it down and concentrate on healing your injuries. And it'd be bothersome if mass media learns of this information, so you better check your mouth, too. Ah, that I believe it's better to let the media know about this. What rubbish are you spewing now? Kim Yurin frowned and glared at the man. I mean, it's not our fault anyway but we still have to swallow lots of ill will. So why not circulate this footage to mass media and take the attention away from us? The grieving for the victims can come later KHM. I'm truly sorry. As he was about to carry on with his words, Yi Su Han finally noticed that her expressions were steadily getting darker so he quickly lowered his head. Better learn to filter your mouth more carefully. After spitting out the threatening words of warning, she turned on her heels and headed elsewhere. Inside the dark and dank sewers where not a ray of light existed. Kim Sae Jean opened his eyes after getting a whiff of humans. 300 meters, northward. One human, one Suin. At that moment. His half-awakened consciousness felt the coldness. He quickly checked the current situation of his body. There was a lot of fur. He was still in the beast mode, but his fears were assuaged as soon as a new message window popped up. The absorption has been completed. The active skill beast mode human mode has been acquired. It's possible to change forms from now on. Beast mode human mode growth level, F. Can change between the beast mode and the human mode in the wolf form. Beast mode, body changes to a werewolf, all stats related to the ebony wolf form will be increased three times during this mode. Human mode, body changes to a human, all stats related to the ebony wolf form will not be reduced during this mode. Calculated from the current energy manipulation stat, the skill beast mode human mode, can be sustained up to 450 minutes per 24 hours. Stats Physical Strength 134 Endurance 133 Agility 175 Energy Manipulation 30 Mana Affinity 20 Magic Strength 20 Luck 7 As soon as the messages rose, SAE Gene quickly activated the human mode. But there was a problem. 
The difference between the human Kim SAE gene and Kim SAE gene the ebony wolf activating the human mode was not small at all. His height must have grown, judging by his eye level being higher than before, and the muscles on his body at a glance look like he's been pumping irons all his life, and his junior down there was now the size of a mace. Who goes there? Out of the blue, a man's shout and the chilly sensation of an ultra-sharp mana were directed at his location. I'm a human. S.A.E. Jean replied quickly. And at his voice, knights rapidly approached him. Oh, my. In front of S.A.E. Jean, two knights, one male and the other a female, was studying his appearance. I escaped from monsters and hid down here. I took my clothes off after they caught on fire. After hearing his excuses, the male knight turned around as if he was unhappy about something, while the female knight continued to observe his body with her face totally red. She covered her face with both of her hands as if to imply she was embarrassed, but actually, both of her eyes were busy peeking out from between her fingers. And her observation continued a while longer until the male knight finally told her to stop it. Chapter, 21 After receiving the aid of those two knights, S.A.E. Jean was able to safely leave the sewers. Oh, so your profession is a hunter. However, a slightly irritating problem had developed. Although he wasn't particularly hurt anywhere, the female knight still dragged him to an emergency ward, and after placing him in one of the sick beds. She plopped down next to him and began asking an endless stream of questions while her black-spotted yellow ears atop her head busily twitched this way and that. Yes. Since he wanted to leave as soon as possible, he kept his answers brief, but this woman showed no signs of giving up at all. She even came real close to his side and openly started sniffing him out. As expected, it was his nice body odor causing the problem. To a Sue in that desired a pleasant body scent over that of good looks, the aroma of a wolf would probably be no different than an irresistible pheromone. So that's how it is. I happen to be a mid-tier knight, you know. On top of that, I'm a person with an excellent future prospect, too. And my annual salary is pretty high, as well he hee. We should go out hunting together sometime. I'm a leopard type, I'll have you know. I'm really fast and sturdy. Quang she made an adorable roar and tried very hard to get into S.A.E. Jean's good books. Honestly speaking, he didn't feel bad at all. No, he felt rather freaking great. Because, this lady knight was a stunner. Contrary to her sharp, leopard-like facial features, her actions were cute like a puppy dog's and that helped a lot with how he was feeling right now. Ah. Uh, you just smiled. That means you'll go out with me, right? We are, right? You won't regret it. I'll help you raise your ranks by a couple of tears in no time. Ahaha, uh -huh, no, I'm. As they conversed, the atmosphere bloomed in pink color, but out of nowhere a proverbial dark cloud loomed over their heads. And that was the other male knight who found S.A.E. Jean. His face convulsing intermittently, he spoke in a tone that indicated how completely displeased he was at the moment. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. What is it that you want now? The male knight definitely called for S.A.E. Jean but it was the woman who replied instead in a prickly manner, blocking him at the same time. You, go away. Mr. S.A.E. Jean, you are feeling okay, no? Unfortunately, there are a lot of other injured civilians crying out in pain as we speak. If you are okay, then. What do you mean, he's okay? Can't you see he's suffered a lot? Even his clothes got burnt. We don't know if he's suffering from some kind of emotional trauma right now. No freaking way. S.A.E. Jean chuckled in slight awkwardness as he raised his body. I'm fine. Since I'm okay, I should get going. There are promises I need to keep, too. Eh. Why? It's okay if you stayed a bit longer. Oh, that's right. She grabbed the rising shoulders of S.A.E. Jean and forcibly pushed him down on the bed. Then she shot the pestering male knight a sharp glare. But the dude was pretending to know nothing while whistling leisurely. No, Miss Knight, it's just that. It's Rosin. Call me in the form you feel most comfortable. Okay, Miss Rosin, I am thankful for everything you've done for me, but I really have to get going now. It was indeed pleasant to receive the undivided attention of a good woman. 
But, to a person like him that never experienced proper love all his life, such focus felt a bit foreign and uncomfortable, plus there was the restriction of time factoring in his mind as well. If, if that's the case, then please give me your phone number. Seeing his unshakable resolution, the flustered Miss Rosin grabbed hold of his collars and handed over her phone. TL, something like the image at the end of the chapter. S.A.E. Jean just couldn't find it in himself to refuse her on this one so he gave her the numbers and said his goodbye. Please, please let's go out on a hunt together later. Rosin sounded like she wanted to play online games with him and that made S.A.E. Jean chuckle softly. There was no meaning behind the smile, though. But her face remained deep shade of red as she longingly gazed his back. Ah. Oi, you wanna die? What the heck were you trying to pull? You pickin' a fight to death with me, a wild leopard, or something? As soon as S.A.E. Jean was far away, Rosin's face crumpled and began throwing sharp words at the male knight. But his lips arched slightly upwards as if he was satisfied about something. What are you on about? I was just following protocol. He wasn't even injured. Why should he take up a bed? You, today, you. For a while after that, she continued to spit out non-stop verbal insults at him. S.A.E. Jean walked past the emergency ward, scanning various injured civilians there. There was a guy with serious burns covering up his entire body, while another had slight bruising on the skin. And as he observed the injuries of the patients, a strange and painful sensation assaulted his eyes all of a sudden. Yuck. Leaking out a soft groan, he massaged his temples, while squeezing shut his eyes before opening them. Then, the world had changed. It was an illusion brought on by the scope of his eyesight widening to an unrealistic level. A normal person's field of view was 180 degrees. But S.A.E. Jean could see what was happening behind him as well. And the whole world seemed richer in hue and brighter too. The light from the bulb stung his eyes, and there were no longer any dark corners he couldn't see. He stopped moving and stood there like a rock and surveyed the surroundings until he caught a distant reflection of himself in the mirror mounted on a wall of the ward. The color of his eyes had changed to a hue of eerie golden shade. Condition complete, sense at least ten cases of negative aura at once while maintaining the ebony wolf form. Passive skill eyes of the wolf has been acquired. The host's eyesight has been widened and not affected by the obstruction from light. Also, the host will be able to discern what is normally invisible to naked eyes. It's possible to activate this skill during forms other than the ebony wolf form. It was another message saying that he had acquired a new skill. Discern what is normally invisible. His query was quickly answered. There were some sort of strange, ominous feeling strands of aura dancing above the moaning patients. There were so many colors blue, green, purple, red, even black. S.A.E. Jean was actually able to discern these strands of light, with different colors potentially denoting severity of each injury. As if he got possessed by a spirit or something, S.A.E. Jean approached one of the patients letting out this mysterious aura. He dazedly stared at this light strand before suddenly recalling a message he had read before. When the skill level is raised, the corporeal, incorporeal and even aura can be exterminated. If that was true. No, he was certain. The wolf's claw could cut away this illness as well. After nervously swallowing down his saliva, S.A.E. Jean placed his hand at the faintly rising aura and swiped at it with his nails. S.F.X. for slicing the air and fingers flailing around. But there was no change. Is my skill level too low? As if to match his thoughts, the system responded once more. The skill proficiency level is too low. Ha! Huh. He let out a groan of acceptance. That was when a nurse asked him if he was a relative of this patient S.A.E. Jean shook his head no, and then he left the emergency ward as if he was making a quick getaway. Until now, he could stay as a human for only two hours in a day but now, S.A.E. Jean found himself with a huge surplus of time. The first thing he did was to head to the one-room apartment he had rented on the outskirts of the city. For the last two months, he was far too busy living as a monster, so he couldn't even tell the landlord he was moving out. It's been a while. A single room in a shabby building, third floor, no. 302. Slightly overcome with nostalgia, S.A.E. Jean slowly stroked the metal gate. 
The place's only security feature was a number pad style door lock, not a fingerprint nor a retina scanner. Bip 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 bip. The door opened after he entered the four digit code, and he stepped over the door sill, entering the apartment. Ouch. He bumped his forehead on the low hanging upper frame of the metal gate. In the past, there was enough gap there to pass through the metal gate but now that his body had gotten sturdier, he didn't feel much pain. He lowered his head and entered the apartment. Sniff sniff. The condition of his place remained largely the same as the moment he left, but with the exception of dust that had settled down everywhere. Even though it had been empty for only two months, sense of a person living here had all disappeared without a trace now. Mm. As he was checking out his home, he spotted a blue light leaking out from his home phone, meaning there were recorded voice messages to listen to. Wondering just who could have left him messages, as something like this had never happened before, he soon thought of one reason for them. Hazeline. S.A.E. Jean was asleep for nearly three days inside the sewer, and when he asked for the date after waking up, he learned that already four days had passed by. Since there was no way he'd call someone during that time, the only possibility left was Hazeline calling him non-stop as he owed her a lot of money. Feeling apologetic, he quickly accessed the voice messages. There was a total of five recordings. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. This is Hazeline speaking. I was shocked to find out there was an incident of monster outbreak in Seoul. I perused the list of the deceased but didn't see your name on it. You must have made it out okay. When things have settled down, please give me a call. The first message was comparatively calm, and exactly twelve hours later, there was another one. Has everything settled down? I haven't heard from you yet. The reports say the incident is now more or less under control. I guess you're still busy. If you get this voice message, please call me. The next message was fourteen hours later, and her voice in the message was audibly trembling with worry. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Where are you? Let me come and see you. I think, maybe we need to meet and talk. Also, that mana stone was a lot more expensive than the initial estimates. It was over four. Five million. Even if you sell all the potions here, after deducting tax and other stuff, it's only about half of that amount. So, please ha, huh, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Please give me a call as soon as you hear this message. S.A.E. Jean listened to the next message as sweat drops formed on his forehead. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean. I hope you are not planning to run away using this outbreak as an excuse. I sincerely wish that you don't even think of entertaining such a foolish idea. You may not be aware of this, but I have a bit of fame in certain circles. Finding a single person isn't even a challenge for me. You even gave me your name, too. Wait a second, that is your real name, right? Wait, what if he gave me a fake name? Oh, no, that's why. I thought it was weird that an alchemist was giving away his name too easily full. I can still find you. No, I will find you. I will chase you down to the ends of this earth, no, even to hell itself. You better believe that. Now it was rage. Her voice itself was boiling with anger, and somewhere in the middle, there were several instances of pronunciation of words being messed up after she gritted her molars hard. S.A.E. Jean sighed weakly as he listened to the final message. Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Yesterday I was distraught with emotions so I couldn't help it. I'm sure you can understand where I'm coming from. If you think about how more than half of your fortune that you worked so hard to accumulate in your entire life just flying away. You wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You'd be angry and sad, wondering why your money had suddenly grew wings and flew away I feel like that. To me, past four days felt like three years. And you also know this, don't you? Dark elves don't easily trust banks so we mostly keep hard cash. Me, I don't have any other assets. You must not run away without repaying that debt. I've shed so much tears and blood earning that money. Please, please, just give me a call. Her heavy, Emotional voice became desperately tearful towards the end. As soon as the last message played out, S.A.E. Jean quickly called her. Hazeline answered the phone even before the first beep finished ringing. Hello. Ah, it's me. Wah. 
Hearing his voice, on the other side of the line Hazeline was letting out a long sigh of relief. She continuously mumbled thank God, oh thank God several times, so S.A.E. Jean started talking first. I'm truly sorry. As you have expected, I got embroiled in the outbreak. And I lost my mobile phone. That's why I ended up calling you so late. No, no, it's fine, it's all fine. No, I'm very thankful instead. Actually, I was expecting the worst, at least for about one year, to be honest, but you called me after only four days. Where are you now? Let us meet. Ah, uh, the thing is. At her suggestion, he studied the reflections of his face and body in the mirror for a moment. Kim Sae Jean in human form, and Kim Sae Jean in the Ebony Wolf's human mode seemed similar, but they were actually like two completely separate entities. The latter's face was similar to normal Sae Jean's, but there were different points as well. Firstly, the lines of his face were sharper, and the features were now better defined, too. To put it another way, his previous puppy dog like face had morphed into a keener, wolf like visage. Hell, even the human form SAE gene was different from the normal human SAE gene before the change. Maybe it was because of the sudden explosive increase in his stats, his bone mass and the overall body size also grew by a lot. Simply put, comparing the numbers of the human form and the human mode went like this. The human form Kim SAE gene was 179 centimeters tall, weight of 77 kilograms and the body in a pretty d in good shape. While the SAE gene in the human mode exceeded 189 centimeters in height and all of his 100 kilograms were mostly of muscles, making his body no different from a living weapon. There will be problems if we meet like this. Of course, since he always wore the hood over his head when he met her so his facial appearance wasn't a problem, but the issue was his hulking frame. Whatever mode he chose to go with, he became just too dn big. Let's meet up at a later date. How about a week from today? There is a potion I'm making right now. I can't vacate the private workshop as I am on the cusp of achieving success. Eh. Right now. What potion are you making? It's. He hesitated for a moment or two, before wetting his lips and replied to her. It's a potion to become taller. I'm sorry. Hazeline let out a shocked voice, and S.A.E. Jean ended up biting his lower lip. But it was too late now, no matter how ridiculous the lie sounded. He couldn't think of any other excuses. Since he didn't grow by just two, three centimeters, but seven for one and seventeen for the other. I'm telling you this just in case, but I will not sell this potion. No matter what happens. He decided to ignore the speechless Hazeline and just keep at it with a straight face. Chapter 22 Investigators are suspecting the involvement of vampires for the Fisher's eruption, after discovering numerous skeletal remains and bodies drained of blood at the abandoned church near the eruption's point of origin. With the first monster outbreak in nearly five years as well as the sudden appearance of vampires that hadn't been seen in recent times. The citizens are worried that T.L. had a real trouble with the word I literally have no idea what it means, other than that it's a church. Google says it's an old church. In the previous chapter, there was a mention of a nameless church, so I went with abandoned. Hope it's more or less accurate. In the middle of sorting out things to throw away and things to take with him, S.A.E. Jean's eyes were pulled towards the images coming out of an old TV. It was a news about the suspected reappearance of the vampires. He unconsciously held tighter the photo frame in his hand after seeing that news. It contained his one and only family photograph. Taken the day before he lost his mother, it was a memento now stuck in the boundary between nostalgia and an old, unhealed wound this faded photograph signified the final day of his childhood he had shared with her. When he thought back to that day, perhaps she must have sensed her own death approaching. That day, the one before what they packaged it as an unfortunate accident. He remembered her unusually bright, yet somehow, unusually sorrowful face. She took the photo with her young son and had the frame made, and in the following morning, she left home for work and never came back. Officially, at least, they said it was a car accident. But even in his young age, S.A.E. Jean suspected something was amiss. If it was indeed a car crash, then her body would not have been that clean, nor would she be that pale. 
when they were putting her inside the casket, she seemed to be in a deep, peaceful slumber instead. But whatever the case might have been, there was nothing he could do at that time. He was just a seven-year-old, recently orphaned kid back then. Since the government declared the war on vampires eighteen years ago, all vampires had temporarily hidden from the world, but this incident serves as a proof that they still operate in underground societies. S.A.E. Jean bit his lip without realizing it. They were just stinking bats, or maybe just trash, or something much worse than that, like pieces of excrement utterly devoid of any redeeming qualities whatsoever. Because they lived off human blood as their sole food source, vampires just could not coexist with the rest of humanity. Actually, it wasn't like humanity acted inconsiderately towards them not at all. But it was they who betrayed the mankind with a reasoning of animal blood is unfit. T.L. literally said animal blood is unclean. Thought that under the context, unfit sounded more correct. And now, those motherfucking bat bastards were acting up again. S.A.E. Jean clenched his fist and stared at his reflection in the mirror. The kid from fifteen years ago who only knew how to cry was not there anymore. Orcs were truly special monsters in that their individual ways of life were remarkably different depending on their rankings. Orcs and orc warriors found in the lowest to low-tier hunting grounds never formed packs. They lived lonely lives, only meeting others out of necessity to copulate and to proliferate. So, they didn't use any weapons, and if they did, it was only to the extent of wielding crude wooden things. But the story changed for orcs found in low-mid-tier hunting ground or higher. They were similar in a way to goblins in that these orcs gathered in large numbers to form villages, but the difference was that their roles had been clearly divided. Orc scouts with their quick feet, searching for the locations of drinkable water and sustenance orc warriors and orc jaguars for hunting according to the intel gathered by the scouts. Or to fight other monsters, knights and hunters or great warriors that safeguarded the village after having a crude experience and wisdom and the orc chieftain that governed the village itself. Hey, wait a sec, is that? Shoo. You're right. It's an orc village. Unfortunately, compared to the level of danger posed, an orc's remains didn't fetch a high price. Ignoring the rankings, a lone orc great warrior possessed enough power to fight evenly against a knight of at least an upper mid-tier ranking and above. But even then, the knight's orders would still raid the village of orcs with an unmatched madness. There was only one reason for this the orcs forge. Today's luck is pretty good. Mark the position in the GPS and let's vamoose, pronto. Okay. But dude, that's almost a mid-sized village, so how much would it be worth to them? Within an orc village, there existed several rudimentary smithies. One could say that the main job of orcs living in a village could very well be weaponsmiths, as they individually crafted their own weapons to use. That was the reason why the degree of weapons completion differed from an orc warrior, an orc jaguar and to a great orc warrior. However, as an orc smithing skills got better the higher its ranking was, those creatures living without a village down by the lowest and low tier hunting grounds. As well as those in the villages found within the low mid-tier hunting ground where the skill levels weren't as impressive, they did not garner much unwanted attention to themselves. I hear the boys at the Dawn Knights order pay the best last time, they paid plus minus 440k. But right now, the orc village these hunters were looking at were located in the mid-tier hunting ground. Weapons wielded by the orc jaguars were far superior than those made by the regular blacksmiths. And the stuff crafted by the likes of a great warrior or a chieftain would be comparable to those made by master craftsmen, or even exceed them in some cases. And so, the knight's orders raided the orc villages in order to acquire these weapons. Obviously, that was because quality weapons were very important to knights. Even more so, in the case of those possessing excellent magic strength. But it wasn't some selfish, simplistic reasoning of better weapons make you stronger. If a weapon's quality wasn't up to scratch compared to a knight's magic strength, then the weapon wouldn't be able to endure the strain and get destroyed instead. Currently, the number of knights ranked upper mid-tier or higher present in South Korea was around 2,500, but the weapons suitable for their levels were estimated to be less than 2,000. It meant that, every time 500 or so knights go out to battle monsters, they would end up being heavily injured after their weapons were rendered useless in the middle of the fight. 
It was not possible to import weapons from overseas either, since other countries were also under similar sort of situations as well. So, most knights' orders placed a fat reward mullah on finding orcs' forges. Especially the Dawn Knights' Order, as they were in quite a desperate position. They might be flush with cash, but somehow, found themselves urgently lacking in quality weapons. I finished marking it in GPS. Let's quickly. But there existed a definite reason why the knights' orders placed such high bounties on finding an orc's forge. Orcs living in the mid-tier hunting ground placed high importance on the safety of their villages, and could pick up on any minute disturbance as if they were equipped with a high-tech radar. Quora. The mountainside seemed to faintly tremble at the angry roar. That effing son of a. The two hunters ran hard without even glancing back once. That roar most likely would have been from a chieftain ordering other orcs around. If those orcs were chasing after them, then. Quam 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 quam. As expected, the foresight of upper mid-tier hunters proved to be correct. With dust clouds and weeds flying everywhere, four furious orcs leapt out of the village and began chasing them down. Unfortunately, since the hunters couldn't utilize mana, it was not possible to escape from their hot pursuit. TL, the author used a term to describe the state of the chasing orcs. It could mean agitated, boiling, etc., so I went with furious. Incidentally, Google said it stands for bro, bro. I lolled hard. Do not stop. The hunters never lost hope amidst this hopeless situation and continued to run hard, but it seemed the heavens had abandoned them as they ended up encountering an even bigger source of despair. Ha! Huh. That black shape in the tall grasses at first, it was blurry and hard to tell what its identity was. But as soon as they got close enough, hunters could see just what it was. It was the legendary creature that shouldn't be here the werewolf. The two hunters lost all strength in their legs and plummeted to the ground after seeing the bipedal wolf monster. What a serious bother. At the same time, S.A.E. Jean sighed out as he alternated his gaze between the two hunters squatting on the ground and the four chasing orc jaguars. He came here in a hurry after catching a thick smell of orcs, but once more, humans were getting in the way. As this was the mid-tier hunting ground, it seemed that hunters had invested a lot in their equipment. And there were more than a few folks using magical items that eliminated all body odors making encounters like these a troublesome affair for S.A.E. Jean. Already, he had run into humans three to four times this week alone and as a result, the rumors of a werewolf roaming the mid-tier hunting ground had spread online on the hunter's cafe like a wildfire. F. F. C. K. Y. A. D. N. Werewolf. Fortunately for him, though, those four orc jaguars would be enough to fill his daily hunting quota. Ignoring the hunters drowning in the swamp of despair, S.A.E. Jean kicked with both of his legs and jumped up in the air. The black beast shot up high as if to block out the blue sky above and then, descended towards the orc jaguars below. From his sturdy body, the evidence of the skill warrior of reversal being activated could be seen as a simmering red aura. Quiek. T.L. It's a SFX for a pig's squeal. I tried my best here. First, using the claws that were harder than steel, he pierced the neck of one orc. After its throat got ripped open, the orc died on the spot, but there were still three more to go. S.A.E. Jean took a powerful swipe with his arm at the head of another orc. The head separated from the body and bounced away like a basketball. Not even scared by the sight of their two comrades falling in the blink of an eye, the remaining orcs focused solely on attacking him. Receiving the implied orders of eliminate all trespassers from the chieftain, there were no other purposes in these orc jaguars' lives other than to carry it out. TL, slightly stumped by this line. The author used here, which kind of means to allude, to imply. But in this line, it didn't make much sense to me. Quarrer. An orc roared out and struck the beast's arm with a square iron hammer. Honestly speaking, S.A.E. Jean didn't expect the blow to hurt him. The body of the beast mode was several degrees tougher than steel, after all. Gwarrer. T.L., seriously, these roaring SFXs are driving me up the walls. However, contrary to his expectations, it hurt like crazy. Enough to make him almost cry, even. Riding on the wave of his anger, S.A.E. Jean grabbed hold the neck of the offending orc. 
As the blood drained out of its green face, the remaining orc tried to save its comrade and attacked him. Puck. Simple, and powerful sound of impact as A.E. Jean swung the body of the orc in his hand and struck the head of the other one, killing them both at the same time. Still hurts like hell. After finishing the fight, S.A.E. Jean turned around while rubbing the arm struck by the hammer. He was half expecting to see the two hunters to sit there dazedly looking at him, but no, they had already made their hasty retreat from the scene, leaving only a cloud of dust behind. Oh. Not giving up on their lives even when struck down by the momentary terror. As expected, something was different about the upper mid-tier hunters. Admiring their quick wits, S.A.E. Jean walked towards the bodies of the orc jaguars. And while frowning, he inserted his claw into the heart of one. The sensation of piercing past the flesh and touching the heart remained rather disgusting, still. Condition complete, absorb twenty orc jaguar mana stones. The host can now use orc's innate skill the smithing technique. Active skill orc smithing technique skill proficiency level, F. By synchronizing mana in the host's body with certain metals, rocks, and wooden materials, their shapes can be altered at will. Depending on the skill proficiency level, the material that has gone through the process of smithing technique will acquire new hardness and lightness, and also depending on the amount of mana used, desired characteristics can be added as well. Currently, it's impossible to bestow magic effects that are not physical in nature. The skill's effects will differ depending on the values of the following stats physical strength and magic strength. This skill can only be utilized during the orc form. Hmm. He learned a completely unexpected skill after the absorption was finished. His head remained upright as he tried very hard to understand what those words meant. It's unknown how orcs refine, manufacture, and forge metals even until now. The temperature of flames found in the smithies within the villages were measured to be, at most, around 1,200 degrees Celsius, which is shockingly low. And it is simply impossible to explain how can the weapons manufactured by the orcs possess such high quality by looking at that weak flame even the modern-day smithies equipped with bleeding-edge technology fail to shed light on the matter thus. Making this question perhaps the unsolvable mystery of this generation. S.A.E. Jean watched the image projected onto one of the walls in the cave with a great focus. It was a documentary titled The World of Blacksmiths, Part 2, The Secret Wonders of Orcs. To get a better understanding of what's what, he even paid a grand total of 50 cents USD to re-watch the program but hell, he instead ended up realizing that humans knew only a tiny little bit regarding the true nature of monsters. Synchronizing the mana inside my body. Let's just have a go. Although both of his stats mana affinity and magic strength had increased a good deal, he just couldn't get to grips with the idea of utilizing mana at all. It was a par for the course, really. In order to wield mana, rather than pure talent, an advanced education administered early on in the life played a crucial role, after all. However, even though he might be using mana, this wasn't a technique to utilize it, but a skill activated from the system. He changed to the orc form, picked up a big rock from the vicinity, and activated the skill. Suddenly, the rock was dyed in the mana's blue color. Ho! Oh. That was the sound of greatest admiration possible to utter out by the layout of an orc's mouth. S.A.E. Jean fondled the rock wrapped in mana. Mysteriously, the shape of the rock changed according to his hand movement. It became a spearhead when he shaped his hands into a sharp triangle, and when he rubbed it in between his hands, it became a thick string. At the wondrous sight of the rock morphing into different shapes like clay whenever he manipulated it, S.A.E. Jean lost track of time and regressed back to the days of childish innocence and curiosity. Then, maybe three minutes had gone past like that. The blue mana infused in the rock dissipated, and its shape solidified into the final form he was making, a star. Smithing technique has been completed. Hardness level, E. Due to the rubbish quality of the finished item, the skill proficiency level has decreased to F. He was left utterly aghast by this announcement. What was supposedly wrong with his star, anyway? Chapter, 23 I'm gonna go batched crazy here. Kim S.A.E. Jean was in the midst of busy fondling a rock that had turned into mud clay after he synchronized it with his mana, but then, his anger spiked up all of a sudden, causing him to angrily fling it away. 
the gap between his imaginations and that of reality was just too dn wide to cross. The human SAE genes had definitely held an idea on what he wanted, and obviously he meant to do it well, but really, with the accursed clumsy hands of an orc, it was simply the mission, impossible. It sure felt like he was back in the art class during his student days. The image was in his head, and if he drew it like this and that, then it'd work out all right however, his villainous hands wouldn't allow him to achieve success no matter what. TL, this last line had to be revised, as the author simply said his hands were disabled. Quite literally. That alone would have made him rather irritated to no end, but the message window that popped up right afterwards made his blood pressure skyrocket, even if it was only for a short while. The smithing technique has been completed. Hardness level, F. Due to the absolute worst quality of the finished item, the skill proficiency level has decreased. Yukak. In the end, SAE Gene reverted back to the human form and screamed out at the top of his lungs while grabbing his head. He wanted to smash apart that stupid message window right now, that kept on telling him his proficiency level would fall when it was already at the rock bottom of F. It had been 20 times already. And during those 20 times, only the negative words like absolute worst, useless, disgusting appeared in the windows. Ha! Even though he couldn't get anywhere remotely close to tasting success, his entire body felt lethargic and energyless. It was a signal that his mana supply was beginning to run dry. SAE Jean sighed out roughly while laying down on the ground. And precisely 90 seconds later, SAE Jean suddenly shot back right up. He felt like Archimedes sitting inside that famed bathtub of his. His eyes went round as he shouted out aloud. Goblin. He'd activate the smithing technique skill in his orc form and infuse a rock with mana, then change to the goblin form to reshape it. This skill could be activated only in the orc form but, once activated, it was possible to manipulate the shapes of objects in other forms as the duration of the skill only depended on the amount of mana used up for the maintenance of the ability itself. To combine the orc smithing technique with the excellent goblin's craftsmanship skill wasn't this the greatest combination like, ever? He quickly assumed the orc form and grabbed a nice-sized rock from the vicinity once more. TL, that bracketed sentence in the middle of this paragraph is from the author. I did it. A goblin with a single line of tattoo on his forehead slowly sighed in satisfaction. Hardness level, E. Due to the excellent quality of the finished item, the skill proficiency level has increased. It was a feel-good message. A deep grin drew up on his lips. What he managed to make this time was a type of a dagger. A small sword made out of stone and its blade fashioned into a crescent moon. As it was crafted from a rock, it couldn't be used as a proper weapon but still, he was rather pleased with this outcome, as this was the first time since the activation of the skill he did something right. But then, he became dissatisfied all over again. Something's not right. Kim Sae Jean muttered to himself. His satisfaction only lasted for a fleeting moment and now, he wanted to make something even better. This didn't mean blacksmithing was his calling, no. Something inside him went through an inexplicable change after he absorbed the mana stone of the werewolf, as well as seeing the news about the resurgence of vampires. One could call it an ambition. A notion he had never ever held in his poverty-stricken old life. But the mana stone of the beast that had now become a part of his heart, desired to make his ambitions into reality. A wolf's ambitions had completely been assimilated with his psyche, the resurgence of the werewolf's irreconcilable enemy, vampires, serving as the trigger. Hmm. However, he was feeling a little lethargic due to the shortage of mana to have another go immediately, so he decided to take a break first and lie down on the stone bed instead. A week later, SAE Jean had left the cave and was walking in the middle of the city for the promised dinner with Hazeline that was when he discovered a signboard that he wouldn't have found interesting before. Tebek Armory. A weapons shop with a simple name. But the weight of that name was rather quite heavy. Tebek it was the name belonging to one of the 17 master craftsmen in South Korea. SAE Jean became interested in a store now that he possessed a skill related to blacksmithing, but unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of time left until the meeting with the Dark Elf. An open invitational tournament. So, rather than stepping inside the store, he took a closer look at the poster plastered on the display window. 
the Fourth Republic of Korea Blacksmiths Open Invitational Tournament. An opportunity to realize the dream of the talented, aspiring blacksmiths. Application requirements, those wishing to become a blacksmith. However, those with the level of artisan or higher are prohibited from entering. How to participate, physically mail the product to the address provided or visit the premise personally to apply. Possible to participate using an alias or in anonymity. Competition process, preliminary screening, first round of judging, second round of judging, and a final a total of four stages. In the final round, audience may participate in the judging process. New equipment must be presented for first, second, and the final round separately. Content of awards, total prize money of 1 million USTL, I've rounded up quite a bit here. The original amount was just under 885k. Seems a bit on the low side to me, so. Sponsors, Dawn Corporation, Dawn Knight Order, Hyenwall Auction House, Raven Knight's Order, etc. We eagerly await the participation of many blacksmiths who are fervently fighting to achieve their dreams. The very first thought emerging in his head after he dazedly stared at the poster, was the word debt. The debt he owed Hazeline was for. 5 million US. And then, he thought about the house as well. Now that he could spend nearly half of a day as a human being, he would dearly love to graduate from the caveman lifestyle as soon as possible. Hmm. He glanced around to see if anyone was looking, stealthily approached the poster, and then. Ah rip. He ripped the poster right off the glass and hurriedly carried it away. Hazeline, who had been waiting for SAE Jean in the restaurant, didn't even have enough time to get shocked at his increased size. You brewed all these in just ten days. No, no. Took me half a year. I brought the ones I had stashed for a rainy day. More importantly, how much of the debt would they cover? A total of ten potion bottles. And among them, two bottles of a goblin's kindness made out of the powderized fong of a saber-toothed tiger. While S.A.E. Jean's expression was slightly bitter as he found it regretful to use up the remainder of the fong, Hazeline's face was full of joy and happiness. After deducting tax, I think around two. Five million, U.S. so, if you add up with the potions sold previously, there's only around 270k left. Still that much, but of course. Their conversation was temporarily cut off. Because, the waiter had brought their food. Looks delicious. S.A.E. Jean spoke as he stared at the thick steak. Hazeline nodded, and carefully stored the potion strewn about on the table inside her bag. Um. Excuse me. Before grabbing the knives and forks, they opened their mouths at the same time. S.A.E. Jean gestured her to go ahead first, so she did. Well, can't you please tell me what perfume you are using right now? Huh. Wait, it's not like that. I don't have any other intentions. I just like that scent, is all. I'd like to sprinkle some on me, and also to smell it in the house, too. Hazeline scratched her cheek and coyly asked him. He made a troubled expression and shook his head. If that's what you want, then you should take me home. It's really not a perfume but my own odor. E.I.I. At his words, Hazeline gazed at him with a sly, knowing look. She was expecting as much. Pretending to be not interested, but in the end, wasn't this a tactic straight out of a player's handbook? I'd like to do that as well, but... You also know this too, don't you? Us Dark Elves are sensitive towards our privacy. So if you find it a bit inconvenient to tell me what the perfume is, just a small hint would. I'm telling you the truth. Really, it's not a perfume but my own body odor. S.A.E. Jean was adamant. Hazeline's brows knitted slightly as if she found his unchanging attitude disagreeable, but still nodded her head to show that she understood, albeit reluctantly. I understand. Well if you insist it is, then surely it should be. Her lips were pushed out in a pout, and anyone could see that she was obviously upset. No, well, if you really want this scent in your home then you should just take me with you. S.A.E. Jean spoke jokingly after finding her rather adorable like this. Fuyu T. Thanks, really, for your suggestion, but I'm fine. Hazeline smiled and accepted his joke and in this friendly atmosphere the lively conversation never once stopped. 
The one talking was S.A.E. Jean, and the one listening and laughing was Hazeline. Perhaps, she was just trying to get on his good side, but even knowing this, oddly enough, S.A.E. Jean's confidence continued to soar in front of this beautiful woman. The heart that used to beat irregularly whenever they talked face to face, now remained calm, and there wasn't even a trace of nervousness in him. Was this because the effects of a heart of a beast the werewolf's or was it the belief in himself, in other words, confidence and pride, had grown? Whatever the reasons were, S.A.E. Jean was really pleased about himself right now. Oh, by the way, do blacksmiths make a lot of money these days? As the thought suddenly floated up, he slightly tested the waters. He figured that, if the skill proficiency level of the blacksmithing technique rose high enough, it'd be comparable to the recognized blacksmiths, no, the very best of the lot, even to that of master craftsmen. On top of that, if he combined the goblin's craftsmanship, he'd be able to make products that perfectly married aesthetics and functionality. It was too good a skill to not utilize it. If the stuff they make is good, then yes. But could it be as simple as that? You need to possess some talent with mana if you want to climb up to a certain level in blacksmithing, but if you have enough talent to reach a level of a master, wouldn't be it better to just become a knight, instead? It'd get rather boring just hammering away in a sweltering smithy, and as a kicker, you'd need to waste 23 years of your life to knock out a single decent item. Oh, wait a moment, please. Blacksmiths can utilize mana? Of course. Loading the hammer with mana as they strike down on the metal apparently infuses equipment with it. And higher the amount of mana infused into an equipment, the better. But, I mean, just what is that? Just depending on luck, is all. Hazeline spoke in a disinterested tone, and S.A.E. Jean floated a deep smile of satisfaction. He now figured out the rough cause of why an orc great warrior's weapon was better than an artisan's, and able to compare with a master craftsman's. Blacksmiths depended on luck, somewhat, to infuse mana, but orcs utilized their physical traits to directly wield mana when forging their weapons. But why are you asking me about that? Hazeline asked him while thoroughly chewing the meat. Oh, well. No particular reason. I saw a poster for a blacksmithing competition nearby. By the way, how much is it for a stuff made by an artisan or a master nowadays? Their prices are seriously enormous. There was an axe that was sold recently called the Strength of Rockta. It's a weapon praised by many master craftsmen as well as rated favorably by the critics. Even the mass media played it up, saying it's a birth of a new source of pride for the country. Well, if I remember correctly, the Dawn Knight's order coughed up around 26 million US for the privilege of taking it home. S.A.E. Jean stopped his knife the moment he heard that figure. I see. He calmed his wildly beating heart and replied in a deadpan expression. And about an hour later, S.A.E. Jean returned to his cave in a hurry while being seen carrying a stash of iron ingots. He wanted to buy raw steel but alas, didn't have enough money for that. Chapter 24 The smithing technique has been completed. Hardness level, D. Succeeded in bestowing special characteristics, sharpness level C, weight reduction level, D. Due to the outstanding quality of the finished item, the skill proficiency level has increased from F to D. Ow ya TL, the author didn't literally say this, but I was watching the Guardians of the Galaxy before TLing this chapter and Rocket Raccoon is such a badass. Kim Sae Jean in the goblin form murmured in satisfaction as he stroked the dagger. On the short but sharp and straight blade, an intricate pattern carved out by the ten minutes worth of the goblin's exacting handicraft skills was visible. And the hilt made out of a rock was perfectly shaped, as well as also being light in weight. Actually, he wanted to make a lengthier and more destructive weapon like a single-edged or a double-edged sword if possible unfortunately, with his current mana pool and the proficiency level, this dagger was his limit. No matter how much mana he poured in, the smithing technique lasted only for ten minutes, and it proved to be really tough trying to make anything longer than a dagger with the tiny-ass hands of a goblin during that short period of time. But contrary to how he felt about the process itself, he was really liking this dagger. This could be called a work of art that combined the orc's smithing technique and the goblin's craftsmanship. Of course, since he was the one who made it, there was a little bit of his own pride mixed in there with the evaluation, but then again, the word outstanding did appear for the very first time in the message window, 
so. But this is the best I can do right now. He would have preferred to raise his skill proficiency level higher before submitting the item for the tournament, but the last day of submission was tomorrow, so it couldn't be helped. He decided that, since he'd be given another chance to craft something new after passing the preliminary round, he diligently raised the level before the first round of judging commences. Kim Sae Jin changed to the human form and got up to leave. Excuse me, can you tell me how I can send types of armament via mail? Looking like a suspicious person while hiding a dagger in his pocket, Sae Jin lingered around inside the post office before asking one of the employees behind the counter. Eh. Types of armament. Yes. I wish to participate in the open invitational blacksmithing tournament. It was as if Sae Jean was looking down on the employee sitting on the chair as he spoke. That was because he was currently in the, the human mode of the ebony wolf form, and was 189 centimeters tall as a result. Aha! If that's the case, it should be here somewhere. Please, wait a moment. The post office worker rummaged through one of the drawers and pulled out a sheet of paper. It was the application form for the tournament. You can mail the item after completing this form. You're entering a bit late, though. Most folks came in to apply on the first day of the application period, you know. Oh. Well, I was it took a while longer to make mine. I hadn't made anything in advance like the others. S.A.E. Jean sat down on a nearby empty chair. Only three things had to be written on the form his name, his contact details, and his address. He left the name bit blank for now and filled in the rest. As for the most important name part, he found it somewhat burdensome to use his real name, so he jotted down an alias he thought of last night instead. Here, I'm finished. How much for the shipping? The shipping cost is taken care of by the Blacksmiths Association. Oh. S.A.E. G nodded his head, said his thanks and left the post office. The post office he visited was located in the city center of Kangwon province, so as soon as he stepped out, he was greeted by the throngs of people coming and going. Rather than returning to his cave right away, S.A.E. Jean blended in with the crowd and took a walk. He wanted to fully enjoy this partial freedom he had finally earned after swimming inside the misery and despair. SFX for eyes swiveling. He could hear the sounds of people's eyes moving. The freedom earned after the difficult struggle tasted a lot sweeter than he could have imagined. Since he possessed an eye-catching athletic physique and a sharp face of an alpha male, the Kim Sae Jean of now was quite a different animal altogether from his past. Unlike before, when he had given up on getting the attention of the opposite SX, all he had to do now was to just walk around and ladies would send approving gazes towards him. He even saw someone who consciously made a fake cough and flicked her hair back. It was, in a word, fun. Really. Then, out of nowhere. A strange scent invaded his nostrils. It was a smell of blood with a faint whiff of brass mixed in that was noticeably different than that of a human being. S.A.E. Jean turned his head this way and that, trying to locate the origin of this scent. And soon, he found it. A normal couple, a man and a woman, outwardly not at all remarkable. But the origin of that stink of blood was definitely those two. S.A.E. Jean slowly moved his feet. Hiding among the crowd, he tailed the couple. He couldn't understand why he was doing this. Only that, he was sure of the need to follow them. It must have been his instincts. And so, in the middle of tailing them, suddenly his eyesight widened. The skill that was woven into his primal instincts, the eyes of the wolf, had seemingly activated all by itself. In this world where every color had gained yet another level of richness, S.A.E. Jean could clearly see it. From the couple, no, more correctly, an ominous aura of blood rising from the man. A vampire. The moment he realized this, his sanity wavered. His heart began pounding madly, and his breathing became shallow. The murderous desire of the wolf beast tried to rear its powerful head, nearly causing him to rush out and pummel that vampire's skull into mush. But the human S.A.E. Jean endured it, albeit just barely. Not yet, not yet. Need to wait a bit more. I gotta find the right opportunity to strike. Thankfully, he didn't have to wait for long. The man grasped the hand of the woman and led her into a shabby housing area. To suck dry her blood, most likely. 
Seeing this, S.A.E. Jean also moved his feet. As humans monitored the activities of vampire species every second of the day, vampires became very cautious when performing the rituals of blood sucking. Even though it was troublesome, they hypnotized their victims and drank the blood in indoor environments. This had become the unwritten rule for vampires. The male vampire, Yu Song Hyun, pulled the woman inside his home while carrying a satisfied expression. That was because, this beautiful woman under his hypnosis was about to become his own personal blood bank. For a period of one year, he'd suck her blood out periodically until her body rapidly withers away. Lie down. As he commanded, she showed no resistance and lied down on a bed. The sight of her wearing only a single one-piece dress was quite alluring, to say the least. He slowly approached the woman and caressed her body. From her toes to her shin, then from her shin to her thigh. Inch by inch, creeping up ever so slightly. The heightened sense of touch gave Yu Song Hyun a deep chill down in his loins. He could no longer hold back his desire and was about pushed down on her hard, when. Knock, knock. There was a sound of someone knocking on the door. For a vampire who had a superior sense of hearing, this was the absolute worst form of hindrance, like, ever. Yu Song Hyun's expression crumpled into an unsightly mess. TL, Kek Block. FCK. Opening wide his bloodshot eyes, he spat out a swear word. Knock knock. The unknown person continued to knock from the other side of the door. The knocking had now become more aggressive than before. Enraged by this ill-timed obstruction, Yu Song Hyun growled angrily and stood up. His eyes, burning with a crimson hue, contained a thick killing intent. TL, the author said enraged at the bad manners. Changed at my discretion. Knock knock. Before the second knock had ended, Song Hyun violently jerked open the door. His original plan was to drag in whoever it was outside by the neck and rip him apart, limb by limb. You son of a bikey hook. But before he could act, a hand of a beast shot out and wrapped around his neck first. Panicking at the sudden attack, Yu Song Hyun clawed at the arm of the beast repeatedly, but he couldn't even leave a scratch mark on the black fur covered arm. SFX for a door slowly opening. The half open door slowly opened, revealing a single man standing there. It was definitely a human. That was, only after disregarding the pair of golden eyes shooting out deathly chilly gazes and the arm that was, without a doubt, belonging to a beast. Keek. Those were the final images Song Hyun would get to remember. SFX for breaking bones. With a horrifying noise of something twisting up, his neck bones cracked into bits and pieces. Kim Sae Jin discarded the limp body of the vampire as if it was trash, and closed the door behind him. He had not a single shred of guilt from taking a life. No, it was more like he had stepped on an insect instead. And if he hadn't killed this BD, the vampire would have committed a murder first, so he felt totally justified for his actions that had saved a human being. He turned his head and checked out the woman still under the hypnosis of the vampire. Fortunately, it seemed like no harm was done to her yet, as she was simply unconscious, only her clothing was in somewhat of a half-disheveled state. There was no other particular smell beside the dead vampire and the woman in this place, so he reverted his arm back to that of a human's. This was one of the ways to use the beast mode human mode he had uncovered recently, where he could change a part of his body to that of a beast's. S.A.E. Jean explored the rest of the house. Whether it was due to the house being so shabby, he couldn't spot any CCTV cameras inside or out. She'll probably call the cops later. Satisfied, S.A.E. Jean took one last look at the unconscious woman and exited the house. And precisely three hours later, Waking up from the hypnosis, the woman screamed at the top of her lungs before calling the cops. Located in front of the Seoul City Hall, was the Blacksmiths Association. Inside this three-storied, plain-looking building, people were busy sorting out all the submitted armaments for the open invitational tournament. I wonder, will there be anything interesting this time? The best item we got from the last tournament ended up being ranked only around mid-quality tier. The highest knight from the Raven Order, Kim Yurin, asked as she eyed the sorting out process. The association's chairman standing next to her meaningfully nodded his head. It should be okay to expect something good this time around. 
Firstly, the Smithies in the Busan and Guangzhou areas are participating en masse, and the direct disciple of the master Kim Taebaek also sent in his work, saying he'd like to enter as well. Perhaps, it's too much to expect a branded product but, it's possible that we might find some high-quality goods. Oh, is that true? Master craftsmen were rather particular about choosing their disciples. Several masters didn't even bother to have one, and the others would have no more than one or two at most. The government begged these masters with the promise of a greater level of support if they even as much as showed a hint of raising a disciple or two, but their stubbornness simply knew no bounds. Of course. We let them go through the preliminary already. I'll introduce you to them at a later date. A direct disciple of that stubborn master Kim Taebaek. Perhaps, is that person who I think he is? Mm. Your thoughts are on the money. That hot-headed geezer would have never taken in a disciple, unless it's his own flesh and blood, no. A nineteen-year-old flesh and blood, that is. Kim Yurin peeked a smile at the dissatisfied voice of the chairman. But didn't he abandon the firstborn, saying he didn't have any talent? I hear he's the last born his talent must be quite amazing. TL, the gender of the disciple is not revealed in the raw at this time. We'll continue with a he until the author clears that up. That's also true as well. Sent in a sword but, phew, it's rather quite good. As the two of them conversed, the last day for submission was eventually coming to an inevitable close. This is the last one. And finally. One of the employees shouted as he raised a metal box. Can I take a look too? Not a problem. But it'll be better to not expect much. Since products sent in from all the well-known smithies had gone through already, it's probably something not very impressive. Yes, I'm also aware. But still, it is the final one, so I'd like to be there. All right. The chairman smiled magnanimously and nodded his head. Hey, you over there. Hold it. Miss Yurin wishes to see it too. T.L., um, the author, for some reason, wrote the line like this, baby, better wait for a second. I'm like, what? Eh, huh? Oh, yes, of course. The employee stayed his hands from opening the box and quickly sat up straight. And people started to gather around the desk with the box on top. Not because the employees were interested in seeing the weapon with a potentially low quality, but obviously, to be around the crazily beautiful knight Kim Yurin's presence. Shall I open it? Yes. Please go ahead. After Yurin had spoken, the employee carefully opened the box. At that moment the box opened. The light from the light bulb got reflected by the blade and stabbed the eye of the employee. Yuk. Ignoring the employee who was busy rubbing his eyes, Kim Yurin and the chairman took a look inside the box. A stunned gasp leaked out from between the lips of Kim Yurin. The only reason why she wanted to see this item was because it happened to be the very last one submitted to the tournament and thus had some sort of ceremonial significance. In other words, she also didn't hold any high expectations either. However, inside this box was an unexpectedly good item. Outwardly, it could be called an ornamental dagger thanks to all the intricate carvings, but the sharp aura of mana infused into the short blade was simply out of the norm. The cold, grey blade seemed keen enough to slice anything it comes in contact with the beautiful patterns on the surface and the smooth, clean hilt roused the flames of greed inside her, wanting to possess this dagger. Yurin dazedly reached out and grasped the hilt. It didn't feel foreign at all, and she could hold it so comfortably, as if it was a part of her own body. This familiarity showcased that this dagger was meticulously designed with the physiology of the user in mind. It seems that, we might have another good product in our hands. The chairman, also dazed like Yurin, muttered while admiring the dagger. Oi, what's the name of the participant? At the chairman's words, one of the employees, who were also stunned into silence by the dagger, hurriedly woke up and fished out the application form inside the box. What the? Why? Something wrong. Ah, uh, no, that is the name is a bit strange, sir. It's the Orc's Forge and the sender wishes to be called Orc in the shortened form. At this terrible name, the chairman's brows narrowed. Although they did approve the usage of aliases as well as anonymity for this competition, but to use a monster's name. 
It must be a hot trend nowadays, using the names of monsters on their products. I mean, there's the goblin alchemist and stuff. Kim Yurin smiled brightly as if she found this a pleasant surprise. And well, since orcs are known to make good weapons, I think it's rather a fitting name. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Ahem. Um, rather than the disciple of Master Tebek, can you arrange a meeting with this Mr. Orc for me? What he wrote does sound a bit strange. But I really like this weapon. If I build a personal connection with this person, I think he'll make me an excellent weapon later on. TL, the second sentence in this paragraph confused me greatly as well. I tried to make sense of it and thus didn't try to do a literal TL of the line. Hearing her request, the chairman scratched the back of his head but in the end, nodded his head as if he couldn't help it anyway. If that's what you want I'll try my best. But before that, we should test this dagger first. It's possible that an artisan or a master could be playing a prank here after deliberately lowering the quality of their work. Yes, of course. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Chairman. Chapter 25 Ten days following the submission of his dagger to the blacksmith's tournament, S.A.E. Jean maintained a regimented lifestyle. In the mornings, he practiced alchemy and blacksmithing technique, and in the afternoons, he went downtown to take a break. Even though he called it a break, it was nothing more than him walking around the city streets aimlessly. But that was enough to put his mind at ease. And at nights, when the number of hunters and knights were few and far in between, he hunted monsters in the low mid-tier and mid-tier hunting grounds. Most of the time, he hunted in his ebony wolf forms beast mode, but sometimes, he deliberately went out in the orc form too. He did that in order to evolve. Well, the thing was he ran into a particularly tough wall while performing the smithing technique. As an orc warrior, hardness level, D and the skill proficiency level, D is the maximum attainable limit. Unfortunately, though no matter how many monsters he hunted, the orc warrior showed no sign of evolving. Foo. Right now, the time was 11 a.m. S.A.E. Jean put the mortar and pestle down after making three bottles of potions. He'd been grinding herbs for so long now, the goblin's tiny little hands were all swollen up in red and everything. The potion crafting proved to be a cumbersome and difficult endeavor. Even though he was blessed with the goblin's craftsmanship skill, its proficiency level was still low and to repeatedly refine ingredients as well as to compound them to the minute. Exacting degree, a great deal of his mental strength and focus was required. Crafting of the element resistance potion has failed. Skill proficiency level will be increased. He often encountered failure whenever he tried to concoct difficult potions. Just as its high price suggested, the element resistance potion was difficult as hell to make. This was his fourth try today, but he hadn't succeeded once. Right about now, he was seriously missing the powder of saber-toothed tiger's fong as that thing not only doubled as a mana stone but also could greatly bolster the success rate of potion crafting. Ha! As he tasted yet another defeat, the strength abandoned him in droves. And the lightheadedness from inhaling the fumes of the ingredients belatedly began to assault him, too. For the sake of taking a break, S.A.E. Jean changed to the human mode of the wolf form and switched on the TV. Without a doubt, proper resting or playing needed to be done in a human's body. Of course, just by being inside this stupid cave, the level of enjoyment he'd derive would be halved no, maybe even worse than that, but still. Precisely ten days ago, a man's body was discovered in one of the Kanwan province's rental houses. The victim had died instantly after his neck bones were twisted, and on his neck, imprints of unidentifiable animal claws were discovered. The crack team of detectives investigated the case using that evidence as the lead-off point, until they announced that they have made a surprising discovery. As to what that exact discovery is, can you inform us, Professor Kim? It was a program related to currently trending news topics. Taking the already happened event as its topic of discussion, the chat show let the anchor and a panel of so-called experts talk about stuff and present information to the viewers. S.A.E. Jean's ears had to perk up from this show's contents, since it was definitely related to what he had done. Thank you. Well, the identity of our victim just so happens to be that of a vampire. This fact was uncovered by the investigators after they had fast-tracked the autopsy. 
The decision came about after hearing the peculiar testimony of the first person to find the body, as well as the discovery of several blood packs inside the fridge of the victim. This incident has ignited fierce debate among the public. On one side, there are those arguing that the vampires are a subspecies of humans so the perpetrator must be caught and punished. While the other side is opposing that view by arguing that vampires are the enemies of mankind to be exterminated and thus there's no need to investigate this matter any further. Also, there are arguments regarding whether the culprit knew the identity of the victim as a vampire and thus committed this act or not. SAE Jean subconsciously leaked a mocking grin. Even after suffering at the hands of these damnable vampires, there still seem to be morons busy yapping on about respecting the fking human rights of these bloodsuckers. No, at this point, he had to suspect whether vampire sleeper cells had infiltrated the human society and what not. Bump. It was then, as he thought up to this point, his heart suddenly felt like it was going to explode. The insatiable thirst for murder assaulted his brain, telling him to track down every single one of these bastards and massacre them all. It was a poisonous and powerful hatred born out of the deeply rooted hostility S.A.E. Gene carried in his heart combining with the primal instincts of the werewolf. And that's when he discovered himself busy destroying the floor of his cave with both of his arms changed to that of a werewolf's. This was weird. Totally spooked by this event, he quickly assumed the human form and flipped the channel. His heart had calmed down somewhat by doing that, but his rage towards vampires wouldn't cool down so easily. S.A.E. Jean concentrated hard on the TV in order to appease this boiling anger. Luckily enough, his attention was grabbed by a very interesting program on the channel he changed to. A total number of 33 workshops and 1308 blacksmiths have entered in this year's fourth blacksmiths open invitational tournament. He remembered hearing that every step of the selection processes by the judges would be televised. And during the final round of judging, over 1,000 audience members would participate in finding the winner that possessed the mass market appeal and also was acknowledged by the professional users. The previous tournament's preliminary saw only 100 participants making it through, but this year, 208 people have managed to reach this stage, ensuring that we will be blessed with a fierce competition to determine the eventual winner. And right here, inside the main headquarter of the Dawn Knights Order, 20 items selected from those 208 participants are on display. The accomplished knights will lend us their expert opinions on judging these items. Oh, here they are. S.A.E. Jean wondered if his dagger was among those on display and looked closer, only to let out a small gasp of surprise after seeing the face of one of the knights there trying to play the roles of judges. To start off the proceedings, we secured the aid of someone that was very difficult to get a hold of. Welcome, the Knight of the Dawn Order, Miss U.S.A.E. Young. It was her, the girl S.A.E. Jean saved from the troll way back when. Oh yes, hello to you as well. I heard that last week, you were promoted to the ranks of low mid-tier. Now that you are the reigning record holder of the youngest low mid-tier knight ever in history, how do you feel right now? I'm not sure. But as I've agreed to do this first round thing, I would like to concentrate only on judging for now. The Dawn Knight's Order got the first dibs on acquiring a single weapon after every round of judging process, thanks to being the biggest sponsor of the tournament. Obviously, as this was just the first round, even the armaments rated low quality would still be rare. But it was still possible to identify the good seedlings from early on. That's why USAE Young volunteered and said she wanted to participate in the judging process. She still hadn't found a weapon that could be called her primary just yet. She already had a sword rated high quality that other low mid-tier knights wouldn't even be able to think about touching. But for the granddaughter of the Dawn Corporation's chairman, it simply wasn't satisfactory enough for both her and her grandpa. Ha ha. Well, then. Please score these 20 weapons on display here after giving them your considered opinions, Miss S.A.E. Young. The scores you give them will be combined with the scores from other judges and the winners will be decided from that, so please give it your best. Normal equipment used by the knights were divided into the ranking system of lowest low mid high highest in that order. And on the very top, there were those that exceeded these classifications and achieved the ranks of a branded goods or a treasure. TL, this is the first time the author has clarified one of his ranking systems hooray. And by the way, the treasure ranking is a literal TL from the raw. 
we can probably expect that the other ranks and tiers work on the same classification system. So, a low-tier knight would use a low-quality equipment, and low-mid and mid-tiers would use up to the mid-quality. And the knights of upper-mid-tiers and above, needed at least the high-quality weapons or better. Of course, this changed slightly depending on the level of the knight's orders. TL, this bracketed sentence is from the author. Will do. USAE Young walked with heavy footsteps and took a look at the weapons arranged in a row. Her judging was super quick and rather strict as well. One look, and she gave two points, another quick look, then a single point awarded this repeated for a couple of times. The maximum possible points that could be awarded was ten. Pardon me, but if you could just tell us what's on your mind. In a clearly restless manner, the announcer exhorted S.A.E. Young who was too busy stabbing the hearts of the blacksmiths countrywide with a lethal blade while not saying a single word. Oh, my apologies. It's my first time being on TV. She quickly lowered her head, and then pointed at the item she gave a single point to, just now. That sword is too malleable to be of any use. It's the lower than the lowest quality that wouldn't even leave behind a cut on the bones of a skeleton. That's why it's only worth one point. I have to wonder how did that get past the preliminary screening. Oh. The announcer wasn't expecting an avalanche of praises, obviously. USAE Young's particularly fussy personality was famous throughout the Dawn Knight's order already. But he didn't expect her to be so ruthless with her put-downs at all. Hmm. All right, please, continue with your evaluations. However, wouldn't such a character go down well with the audiences as well? An ice-cold high school girl with a cute face spitting out decidedly harsh judgments. The announcer's face regained its happy bearings and he relaxedly smiled. And this axe over here, looks like it might break if I slam it down just once. Oh, it really did break. It's made out of steel but, I think there was a problem with the base material. If not, then well, the skill of the smith must have been terrible. Ha, ha. After that, she continued to pour out more scorn. USAE Young never gave out points higher than a four. The passing criteria for the first round was, at minimum, better than lowest quality but maybe she wasn't aware of this little fact, as she continued to slap terrible points to all the equipment she saw. And so, her evaluations for the 17 weapons ended in a blink of an eye. When she arrived at the 18th, USAE Young's feet that were constantly moving forward, finally stopped still. At this strange behavior, the camera hurriedly closed in and alternated between her face and the weapon that made her stop. Is this one different from the others? Yes. Quite different. Is it okay if I touch it? Of course. USAE Young picked up the weapon, her eyes sparkling brightly. It was an expertly crafted dagger, the reflections off its sharp blade imparting a chilly sensation down her spine. And your evaluations are? The announcer asked, full of expectations. Even he, who was not a blacksmith, could see that this dagger was an excellent item as well. It's excellent. It's been crafted wonderfully and the blade is really sharp. The carvings on the blade itself are also quite intricate too and the feeling of the grip is stable and light as well. Most importantly though, it's surprisingly easy to infuse it with mana. On the open market, this dagger would be good enough to earn the ranking of the low, even the upper low quality quite easily. What a pity that it's a dagger, but still, a very good product. It's the best among what's on display here. USAE Young spoke to the announcer after examining the dagger this and that for a while. Is it possible for me to learn the name of the blacksmith who made this? I heard that it's been engraved at the bottom of the hilt. USAE Young upturned the dagger and checked the bottom of the hilt. There were exactly three English alphabets engraved there. Orc. Is this supposed to be Orc? The blacksmith has asked to be called the Orc, apparently. But isn't the spelling supposed to be O, R, and C? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, even I'm not O, please assign the points first. USAE Young gave it eight points. Oh, did you deduct the last two points because it's a dagger? Yes, unfortunately. Huh, but wouldn't the blacksmith be slightly unhappy if you deduct points like that? The announcer was making a small joke. 
But USAE Young suddenly became dead serious and contemplated for a bit, before nodding in agreement and changed her evaluation. 10 points. It's 10 points. The announcer's lips automatically twitched at the sight of USAE Young's rather adorable actions, but since she was quite serious about this whole thing, he worked very hard to swallow his smiles down. That 8 points, it was my mistake so please edit it out. Ha ha ha. Unfortunately for her, USAE Young's gaffe wasn't edited out, and Kim SAE Jean was busy bursting into laughter. I thought she was picky and rude, but I guess she also has an adorable side, too. He felt that she was even more cute now after she had heaped praises on his dagger when she thoroughly rubbished the others so much. Now then, next up we'll chat with Mr. Kim Hyuk Joon, a mid-tier knight from the Gabiuk Knights Order who's been igniting the world of celebrity gossip. Before he knew it, the coverage of the tournament had ended as A.E. Jean checked the current time, and stood up to leave. It was 1 p.m. Time to go to the city. Chapter, 26 the temporary resident of a cave in the monster field, Kim S.A.E. Jean was about to utilize the regular exit route for an afternoon out in the city. What he meant by the regular route was that, instead of him changing to the ebony wolf form and jumping over the wire fences and traversing the wilderness that way, he'd assume the appearance of a human and walk out of the entrance exit proper. When utilizing this regular route, he had to go through the so-called rest stop, a large structure built as a shelter. Inside this building which was the size of the Seoul train station's waiting area, he saw hunters, or maybe knights, going through a final mission briefing before embarking on another hunt. TL, this is weird, the author referred to this place as reception area in chapter 15. Hmm. Uh. In this place, S.A.E. Jean found a familiar face he saw on TV just now. It was U.S.A.E. Young. With her colleagues around, she was intently listening to the words of a man who looked to be the captain of the hunting team. He tried to figure out if she was nodding her head like that because the hunt she was about to participate in was important, when an army of camera-wielding crewmen descended down on the group out of nowhere. Be rest assured as we got our own knights providing protection so, please, just focus on hunting as you'd do normally. We only want to capture your natural actions. Aren't we doing this? because the public's opinion on the knight's orders aren't so good right now thanks to the recent monster outbreak. Let's turn all of that around with this reality TV show. Although we're filming only the pilot episode, but still, please remember that this isn't a documentary but a reality TV. Please, please remember this. Oh, and. Knight USAE Young. Yes. Well, it'll be like, since Miss SAE Young is the face of the show, so, we'll have to focus more on you from now on. A cold expression is okay, no, it's more than okay, but please smile every now and then. That's for the best, you see. If you're cold and distant all day long, the viewers might end up not liking you. So, people would think more favorably of you when an unexpected, bright smile breaks out of all that coldness. Like. She's only cold outwardly, but inside, she's kind-hearted. Like that. Oh. USAE Young had an expression of slight unwillingness, but she still ended up nodding her head, once. It's just them filming stuff for a show. The guy SAE Jean thought was the captain of the team, actually turned out to be the producer of the show. SAE Jean stood there watching for five minutes before moving towards the exit. Actually, he tried to move, but. H, hey, please wait a moment. USAE Young found the current situation not to her liking. But she couldn't do anything about it. It was decided to give access to her life to these media people already. She also knew that, in order to become a highest tier knight in the future, the goodwill of the public would be important, to a certain degree. To follow in the footsteps of Kim Yurin, her childhood idol, she was willing to endure just about everything. Please remember, it's not a documentary, but a reality TV show. And. Night USA Young. She disliked this producer who wanted to package the monster hunts into a reality entertainment TV show, but her father did recommend him, saying the man had the right abilities. She did her utmo. Street hardest to repress the urge to just get up and run away, and reluctantly made her replies. Even after that, though, this guy continued to yap on and on. So, she answered him insincerely while turning her gaze elsewhere. 
this was the only way for her to endure this torture. And that's how, like fate or even maybe a lie, she found him. Eh. K. Cook. At her sudden outburst, the producer got confused but USA Young couldn't care any less even if she tried. She shoved aside the producer blocking her way, then rushed out in front of the man she had been searching for. Hmm. Is it? Really him? Now that she was standing before him, USA Young had to take a moment and wonder. The face was the same, but. Was his size this big before? Excuse me, you're Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean, yes. From that time. However, the face was definitely the same as the one engraved in her memories, so she worked hard to appear confident. Even if he seemed a bit taller, it was definitely the same guy. I know it's you. Why aren't you answering me? When S.A.E. Jean failed to reply, she narrowed her brows and stared up into his eyes. She was even more convinced now, even though the question of his height entered her mind again. This man's face was completely embedded in her brain and she would never be able to forget it no matter what. Hell, she even saw it in her dream several times already. Good to see you again. Kim S.A.E. Jean thought about playing dumb here. But in the end, he offered his hand for a shake with a smile. After all, she was USA Young, the daughter of the Dawn Knights Order's master, as well as the granddaughter of the Dawn Corporation's chairman. He thought that letting go of this chance to build a personal bridge would be such a waste. Ah, uh, as I thought. Thank you. For that time. And as the two of them shared only this much of conversation, suddenly a camera was shoved in his face. Miss S.A.E. Young, who is this gentleman? The producer asked, his face brightly smiling in happiness. Well, it was an entrance of a new character. Not just any, but a man, that made the frosty gold spoon female knight go out of her way to offer a warm greeting. The producer planned to shoot some opening sequences in this rest stop but hell, wasn't this an unexpectedly huge scoop? What do you think you're doing? Get rid of the cameras. Fearing S.A.E. Jean would escape trying to avoid the cordon of cameras, she grabbed the collars of the producer and shouted in anger. At her unexpectedly sharp reaction, the producer panicked a little. If he got on U.S.A.E. Young's bad books, then not only in the entertainment industry, he wouldn't be able to find work anywhere on this planet. However, his desire regained its vigor the moment he saw the face of the unknown person, Kim S.A.E. Jean. This unknown man didn't seem to be too bothered by the presence of the cameras. If anything, a gleam of curiosity could be spied from his eyes. Excuse me, mister. By any chance, is it possible for us to film you for a very brief moment? The TBK production is making a reality TV show about nights. Hey, you. USAE Young pushed the producer back while stealing glances at Kim S.A.E. Jean. Contrary to her worries, though, he didn't seem to show any discomfort towards the sudden intrusion of the cameras. It, it won't take too much of your time. It's like, it's the opening, and an unexpected but fateful encounter stuff like that is good for the ratings, you see. Very good, in fact. S.A.E. Jean slowly scratched his chin and agonized a little about this. For him to appear on TV. Wasn't this one of his childhood wishes? He felt envious, watching those shows featuring cool celebrities and knights, wanting to be just like them. But that was a dream unattainable for a child who was struck down by the sudden twist of fate to become an orphan. What type of show is this? When S.A.E. Jean nodded his head slightly, a thick smile drew up on the producer's face. But U.S.A.E. Young frowned instead and had to ask him first. Eh. Are you okay with this? Oh, well, actually. It's been a while since our last run-in, so I thought. It's USAE Young. Ahaha. Ah, ah. If so, then, we'll start filming for a bit now. It's simple, actually. Just talk to each other, as if we aren't even here in the first place. Well then, we'll be just over there, so don't mind us. Cameras retreated slowly and maintained a comfortable distance. Of course, it was still noticeable but SAE Jean did his best to sound natural as he spoke. Shall we go somewhere to sit down and talk? Oh. Ah. All right. Good idea. The two of them walked towards the coffee shop located inside the rest stop. Heh. 
isn't this a huge scoop? Who knew, that picky and rude goldspinner would be this talkative? The producer and his crew members, as well as other knights, couldn't stop being surprised and astonished by the sight of USA Young beyond the glass of the coffee shop. She always maintained a cold, expressionless face and whenever she spoke, it was as if she was throwing rocks out of her mouth with her stiff, officious attitude. TL, the author made a joke based on wordplay here, but please forgive my shortcomings, I couldn't TL it properly. Oops. But right now, sitting there talking to this unknown man, USA Young seemed different. It wasn't on the level of calling her face blooming brightly but at least, she was not icy cold anymore. And to top it all off, those cute little mouth of hers busily bobbled up and down to string lengthy sentences instead of her usual short, curt answers. Those who knew her, ended up wondering if that girl sitting over there was indeed the real USA Young or not. Hey! She smiled. Did you get that? Yep. And it was a close-up shot. Oh. Nicely done. Nice. What about audio? The producer asked the sound recordist. The man in charge of recording sound raised his thumb up, a deep smile etched on his face. The contents of their conversation are pretty nice as well. Seems like that guy is a hunter, and saved USAE Young once before from danger. Ooh. And he's a hunter. But a hunter saved a knight. How? They haven't talked about it yet. That part's been glossed over, and they are talking about more mundane stuff now. Oh, wait. Suddenly, the sound recordist opened his eyes wide and let out a loud gasp. What? She just asked him to join the Dawn Knight's Order. She's trying to scout him. Would you like to join our Dawn Knight's Order? We always welcome a talented person like you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean. Kim S.A.E. Jean could only grin softly at her serious offer. Wasn't the way she speak too grown up, even though she was still just a minor, a high school student? I'm grateful for your consideration, but... I've made up my mind to stay as a solo hunter. He replied half politely to her. In the beginning, he spoke in a more familiar tone since there was a bit of age gap between them, but she showed signs of not liking that, so he decided to converse with her in the established conventions of honorific speech. TL, the Korean language has a honorific speech pattern which is nigh on impossible to replicate in full in English. This time, the author used. I TL'd it as speaking half politely instead. As a solo hunter, USAE Young's eyes went round as she tilted her head. A solo hunter was a person not affiliated with any organizations or knights' orders. This was pretty rare, even more than the so-called free knights. That's because most hunters couldn't hunt monsters on their own. TL, the author used the word to describe the knights in this paragraph. It means, in this case at least, someone who has not been recorded anywhere, not with any government, not with any body of education or business entities, not even families. So, uh, I'm not aware of simpler English term that can accurately imply such a state other than free, so I used that word. Without a doubt, if it's you, Mr. S.A.E. Jean, I guess it's possible. That amazing strength you displayed back then, it was a trait, yes. S.A.E. Jean's body trembled for a moment. But he maintained a poker face and sipped the coffee. Yes. You're correct. If it's not too much trouble, can I ask you what kind of trait it is? At her question, S.A.E. Jean pondered slightly, before giving her an ambiguous answer. It's a trait related to physical constitutions. Aha! Thankfully, U.S.A.E. Young accepted his story without a problem. In a way, his attitude made sense, as most knights with traits try to keep the detailed information of their abilities under the wraps. Oh, and, you seem to have grown taller than before. Must be the result of the trait's growth. Eh. Ah. Yes. That's exactly it. This was a more believable excuse than trying to explain the usage of some magical potion, which he should have thought of before. S.A.E. Jean hurriedly nodded his head. A trait, you say? U.S.A. Young fell into a deep thought while sharply staring at his eyes, almost enough to bore holes in his body. This was one of her habits. When she stared long enough until the other party felt uncomfortable, they would turn away and avoid the eye contact first. 
However, SAE Jean didn't do that. Actually, he found it rather wondrous the way her jewel-like eyes seemed to wiggle around in a matching rhythm with her flowing thoughts. I wonder. Although you are a solo hunter, isn't it possible to go out on a cooperative hunt with our knight's order? Your skills have already been confirmed, after all. At her words that came out after a short moment of pondering, S.A.E. Jean grinned slightly while nodding his head. Yes, it's possible. That's great. Then give me your contact numbers. Unfortunately, it looks like I need to go soon. I'll give you a call at a later date. Please, try to contact me in the mornings. I don't have much free time otherwise. U.S.A.E. Young handed over her phone. Suiting her personality to A.T., the phone was jet black and simply designed, the feeling of its metal frame icy. S.A.E. Jean saved his home number on the phone and parted ways with her. Whenever he walked around in the city, S.A.E. Jean was in the ebony wolf form's human mode. And as he walked around enjoying the attention from the passers-by, he discovered a flyer plastered on one of the street lamps. No, it was more like the flyer discovered him instead. That smell. The thick scent of blood leaking out from that flyer had his eyesight totally under its grips. Recruiting mercenaries. For vampire extermination. Your rank's not important. Remuneration favorable. Mercenaries, one of the more famous jobs among those that were born from the entrance of the monsters to this world. However, the purpose of a mercenary was different from that of a hunter or a knight. Besides the fact that they get hired with money, they had to kill people every now and then. Of course, those killed were the targets for elimination designated by the law, such as vampires, nagas, corrupted humans, etc., etc. In other words, the types that harmed the society as a whole. TL, the author used in this paragraph. No context was given, and I'm assuming he means humans corrupted by mana magic, so I went with corrupted. But in modern times, Facing fierce opposition from many human rights groups as well as the change in the constitution, the so-called murderer's jobs professions began to slowly disappear. And before anyone knew it, mercenaries, who had lost the meaning to their professional existence, faded away into obscurity, as well. However, the mercenaries didn't go extinct. Even though something as important as mercenary ranking system wasn't sorted out until now and remained chaotic, somehow, 13 mercenaries taverns still managed to continue existing throughout the country. Mercenaries that have remained till the end were the bunch of hard men still possessing their original inborn nature, a tenacious, unyielding spirit and unshakable faith. These guys all lost important people to these enemies of mankind so they would never give up until they get their revenge of ripping out bits and pieces of those damnable bastards. As long as there were those who'd rather choose death over that of losing their meaning of existence drew breath, mercenaries would never completely disappear from this world. Kim S.A.E. Jean who lost his mother to vampires, knew these men more than anyone else. That was why, the beast Kim S.A.E. Jean just could not leave behind this flyer looking to find mercenaries to kill vampires. He roughly ripped the flyer off the street pole and shoved it in his pocket. Chapter, 27 In a mercenaries tavern located on the outskirts of Kongwan province. Once upon a time, this establishment was packed to the brim with the voices of drunken mercenaries, smell of strong liquor, sweat, and sounds of fisticuffs. Back then, 24 hours in a day weren't enough for the working mercenaries and when they were sitting here doing nothing, the master of the tavern reminded them of their shortcomings, all in a good camaraderie. TL, this last line also confused me a great deal. Wasn't sure whether the author was saying the master was telling the mercs off, or it's the other way around. But now all of that was a distant memory. No one sought out the singularly frozen in time, mercenaries tavern. A shabby exterior in the worn, broken down furniture, bottles of strong alcohol going through another stage of fermentation thanks to no one buying them and an empty wooden board made of cork, bereft of any and all assignments. Like the dying mercenaries, a tavern also forgotten and buried in time. However, regardless how forgotten this place was, there still was one man resolutely looking after it. He was Kim Yuson, a middle-aged mercenary. Just like every day, he polished the cutlery of the tavern, cleaned the furniture, and brushed up the empty cork notice board, believing that, one day, this board would be choke full of assignments. SFX for an ill-fitting door sliding open. 
The wooden door's metal hinges made a sorrowful wail as it opened. The half-open door then made more weak noises before breaking up completely. The man who was trying to open it carefully lowered the broken door down and entered inside the tavern. Dad. You've come. Take a seat. Kim Yusun stopped cleaning the furniture and went behind the bar to receive his son. It's been really a long time since your last visit here. The son couldn't say anything. Even though he had something he wanted to say prepared beforehand, the moment he saw his father's face nothing came out of his mouth. As a son, he knew better than anyone what this tavern meant to his father. That's why, the son began talking about his current situation, trying to beat around the bush. Dad, I've managed to rank up to a mid-tier knight in the Goryeo Knights Order recently. My annual salary has doubled as well. Because of that, I've decided to look for a house here in Kongwon. Now that I've got some breathing space, I thought it was a bit of waste commuting from Seoul all the time. TL, ha. Got you. I bet you thought this was our MC. Ha. You naughty author, you. Is that right? Well done, son. Your mother on the other side will be proud of you. The father, Kim Yu Son, smiled warmly. The son that was looking at his father with sad eyes, bit his lips and lowered his head. That was an event of the distant past, long enough ago to cause the memories to become indistinct now. His mother. His father's wife. The most beautiful woman for both of these people, lost her life in a manner that was truly depraved and utterly filthy, even to her final moments. The day Kim Yusun became a mercenary and not a knight was this very day. The son's dream also had changed on that day, too. The son was always proud of his father's dependable back, even if he became a mercenary and not a knight. Didn't matter he came back late at night, leaving behind a young child alone not even when he failed to return home altogether the boy was still proud of his father. Dad. From now on, let's stay together. Mercenaries they are not coming to this place anymore. The son was finally able to force out the words he wanted to say in a trembling voice. He knew better than anyone, of all the hard work his father had put in. That was why he raged so much when those fking mass media people tried to turn everything his father had done into crime. But now, the times had changed. The war against those bastards it was now a story from the past too long ago. That's not it. Unfortunately, his father shook his head. At his adamant attitude, the son hurriedly continued with his words. I also saw the news about the vampires. But right now. No, no. That's not it, my son. The father, Kim Yusun gently stroked the son's head like way back when his height was much shorter. I had a dream. You know very well what it means for me to have a dream, yes. Yes. The son dazedly nodded his head. His father possessed what those great knights call a special power, a trait. A strange power, that was distinctly different from mana and magic. I saw the vampires. I don't know what their end goal is, but they have somehow become stronger than in the past, and are getting ready to unfurl their wings. Even still, that is the job of knights' orders now. Mercenaries are. No. Knights' orders fear the public sentiment. And there are a lot more vampires out there than you think, existing in many different places. The son was about to raise his counter-argument when Kim Yu Son raised his index finger and placed it on his lips. Shu. He gestured his son to remain silent. Right at that time. SFX for an old-fashioned phone ringing. The unfamiliar sound of a ring leaked out from the old phone that hadn't had a reason to cry in the past several years. The father carefully picked the receiver up. Defeated by his own curiosity, the son jumped over the counter and stood very closely next to his father as well. This is the mercenary's tavern. Hello. A low, heavy voice came out from the phone. I'm giving you a call after seeing the flyer. Yes. It's a difficult assignment. That is why. Just tell me of their whereabouts. I'll take it from there. But then, how will I be able to tell you're successful or not? I'll discard the bodies where they'll be discovered more easily. The media will then do its job. Kim Yusun smiled thickly as the conversation flowed exactly as in his dream. Next up, 
he should deny being a mercenary. All right. However, there's a problem. I'm not. Just provide me with your mercenary name and a passcode to identify you. That's all I need. I'll take care of registering you as a mercenary. As if the man on the other side had panicked a little, the conversation stopped for a short moment. But not too long after, his name and the password came out accompanied by that deep voice. I understand. One week from today, please go to where you found that flyer. I'll leave behind the new information there. Eh. Hmm got it. The guy seemed more surprised at Kim Yusone's words, but he hung up without inquiring further. Who was he? The son asked, clearly puzzled. I don't know either. As he lightly replied, for the first time in a long while, the father had to fish out a mercenary application form from a drawer. Back when it all started, in order to apply as a mercenary, a person was required to provide a thorough proof of his or her background, such as a name, age, and the current physical condition. But now, the story was different. Since the industry was dying, the details of an application were left to the discretion of the tavern's boss. Grinning widely, Kim Yusone wielded his pen like a sword, and at the totally unbelievable things he wrote down, the son's mouth flapped wide open as well. Wah, wait a second, dad. An A rank? Isn't that the highest rank available? You only had one phone conversation. Wasn't I an A rank before as well? And besides, no one cares about mercenaries' rankings anymore. It's just a set of irrelevant alphabets now. Okay, fine, let's say we can make a concession on the ranking, but what is up with that name? By using that kind of a mercenary name, isn't it the same as telling the world, come and just kill me? At the son's worries, the father simply chuckled slightly. Actually, Kim Yu Son found the name to his liking. A mythical creature that ripped vampires to shreds more than that, a lonely but enraged beast that saw the rest of the world as its enemy. What's wrong with the Lican? It sounds cool and all. Dad. For the first time in his life, Kim Sae Jean bought a miracle of the modern world, the mobile phone. And what a wondrous contraption it was. He could activate it by touching the liquid crystal display, and if he projected the screen in the air, then the images became a lot bigger. At first, he got surprised by the projected images from the screen, but he was more or less used to it now. Wow. And now, Sae Jean was surfing the web using his phone inside a cafe near the Kangwon province. He paid special attention to neighbor news and entertainment TV and almost half of all the stories that were related to USAE Young. It seemed like the recently broadcasted episode of first round of the blacksmithing open invitational tournament had given rise to an ample amount of gossip material. While sipping his coffee, Sae Jean slowly read the articles regarding her and all the comments littering the comments section below. I thought she was unlikable in the beginning, but she was really cute by the end. Upvoted 1093 downvoted 53. I actually liked her from the beginning. Honestly, don't like it if she was trying to curry favors and say nice this and nice that. What didn't USAE Young try to do that at the end with that one blacksmith? Are your eyes decorations? You bloomin' dinkleberry. TL, no, the author didn't actually write this. He had the common sense to censor himself I had to figure out what insult he was writing here, so I improvised a bit. That blacksmith was worth it, that's why, you numbskull. You can see at one glance that weapon was something else. Didn't you see the close-up shot? Just shut the FCK up if you know jacked. Don't fucking make me laugh. It's still a low-quality CP no matter how nice it is. Trying to swing your DCK around with your trashy lowest tier low tier hunter knowledge. Do you even know anything about weapons in the first place? Yep. This dagger received the official rating of low quality today I'll go and take a look myself don't believe me, then come yourself, you loser BT monkey BD. We'll send you a PM so you better reply. What the hell? Reading this banquet of weird swear words, SAE Jean's brows narrowed slightly. Since he didn't want to read this junk no more, he scrolled down quickly until he found another interesting article. This one was also related to the blacksmithing tournament, but instead of focusing on people, it was about the submitted items. Through the eyes of an expert, 
evaluating the selected items from the first round of the Open Invitational Tournament. Becoming an artisan at a young age of 36 and raising much expectations to himself, the artisan craftsman So Yun Han has given his evaluations on the top 10 entrants out of the 40 that had successfully passed the first round of judging. It's a good weapon. Most of all, the refinement and the steelworking is quite faultless, and Smith's blacksmithing skill as well as the important mana infusion, is exemplary considering the level of the judging criteria in the first round. If there is one thing that falls short, then it'd be the fact that the apprentice Kim Su Han just so happens to be the disciple of the master Kim Taebak. This weapon isn't going to 100% satisfy that incredibly weighty expectations. Of course, he could have submitted the worst of his prefabricated items for this round as there are still second and final rounds to go if so, then that definitely raises the future expectation on this young craftsman. The evaluation of an artisan, be a mid-low quality. To be honest, I was quite astonished. I became so curious, I ended up asking about the information of this blacksmith who calls himself the ORK. First of all, the full name of the blacksmith itself is different from the others the Orcs Forge K. I've no idea why he chose to use such a name, but still, what he had crafted caused a huge buzz in this first round of judging. If you judge it by the criteria of the first round, then it's perfect in almost every way. The only weak link here is the quality of the material used but the excellent level of mana infusion more than compensates for that. Every knight that saw it praised this dagger greatly, saying it's very easy to infuse mana with the weapon. Well, there is no point in delaying this. Personally, I'd say this dagger takes the top spot in the first round. To think such a wonderful item would emerge so soon in the first round the future of blacksmithing, and the future of this tournament, is going to be a lot brighter moving forward. The evaluation of an artisan, a upper low quality low mid quality. Kiem. S.A.E. Jean let out a fake cough after getting somewhat self-conscious by what he had read. Tiring. Suddenly, a text message flew out of the phone. A very businesslike, no-nonsense text message was written there. It's U.S.A.E. Young. When can we meet? He had received U.S.A.E. Young's message she sent to his home because the mobile phone was synced with the landline there. There's that, but why was she calling him already when it had been only two hours since they parted ways? S.A.E. Jean decided not to reply yet, and stepped out of the cafe. Chapter, 28 It was at night, with a deep darkness descending down like a fog. A man, Kim Ji Han, was walking on an alleyway while talking to a certain someone on the phone. Another one was murdered three days ago. Yes. A total of two. No. I also have no idea. Even the police have no clue, so it's impossible for me, too. Yes. Both were revenge killings. It's revenge, because nothing was taken after the commission of the crime itself. Yes, well. I told you I don't know who it could be. I can't even get a feel for this guy. But still, I'm checking out all the mercenary bastards, just in case. I'll let the result known lat. Kim Ji Han suddenly stopped talking. The reason was because of a man standing by the corner of the alleyway. Since the person's back was turned away, Ji Han couldn't see the face, but it was not too difficult to figure that it was a he judging from the tall height and the athletic build. Please hold on for a second. Don't hang up. Ji Han held the phone in one hand and slowly approached the man. However, an ominous feeling suddenly brushed by his senses. He realized he should not get too close. The instincts of a vampire was busy telling him so. So, he began to carefully retread his steps backwards. Yeah. I'm going now. However, as if to say his worries were false, that man spoke to his own mobile phone and left the alleyway. Breathing a sigh of relief, Jihan raised his phone to his face. It's a false alarm. The moment he finished speaking, a giant shadow fell upon him from above. He couldn't even utter a single word. Terrifying fangs ripped out chunks of his throat, and monstrous hands tore off his arms away. The blood of a vampire was cold. An icy feeling akin to taking a cold shower enveloped his body. And at the same time, several alert windows popped up. The skill proficiency level for the passive skill flesh of a beast has risen from F to D. 
the skill proficiency level for the passive skill high strength wolf's claws has risen from F to D. The skill proficiency level for the passive skill predator has risen from F to D. The skill proficiency level for the passive skill the scent of a wolf has risen from D to C. Oi, oi. As he was reveling in the ecstasy of his level up, a sound leaked out from the mobile phone that had fallen on the ground. Kim Sae Jean lightly stepped on and crushed it. On the following day, Sae Jean headed to the coffee shop in order to meet up with USAE Young. The meeting had to be delayed for two weeks as both of them were swarmed with stuff to do. USAE Young was waiting for him inside the most luxurious coffee shop in the city. She was sitting alone in a corner of the shop, manning her phone. Even though she still had that youthful feel of a high school girl, there was a sophisticated aura oozing off from her as well. S.A.E. Jean carefully approached her and sat on the opposite side. Suddenly, the attention of the surroundings focused here. Ah, you've arrived. It's been a while. U.S.A.E. Young spoke in a relaxed manner as she shut the projections off. Were you looking at something? News articles. Another murder of a vampire happened yesterday. I hear this is the third victim already. S.A.E. Jean's heart missed a beat there. But he quickly adjusted his mind and relaxedly nodded his head. Oh. I also saw that. By the way. What is that next to you? He didn't want to deliberately walk down this conversational path and give himself more pain, so he changed the topic and asked her about the rectangular box next to her instead. Oh, this? I wonder, will you recognize it if you see it? S.A. Young placed the box on top of the table with a strangely excited voice. And with her lips twitching in a barely concealed smile, she opened the lid of the box. Ha! Huh. Kim S.A.E. Jean was left utterly shocked. However, the reason for that was rather different from what she was thinking of. Seeing your reactions, you must have seen that program I was in. This is that dagger. The iron dagger with excellent mana infusion. S.A.E. Young had a boastful smile on her face. It was as if she was proudly declaring, Hey, I'm this kind of a woman. This, how did you get to acquire this dagger? He asked in a serious manner. He was genuinely, really dying to know. This dagger was, without a doubt, his creation. But it was now in the hands of another person without his approval. Well, the organizers of the tournament did say they would take care of selling the submitted products, but still, they didn't even ask for his opinion. Our Knight's Order is the biggest sponsor of the tournament so we can choose one item each round before anyone else can. So, we quickly took away this dagger. Oh, is that right? Then, did you get in touch with the person who made this weapon yet? USAE Young shook head with a regretful expression. I couldn't. I really wanted to, but strangely, this person wished to be contacted through post only. And the address isn't for home but actually, just a post office in Kongwan as well. I did send him a letter, but seeing that there's no reply yet he probably didn't receive it. Ah. Oh. Now that he had heard her reasoning, the blame lied solely with his memories. He smiled apologetically and scratched the back of his neck. By the way, does Miss S.A. Young need something like that? I thought you already possessed better weapons. Yes. That is true. But this dagger, there is something special about it. Normally, daggers with short blades don't have a good built-in mana infusion so it's harder to wield mana with it, but this one is different. She said that, and while gripping the dagger, sent in her mana through to it. Shrung. An eerily chilly noise accompanied the mana blade quickly rising out from the dagger's blade itself. How is it? It's great, right? If it's this much, it can more than work as my backup weapon. That's why I bought it. Ah, ha. It's a good purchase. Such an item is hard to come by, after all. Finding her bright, satisfied expression as if she was a kid who just received a new toy rather adorable, S.A.E. Jean ended up smiling happily along her as well. Yes. I also think the same. The carvings on the surface of the blade is also really intricate, too it's almost like it's a work of art, you know? Even my father was tempted by this dagger. USAE Young retracted her mana and carefully stored the dagger back inside the luxurious box. 
he felt rather happy for some reason and stared at the box for a bit. Since his work was stored inside a luxurious container, didn't that mean his dagger was also a luxurious item? However, USAE Young misunderstood the intentions behind his gaze. She hurriedly shoved the box inside her bag. It was a rather disconcertingly hurried maneuver. When SAE Jean looked at her quizzically, her body trembled for a moment as she avoided a direct eye contact. Are you worried about me asking you for it? It seemed like he hit the nail on the head. USAE Young's face visibly stiffened, and it was dying in the colors of an unwilling defeat. Her expression was like, I shouldn't have boasted about it to him and after biting her lower lip, she reluctantly opened her mouth to speak. If you want it, I can give it to you. Why, you are my benefactor, after all of course I must give to you if you want it. She inserted her imperceptibly trembling hand inside the bag to search for the box. However instead of the box containing the dagger, she started pulling out stuff like her makeup, purse, books, a gold bullion a gold bullion? Something with a rather enormous implication popped out in the middle there, but actually, it was all her ploy to waste time for as long as possible. It's fine. I can't use weapons like that. I can't use mana. Is that true? What a shame, then. As soon as S.A.E. Jean said those words S.A. Young spat out a big sigh of relief and started shoving all the junk on top of the table back inside her bag. That's that, but why are we meeting here today? When S.A.E. Jean asked her for the original reason for the meeting, her eyes opened wide after realizing that she had forgotten all about it. Ah, uh, that. Hunting, I suggested before that we should hunt together. I should apologize. Two days from now, I'm scheduled to go out on a hunt. I'd like Mr. S.A.E. Jean to accompany me. Oh it'll have to depend on time how many hours are you planning to spend hunting. Since the amount of time he could spend as a human was limited, it would not work for him if the hunt took too long to finish. Around two hours. I also have other things planned afterwards, so I can't hunt together for too long as well. Mm. It's fine, then. Kim S.A.E. Jean smiled and reached across for a handshake. Two hours. There were more than enough people willing to pay a handsome amount just to meet with you S.A.E. Young. For a person of her status, he was very much willing to invest just two hours of his time. I'll see you then. As she began shaking his hand, a black car came to a halt in front of the coffee shop. That was some terrific timing, that. I'll be going now. Oh, do you need a lift? No, thank you. I'll be fine alone. If that's the case, then I shall go ahead. S.A. Young walked upright first and then suddenly, started walking awkwardly as she left the shop. It seemed like she was not used to walking in high heels just yet. Watching those high school girl-like actions, S.A.E. Jean smiled slightly before he himself vacated the coffee shop. After separating from her, S.A.E. Jean went to the same lamp post where he had found the flyer. As before, there was another flyer there. Outwardly, it was an ad for house for sale but it was actually the information on his next job, judging by the thick smell of blood coming off of it. Kongwan Province, Hengxiang County, Starlight Apartment immediately available to buy. Call 05-01-0239-4039. The location was the Starlight Apartment in Hengxiang. And the difficulty was 05. The vampire he took care of yesterday was 02, so in comparison, this one should be 2. 5 time more difficult. S.A.E. Jean agonized for a moment. He was getting stronger, somewhat, after hunting numerous monsters and absorbing their mana stones, but. As he continued to agonize, the OLED exterior billboard hanging on a building showed a breaking news. Now, we bring you a public announcement from the Special Investigation Division of the Police regarding the serial killings of vampires. How do you do, this is Chief Yu Song from the Special Investigation Division of Police. That was the famous Chief of Special Police that even S.A.E. Jean knew of. Probably, she was the most famous person in the entire country. Long, white hair. A pair of sharp but also elegant eyes, lips etched with a determined spirit. Outwardly appearing as a beautiful woman, she was the sole divine beast type Suin in South Korea. She was the white tiger, Yu Song. 
The bloodline that was widely acknowledged as possessing a superior strength than a regular highest tier ranked knight flowed within her. The days of sanctioned killings ended in utter failure a long time ago, leaving nothing but bloodshed and hatred behind. We at the Special Investigation Division, in order to prevent the repeat of the past mistake, will swear to the high heavens to spare no efforts in investigating the series of murders involving vampires. We have determined that all three murders were a hate crime committed by a single individual. Even S.A.E. Jean felt momentarily pressured by someone as important as Yu Song personally announcing that on TV. And now, as a part of our ongoing investigation, we shall reveal the identity of the prime suspect. Ever since he used the name Leakin, he was prepared to face suspicions from the vampires, but still, his heart had to skip a beat here. But that was just only for a moment. The prime suspect calls himself the Leakin, and he is a human mercenary ranked A, the highest. Operating for almost two decades now, and his job completion rate at 100%, he is confirmed to be a true veteran among veteran mercenaries. Operating only in the shadows, and as a consequence, little if any people know about him, this mercenary even has earned the nickname of the legend. The highest ranking. Completion rate of 100%. A veteran. And a legend, etc., etc. Hearing all that nonsensical description of himself, only then did S.A.E. Jean understand what the tavern boss meant by, when he proudly boasted there was no need to worry about the exposure of his identity. The governing oversight of mercenaries had collapsed a long time ago. So, as long as a boss said so, it became truth. On top of that, there weren't any other mercenaries to dispute that as a lie. The boss already fired the first salvo by saying that very few people knew of him but even without such deception. Mercenaries were strictly independent-minded individuals anyway, so they would hold little to no interest in other mercenaries' affairs. That's all we have uncovered so far. That is why, we are searching for those who have worked together with this Leakin in the past twenty years. Citizens, perhaps retired mercenaries. Looks like I'll have to lay low for a while. The fake information on the application form had become a veil that completely covered the truth but, the existence of Yu Song still placed a great deal of pressure. The relationship between a wolf and a tiger was that of a prey and a predator so there was that, too. Of course, a wolf that grew up completely in an unnatural manner like him would eat up a tiger easily, but Yu Song wasn't just any tiger. She was a divine beast, a bloody white tiger, to boot. Chapter 29 According to the current estimates, a total of around 2,000 vampires are living peacefully while consuming the blood of livestock. The government is currently protecting their identities which helps them enjoy a smooth integration with the society. And the increase in the number of vampires seeking this protection of the government seems to be a fast-growing trend as well. I believe the reason why the Special Investigation Division of the Police has designated the serial killings of vampires as hate crime, is because the authority doesn't believe they aren't serious enough in nature. However, weren't all three murdered vampires drinking the blood of humans? And on top of that, human remains were discovered in their homes. Not to mention, the last monster outbreak near the nameless church was the work of the vampires as well. Of course, those incidents are being thoroughly investigated, as revealed by the investigators themselves. But, those incidents and this one is a separate issue. And, even if vampires had committed such an atrocity, the punishment should not be immediate execution. We even established a special communication channel for vampires as well, so this. From the TVs installed inside the waiting area of the rest stop, the conversations that made SAE Jean uncomfortable continuously leaked out. From his point of view, he just could not understand. Vampires consuming the blood of livestock what a pleasant idea. However, the real nature of vampires wasn't like that. Vampires had a totally different origin from the Suins, who had blended in with the rest of humanity by suppressing their nature and even going as far as mating with humans, knowing that their identity might be lost in the process. After all, they weren't being referred to as bats for no reason, were they? These bastards betrayed others as if enjoying a meal. Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean Mr. S.A.E. Jean S.A.E. Jean woke up abruptly from the thrall of TV's broadcast by the call of the approaching U.S.A.E. Young. What were you doing? You didn't reply even though I was calling for you. Oh. I'm sorry. 
My bad. I was thinking about something else. Let us get going, then. So, which hunting ground did you say it is? The low mid-tier hunting ground. S.A.E. Young promptly answered. S.A.E. Jean fell into a slight contemplation. Currently, he was acting as a perfectly normal human Kim S.A.E. Jean. In other words, his stats were in the lowered state. If he was to do rough evaluation of his rank in terms of the knight ranking system no matter how favorable, a low tier at most. All right. Sounds good. It sounded about right, a team of a low mid-tier knight and a low tier hunting together in the low mid-tier ground. Oh, by the way, what is your current hunter ranking? Back then, you were ranked a low tier, yes. I rose up by two ranks and now I'm a mid-tier. USAE Young's lips became O-shaped in an expression of admiration after hearing his words. It had been only four months. The difficulty of raising the rank by two during that short amount of time would have been unimaginably high, no matter whether one was a knight or a hunter. As I thought, your speed of growth is really fast. By the way, is that a weapon on your waist? Eh. Oh, this? Yes, I also use a close-range weapon. As you already know, it's because of my trait. But, well it's nothing much compared to a knight, so it should be better to just think of me as an assistant for today. Back then, I just got lucky, is all. As I have said before, I can't use mana. Like a muscle head, all I've got is my physical strength. Seeing Kim S.A.E. Jean speak as if it was nothing much, U.S.A.E. Young lightly smiled and nodded her head, telling him not to worry. There was a lot of danger lurking around in the monster field. As the instances of sudden monster encounters were rather common, even the knights thought better of hunting solo in a ground with the equivalent rank. Hunting solo, in this case meant either a knight moving alone or a knight and a hunter forming a pair to hunt together. I'll help you pile up good achievements today. For the next two hours, let's catch five monsters, which should be enough. Regardless of the dangers, USA Young was, outwardly at least, full of confidence. She was full of energy seemingly because she wanted to make up for the defeat of the other day, or maybe to show off the different and improved side of her. All right, I'll be in your care, then. S.A.E. Jean replied with a smile. And with the end of the conversation, the hunt began in earnest. Twenty minutes passed as they searched around the low mid-tier hunting ground for a monster, until finally, a faint smell entered S.A.E. Jean's nostrils. Northward, three hundred meters, one schemer. A schemer was a skeleton-type monster wearing a special robe. This robe featured an amazing protective coloring ability that allowed the sly monster to blend in with the surroundings and perform sneak attacks that were difficult to avoid. Since it carried around a death scythe constructed from mana, those who had witnessed a schemer for the very first time mistook it as the so-called Grim Reaper and therefore a very powerful monster but in reality, as long as one was wary of its sneak attacks, it didn't amount to much. But spotting it was terribly difficult, so a schemer fell into the category of the troublesome monsters to deal with in the low mid-tier hunting ground. Especially so, for a knight like USA Young here, who enjoyed going out on a solo hunting. She was mindlessly walking straight towards the monster's direction, never in her wildest dreams imagining that there was a schemer waiting for her there. Hold up for a second. S.A.E. Jean grasped her shoulder. U.S.A.E. Young floated a big question mark above her head. S.A.E. Jean simply pointed towards the seemingly empty northerly direction. What is it? It's a schemer. She narrowed her brows. A schemer was nearly impossible for a human to spot. Only a knight with a rank of high mid-tier or high tier could just barely perceive the feelings of danger. I've got a knack for stuff like this. I can sense nearby monsters like a clairvoyant. TL, the author wrote like a ghost. Change to clairvoyant. Before USAE Young could make a retort, SAE Jean picked up a stone and threw it at the schemer's position. They said that action was better than words, and seeing it personally would be the best proof there was. Puck. The stone drawing a parabolic line flew until colliding with the empty air. The schemer slowly revealed itself after getting struck unexpectedly on the back of its head by a rock. See? It's your turn now. Charge. Kim S.A.E. Jean refreshingly smiled. 
USAE Young was momentarily lost for words at his ability to find a schemer, but still quickly drew her sword out and rushed forward. Already, the weapon's blade was gleaming in the layer of blue mana. At the sudden attack of its enemies, the schemer raised the scythe to resist, but her sword that cut straight down ignored such a pathetic attempt at defense and cleaved the monster and its weapon in half. Just like her personality, her swordsmanship was straightforward without any unnecessary add-ons. The fatally wounded schemer became a heap of dust as it fell, and on top of this mound of dust laid a brightly shining mana stone. Even though she had oh so easily taken care of the schemer, USAE Young still carried a confused expression on her face as she looked at him. I've got a good perception and an eyesight. SAE Jean made an excuse as she continued to gaze at him, but it was not enough to completely dissolve her curiosity. A schemer wasn't a monster that could be located by some perception and an eyesight. But what could she do? The person himself said so. Let's go somewhere else. Kim Sae Jean pushed the back of still unconvinced USAE Young and urged her towards the next prey. Their hunting proceeded without a hitch. The commonly occurring sudden encounters never happened once. As soon as Sae Jean located monsters, USAE Young would rush out and cut them down. If there was a group of monsters, then USAE Young took the front and Sae Jean brought up the rear. The strength of the human Kim Sae Jean wouldn't be able to defeat a monster from the low mid tier hunting ground, but it was enough to buy them some time, which helped USAE Young a lot. Like this, the number of monsters they were able to hunt during the two hours together was 15. This was the highest in USAE Young's career, all thanks to Sae Jean's ability to locate monsters like a radar. My pockets are full only after two hours. I didn't expect this looks like we'll make a pretty good pair, don't you think so? TL, the pockets here aren't literally her trouser pockets, as you'll see below. USAE Young spoke as she hefted the expanding pocket full of monster remains. TL, lit. Expanding pocket. I agree. Us too, work better than expected. SAE Jean replied while smiling lightly. At his joking tone, she narrowed her brows and stared at him with serious eyes. I'm serious. Normally, a knight would pair up with other knights or hunters of equivalent ranks, you know. But I don't want to pair up with another knight as that would divide up the achievements. That's why I paired up with Hyun Oh Appa back then. Hyun Oh Oh, you mean that bullet man? TL, not sure whether the author made a reference here or not but he used to describe Hyun Oh. Although it literally means a man riding on a bullet, I have TL'd it as bullet man, but in actuality, it's the localized title for the 1988 Hollywood comedy The Naked Gun. If you've seen the original poster for that movie, you'll understand why. Also, no, you're not wrong, the author did make a mistake with the name here. Hyano is a high-tier baldy knight, while this bullet man is a low-tier hunter named Yun Du Han. Yes. You also know his nickname. He's the butler in my house. No, wait a sec, please don't change the subject. So, what do you think about me? USAE Young clearly addressed SAE Jean in a manner that, if anyone ever heard only this part of the conversation, it would have splendidly raised a misunderstanding. If any old hot blooded man heard that, he'd accept the proposition in a heartbeat, full of joy. But seeing SAE Jean take his time and agonize over the decision, she sighed out in frustration and continued with her words. Let's just do it together, since it's possible to pair up even if we're not from the same knight's order. We'll divide our earnings 9 colon 1. No, I can do a 10 o'clock, even. Of course, the 10 is for you. This was, indeed, the majesty of the gold spoon. Maybe it was because of the debt of 4. 5 million US, or maybe because his greed over wealth had increased, whatever, the talk of money greatly interested him. Let's aim high and grow together. USAE Young reached her hand out for a shake, her face solemn. She didn't want to let go of someone like him. Initially, she met him to repay the debt of saving her life but after spending this short amount of time together, she now understood the true value of this man. Normally speaking, there wasn't a lot of hunters with abilities out there, and someone with a detection ability would be even more difficult to find still. No, if it was at a level of spotting a schemer that easily, then the situation was well past being rare now. 
Even the second-generation Suins that made up the majority of Suins nowadays found it difficult to spot a schemer, as their animal-like senses were noticeably weaker compared to the pure-blooded first generation. TL, this bracketed bit, again, isn't mine, but from the author. On top of this, SAE Jean's physical prowess was nothing to scoff at, either. She estimated that his ranking would have been in the upper mid-tier, and the only reason why he remained in the mid-tier was probably because of the fact that the required quota of hunting experience had to be fulfilled first. As you may well know, I'm a really sturdy, strong and stubborn golden rope. TL, this line proved to be a weird one to TL. Personally, I think you SAE Young meant to say, because of her background, our MC better think of riding on her coattails or something like that. USAE Young was taught to give precedence to what she needed over what she wanted. And now, the person she needed was standing right in front of her eyes. What are you waiting for? Take my hand. SAE Young waved the hand offered and urged him for a shake. SAE Jean agonized for a bit longer, before laying out a single condition first. Twice a week. Two hours a day. And please, give me all the recovered mana stones. He then waited for her reply. All right, that's not so hard. With those light words, a bright smile filled with sincerity greeted SAE Jean. He too assumed a smile and smoothly took her hand. You promise? Let's do a stamp, too. She even tried to do a thumb and index finger stamp. And at the same time, a new alert window floated up to his view. Condition complete, forming a pair. Acquired the passive skill pleasant voice. Skill proficiency level, FTL, lit. Said nice to hear voice. The host's voice will have a positive effect during negotiations and persuasions and can evoke empathy in interpersonal relationships. This skill only becomes active when the host is in a human's appearance. Ah. SAE Jean looked at that window, stupefied. It seemed like his belief that skills could only be earned in monster forms was quite wrong. Ha. Kim SAE Jean returned to his cave side leaked out of his mouth first. It was gloomy and soggy and hard and. His body was itching to leave this stupid place as soon as possible. The proceeds from the sales of potions should I just ask for a half of it now, and promise to make up for it later? He thought about the proceeds from the potions for a bit. Whatever he wanted to do, he needed a home first and foremost he was getting this close to making his escape from the stupid cave but since it was already in the middle of the night, he might as well ask later. He brought out his mobile phone, switched on the internet connection and projected it to the wall of the cave. Why is it all about USA Young again? As he was surfing the net the activity that had become an indispensable part of his daily routine he saw that the no. One real-time search result was about USA Young. Not thinking too deeply about it, he clicked her name. The very first thing that showed up, was articles related to the TV show The Qualities of a Night. Aha! Kim Sae Jean nodded his head, realizing that the stuff shot a few weeks ago had now become another trending topic. It seemed like this type of reality TV featuring a knight going out on a hunt was a first of its kind, and as a character, USA Young had gone down quite well with the audience. It might have been an average sort of an idea at the least, but if the producer did his job smartly, there was certainly a possibility to do something big with the show. The top trending stories related to her on the website were of fairly simple topics. Like, how did her hunt progress, how much hardship did she face during her hunt, and finally, what USA Young was like. The last one was a bit out of kilter with the others, but the rest had taken up more than half of the coverage and was incredibly popular as well. He found all of them very interesting to read until he got to see what the seventh real-time trending search topic happened to be. What the hell is this? At seventh, three words Kim, S-A-E, and Jean was written there. He thought it was someone with the same name and as he was thinking that, the list of the real-time search topics began to change. And just like that, new words showed up on the tenth. The Hunter Kim S-A-E Jean. Chapter, 30. At first, he panicked. As easily demonstrated here, S.A.E. Jean's identity wasn't worth much to dig up. What troubled him more, though, was Hazeline. Under the context of having a friendly relationship, he had shown her his real face, after all. 
Of course, he was not worried about his secrets being exposed as Dark Elves hated meeting people in the first place as well as placing a huge importance on being trustworthy. But still, he did feel somewhat uncertain as there had never been a precedence of an alchemist moonlighting as a hunter on the side. But man, this is so weird. Whatever the case may have been, his name, face and the job description was exposed here for all to see in the top portal site of South Korea, neighbor, and he found all these oh so strange. And the photo of his face taken from the side was showing his ungainly chin line as well tl, to be honest, I'm not sure if I tl'd the last line here correctly. The author wrote his chin from the side seemed fatally jutting out. I took it as MC not liking how his chin is shaped or some such. After becoming a mid-tier ranked hunter at the young age of 22, Kim Sae Jin is acknowledged by other hunters as one of the top prospects of the future, having already received the title of the Heavenly Gifted. The journalists seemed to love fabricating stories. He had no clue just who had acknowledged him as a top future prospect. But he had to concede that reading such rumors about himself was a fun thing to do. Likewise, he found the words written in the article itself, as well as the comments in the comments section, rather interesting too. He's got a nice enough face, got a good build, his height is just about right, so he matches up well with USA Young, me thinks. Upvoted 983 downvoted 482. Matching up well, my ass. You really think a romance between a regular hunter and an unobtainium spoon is possible? Me agree. The Dawn ain't the name of your pet dog. They are duking it out for the top position in the country. Plus, USAE Young is still a sophomore in a high school. Oh and by the way, what's USAE Young's real height? Saw it personally, it's between 159160. But me thinks she's got a complex about her height, always insisting that it's 164. That was really cute. I told you, it's 164. Not 159. Obviously, not every comment posted would be of nicer opinions but still, he found it fun just reading all the replies. That night, Kim Sae Jin stayed awake while reading all the articles related to himself and the accompanying comment sections. In the following afternoon, Sae Jin headed to the Yosian Alchemy House to meet up with Hazeline. Since he was going to ask her for another big favor, he took along nine bottles of potions as well. He handed the potions over as soon as they met, and he waited until her face was glowing with ecstasy and happiness before bringing up the real reason for his visit today. The rest of the money. Can I repay you slowly over time? Right now I'm running short on funds. Hazeline showed a brief panic, but soon, nodded her head with a magnanimous smile on her face. Her reason was simple enough the alchemist she was going to work together for a really, really long time shouldn't be left destitute, after all. She immediately transferred one. Seven million US out of four. Two million accrued from the sales of the potion so far. She even added that he could take his time to repay her. Sae Jean thought that she was really one cool woman. The persuasion has been successful. The skill proficiency level for the passive skill pleasant voice rises. And there was an unexpected bonus to boot as well. As Sae Jean was glowing in the satisfaction, Hazeline remembered something and asked him about it. By the way, what was that reality TV show all about? I was really surprised to find that you are a hunter. And also, friendly with the granddaughter of the Dawn Corporation chairman, too. Oh that? That's my side job. I was getting a cabin fever stuck in a workshop churning out potions, so was trying to de-stress when I accidentally ran into Miss S.A.E. Young. That's about it. Is that true? How mysterious. But well, it really doesn't matter what you do on the side anyways. And with you S.A.E. Young Kiem. Fortunately, Hazeline didn't try to dig in deeper. To her, who knew about SAE Jean, it was understandable to a degree since the near-crippled USAE Young was able to quickly recover soon after taking the potion brewed by none other than the alchemist Kim SAE Jean right here. Have the Dawn made contact with him already? While making such wild guesses, she inwardly accepted why USAE Young and Kim SAE Jean were so friendly with each other. It was a totally plausible scenario. No matter what other people said, the Dawn Corporation was the biggest company in the country. And if they wanted to find someone, it wouldn't be hard for them at all. 
Ah, uh, right. Sir Alchemist, you do know that, by law, direct dealings between people are prohibited, and you must go through an alchemy house, yes? If you receive a sales request, please, you must inform us first. Hazeline was sincerely asking for something that made no sense from SAE Jean's point of view. Huh. Oh. Of course. I'll do just that. Kim Sae Jean bought a detached single unit house near the monster field of Kongwon with the money received from Hazeline. But the house cost him a whopping one. Six million, instantly depleting his bank account and making him feel bitter inside. The house had two floors above ground and one basement floor. He decided to use the above ground floors as the living space, and to convert the basement into a workshop where he could do his blacksmithing and alchemy work. With the remaining funds, he went around and bought various furniture. Besides the obvious things like a bed and a set of couches, he also got himself proper potion crafting tools and storage cabinets to store both the ingredients for potions as well as the metal ingots for blacksmithing. Although he purchased so many things while feeling excited for the future, there was still a week left before he could move into his new home. He had to learn the hard way that the dates of buying a house and then moving in, could be quite different from one another. After all that, the remaining money was around 2,600 US. Currently, SAE Jean was inside his cave. Inside this dark, gloomy cave, he was concentrating on making the next weapon for the second round of the blacksmith's tournament, which would take place in a week's time as well. He initially thought that once some leeway was found, he'd not want to do this thing again, but no, he was getting really fired up for this. The reactions of the media and the general populace were like a drug to him. He wanted to be praised by them some more. He wanted these people to see his hard work and go bonkers mad with admiration. And his desire helped him to find the true value of the orc smithing technique the potential of this incredible skill. And that is the bestowal of special characteristics. It meant, as the words implied, to enhance an armament with special powers. At first, just like those simple-minded orcs, he only thought about one-dimensional special traits like sharper, sturdier, but things were different now. The flexibility, fluidity, flammability, density, melting point, boiling point, electrical and heat conductivity, viscosity, spectrum of color for the material's absorption of light, magnetism, and etc., etc. There were numerous chemical properties to consider. Depending on the proficiency level, the orc smithing technique could combine these properties and bestow them. The blade that could bend like a snake to attack the enemy at the will of its user, the whipsword and invisibility cloak that manipulates the refraction of light to fool the eyes. Etc., etc. The possible types of armament he could create through the smithing technique were truly limitless. Of course, the weapons with such added attributes that were made by human smiths could be found every now and then out in the market but they were simply the results from nothing more than lucky accidents. As an orc, though, SAE Jean could bestow all these special attributes at will. But for now, his skill proficiency level was too low, so he still had a long way to go. There wasn't a single sign of the orc warrior evolving to the next level, and no matter how many mana stones he absorbed, the amount of mana he possessed remained the same as before. The smithing technique has been completed. Hardness level, D. A new attribute has been added, Flame Damage Level DTL, the author wrote here Level D Fire Start. Since I'm not 100% sure if that's a correct translation, or indeed what he wanted to convey, I'll go with a game-wise sounding Flame Damage for now. Although the degree of completion is exemplary, the current skill proficiency level limit for the Orc Warrior is D, and thus the level cannot be raised anymore. So this is the best I can do. The weapon SAE Jean crafted just now was a saber. Beautiful patterns on the surface of the sleek, smooth and ashen-colored blade imparted the feelings of noble elegance. The attribute bestowed to the saber, the flame damage level D, did not mean that flames were literally lit on the blade itself. When a knight breathed mana into the weapon, only then the effects of ultra-high temperature would show itself. In other words, the melting power comparable to a furnace would be added on top of the mana-enhanced cutting power. he -ah. He was really chuffed at this weapon, completed after dozens of attempts over the last several mornings. But his head was getting dizzy now. So, he promptly lied down on the cold, hard floor and fell into a restful slumber. 
That night, he dreamt of a dream where he was receiving a lot of praise from the mass media. It was a clear afternoon. And it was finally the day for him to move into the house of his dreams S.A.E. Jean was busy placing the furniture with the aid of the workers from the moving company, when... Vroom! The phone he placed in his back pocket silently vibrated. Let's go hunting today at 2 p.m. It was a text message from USAE Young. In the three weeks following the broadcasting of that TV show, he went out on a total of five hunts as a pair with her. And every time that happened, the attentions of the world focused on him. Hell, there was even an incident where another hunter took a paparazzo shot of him and uploaded it to a SNS. But USAE Young didn't seem to mind that at all. She concentrated only on hunting and treated SAE Jean no differently from before, regardless of whether they filmed her or not. No can do. In the middle of moving house today. And somehow, SAE Jean could speak to her without using honorifics now. From their second hunting onwards, he felt that they had become friendly enough so he started omitting the honorifics every now and then, but at that time, USAE Young didn't like it and became rather curt with her response. So, he replied in kind. Initially, he just wanted to test the waters, but then, even SAE Jean became stubborn about this matter and ended up not using the honorifics at all for the rest of the hunt's duration. He thought it was par for the course. After all, he was older than her by four years. The hunt that was supposed to last for two hours was cut in half as a result. Actually, she became pretty peeved and returned home early without saying anything. However, she called him back precisely after a week had passed by. Well, that's how the human relationship generally worked the one in need would make the approach first. From then on, USAE Young resolutely endured SAE Jean speaking without honorifics. Nowadays, her face color remained the same even if he spoke to her without one. When he asked her how she felt about it, she said that initially at least, she didn't want to see him ever again but it became unbearably frustrating when teaming up with other hunters so she gave up and called him in the end. S.A.E. Jean naturally felt quite proud of his own skills after hearing her confession. How come? We'll take too long to finish up here. But that's no good. I don't have any other free time beside today this week. Let's hunt next week, then. I can't today. During this exchange of texts, it was plain to see who was in the advantageous position. USAE Young didn't send any more texts as if she got peeved again. Not really caring about that, SAE Jean pocketed the phone and went back to work. After all, she'd call him again in her own time. Indeed, this was only possible because this lady knight had become too dependent on the abnormally talented hunter's abilities. Thank you for all your hard work. And finally 4 p.m. The placement of furniture was completed with only one hour of human time remaining. This was his home. Even though he had to take on a debt to purchase it, S.A.E. Jean was still overcome with emotions and he took his time surveying the spacious house. Each of the rooms here was as big as his one-room apartment. The longer he gazed at his house, the closer he got to shedding tears of happiness. Chapter, 31 Ah so the dawn managed to take that potion, too? They aren't messing around, are they? The headquarters of the Raven Knights Order, inside the rest area for the waiting knights. The words of a disappointed knight spread around like an infectious sigh. Inadvertently eavesdropping on the side, Kim Yurin's body trembled ever so slightly. Right. They are very aggressive nowadays. Don't forget, they also hit jackpot with this year's blacksmith's tournament, too. They say a lucky son of gun would fall into a lap of a beautiful woman even when tripping over backwards. Not only two unexpectedly great weapons showed up, there's the hidden master, too that gathering of small fries all of a sudden became a meeting of the masters. Oh, that's right. There was the tournament, too. What was it again? The Orc's Forge. What was it like in the second round? Did you see the item? I didn't see it but the seniors did, though. And I hear it's pretty incredible. It's supposedly the same rank as the last year's winner, at around mid-quality, even though it has been the second round only. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do but to sit on the sidelines sucking on our thumbs. Since the dawn has the first refusal and what not. The male knight massaged his temples, as if the mere thoughts of this event irritated him to no end. 
Ha! That's why the boys from the Dawn Knights Order are strutting around like that after seeing their irritating mugs, how the hell am I supposed to carry on like this? Their conversation was full of complaints about the Dawn Knights Order's aggressive rise to the top spot. On the side, Kim Yurin let out a long sigh and roughly tousled up her hair into a mess. Ow, SHT. If taking into account the end results only, what was happening now seemed like entirely her fault. Firstly, the Goblin Alchemist. This alchemist, who had caused an uproar in the worlds of alchemy and with the knights as well, was in a tight relationship with the Yosian Alchemy House. It was suspected that they had secured the exclusive rights to distribute the Goblin series of potions. And the reason why the Raven Knight's Order didn't receive the necessary info regarding the Goblin Alchemist was because of the blood feud-like animosity existing between her and Hazeline. Next, the Blacksmith's Open Invitational Tournament. The reason why the Dawn poured so much money to sponsor the competition was to secure the rights to acquire the outstanding weapons from each of the judging rounds. If it was in the past, the Raven would have rallied other knights' orders and opposed this. Saying granting such rights was utterly nonsensical rubbish but the quality of the tournament's participants were in a clear decline from before, so the Dawn was left to do whatever they pleased. Heck, Kim Yurin herself argued that investing in other projects with that budget would be a wiser move. However, such an estimation ended up dramatically missing the mark. It was fine even when the apprentice of Master Tebek entering the competition. But then, the orc's forge happened. Nothing was known of this unknown person the gender, age, even the race but for sure, his sudden appearance was completely out of everyone's expectations. Only yesterday, Kim Yurin was there at the second round of judging and personally saw the weapon submitted by this smith the hotly burning flame steel saber. She was utterly stunned by the gorgeous elegance of the saber, and was left even more speechless at the name modifier she had never seen before in her life. At first, she was puzzled by what this hotly burning flame thing might be. But after testing it for less than five minutes, she was able to definitely understand what it meant. And then, she was entranced by it. As she infused mana with the sword, the mana blade took on a crimson hue and that reddish blade aura boiled at high temperatures. As the quality was only rated around the mid-rank, she couldn't infuse a lot of mana into it but still, it was an incredible feat that the sword could add the effect of heat to the mana blade. It was a very good weapon. It was so good, the Raven Knight's order just had to take it with them. It was that excellent. Unfortunately, that was just a pie in the sky for her. The issue was the rights to the first refusal. As long as the Dawn Knight's order wasn't made up of dummies, they would definitely choose this saber. At the thought of giving up on this wonderful weapon without a fight, only to obediently hand it over to the people of Dawn, made her lose last night's sleep. You idiot idiot idiot. S, stop that, please. Unable to hold back anymore, Kim Yurin began hitting her head in regret when, Kim Sujayam suddenly popped out of nowhere and tried to stop her. Amem. How long have you been watching me? Now thoroughly embarrassed, Yurin scratched the back of her neck and stared at him. He had a shortish stature and a cute face, but contrary to that young appearance, he possessed a genuine talent that promoted him to a mid-tier knight at a tender age of twenty-three one of the brighter future prospects of the Raven Knight's Order. Just now. I was training with Senior Jong Suk and wanted to take a short break. Is that so? Yu Rin let out another long sigh. Kim Soo Jiam gazed at her with worry before handing over a cup of warm coffee. Ahem. Um, please, don't mind too much about those things. It's not like as if Miss Yurin knew what was going to happen, anyway. You're right. Thanks. She lightly brushed the head of the young knight she found adorable for worrying about her. His cheeks blushed softly at her actions. By the way, you think the goblin alchemist definitely made a deal with the dawn? Yurin asked while sipping the coffee. Kim Sujayam came from a prestigious family background. Currently, his father was serving as a judge and his uncle was the vice chief of the Wizards Association. So, when it came to intel, he should be better informed than her. I also don't know the details, but it's almost a sure thing. Judging by the potions all entering the Dawn's pockets. They are openly being favored, aren't they? Do you know what kind of terms they offered him? Eh. 
Ah, from what I hear, the rumors say the Dawn has offered the alchemist his own private workshop and an unlimited supply of ingredients, to boot. That's how we get the non-stop flow of the potions. The goblin alchemist, a genius alchemist who appeared like a meteor. His name might be a little irksome, but the capability and talent displayed were good enough to be referred to as the second coming of Rhodes. On top of that, he was also quite diligent with his work earning the title of the chief of a workshop by producing over 50 bottles of potions in just under five months since his debut. Oh, and a private jet, too. There was a rumor of them buying him a private jet as well. What, a jet? Ha! Huh. I've got no answer for that. Not even one. I mean, do they have a surplus of money like air or something? She found herself sighing a lot more nowadays. The fact that the country's leading knight's order, the Raven, couldn't have an amiable relationship with the rising star of alchemy, was a fatal chink in its armor. And to think, the blame laid solely with her. Hazeline. However, when a certain person's mug floated up in her mind, Kim Yurin ended up gritting her teeth. Until the end, like a stubborn mule, she was getting in Yurin's way. What an evil bitch. Hey, Su Jian. Can you find out something for me? Kim Yurin asked him in a powerless voice. He quickly nodded his head. Of course. Just give me the word. That goblin alchemist. Dig out his identity for me, will you? Excuse me? Su Jian was taken aback and had to ask her again. Keeping the identities of alchemists were an unspoken rule that had been in practice for a very long time. Especially more so for a knight's order, as they had an indelible symbiotic relationship with the potion-making alchemists. Well, it really can't be helped, right? Kim Yurin just couldn't accept this lying down without doing something. The number of times the Raven Knight's Order failed to attend the auction venues for the potions was already way too high, because the alchemy house informed them of wrong dates by a mistake. Allegedly. So, she decided that she needed to act, even if it meant clashing against Hazeline once more. Even then, even if you meet the alchemist, what will you do? I don't think we can offer better terms than what the Dawn has offered him. Well, that. Kim Yurin massaged her temples and agonized deeply, before spitting out the only idea that managed to pop up in her mind. Well, let's just hope that Mr. Goblin is a dude. Eh, eh. Wah, what are you talking about, Miss Yurin? It was just a joke. But the reactions of Kim Su Jian was something else. He stood right up, his face crumpling in an unsightly manner. Both of his tightly clenched fists were quaking visibly. That, that, that. Yurin snorted after finding his current actions where he couldn't even string proper words together rather ridiculous. I was just cracking a joke. You think I'd do something like that? As a highest tier ranked Knight of the Raven Order, I feel that I should have a chat with this alchemist at least once. Sitting on our asses doing nothing won't solve anything, after all. Besides the matter of the potions, there are more important things to consider, such as our fame and the pride of being the best in this country. Are, right, of course. Only then, Kim Su Jiam was able to calm down and sit back on his chair. Check it out for me. We can't let the people over at dawn take everything away. Especially now, when we are conflicting more and more over the issues of the fishers. We'll do. But seriously you wouldn't do that, would you? Kim Su Jiam asked her timidly, like a rabbit. Yurin chuckled lightly and replied. Obviously. What do you see me as? Yes. Well then, I'll do my best and see what I can find out. On a certain afternoon, drowsiness brought on by a full belly slowly consumed an ebony-colored wolf lying sprawled on a sofa, making it slowly drift in and out of sleep. But then, a mobile phone went for wrong and woke up the creature. Opening its eyes, the wolf extended one of its legs. The paw that looked no different than that of an animal suddenly became a person's hand as it grasped the phone. An incredible weapon came in during this round of the tournament. Would you like to see it? It was a text message from USA Young. It had been a month and a week after their first hunt together. The number of times they hunted as a pair was eight. Nowadays, she sent him text messages like this quite often. Even if there was no scheduled hunting, 
she'd message him at least once every two days. It was the proof that she and SAE Jean had grown quite familiar with one another. He stared at the message for a moment, before slowly moving his fingers. What? Is it a weapon from that blacksmith called the ORK or something? Even before he had the chance to put the phone down, the reply rushed in. Yeah. This time, it's a saber but it's just an amazing thing. There's a special attribute added to the weapon and when you pour the mana in, it becomes dyed in red and starts boiling. Add that together with the improved cutting power, I think it's going to show off some shocking potential. Regrettably, I couldn't swing it, though. Is it okay to tell me that? Isn't that a spoiler territory? Ah, uh, it's fine. A short reply, and then the images of the saber in question flooded his inbox. As if she was taking pics of a delicious food, there were several shots taken from differing angles, and some of them even had filters applied as well. Looks good. Are you going to use this one too? I'd like to, but can't. Others might see it in a bad light. If I wish to take the final winner of the tournament, I have to let this one go. I'm really excited to see what will come out in the finals. Smiles. He felt quite proud when she started praising the weapon. If someone like USAE Young who was famous for being blunt without caring for other people's feelings was this enthusiastic, he could expect to see some favorable reactions this time as well. By the way, do you have time this week Friday? I might. What, another hunt? SAE Jean grinned slightly. It seemed that all the messaging to and fro was to butter him for this moment, to ask him out for a hunt. Okay, cool. How about 2 p.m.? Yes. It's cool. Thank you. By the way, you don't have do those emoticon thingy towards the end, you know. I know. Oh, and it's not towards but at. You are fine with the regular grammar, but why do you always get this one wrong? TL, Wheel, this line had our MC speak in a local dialect and USAE Young is admonishing him for the grammatical faux pas. It's literally untranslatable to English. So I ended up making stuff up. Please bear with me on this one. Kiam. My bad. I didn't receive proper education. I'll engrave it to my heart. LOL it's okay TL, Daijobu, Disu. Fuhu. SAE Jean scratched his head while sighing, unable to figure out whether she was making fun of him or not. Chapter, 32. In the low mid-tier hunting ground of the monster field. Kim Sae Jean and Yu Sae Young were hunting together under a rather nice atmosphere. It had been just over an hour, but her expanding pocket was nearly full with the monster remains. Ah! There has been an increase in the number of monsters rampaging around in cities lately. As if she had abruptly remembered it just now, Yu Sae Young opened her mouth as they continued to search for their next prey. Is that right? Yeah. So, Knight's orders have begun in-death investigations into the matter but a lot of the stuff must be of a sensitive nature. They've been all labeled top secret. Hmm. That is strange. Oh, another ebony wolf is hiding over there. He pointed at a bush and spoke. Since it was an ebony wolf, he sort of felt empathy towards it, but well, not he could do for it now. The rule of the strong preying on the weak was heartless and cruel, after all. All right. I'm on it. It was a surprising thing for a human to spot an ebony wolf but, USAE Young was now more or less used to it she just replied calmly and gathered mana into her sword. From the expensive sword in her hand, raging mana rose up, quickly forming into a refined blade. Her mana, compared to when SAE Jean first met her, every facet of it had taken a qualitative leap forward the density of it, the richness of its color, etc. When he asked her how she did it, USAE Young explained that she too possessed a trait which made it possible for her to grow so quickly. Of course, she also chose not to tell him the details of her trait as well. Hot! With a loud shout, she kicked the ground and rushed forward. Her target was the ebony wolf hiding in the bushes. SFX for a blade slicing the air. Her smooth horizontal swing sliced apart the tall grasses, and the wolf hidden within issued a short whimper before expiring immediately. SAE Jean lowered his head to mourn its passing without even realizing it. Fut. What are you doing? 
After stuffing the remains of the ebony wolf into her expanding pocket, she approached him while leaking a smile. Oh, ah, uh, it's nothing. He hastily made an excuse. USAE Young tilted her head in slight confusion, before pulling out her phone in a hurry to check the time. Looks like I've got to go. Mm -hmm. It's been only an hour, though. I have to go to the Eden tomorrow for the rank advancement exam. Ah, uh, is that right? The Eden was the name given to the tallest building in the skyscraper-dominated province of Kongwon. Often referred to as the Holy Land of the Knights, it was the place where the administrative work regarding all things knight-related took place. Such as the aforementioned rank advancement exam, as well as the education and training of the young, up-and-coming knights. Well, since there's still a bit of time left before my chauffeur arrives, why don't we have a coffee while we wait? S.A. Young smiled and made a suggestion. He thought about this for a bit. Right now, it was 3.30 p.m. It was still in the afternoon, and since he was planning to go on a solo hunt later on anyway, there didn't seem to be a reason to be mindful of the time limit here. Yeah. Let's. So, he nodded his head. In that case, let's go right away. I hear there's a new coffee shop inside the rest stop called Dawn in Coffee. TL, the name of the coffee shop is written in English in raw. I'm okay with whatever. To know much about stuff like that anyways. Well, in that case, you'll just have to follow me, then. They turned around and headed back towards the rest stop. As soon as they arrived, USAE Young dragged SAE Jean and entered the coffee shop. The ordering and paying were USAE Young's job. She expertly ordered at the counter and walked back to their table. When is the driver coming? At his query, USAE Young delayed answering and checked on her phone first. 30 minutes. Around 30 minutes. Her eyes didn't leave the liquid crystal display as she answered. And then, she went silent. Judging from the way how she kept on wetting her lips, she seemed to be a little bit tense. USAE Young was about to go on a week-long training camp from today in the Eden, the holy land of the Knights. Even though it was nearly impossible for an 18-year-old to become a full mid-tier knight, she still had to continue attending several of these tests just for her inevitable rank advancement in the future. Mm you nervous? She immediately shook her head at his question. However, her oddly quick answer only served to reinforce the notion of her being tense instead. Nope. Not at all. I mean, I'm not even expecting anything. Both my achievements and skills are still very far from being on the level of a mid-tier anyway. If you say so. However, as she implied, her initial nervousness eased with the passage of time. It seemed that, as they drank coffee and conversed, she could sense that her mind had gradually calmed down. You sure do have a nice scent. And twenty minutes had passed. The coffee had cooled down, and the topics of conversation had dried up. As S.A.E. Jean wordlessly checked on his phone, suddenly U.S.A.E. Young muttered out as if it was in passing. Oh, thanks. But I don't use perfumes, though. I know. I haven't heard of a perfume like that anyway. U.S.A.E. Young stared at him and lightly grinned. But there's something different about your scent. When I'm next to you, my mind inexplicably calms down. Honestly, until a short while ago, I was really nervous, you know but when I keep on breathing in your scent. She stopped her words and carefully breathed in the air. Her demeanor was practiced and careful, as if to impart the feeling that even the actions of sniffing the air could be an act of elegance itself. Really, it helps me to settle my mind. I'm sure you weren't aware of it, though. Normally, a person supposedly doesn't know of his own smell, so. Oh. Yeah. Right. I didn't know. Honestly speaking, of course he knew already. It was all because of his passive skill born out of his trait. The scent of a wolf was said to have special effects on the opposite SX. It was likely that USAE Young was subjected to this effect at the moment. But still, it's quite faint, so if it's not an enclosed space like this, it's not easy to smell it properly. Especially out in the forest. The rank smell of blood and the monsters are far too strong there. Is that the reason why you wanted to come here? Yep. That was one of the reasons. 
As she spoke up to hear and smiled, the phone placed on top of the table vibrated and issued a ring. Ah, looks like he's arrived. I should get going now. USAE Young rose up from her seat, and SAE Jean followed her. Mm. -hmm. Do your best. Yeah, thank you. By the way. Later on when I need your help again, can I bother you for a quick favor? At her cutely made request, SAE Jean nodded his head while smiling. At the same time, an alert went off. The skill level of the scent of a wolf has risen from sea to sea. The strong odor of a wolf. Depending on the gender, race, individual taste and characteristics, varied positive effects will be applied. This skill will also remain active during the human form. Well, I shall go ahead first. And please don't greet me out. My father has also come today. USAE Young spoke apologetically. But SAE Jean nodded his head in agreement as if that was the most obvious thing in the world. And right after seeing her depart with his own two eyes, he turned back towards the monster field. The real hunting was about to begin. Kim SAE Jean's trait continued to grow. He diligently hunted in the mid tier hunting ground, and with the exception of a handful of mana stones he'd use for potion crafting, he swallowed them all. However, as usual, the problem laid with the evolution. He just could not evolve no matter what. No, he hadn't had found it yet. A goblin witch doctor. TL, the author used the Hanja word for witchcraft and wrote a witchcraft goblin. Obviously that doesn't sound right when TL'd literally, so I changed it to a witch doctor. Kim Sae Jean in the wolf beast form silently observed the distant goblin village while lying hidden in the bush. He coincidentally discovered this sprawling village located by the mountainside. And it was fairly easy to discern the types of goblins living in this village. He only had to take a look at those Sakti-like wooden poles they were carrying. Those carrying that pole and capable of using witchcraft, the goblin witch doctors. Even though outwardly they appeared to be a bunch of weaklings, all frail and small of stature, their notoriety was high enough to pierce the heavens. Their bad reputation wasn't simply the result of their fondness towards practicing the deadly witchcraft. The thing was, one would find pretty much no loot in their villages after braving all those dangerous curses and conquering them. At least there was a chance of procuring potions when raiding a goblin village specializing in medicine but well. There was no point in attacking a village full of witch doctors as that kind of action pretty much signified the old adage of high risk, low return. However that was applicable for those who saw the monsters in monetary values only. Back then, I evolved after killing a goblin. In all honesty, it was a bit hard to call that an evolution for his goblin form. It was more like him absorbing knowledge and going through an awakening of sorts. SFX for swallowing saliva. SAE Jean unconsciously swallowed his saliva. A goblin witch doctor. It was an opponent that the current him would find hard to deal with. Of course, if it was a one on one situation, that wouldn't be a problem, but unfortunately, life wasn't so considerate towards his feelings. I need to kill an elite, or something stronger. He understood that killing a regular goblin was a waste of time. Just like that time, he needed to kill an elite goblin, the one with lots of tattoos on its body. Using the eyes of a wolf, his gaze pierced further and deeper into the village. The previously limited scope of his sight expanded gradually. The eyesight that didn't know the meaning of the physical limitation continued to expand until he finally spotted a suitable goblin. It was located inside the deepest parts of the village and it was noticeable due to it performing some kind of a ritual. It also wore a headgear signifying its position as a chieftain, its body playing host to numerous tattoos. That was the one. The wolf's savage lust for battle spread out from his beastly heart and made his body tremble slightly. He briefly thought about the ways to kill that goblin. But well, it was actually quite simple, really. He'd dash past the mountainside, bite the goblin chieftain to death, and urgently hoof it out of there. From his current position to where the goblin was, using the absolute speed of this beast form, it'd only take ten seconds. However, he thought there was something slightly lacking with this plan. Goblin's speed in firing off the witchcraft magic was deceptively fast. If he wanted to avoid getting cursed to death, then he had to be faster. He accessed the small pouch hanging on his wrist and pulled out a small bottle of potion. 
It was a low mid-tier ranked potion called a Goblin's Courage, capable of boosting his physical stats temporarily. The bottle was as small as a speck of dust within the huge palm of the beast, which made it difficult to pop open the lid. So, he just swallowed whole the bottle down his throat. The effects of the potion appeared quickly. His muscles expanded and his body felt hot. S.A.E. Jean crouched and took on the starting pose of a sprinter. And finally, he activated the last piece of the doping procedure. The skill warrior of reversal has been activated. All stats rise temporarily. Normally, the skill warrior of reversal aided with the durability and strength, as well as resistance to pain it had little to do with increasing speed. But for him, he needed that increase in durability and pain resistance right now. The wolf's the beast's heart could freely control the circulation of blood. If he could momentarily increase the rate of blood flow, then he'd be able to display significant burst of overwhelming power. SFX for beast growling. The blood in his body rapidly circulated like a boiling liquid. As the sensation of his body ready to blow up from the churning heat spread throughout, he felt the unexplainable feeling of the perceivable time slowing down to a crawl. He could clearly see the blowing winds, and these winds rustling the blades of grass. All his preparations were now complete. Right away, he kicked the ground, hard. The illusion of the world twisting apart occurred. At the incredible pressure created by his speed, the atmosphere was being compressed ruthlessly, and every time he took a step, the ground below violently caved in. And when he gained enough speed, he then activated the whirlwind dash. His speed broke past the speed of sound. Moving so fast that not even leaving behind an afterimage, the beast was like a calamitous land-bound lightning strike. In the blink of an eye that didn't even last two seconds, S.A.E. Jean arrived in front of the goblin chieftain. And before the expression on the goblin's face had the time to change, the wolf's savage fangs shot out towards its neck. Quajiek. S.A.E. Jean started running again, with the goblin trapped between his jaws. He obviously didn't want to get cursed by dawdling around there. Complete, tradition of goblins, inheritance of memories. The host has absorbed the blood of the goblin witch doctor leader type. Now, the host can use goblin chieftain's witchcraft. The witchcraft that can be used will be dependent on the stat, magic strength. Spiritualization, skill proficiency level, F. Matter can be turned into spirit forms and stored inside the host's body. When a matter is stored in the host's body as a spirit, 30% of the matter's original characteristics will be granted to the host. The Curse of Binding Skill Proficiency Level, F. By sacrificing his own blood, the host can restrain a target. Magic Tattoo's Skill Proficiency Level, F. The host can use liquids from potions, blood of the others or even liquefied mana to inscribe magic tattoos on his or other's body. The magic tattoos will show differing effects depending on the base ingredients used. These messages popped up. Kim S.A.E. Jean ran and ran while carrying a thick smile on his face. The spiritualization what a great skill he earned just now. No, should it be called witchcraft, instead? Whatever the case may have been, he was more than satisfied. To turn things into spirits and store them in his body which would in turn grant him increased stats didn't that mean a new way to utilize his equipment from now on had appeared? On top of that, the magic tattoos also had seemingly no limit as to how it could be used in the future. SFX for a beast growling S.A.E. Jean quickly arrived at the banks of a stream with very little trace of human activity and lowered the dead goblin down in order to search for the loot. However, his left arm wouldn't move. Confused, he took a look at his left arm. And from his arm, a black aura was rising up like a steam. It was a curse. Oh, S.H.T. The Fkin goblin still managed to curse him in that short amount of time. Core. Today, he got to engrave it onto his bones why the countless knights and hunters did their best to avoid confronting the goblin witch doctors. Chapter, 33 As soon as he came back home, S.A.E. Jean scoured the internet to find the cure for the goblin's curse. There were two ways to deal with it. One was to find a wizard specializing in buffing magic to cast the purification spell, or to wait for the curse to naturally dissipate all on its own. 
The former option took around four days to cure but it would cost him a pretty penny, while the latter required him to wait around for a minimum of three weeks. Hello. Miss Hazeline. That's why he called Hazeline first. He figured that the professions of alchemists and wizards had to have some kind of relationship with each other. Oh, it's you, Mr. Asayi Jean. What's up? Fortunately for him, she happily greeted him while extending the end of her sentence. Ah, that is I was. Sae Jean significantly shortened the event as much as possible and explained it to her. As he was out hunting in the low mid-tier hunting ground, he encountered a wayward goblin witch doctor and ended up getting cursed by it. Oh my gosh. Really? And it's your arm, of all things it's a big trouble, that thing. Oh, but I'm currently in the airport getting ready to head overseas on another assignment right now what should we do? Maybe you know some other wizard that can help me? I do know someone. But, will that be fine? Hazeline carefully asked him. Most alchemists hated, like a pathological illness, letting other people into their homes. However, S.A.E. Jean didn't suffer from such inflictions. Yes. I'll be fine. Ah, if you say so I'll send a wizard who's my junior to your home. Don't worry about a thing and just wait for him to show up later. Ah, and I won't tell him that you're an alchemist so you should also watch what you say around him. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I didn't have to worry at all, then. I should have just called you the first thing. Hee hee. It'll be fine. Then, please wait for him. The call ended with the friendly words from Hazeline. It looked like that this curse might be taken care of much easier than he thought. Now that he didn't have to worry about the dang thing anymore, S.A.E. Jean put the phone down and headed to the basement. It was the time to check out the witchcraft techniques he earned after killing that boss goblin. The spacious basement was divided into left and right workshops. The one on the left was the alchemy workshop packed with tools, ingredients and mana stones for potion crafting, while the right side featured a sofa. The storage cabinet that stored several metal ingots as well as a glass display cabinet to show off all the items he had created so far it was a blacksmithing workshop that just happened to not resemble one. Let's try out spiritualization first. Turning matter into a spirit form and storing it within the body, the so-called spiritualization. In order to test this technique, he took out a steel ingot from the storage cabinet. While holding it, he closed his eyes and activated the spell. The solid steel became pliable like liquid, and then turned into a metal-colored gas before entering his body. The spiritualized plain steel ingot has been absorbed into the host's body, increasing the overall sturdiness. Level of saturation 5100 This increase is carried over to the other forms. Durability rises by 7. Outwardly, he didn't seem all that different, but the feeling of his body becoming sturdier was definitely there. Once more, it proved easier to understand by actually colliding head-on rather than wrestling with all those complicated words. That saturation level thing probably means that I can store things within me until 100 is reached. He accepted this and moved on to the next thing. This time, he checked out the weapons on display inside the glass cabinet. They were all made by him, but ended up being stashed here as he found it somewhat wasteful to submit them for the second round of judging in the blacksmith's tournament. He picked up a steel mace endowed with an attribute called Material Destruction Level E. By endowing this mace with the ability to impact the cleavage plane of other materials, it could destroy other weapons one rank below it in terms of strength. Spiritualization The technique activated according to his thoughts, and the mace turned into a spirit and again, entered his body. The spiritualized steel mace with an attribute rated level E has been stored, and a special effect has been applied to the body. Level of Saturation 50100 Physical strength and durability rise by 15 each. The attribute rated F- material destruction will be applied to the entire body. Oh. Kim Sae Jean murmured lowly in admiration. Without a doubt, this was very useful to him. With this technique, it should be possible for the human Kim Sae Jean to be equipped with above average strength from now on. But, what about the magic tattoos? Next up was the turn of the magic tattoos. It seemed awfully useful, judging from its explanations alone. 
but considering that it was pretty darn difficult to tattoo oneself, this technique seemed openly geared towards helping out others instead. That's why it looked like a good fit for the boss-type goblins. The so-called chief would have performed the role of awarding these tattoos to other goblins, after all. SFX for a doorbell chime. He was busy debating whether to try this technique out for himself or not when the doorbell went off. Looked like the wizard Hazeline referred to had arrived. He quickly ascended the stairs. Who is it? As he spoke the customary question, from beyond the door, a reply of I'm a wizard in a man's voice came back. S.A.E. Jean opened the door. Hello there. I'm Kim Yohan, the wizard. It was a wizard wearing a blue-colored robe. One could discern the ranks of a wizard by the color of the robe he or she was wearing. The blue color denoted the rank of C. The ranking system used the English alphabet, starting from A, the highest, to F, which was the lowest. Nice to meet you. Please, come in. S.A.E. Jean guided the wizard to his living room. Then, the two guys sat on the couch in a totally awkward silence. Should I start right away? Please do. I'll be in your care. When S.A.E. Jean rolled up his sleeve on the arm with the curse, the wizard let out a groan. Ha! Huh. It's a lot worse than I thought. At minimum, it looks like you need to receive purification diligently for the next two weeks. Ah, uh, is that so? Yes, unfortunately. I was taking it easy since I heard it's a low mid-tier curse but... Maybe, from next time onwards, a wizard better skilled than me might be needed here. And then, more silence. The male wizard continued to stare at the curse's condition. No, from a certain point in time, he was studying S.A.E. Jean's arm with a great interest, instead. Ten minutes went by, then fifteen. What are doing? Eh. Oh, ah. My apologies. This. Your blood vessels seemed a bit different. Kiam. I'll start right away. Only then did the wizard place his hand on S.A.E. Jean's affected arm and begin chanting. That's when the mysterious event occurred. The mana in the air converged towards his hand and formed the purest form of white light. This light made him feel comfortable and warm inside at the same time. S.A.E. Jean closed his eyes and enjoyed to the fullest this fuzzy, warm feeling. Right at the same time, a new alert window popped up into his view. It was a little bit, no scratch that, completely unrelated to what was happening here now. Condition complete, an orc's joy acknowledged by the critics, mass media, and the general public. The equipment created by the host has gained acknowledgement from numerous people. The monster form orc warrior evolves to orc jaguar. All stats related to the forms rise. What? Yes. When S.A.E. Jean let out a sound of puzzled exclamation, the wizard inadvertently asked back. After S.A.E. Jean killed off this sudden outburst of stupid exchange with a bout of silence, he picked up both his phone and the TV remote. Is it alright if I switch on the TV? Ah, uh, yes. It doesn't matter. I finished with the purification already. Already? Yes. This purification effect will continue for the next eight hours and fight against the curse. Normally, the first treatment always ends in failure. But by repeatedly doing this, we are weakening the curse bit by bit. Aha! S.A.E. Jean nodded his head and waited. He was thinking that the wizard would leave now since his work here was done. However, the wizard leaned back comfortably against the back of the couch and fixedly stared at the black TV screen. So, S.A.E. Jean turned on the TV. The channel was set to 08. The program showing the blacksmith's tournament was on this channel. The hotly burning flame saber crafted by ORK, also known as the Orcs Forge K, has won the second round of judging by scoring an average point tally of 9. 48. The show was already near the end. This saber has a special mana effect built in, and ever since its appearance, it has garnered a great deal of attention from the critics and the knights alike. And it has earned a drastically higher tally of points than the second place finisher. Finally, a word from the hottest trending night right now. Let us hear the final comments from Miss USAE Young. The MC then handed over the mic to USAE Young. Thank you. Yes, it was truly a top tier product. 
Not only its design, but the performance was perfect as well. There were parts that were still a bit lacking in terms of its hardness and strength, but still, this effect of hotly burning flame, something I've never seen before, has proved to be the best addition of all. USAE Young uttered out these short words and expectantly stared at the MC. Is that all? I believe that the next product from this blacksmith should truly be worth the wait. All right, thank you for your words. Well then, we shall see you again in two months' time, at the grand finale of the Open Invitational Blacksmiths Tournament. The program ended there. SAE Jean picked up his phone and began browsing the internet. He saw that the saber he had made was a trending topic in the real-time search results at various portal sites. Even the news outlets were busy reporting on it as well. Not only that, the local critics, blacksmiths, knights, as well as international broadcasters were busy talking about his creation, the hotly burning flame saber. The tips of his lips rose up by themselves. 9.30 a.m. this morning, a fissure measuring 500 meters in diameter opened up in the middle of Beijing, China. The Chinese government has revealed that they are still battling the monsters pouring out from this fissure, eight hours after its eruption. This incident has once more demonstrated the insufficient abilities of the Chinese to counter the monster threat. Suddenly, the sounds of news broadcast assaulted his ears. SAE Jean lifted his head to see what's going on, only to find the wizard sitting there as if this was his own home and busy playing with the remote. Excuse me. When SAE Jean asked, flabbergasted, the wizard finally put the remote down and quickly got up. Ah, uh, yes. I should get going now. And probably from next time onwards, a different wizard will come by. That curse. Well, I think it'll be tough for me to deal with at my current level. Okay then. Take care. S.A.E. Jean walked the wizard out to the door, and returned back to the couch. Please take a look at the footage. He was about to turn the TV off, but the footage shown there briefly stole his attention. In a word, it looked fantastical. It showed the combined efforts of countless knights, hunters, and wizards. The sword aura of the knights split apart the earth, and the destructive magic spells from the wizards slammed around like the winds of a tornado. In the midst of the wizards, S.A.E. Jean spotted someone who was quite familiar to him. A woman covered in a robe, ordering the troops around like a general in a battlefield while freely wielding the high-level magic spells Thunderstrike and Gale Force Blade Winds. Hazeline. Although he could only see the lower part of the face, he was quite sure of her identity, especially when looking at that slender nose and the chin line. Since one would need around ten minutes to get to Beijing from Seoul using a mana jet, even the time frame seemed to fit. She's incredible. He only thought of her as an alchemist until now. Totally speechless, he bore witness to the absolute domineering display of her battle prowess. Chapter 34 Two days later, Kim S.A.E. Jean headed to the local post office in the afternoon to collect the money for the saber he submitted to the blacksmith's tournament. He entertained the idea of showing up proudly but then decided to go while wearing a hood and a robe. He figured that if his identity was discovered, it would cause quite a bit of inconvenience for him. After all, the method he used to craft his weapons was definitely out of common sense and therefore not something he could show to other people. Yes. The Confirmation has been completed. As soon as SAE Jean entered the correct identification password, the post office worker behind the counter handed over a tightly sealed box. Even during all that, the worker tried his best to take a peek at SAE Jean's face without getting noticed. Most likely because of the word ORK written on the box. Since he found the actions of the worker bothersome, SAE Jean hastily escaped the post office and returned home. A letter? After sitting down on the sofa and opening the sealed box, he found that there was only a single envelope stored inside. Burke. Inside the envelope, he found a check with enough zeros to make him mutter out in shock, as well as a letter written with sincerity and care. TL, unfortunately, the pun here is lost during translation. Burke actually serves two distinct purposes here, one of shocked proclamation, as well as a term to denote a certain amount of money in Korea. One Urk won around 88,000 US. To Sir Honorable Blacksmith, the Orcs Forge K. Good day to you, sir. My name is USAE Young, a low mid-tier knight from the Dawn Knights Order. 
Normally, it's only a correct etiquette to greet you in person but you, the Honorable Blacksmith has requested to remain anonymous. Therefore, I hereby write to you these handful of words even though it can potentially become an irritant to you. Firstly, we at the Dawn Knight's Order wishes to purchase the weapon sent in by you, the Honorable Blacksmith, the hotly burning flame saber. Once more, we are truly grateful for your unceasing toil and unrelenting effort to create such an amazingly useful product. With my limited scope of understanding, I can't even begin to fathom the lengths of anguish, agony, and zeal you had to go through in order to craft such a weapon. And that's why we at the Dawn Knight's Order and the Dawn Corporation dares to suggest to you a certain proposition. If you, the Honorable Blacksmith wishes to continue with the crafting and selling of your products in the future. May we dare to ask for your opinion if it's possible for us to gift you a small present, a smithy that has taken after your name, the Orc's Forge. Of course, we solemnly promise that all the rights to the smithy will be handed over to you, and will never interfere with its administration. Only that, we would be grateful if you, the Honorable Blacksmith thinks of us, the Dawn Knight's Order every now and then. As we only wish to make the road ahead for the remarkably talented personage such as yourself as smooth and trouble-free as possible. Please, give it your deep consideration, and give us a correspondence to the address I've written below. Kind regards. The Low Mid-Tier Knight from the Dawn Order, USAE Young. It was a sincerely written letter from USAE Young. He scratched the top of his head, wondering what he should do about this complication of fate. It sure would be nice if I had a smithy of my own. Hmm. He fell into a deep thought, while his gaze alternated between the letter and the check. The difference between the mid-tier and an upper mid-tier. There was seemingly only a difference of a single word but in truth, the gap between the two was actually enormous. The best example was the upper mid-tier monsters. As they possessed something called the special abilities, the creatures ranked upper mid-tier, on average, were twenty times stronger than the monsters of mid-tier range. And that was why, for both the knight and the hunters, they had to fulfill a specific and difficult criteria compared to before in order to rank up to upper mid-tier. From the upper mid-tier ranking upwards, a hunter must compete in the mid-tier hunter's leaderboard, and you must belong to a society, as well as have a recommendation from a knight's order. At the monster store, the clerk handed over a sheet of paper and spoke. Republic of Korea's mid-tier hunter's leaderboard. First place, Ryu Sung Han, 3,309 points. Second place, Kim Cho Rang Yi, 3,219 points. 332nd place, Kim Sae Jean, 989 points. Oh, and when you become an upper mid-tier hunter, your ranking in the leaderboard will be accessible to the public like the one for the knights. I understand. Sae Jean nodded his head while looking somewhat bewildered. Actually, he was panicking slightly, too. He came here to sell off the monster materials but this clerk suddenly began butting in without a prompt from anyone. My ranking is pretty low, though. But, when he saw that his placing was only 332nd, his competitive spirit began to rise up inside. Eh. Oh. That's plenty high enough, actually. The number one ranked Mr. Ryu Sung Han is a veteran of 13 years, and the second place Mr. Kim Cho Reng Yi also has spent 8 years as a hunter. But Mr. Sae Jean has been a hunter for only half a year, so it's really a high position, honestly speaking. Okay, fine. But why is there a in front of my name? That's to denote a rookie. It's to mark a person who hasn't been a hunter for more than a year. Including Mr. Sae Jean, you, there are only two such persons within the ranks of the mid-tiers. Sae Jean scratched his chin and agonized a little. What's a society? Is that like being affiliated with a knight's order? No, it's not. It'll be easier to think of it as a gathering of people, who can hunt together, and enjoy a meal together afterwards. You can form one with anyone, really, and not just with other hunters and there are no strict procedures to follow, either. All you need is the agreement of the participants. Would you like a registration form? Hmm. What's the minimum number to form a society? Well, including the person registering, three. The maximum is thirty. Two others. He could think of a couple of people. Actually, he only knew two people personally, and that was the extent of his personal connections. 
Hazeline and USA Young. Now that he thought about it, even though the number was pretty low and thus nothing to brag about, the quality of those connections was just too damn amazing. So, in order to advance to the upper mid-tier, you are saying that I must form a society, is that right? Yes. It's one of the prerequisites. Having a recommendation from a knight's order will be good as well. All right. I understand. He took the society registration form and headed home. One afternoon with clear sunlight pouring down, Hazeline personally came to visit S.A.E. Jean in his home. Hello there. She strode into the house with an energetic smile and her eyes arching into half-moon shapes. This is a nice house. Yes, well. Please take a seat first. Let me have a look at the curse. She sat down first on the couch and patted the spot next to her vigorously while calling for S.A.E. Jean. Ah, uh, yeah. S.A.E. Jean sat down promptly next to her, and rolled up the sleeve of his left arm. The arm dyed in black, thanks to the curse, was revealed to her eyes. It's pretty serious. No wonder the other wizard guy ran off after seeing this. Hazeline spoke with a serious expression. But no need to worry any more, I'm here now. Hazeline immediately began the purification spell. Right away, he mistook the blinding light as a miniature sun rising in front of him. That's how overwhelmingly bright it was, completely inundating everything with whiteness. It was well past being warm and into being scalding hot. He felt like his entire arm was being burnt away along with the curse. It's done. You'll be back to normal in six hours or so. The purification only needed three minutes. Hazeline grinned refreshingly in satisfaction at S.A.E. Jean who was carrying a confused expression. Now then, I shall be on my way. I'm way too busy. Oh, wait a second, please. S.A.E. Jean hastily reached out and grasped the wrist of Hazeline, who was just about to leave suddenly touched like this, Hazeline snatched her hand away much faster than she realized. Wah, what do you think you're doing? She rubbed the wrist and became alert towards him. It might have seemed as a over-the-top reaction, but S.A.E. Jean who was already well versed in rejection, hastily raised his hands and showed that he meant no harm. No, no, it's not that. Actually. I was wondering if you could hear a favor of mine. A favor? What is it? When Hazeline asked back bluntly, he roughly explained to her the rules of the hunters and raised the issue of the society. It was a favor of borrowing her name for the society's registration. Oh. Well. It's fine. By the way, is it okay if I used a different name? A different name? Yes. If it's a society, then it'd be better as a wizard rather than as an alchemist, I think. S.A.E. Jean was slightly dazed by the suggestion, but then, he remembered the sight of Hazeline in that news broadcast, so he quickly nodded his head. Yes, yes. Of course. After Hazeline left, the lone S.A.E. Jean called a certain someone. He checked the time with the corner of his eyes, a bit past 1 p.m. The training camp was still ongoing, but he figured that she might pick up her phone since it was during the lunch break. Before the end of the third ring, her voice came out from the receiver. Hello. Uh, it's me, S.A.E. Jean. I know. Is there something wrong? Well, there's a thing. He trimmed the story as much as possible in consideration for the busy USAE Young and explained that he wanted to form a society, but needed a minimum of three people. So whether it was possible for her to lend her name for the registration or not. Okay, I will. Ah. Thanks a bunch. No, it's all right. Actually, I was also planning to enter a society as soon as the training camp ends here. One of the listed things to do is to achieve cooperation, so it's me who's thankful right now. Well, that's a relief. Someone will probably call you later on, so you just have to say that you agree to form the society with me. And with that, he prepared to end the call. But before he could do that, USAE Young's voice hurriedly exited the receiver. W, W, wait a moment, please. What's wrong? All the stuff that's been happening in Eden, aren't you curious? She asked him in the tone of a voice that was pleading with him to show some interest. S.A.E. Jean was obviously not too interested, 
but he was grateful for her granting him the favor without much fuss, so replied yeah, I am. The first test was about the physical fitness training. But it's not like the normal fitness training as I expected it to be. They made us do a tug of war while subjecting us under the magic spells affecting our minds. Really, my head was. My soul escaped me. He honestly believed a few minutes would be sufficient. But that few minutes steadily stretched past the five-minute mark, then ten, and finally, twenty minutes. Until the voice of whom S.A.E. Jean thought of as an instructor called out to her, U.S.A.E. Young tried to explain every minute detail of every little event that had occurred in Eden over the phone. She's a chatterbox, all right. T.L., I had to change here as the author wrote she's an explaining bug. Ha. Huh. Oh, I need to go now. Okay. Work hard. I will. Thanks. Talk to you later. Here it is. It was a quiet morning. A man came in and submitted a society registration form and left. The employee who had just arrived at work, yawned out loudly and leisurely scanned the form. Mm -hmm. However, the written contents were a bit strange. It seemed like a bit of typo, or maybe even some error, was mixed in there. The worker tilted his head a bit, before calling the number on the form. He was pretty sure that this was either a prank or a mistake. Ah, uh, hello. By perchance, am I speaking to Miss Sheena? The A-ranked wizard, Sheena. Miss? You're not her, yes. Huh. No, I am Sheena. Why did you call me? In that moment, the worker forgot to breathe. Why was an A-level wizard participating in a society with a mid-tier hunter serving as a leader? This made no sense. He was still convinced that he was being pranked right now. That is. I have called you. Because a society registration. Surely, it's not true. What's not true? I did sign the form and even stamped it as well. No, that is. This. That, Miss Sheena is participating in such a society is. Well, yes, it's true. I've decided to participate. I am going to hang up now since I'm really busy here. But I am a member of the society for real. Tuck. The call ended. The worker's mouth remained wide open, as he tried to recall what he had just heard over the phone. But no matter what, he could not understand. However, there was still one more thing left on the form for the worker to remain dumbfounded like that. Of course, even this one was also totally unbelievable. USA Young, a low mid-tier Knight of the Dawn Knight's Order. The precious royalty of the Dawn was a member of a society with a measly hunter as the leader. The worker's hands shook visibly as he keyed in the phone number. Hello. Ah, uh, by any chance. Are you Miss USA Young, affiliated with the Dawn Knight's Order? Yes, that's correct. Again, the worker forgot to breathe. He had a case of a deja vu. The society. Is that correct? The society. He was so shocked, he couldn't even form a proper sentence. But as expected, USAE Young could understand what he was saying, even though the worker's words sounded half-assed. Yes, I am participating. You're talking about the society with Mr. Kim SAE Jean serving as the leader, yes? Eh. Ah, uh, yes. The mid-tier hunter. Kim SAE Jean. Yes. Then, yes, that's correct. Please register my name on the system. And there will be a call from the Dawn Knight's order shortly as well. With that, the phone call came to an end. The worker's soul also left him at the same moment. The worker recovered slightly and recalled the conversations he held with the real big shots three minutes ago, then fell into a deep but dazed contemplation. For personal connections of a mid-tier hunter. They couldn't be explained away at all. Chapter, 35. A Society. Initially, this system of society began with the idea of forming a party to make the monster hunts more effective. But as time passed, the goal and the scope expanded far beyond that initial premise. From the humble beginnings of hunting parties where only the knights and hunters could join, to a versatile gathering of individuals where its members would communicate with one another in pursuit of the better tomorrow. 
So, nowadays, people other than knights and hunters, such as wizards, blacksmiths, alchemists obviously in very low numbers, as well as regular civilians join societies. The current situation was that nearly half of the country's population had joined one or more societies. Which meant that the number of societies continued to increase and as such, there were as much as 30,000 active official societies in South Korea alone. And among all those active societies in the country, none were more famous than perhaps the trilogy. Its leader, Kim yak sane was also the current order master of the Goryeo Knights Order. Currently the only S-class ranked society in the country, Trilogy boasted a total member count of 273, and they all came from quite varied and colorful backgrounds. Surprisingly, even the societies had a ranking system. The higher the rank, the higher the number of members it could have. Its members consisted of, knights and hunters ranked at least the upper mid-tier, wizards, several big fish from the worlds of politics and finance, famous celebrities, and even blacksmiths and alchemists. It was not wrong to say that the communication happening internally within Trilogy could easily control the entirety of South Korea. Recently, with the advent of couple more behemoths like Trilogy, a growing number of voices were saying that the societies in A and B classes should be called a guild or a clan instead, for the sake of differentiation. Already, one or two media outlets had tried those terms out to see how it would go with the viewers. Congratulations October 8th, in other words, today, is the day the society, the monster, is born. Ah well, thank you. S.A.E. Jean was giving his disinterested reply inside the monster store he came here after receiving the phone call of confirmation that his society had been formally recognized and registered. Within his arms, he carried an armful of the society operational chart and leader business cards. T.L., I T.L. society operational chart literally. Really, you are just too amazing. From the get-go, your society has been rated as a deep class. It's like we're witnessing the beginning of a legend. Kim S.A.E. Jean found all this as kissing a bit burdensome. More correctly, as a person who had no clue on the significance of a society, he just could not fathom why these people were busy making a scene in front of him. It was rather obvious, actually he had lived a busy, work-swarmed loner life until now, so why would he pay attention to the symbol of the multitude of people, societies? To start as a D dash, is that supposed to be that amazing? Eh. Oh, of course. Normally, most start at F class, and if the evaluation is favorable, then E. The increase in a society's rankings depended on its results. And when talking about the results, it didn't only mean the successful hunts of monsters by the knights, hunters and the wizards but also included matters such as performing volunteer work as well. The ones in charge of measuring the number of these services rendered for the good of the populace. Was some nameless government entity that no one seemed to know what it was exactly but since there were no particular complaints from the societies, it could mean that their evaluation process was all 100% above board. Is it a good thing to have a higher rank? Members from the same society usually felt close camaraderie towards each other they also outwardly showed no hostility towards other societies. The reason was that, as the name implied, a society was basically like a student club found in universities. Classes were assigned to make classifications easier, but in the end, there was no profit to be made other than personal connections that would form within a society. So, a society was simply an environment for meeting people and making connections. Why, yes, it's a good thing. And if you can develop deep relations with other members. It will be even better. I'm so envious. When looking at the society SAE gene had formed from this point of view, it could be seen as a rather important one. After all, its members were an A-ranked wizard and a precious granddaughter of a multi-billionaire. On a side note, one of the main reasons why SAE Gene Society started off as D class had a lot to do with the exploits of the A ranked wizard, Hazeline. Yeah. I'm also happy about the high rank. I get this urge to raise its ranking even higher in the future, too. Well, then, I'll be on my way, now. But, for SAE Gene, who was not knowledgeable about how the societies operated, he simply scratched the back of his neck and turned around to leave as if it was all in a day's work. Watching the back of such an uncaring man, the government workers present had no choice but to carry around the maddening curiosity, a collective desire, to find out just what kind of background this guy had. 
But why did the name end up as the monster? USAE Young's puzzled voice came out from the receiver of the mobile phone. No particular reason. I just got set off. I mean, whatever name I picked, they kept on telling me, it's already been taken. So I went for something nobody would go for. But even Monster was taken. So, I just tacked the in front of it. It's true that there are one too many societies nowadays. Even the civilians are busy making their own civilian societies, too. A mountain climber society, a football society, etc., etc. Ah, right. There are guys forming societies even at my school, calling them study groups and such. SFX for water boiling. While in the midst of the call, the water began to boil. SAE Jean put the phone on the speaker and placed it on the table. Were you in the middle of a meal? No, not yet. I am cooking at the moment. Wah, all alone. Yeah. I'm pretty good at cooking, you know. As good as a pro chef, even. SFX for knife chopping up stuff. The kitchen knife flashed like an arcing electricity and uniformly sliced the vegetables. The bits of veggies cut in the blink of an eye were all shaped into a perfect geometric symmetry as if they were measured with a precise ruler. As expected, the goblin's craftsmanship, now at C- dash, proved to be a wonderful skill once more. Fut. If that's the case, then you should apply for a spot at the hunter's food sense. TL, literally food discovery. The Knights and Hunters Food Sense was a program where knights and hunters showed off their cooking skills in a dual-style format. SAE Jean had heard that there were a few participating knights who were crazy enough to rely on their constitutions to cook with mana rather than using any cooking utensils. No way, since I'll never lose. Which means I'll have to keep on making the appearance like, forever. That doesn't even make sense then, you should cook for me at a later date. SAE Jean stopped moving for a moment. He was about to feel good about himself. But he remembered the age difference. Although there was only a four-year gap, she was still a minor. TL, the author wrote for here. It's almost impossible to describe what these words mean without going through a lengthy explanation. So I TL'd without them. Well, that's that, but can you tell me your address? Why the sudden change of topics which one would you like to know the one in Kongwan province or the one in Seoul? Why do you need it so out of the blue? Give me the one where you stay most often. I heard that the leaders of societies are supposed to hand out gifts to the members on either a monthly or an annual basis. So, I was thinking. That I should send you a membership gift for helping me out, even if it's not worth that much. USAE Young chuckled at his reply and told him the address. By the way, what present are you planning to give me? Ah. Uh, well, you'll just have to find out later. There was a lot of stuff he could give to her. Potions, weapons, and if she wanted to become stronger, then even the magic tattoos. If he sent her a weapon, there was a good chance that she'd go crazy over it, too. However. He needed more time for that. For now, it was still too early to reveal his true identity to her just yet. Should I just add the orc blacksmith as a member too? An idea suddenly came up to him. Really, if he did this, then moving about as a blacksmith should become more convenient for him. And since he was the society's leader in charge of the members' records, he could add anyone without the need for a rigorous vetting process as well. Of course, he'd need the written agreement, but hell, it'd be rather easy to get one from himself anyways. Two afternoons later. Kim Sae Jean decided to hunt as a human for the first time in a long while, and stepped up towards the monster field. The performance of his equipment was guaranteed as they were all the orcs Forge KS products. Plus, he had turned two other pieces of equipment into spirits and had absorbed them too. What's this? However, the moment he stepped into the rest stop, all eyes suddenly focused on him. This place was quite big, for sure, but SAE Jean could clearly feel all those eyes taking a peek at him. USAE Young isn't even with me today, though. SAE Jean hurriedly checked out his attire. No problem there. His armors were clothing type as well, so they wouldn't necessarily attract attention either. But before long, he was able to figure the puzzle out. Ha, huh, how do you do? 
an unpleasantly greasy man approached S.A.E. Jean and blocked his progress. S.A.E. Jean couldn't help but panic slightly as this guy, whom he had never met before, approached and started greeting him with a certain amount of arrogant swagger. But this guy just thrust out his hand for a shake as if he was unperturbed by the reaction. I heard it through the grapevine, Mr. Kim S.A.E. Jean, that you have formed a society. Ah. It seemed like the news of him forming a society had spread around like a plague. Even though those government workers were making a bit of a scene back then, he didn't expect the news to spread this fast. Oh, right. I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Kim in Soo, a mid-tier knight from the Genesis Knights Order. T.L., decided to use the English translation of Gabiak from now on. Got a feeling this guy will pop up again in the future chapters. The guy introduced himself first as S.A.E. Jean just stood there looking at his hand wordlessly. S.A.E. Jean's brows narrowed after hearing the name Kim in Su. He was quite sure of hearing it from somewhere. Ah, the mid-tier knight nicknamed the Savior of the Light. S.A.E. Jean had indeed seen him from somewhere. It was that guy from that ad he saw on that outdoor electronic billboard, when he spewed out those corny, cringeworthy lines. He was the mid-tier knight from the Genesis Order, Kim in Su. Ahem. As expected yes, it is I, the savior of the light. Also, I'm planning to advance up to upper mid-tier very soon. Ah, uh, yeah how do you do? But what can I do for you? That, well, I heard that Mr. S.A.E. Jean has formed a society. With Miss U.S.A.E. Young. Kim, with a fake cough, Kim in Su handed over a business card. It's a wise choice to form your own society in these trying times. But, wouldn't you agree that having only two members is a bit, well, not enough? Kim in Su stopped speaking there. Looked like he was waiting for S.A.E. Jean to take the hint and continue the conversation from here onwards. That's true, but I only formed one to advance to the upper mid-tier rank, so the number of members doesn't really matter to me. Oh, and it's not two, but three members. Aha. Is that right? And another period of silence. Wondering what this nonsense was all about, S.A.E. Jean simply bowed his waist a little to say goodbye and tried to enter the monster field. Oh, hey. Where are you going? I, I'm still standing here. Unfortunately for him, Kim in Su grabbed his shoulder. S.A.E. Jean studied this guy with dissatisfied eyes before finally realizing why he was acting like this. Do you wish to join my society? Eh. Ah, uh, it's not like I wish to, but well, if you ask me for a favor, then, sure, why not? You see, I already enjoy a friendly relationship with Miss S.A.E. Young. We met in the Eden recently, and have shared many conversations, as well as exchanged advice. Blah blah blah, as if he had infinite amount of things to say, Kim in Su yapped on and on without taking a break. But S.A.E. Jean became sure of one thing. Whenever Kim in Su spoke of you S.A.E. Young, his eyes would gleam and he'd put more emphasis in his voice plus his cheeks would slightly blush. In other words, this guy had developed a very clear case of crush on her. Kim. Well, what do you think? When Miss S.A.E. Young was looking for a society to join, I was going to ask her to join my Light Savior Society but then, you have scouted her already. I still can't understand why Miss S.A.E. Young agreed to join yours, but but well, it's still possible to be a member of multiple societies, you see. The achievements would be divided but, if Mr. S.A.E. Jean wants me, then. Kim in Su stopped short of saying he'd join the society. While busy yapping on, he was expectantly waiting for S.A.E. Jean to bow down and make the offer first. Ah it's true that it'd be great for the society if a knight such as yourself joins but. There is a single condition for the prospective members. Eh. A condition? Kim in Su made a disbelieving face. There were lots of other societies with conditions to join, but they were led by high-tier knights or A-ranked wizards. So, how could a measly little hunter? New members must completely submit to my will. Kim S.A.E. Jean spoke without thinking too much in order to chase away this guy. But instead of that happening, Kim in Su stood there, his eyes round and dazed, before all of a sudden, his face began to take on the colors of a tomato. It was not too hard to figure out what sort of imagery was blooming inside the head of this repulsive-faced man. 
what do you mean by completely submit to your will? You, you you you, what have you done to my little S.A.E. Young? It's only for the new members. Miss S.A.E. Young isn't a new member, but a founder. And trust me, what you are thinking of right now, I won't ask anyone to do that. Kiam. Although the face dyed in the colors of a ripe maple tree leaf was reverting back to being normal really fast, the arrogant demeanor of Kim in Su hadn't weakened one bit. And after a lengthy, silent and hostile stare down, Kim in Su spat out that no one in their right minds would agree to that kind of condition and walked away in a huff. Chapter 36 SAE Jean was worried about hunting solo in the low mid-tier hunting ground, but it turned out to be a baseless concern, after all. With his entire body taking on the characteristics of weapons via the spiritualization, as well as using the equipment crafted with an orc jaguar's smithing skill, the hunt went down a storm. Well, currently, SAE Jean was a walking mass of special attributes, as evidenced below. Reflect, Level E. Material Destruction, Level E. Haste, Level E. Flame Damage, Level E. Additional Stat Buffs, Physical Strength 30, Durability 25, Agility 10. The added stat buffs resulting from the spiritualization, equipped with armors made from the ultra-tough corundum all over his body, and carrying an evil-looking corundum mace that let out a dangerous aura without the need for mana's input. All these things were making him feel real good right about now. Most of the low mid-tier monsters could not overcome the hardness of corundum that had gone through the refinement process. TL, now, I'm sure there are mineral experts out there reading this and thinking, really? Corundum? But well, I'm just TLing it as it is in the raw. On top of that, the mace also had another added attribute, growth by absorption, level F. Every time he killed a monster with this mace, its performance would increase little by little. The more blood it drank, and the longer the monster flesh remained stuck on it, the more the weapon grows dangerous. Regular monsters found in the low mid-tier hunting ground could barely withstand a single hit from this mace. And after plus minus an hour of concentrated hunting. SFX for a pig squealing. The moment he killed a wild boar-like monster called Wizrakan, an alert window floated up to his view. TL, no idea where this one's from. Condition cleared kill 100 monsters using self-made weapons. Acquired the active skill, weapon user, beginner. Current level, F. The host can now view information of weapons. From now on, the proficiency for weapon usage will be unlocked. When the host achieves 100% proficiency, the next stage will become available. Beginner Intermediate Expert Professional Master True Master. TL. This bracketed bit was very troublesome to TL, as the author decided to simply rehash exact same thing over and over again such as and which I translated as expert and professional respectively. But actually means the same thing, just in different hanja. It's the same for master and true master. Hell, the word he used for master, can also be translated as expert as well. Oh, lordy. The proficiency is not limited by the weapons used. While in the orc form, the skill level will be increased by 2. Oh. He just earned a pretty good skill. S.A.E. Jean continued on with the hunting while feeling deeply grateful for this unexpected present. Early next morning. Kim S.A.E. Jean headed to the Yosian Alchemy House carrying potions and a stack of business cards. These business cards were for the society, the monster. S.A.E. Jean refused to use the cards issued by the government employees, instead relying on the orc smithing technique to make new cards that looked more expensive. How more expensive? He used pure silver as the material when bestowing the attribute coating. As to why he suddenly felt the urge to act like a leader of a society, well, even he couldn't say for sure. Was it because this was his first time ever being appointed as a leader of anything? Or did he subconsciously want to compensate for his lonely past? Whatever the case may have been, he wanted to do his best for his society. And after reading the history of the trilogy online, his fervor began to burn even more fiercely. He also felt confident that, as long as he had the ability, he'd be able to make his society surpass trilogy in the future. He was a person who, as a child, had lost his parents early on and never really felt the sense of belonging with anyone but now, he was thinking like this. What the hell? 
Kim Sae Jin was trudging towards the alchemy house, but when he confirmed with his own two eyes the cordon of people crowding in front of the building's entrance, he hastily hid himself in a corner. Yawn. Dn, there's still an hour left to go. Hey, just when will the new potions become available? If we knew that, why would we be wasting time waiting around like this? Sae Jin wasn't too sure of the identities of these people who seemingly had set up a camp there. But he could understand why Hazeline told him to use the back entrance, not the front. Lowering his posture as much as possible, Sae Jin hurried towards the back entrance. When he arrived there like an infiltrating spy, he found a door with a simple fingerprint scanner there. He pressed his thumb on it and the door opened without any trouble. Hello there. As soon as the door opened, he was warmly greeted by the waiting and smiling Hazeline once more. Were you surprised? She pointed towards the front with her finger. Yes, I was. Is it, by any chance, because of my potions? Yes. Thanks to the Goblin series of potions, our alchemy house is currently being swarmed by the prospective customers like there's no tomorrow. Those people waiting out in front are all dispatched by either knights' orders or employees from private institutions. Since we started selling on the first come, first served basis, the number of people waiting outside increased so much. Hazeline happily yammered on as she led Sae Jean to the manager's office. Aren't you going to hold an auction? I remember a goblin's kindness was sold through auctions. Ah, that. We just sold the potions of low mid to mid grades at their ceiling prices. As you can see, our alchemy house's premise isn't so wide enough to hold auctions every day. But well, no matter what, they just keep on selling so if things go well, we can probably buy the building next door too. It's all thanks to Mr. Sae Jean's hard work. Hazeline proudly replied as they quickly arrived at the manager's office on the second floor. She opened the doors personally to let him in first. Would you like a cup of coffee? This was the first line she would always say when having a meeting with Sae Jean. No, thank you. I'm fine. Even though he refused her every time, she didn't give up on the coffee thing. She held a slightly regretful face as she poured herself a cup, and lightly hopped on her feet like a happy rabbit to her seat opposite Sae Jean. By the way, what brings you here today? Hazeline asked him while stealing glances at his bag. Her gaze was like that of a cat carefully eyeing a juicy fish. Firstly, some potions. This time I tried to make a new type of potion. A new type? He fished out a small glass bottle containing white liquid from the bag. This was the potion he invented based on the sensations he felt as well as the effects he perceived from the memories of the purification spell engraved in his head. This is the new potion. As expected, the brain of a medicinal goblin was seriously amazing. After experiencing the magic, and if that spell could be recreated with potions, the ways to get the effects of the potion as close as possible naturally popped up in his mind. And this potion was the end result. One could say it was because of Hazeline, since it was her magic that had left such a strong impression in his mind, which led to him making this potion. In all honesty, he couldn't even remember the face of that blue robe wearing wizard all that well. What kind of potion is this? It's purification. But I fear it won't be that effective. It's what was his name? Kim Yosep. The potion's effects should be worse than that wizard guy. There's still a lot of room to improve. Hazeline was thoroughly shocked after hearing his words. There never had been a potion with purification effects until now. In other words, Sae Jean had invented a new potion. He had just helped the alchemic world to progress forward with this invention. The degree of difficulty would be like a scenario of a veteran alchemist needing to devote countless years of single-minded bloody focus just to come up with one formula. A potion for purification? Of course, there was a reason why such a potion hadn't been invented as of yet as wizards could already use the purification spell, there wasn't any need to come up with a potion with similar effects. In short, it was a waste of time. And to put it not so nicely, rather than spending the valuable time trying to create a purification potion, it'd be smarter to brew potions from the recipes already available to the public. It's nice. However, Hazeline couldn't inform him that what he did was a waste of time. 
Since the alchemist in front of her was a certifiable genius, she was sure that he didn't spend years solely trying to invent this potion. And it also didn't really matter that there was a magic spell with the same effect as the potion he invented, since it'd just add to his growing achievements anyways plus, it wasn't like no one would buy this potion either. Nowadays, a fixed customer base had formed for the Goblin series meaning, Kim Sae Jean had become a named potion maker and there were people who would just sweep up everything that had the name Goblin slapped on the bottle. I will do my best with this one as well. Hazeline gratefully hugged the potions he brought along with a happy expression on her face. Ah, there is one more thing I still need to give you. Also, I had a question as well. Oh. What will it be? After rousing her curiosity, Sae Jean searched his inner pockets for a bit, before handing over five business cards to Hazeline. Coated in pure silver, they were probably some of the most luxurious business cards out there. It's our business card. Hazeline received the straight cut cards dazedly, and her face soon became pretty adorable as she studied it this way and that. On the card, the black colored words. The founding member of the group The Monster, Shenarine TL, I thought her wizard name was Sheena. Hmm. Were engraved on it. Wah, it's really pretty. This, doesn't this feel like too nice to give away? Sae Jean chuckled slightly at her words. When he searched for more information online, he learned that most deep class societies couldn't even show their business cards in other places. It was because D was the minimum class for the societies that were officially recognized to be truly active. That was also why he deliberately didn't mention the class on the card. This makes me feel truly like a part of the society, you know. I'm really tempted to work harder from now on, too. Hazeline spoke while looking at him, her eyes arching like a fox's. It was still one of the most dazzling smiles out there. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, and what was the thing you wanted to ask me about? Ah, uh, right. At her prompt, Sae Jean pulled out the society's member directory. I want to add the goblin alchemist to the society as well well, is it possible? Like, Hazeline and Shenarine. Ah. Hazeline nodded her head. Yes, it's possible. After writing the name down on the directory, submit it to the authorities via either internet or by physically going there. When you do that, they give you a week to reaffirm the identity of the applicant. During that time period, send in a letter written by the goblin alchemist along with another form of evidence, then it's all done. Since it's not uncommon to ask for anonymity when joining societies, it's not going to be a problem. Can potions serve as evidence? Allow me take care of that bit. When putting this purification potion out for sale, we'll just label it with Goblin Alchemist the Monster Group Affiliate. And if there are any more procedures needed after that for some reason, then please, let me resolve them too. Sae Jean stared at the trustworthy and very knowledgeable Hazeline with a pair of sparkling eyes. As if such gazes were making her feel a bit bashful, she twisted her body a little and began showing a bit of Egeo. TL, Egeo means a cute display of affection often expressed through a cute baby voice, facial expressions and gestures. Thanks, Wikipedia. Thank you so much. I'll be on my way now. Okay. Kim Sae Jean stood up. He shook her hand for the last time and prepared to leave the manager's office. Uh, by the way, Mr. Sae Jean, did your height grow a bit again? However, her sudden words stopped him from moving. My height? Yes. Not just your height, but your overall physical size is also and even your face seems a tiny bit different, too. Is the effect of that potion still continuing until now? But it shouldn't be. It isn't. But that can't be. My eyes. Should not be wrong, though. Both of them tilted their heads and stared at each other. Panicking slightly at her strange words, Sae Jean quickly accessed his own information window. Name, Kim Sae Jean. Age, roughly 22 years old. Height, 181 centimeters weight, 86 kilograms. Status human form. Physical strength 83. Endurance 82. Agility 96. Energy manipulation 34. Mana affinity 20. Magic strength 19. Luck 8. It's true. 
His height had grown by another two centimeters. The weight increased too. He pondered why his height grew up so inexplicably, but soon decided that it must have been the increases in his stats causing the change. I think there is still a tiny bit of effects left within me. Well if I do get taller, then well, I guess it's all good. That was why, he didn't think too much of it. Chapter, 37 In a month's time, the much-awaited finale of the Blacksmith's Open Invitational Tournament would begin. I know that there isn't enough time so I've even reduced my sleeping hours to concentrate on finishing my work. However, the TV show covering the tournament was on air already for a while now. Once every week, it showed the daily lives and workplaces of the 11 finalists who had passed the second round of the tournament. Of course, since SAE Jean had to refuse being filmed, the program could only show the 10 remaining participants instead. From the rumors, I hear that Mr. Taysane, you, have deliberately destroyed the item you prepared for the finale of the tournament. The guy being interviewed on screen now was Kim Taysane, son of the Korea's famed master craftsman, Kim Taebaek. Being treated as a rising star among the current crop of blacksmiths, he was garnering quite a lot of fame for his warm, gentle face and an athletic physique to go with that nice face. TL, oh boy. Our author has made a big mistake here. Previously, he wrote Kim Soo Han as the name for this son apprentice. I guess he either forgot or didn't like the name. Yes, that's correct. Why did you do it? Haha <laughs> it's as you have suspected because I believe that it was just not good enough to stand toe to toe with the blacksmith, Mr. Ork. Compared to his amazing creations, I felt that mine were uncompleted missteps lacking in so many criteria. I wanted to make something better, even if only by a little bit, so I chose to get rid of the item altogether. I feared compromising my ideals so I had to destroy it completely. Oh that's a little bit regretful, I'd say. I'm sure that weapon was still a good quality product. Haha <laughs> no, that's not true. Well, anyway, please follow me. Let me show you my workspace. Carrying a gentle and friendly smile, Kim Taesane led the interviewer into his smithy. TSK. The program hadn't ended yet, but SAE Jean still turned the TV off and fell into a deep thought afterwards. That guy on the screen just now, Kim Taesane, he seemed quite an exciting and passionate fella. If that was not a calculating front put up to make himself look good, then he'd be the perfect main character filled with a great ambition. It was fine up until there. After all, having someone as talented as that guy regarding you as a rival certainly made him feel pretty good about himself. But the issue laid with the mass media and the shifting opinion of the public at large. Since he couldn't do any sort of interviews or allow filming, the blacksmith ORK was unable to show himself, not even once. He believed that people would naturally understand and maybe even find enjoyment out of his enigmatic actions. Of course, they did just that, initially at least. But that was until Kim Taesane's appearance on TV. Using the looks that even guys would find handsome, and with his uniquely passionate and humble personality, he was able to completely capture the public's imagination. There's no doubt that the orc blacksmith is the most likely candidate for the overall win. And I'm still lacking in comparison. But my aim will always be to win. In order to surpass him, I'll always try my hardest. That was the so-called catchphrase of Kim Taesane, the one that showed off his public persona brilliantly. Again, it was fine up to here. The real problem, though, was the rapidly ballooning fan base of Kim Taesane. They busily talked highly of Kim Taesane's products and at the same time, ruthlessly cut down the orcs. Their reasoning was that the unknown blacksmith was arrogant, didn't know how to be humble and all that. Even the mass media was on the side of Kim Taesane. While the son of Kim Taebaek was quite friendly towards the members of the press, the mystery blacksmith, the orc, seemed to be showing hostility towards them. And that's how the situation was like, with only a month left until the finals. The current mood had come to a point where people thought Kim Taesane was the protagonist while the orc was, just as the name implied, a monster he had to defeat. Kim Taesane, who was working his BT off to become a better person, while the orc, who hadn't even shown his face to anyone until now. The media and the public conceded on the fact that orc skills were superior, but they all wished that Kim Taesane's hard work would be enough to defeat his opponent and win. Humph. 
However, SAE Jean had no thoughts of letting this guy walk away with an easy victory. The more bad press he got and more he got bad mouthed by Kim Taesane's fans, both of his stubbornness and unwillingness to lose flared up higher, and now, his greed for victory had gotten far more severe than before. At least, I need something that's better than a high quality. In order to win, he needed to make an item that exceeded a mid-rank, meaning at least a high-quality ranked weapon. If he could make a branded goods then he'd win for sure so that would be more preferable but with his smithing technique only at C-dash, that was still too difficult for him as of now. He thought that he needed to be at least B before even attempting to craft a branded goods. No, wait a minute here. No, he was wrong. It was not impossible, as a matter of fact. The attribute that could allow the weapon to grow towards the rank of a branded goods the more it was used in hunting. Like an idiot, he had forgotten all about it, even though he had already bestowed such an attribute before. Growth by absorption. The attribute here the weapon could grow by absorbing the mana present within the blood and flesh of the monsters. Of course, this attribute was incredibly difficult to bestow so he'd only achieve either the level of D or C, but, even it was only at that level, most knights would go absolutely mad with avarice over a such weapon for sure. However, this highly sought-after weapon would remain as a pie in the sky for the absolute majority of the knights out there. After all, it would be no different to the weapon having a designated owner already. USAE Young's preferred type of weapons was called a broadsword, right? He remembered that her weapon was called the Lorenzo's broadsword. It was a weapon good enough to have its maker's name added on. SAE Jean was confident that he could craft something even better than that. Let's take this opportunity to gift her a new weapon. SAE Jean figured that, thanks to the first refusal agreement, the weapon would end up in USAE Young's hands anyways so he should make it to fit her the best from the get-go. Title, The Wolf Guardian. By, Slope TL, yes, the author really did write this. SMH. Have you ever seen the back of a lonely wolf? A brightly shining creature, carrying the full moon on its back and climbing the mountains, surveying all the other lesser creatures with its golden eyes ablaze. It's most likely the avatar of our world, symbolizing the purest form of desire, a divinity more fantastic than the miracles of the gods. Seeing that truly dependable back, I wish to call the creature the guardian. How can these hunters be so pathetic? Worshipping some lowly monster why not just follow a proper religion or something? It was a certain dreamy night, with a full moon high up in the sky. The members of the 6th ranked knights order in Korea as rated by the publication Korea Daily, Genesis were currently engaged in the middle of an adaptive training exercise, in the mid-tier hunting ground. An adaptive training was where knights would attempt to survive in a hunting ground that was one tier higher than they were, while under the supervision of senior knights possessing higher ranks. This hunting party currently consisted of three low mid-tier knights and a single mid-tier knight, who had previously boasted that he'd move up a rank pretty soon. But there is a reason for that, isn't there? The werewolf that appears in the mid-tier hunting ground has saved lots of people numerous times already. That's why those hunters who were scared of entering the hunting ground all changed their tunes and say they feel safer now precisely because of this werewolf. There was a rumor floating around the mid-tier hunting ground. A werewolf with a rank of either upper mid-tier or higher was supposedly roaming the mid-tier hunting ground and rescued humans in trouble. The rumor was classified as a total rubbish, but as the number of witnesses and survivors continued to increase, the situation was at the point where even the media was getting more interested in the story. Of course, the mid-tier hunting ground was off-limits for the media personnel as it was deemed just too dangerous. But seeing how they conducted interviews with various witnesses, it was pretty clear to see the level of their interest in this rumor. Oh, man are you talking about that wolf guardian? Do you really believe in such a thing? As a knight? On top of that, as a knight of the Genesis Order? No, that's not. A male knight scratched the back of his neck and avoided making eye contact with the female knight. Filled to the brim with pride for being a member of the Genesis, the female knight narrowed her eyes at him with a dissatisfied expression. Even if that's true, it's still a monster. And it's our job to kill monsters. Some people are saying it's not a monster, but a spirit beast. I mean, that ebony wolf that often appeared in the lower tiered hunting grounds has not been seen in a while, right? So, maybe it has evolved. 
Hey, excuse me. What kind of nonsense are you saying? Enough. When a heavy voice divided the two knights' argument apart, they quickly lowered their heads at the same time. That's how their ill-timed war of words had been brought to an abrupt end by the person in charge. What the low mid-tier knight, Miss So Yeo Jin has said is correct. Our job is to kill all the monsters. Doesn't matter whether it's a wolf guardian, the vermilion bird of the south, the black turtle of the north, or the azure dragon of the east. The mid-tier knight, who would ascend to the upper mid-tier very soon, also known as the savior of the light, Kim in Su put some weight behind his words as he admonished the junior knights. All you guys have to do is watch how I battle monsters in the mid-tier hunting ground, that is all. Witnessing a battle of a knight far greater than yourself should be a good learning experience at the end of the day for you all. And as soon as he finished speaking and moving his feet. SFX for a distant roar of an unknown beast. A savage roar of a monster shook the mountains. It sure sounded like an ominous call to all who heard it. Follow me. Right away, Kim in Su dashed towards the direction of the roar. Kim Sae Jin came out to hunt in the mid-tier hunting ground. It was to procure something called monster parts that could improve the results of the smithing technique. TL, the author wrote monster here. It literally means monster byproducts. Change to parts. His target was a three-horned monster called Trainos. TL. Outwardly resembling a rhinoceros, it not only had three horns on its head but also had three eyes, making it rather ugly to look at. Plus, its nature was quite violent, so it was viewed as one of the difficult monsters to battle in the mid-tier hunting ground. After acquiring the ability to read information on weapons, SAE Jean got to read the following words, dot. When a horn of Trainos is used as an accelerant in the smithing technique, the finished item's quality and attributes can be improved further. Which made him realize that the horns of this monster could greatly improve the efficiency of the smithing technique. And now, SAE Jean was able to locate a Trainos without much trouble. SFX for a monster growling. Strangely enough, the rhino-like monster facing SAE Jean only growled and remained rooted to the spot, unable to charge in towards him. Most likely, this creature had instinctively felt that the werewolf standing in front occupied a higher rung on the food chain than itself. KHRNG When SAE Jean returned a growl of his own, the monster began to backtrack slowly. He thought that the creature was trying to make a run for it. That's why he lowered his guard and leisurely watched it move. After all, the speed of the werewolf would be so much faster than this BD trying to run away. SFX for a loud monster roar. However, out of the blue, the monster began charging forward with all its might after roaring out angrily. Unfortunately for SAE Jean, it seemed that the monster was making a room for itself to propel forward and gain a lot of speed in the process. SAE Jean panicked just a little, but he knew there was really no need to dodge here. The wolf's claws was now at sea- and its hardness was comparable to that of the pronium, which was only slightly worse than the famed mithril. Dot. He knew that, just one swing of his claws would be enough to turn this rhino BD into finely sliced slabs of meat. He extended his claws. Sharper than seemingly any other weapon in existence, they gleamed under the pale moonlight. SFX for thudding footsteps. And he powerfully swung them at the still charging monster. It was an attack so stupendously strong, the air resisting the advance of the claws got torn apart and as a result, the sky seemed to waver like the surface of the ocean. SFX for meat being sliced apart. The rhino's abdomen area was sliced open, and the creature ended up collapsing before arriving at the feet of the werewolf. As he was about to recover the fallen monster's horns, he felt a sharp aura of mana at his back. When SAE Jean turned around, he found a man with a somewhat familiar mug standing over yonder. Kim in Su. It was that slimy dude with a not-so-nice personality from before. He was intensely glaring here with his sword drawn. It was as if he'd rush in at a moment's notice. KHRNNG. And that's how Kim Sae Jin and Kim in Su met again face to face. Chapter, 38. A Werewolf. Kim in Su muttered in a heavy voice. If one was to get technical, then Sae Jin wasn't really a werewolf. No, he was actually an ebony wolf using the beast mode. 
but, seeing that the werewolf was a rare monster with very little facts known about it, to differentiate with such a minute detail was just not possible. T. Team Leader We need to run away. That werewolf is the one I was. What do you mean, run away? That's a monster, isn't it? The female knight. No, no, that's a spirit beast. The war of words between two people threatened to explode again, but it was quickly brought under control by Kim in Su pulling out his sword. T, that are you planning to fight that thing, sir? Even if we evacuate, that werewolf won't come after us, you know. A werewolf is a particularly dangerous monster. You could say it does not belong in the mid-tier hunting ground. And one of the jobs the knights ranked upper mid-tier must perform, is to defeat dangerous monsters that doesn't belong in certain hunting grounds. Kim in Su pointed his sword at the werewolf. The tip of the blade was now directed at the head of the creature. The subordinate male knight watching him did his best to swallow these words down, Sir, you are not upper mid-tier yet. You guys can evacuate since you won't be much of a help here. No way. I will fight alongside with you. When the female knight bravely replied and pulled out her bow from her back, Kim in Su nodded his head in satisfaction. It was very hard to find an archer among the ranks of the knights. That was because, the fired arrow had to be guided and loaded with mana by the archer until it caused damage to the target. Of course, such a thing required a tremendous talent to perform. One needed the affinity with mana approaching that of a wizard to do this, even. Knight So Yeo Jin, cover me. Yes. Seeing the energetic duo conversing like this, the remaining two male knights had no choice but to draw their swords as well. They must have gone mad. Kim Sae Jin's brows tightened in irritation. Even though it was a simple change in his facial expression, on the wolf's face it became a lot more terrifying. And that caused the subordinate knights to stumble backwards a little. You don't have to worry. Kim In Su assuaged the fears of his knights and concentrated mana on the sword. Unlike the blue color of regular mana, a pure white light gathered around the blade. Wow! Dazed by the spectacle, the female knight, So Yeo Jin admired the show of this purest form of white mana. That was the savior of the light, in action the miraculous trait that supposedly increases destructive power when facing off against monsters. KJHRNG As expected of the famous trait, even Kim Sae Jin felt that was dangerous. No, it wasn't on the level of simply being dangerous. The ebony wolf was actually fearing for its life after seeing that white mana. His trembling hands were the inescapable proof of this. However, Sae Jin's pride stopped him from running away. When the instincts of a monster, and the consciousness of a human became all mixed up, that mess had been replaced by a new type of ego. And in this situation, the burning desire to fight suddenly exploded in his heart. SFX for another loud roar. It was the weirdest thing. He really didn't plan to cry out like some wild animal, but his mouth opened up and the loud roar escaped out all by itself. Right then, his consciousness blurred, and his body began moving automatically. The skill warrior of reversal has activated. Exploding into a storm of winds, Sae Jin lunged forward towards the knights. The amount of reaction time against that sudden turn of speed was almost zero. Kim in Su quickly covered his body with mana, but too bad, the wolf's target wasn't him. SFX for a woman's scream. A high-pitched scream could be heard from his back. The clever wolf attacked the female knight at the back trying to provide cover and disabled her first. The bow was sliced in half, and her slender wrist had a deep gash on it, blood spouting out from the fresh wound. This fker. Kim in Su and the two knights hurriedly attacked the wolf. Oria. With a powerful, explosive shout, the subordinates swung their swords towards Kim Sae Jin. Unfortunately for them, the attribute weapon destruction level E was currently active in his body. He simply slashed at their swords with his claws. SFX for metal bits being cut. The broken halves of blades danced into the air. After their mana-infused blades were broken so easily, the subordinate knights panicked and had to take several steps back. So, Sae Jin stopped paying attention to them and turned towards his back where he could sense the explosive, violent mana. With his entire body glowing in white, 
Kim In Su slashed down with his blade at Sae Jin. Kwa Hang. However, his sword only managed to overturn the ground as the wolf had already escaped into the air and retreated to a safer distance. Team Leader. What should we do? One of the subordinates asked worriedly. Kim In Su took a glance at him and gave his order. Take So Yeo Jin and evacuate. There are still potions left, so her recovery should not be difficult. Without a weapon, you'll only get in the way. So, move. When the knights hesitated and did nothing, Kim In Su shouted out loudly. Only then, the subordinates made their escape in earnest, while he pointed his blade at the wolf. You smart BD. Sae Jin's only weapon against the mana infused sword was his claws. You sly BD. The intensity of the light blurring Kim In Su's body increased up a notch. Sae Jin narrowed his eyes to mere slits, as the brightness made it very difficult to keep them fully open. Right at that moment, from Kim In Su's body, countless blades of mana shot towards Sae Jin like an exploding nest of snakes. The countless rays of light, bright enough to erase the sun, filled the sky and began raining down on the single target. It was impossible to escape. However, the wolf's claws could slice apart both the corporeal and incorporeal. In other words, the claws could cut even mana as well. Sae Jin slashed out at the falling drops of light rays, again and again. One could say that it all looked rather effortless, even. As soon as the mana rays touched the claws, they powerlessly disintegrated and dissipated like the early morning fog. It was now Kim In Su's turn to panic after witnessing this incredible scene. Staring at the wolf with disbelieving eyes for a short while, he then ceased his ineffective attack and rushed towards the creature. Clang! The wolf's claws clashed angrily with the blade. The sharp screech echoed throughout the forest, with red hot sparks shooting out from the contact point. Aura. TL, I was this close to TLing this part as Aura 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 X 1000 LOL. The sword descended, accompanied by a terrific shout. But the wolf lightly rolled out of the way and easily dodged it. Right after, the claws swung upwards from below. Cook. Kim In Su could barely block it in time. As soon as that happened, though, he had to open his eyes really wide. He saw that on the surface of the blade in contact with the wolf's claws, cracks began to form. He quickly kicked the abdomen of the wolf and retreated. He could not understand what just happened. How could a measly monster leave scars on a mana-infused sword? Of course, right now, time to think was a luxury he couldn't afford. The wolf attacked him again. Kim in Su hurriedly dodged out of the way. SFX for claws cutting up stuff. The air pressure from the swung claws divided distant trees in half. Kim In Su stepped on the ground, hard, and thrust out his sword towards the neck of the creature. That was the beginning of a fierce battle. A violent close quarter combat taking place within the radius of a person's two regular steps. The swung sword was blocked by the claws, and the claws aimed at the neck missed as the target dodged with quick movements. As the battle dragged on, their battle arena became more destroyed than before. The sword aura, seemingly missing its mark, carved apart the forest vegetation while on the ground, numerous terrifying scars were left behind. However, the end of the fight wasn't far away. The endurance of a human and that of a beast there was no point in arguing, the latter simply held the advantage on that front. While Kim In Su's movement had become noticeably sluggish compared to the beginning, the wolf was still maintaining the shocking speed without a problem. Kim In Su gritted his teeth. He had to make a choice here. Hold out for a bit longer and die, or bet everything on the next attack. He didn't agonize deeply, really. He scraped together the very last bit of mana still left in him and forced it onto his sword. However. Snap. Before he could do anything, the sword couldn't hold on, and broke. Kim In Su stared at the fallen bit of the blade, dazed and wordless. Then, he lifted his head to look at the wolf. The wolf beast was looking back at him, waiting. But something was different. The previously bloodshot eyes had regained the clarity of the golden iridescence, and the emotions he saw in them were calm and thoughtful. It was as if he was looking into a human's eyes. What the hell just happened? 
Kim Sae Jin alternated his gaze between Kim In Su and and the alert message window while failing to put a rein on his panicking mind. He was able to grasp hold of the fading sanity drowned out by the animalistic instincts, thanks to this window popping up. Condition complete 13, achieving victory after putting everything on the line. All stats rise by 10. When the remaining two conditions are met, the ebony wolf form will evolve. All stats related to the wolf form will rise. The problem remaining now was Kim In Su. His weapon was quite rubbish. He was an upper mid tier knight, but he was using only a mid quality weapon. Of course, it'd break easily. Didn't expect him to be dirt poor. What a shock. TL, author simply wrote, he's a beggar. It didn't sound quite right to me, so I fiddled around a bit. Kill me. When Sae Jean tilted his head in confusion, Kim In Su spat out the words of utter defeat. What the hell is this guy even saying? Sae Jean had no desire to kill this guy. He deliberately locked his gaze with that of Kim In Su's and snorted derisively before leisurely walking away. Left alone, all Kim In Su could do was to follow the back of the wolf beast with his dazed eyes. Located in the wealthiest district in the city of Seoul, the headquarters of the Dawn Knights Order was famed for its stylish exterior, advantageous locations, as well as its cutting-edge training facilities. Plus, there was another source of envy and pride, in the form of an online networking app called the Dawn of Today, which could only be used by the current and former members of the Knights Order. You do it. No, you do it. Why are you asking me? Hey, you went to the same training camp with her. And now, this place was the Dawn Knights Order's training facility, where the concentration of mana was reputedly higher than that of the mountainside thanks to the centrally located artificial mana spring. Two new recruits to the Order were busy having a light argument here. Doesn't matter if it was training or schmucking, we never talked, not even once, you know. The topic of their conversation was the cute girl training alone over there, USAE Young. Always the center of the attention whenever she came here to train, but the interest drawing upon her was a bit more special this time. And even if we ask her, we won't be able to join. You know this. Why not? They even have a mid-tier hunter as a member, so why can't we? Their interest in her this time was because of the society she had co-founded, the Monster. Although its name was not very cool and its class was only a D-dash, it was currently the most mentioned society in the dawn of today. It wasn't just because the mascot of the dawn and its most talented knight USAE Young and an unknown wizard's participation in that society. No, it was because the news of the hottest trending alchemist right now, the goblin, joining this society had popped up out of nowhere. But that's just once. Once. She doesn't even know my face. And take a look at my mug, will ya? So. You think I stand a chance? Fool. Really, dude. You do this right and we join that society, then our lives will be smooth sailing from now on. I mean, you also heard that rumor going around, right? That one, the orc and the goblin both being the monsters. Hey, you moron. That's just an empty rumor. And there was a strange but compelling rumor floating around as well. And that was, the orc blacksmith would be joining this society as well, very soon. Not only in the dawn of today, all the other knights who heard of this rumor couldn't easily dismiss this notion simply because of the fact that the society was called the monster. Plus both the orc blacksmith and the goblin alchemist had a similar naming concept. Whatever, dude. Just go and talk to her. The hope of these two fellas was like so, the society would have liked to admit more members, but since no one dared to approach, it only had four core members so far. So, if one plucked up some courage and made his intentions known, then he'd be welcomed with open arms in other words. Something like, only the brave gets the prettiest girl. Ha, fine. Wait here. The cool and handsome looking male knight sighed out grandly and walked towards USAE Young. His gait was stiff like an old robot thanks to him being filled with nervousness. His friend tried to rein in his nervous heart and waited for the arrival of the good news. Hoo. Another intake of deep breath. Arriving before USA Young, he began speaking in a shaky voice. Uh, I heard that, you, you have formed, uh, 
S. S. Society. And USA Young expertly replied as if she had experienced the exact same situation dozens of times already. The leader of the society isn't me but Mr. Kim S. A. E. Jean. If you wish to join, please seek him out. Yes. The poor guy heard that as a complete rejection. He walked back to his friend with heavy footsteps and crossed his arms in an X in front of his chest. And they grandly sighed out at the same time. Why are there so many requests to join the society? USA Young took a glance at the two and tilted her head. She couldn't figure out why they wanted to join a small society with only three members. She didn't understand, as she had stopped using her phone altogether since it was around the time for her school exams. Of course, as USA Young, she was fully aware of the true value of building a personal bridge with her. But wasn't this society simply formed to foster amity and goodwill? Even Kim Sae Jin himself did say that he formed this society to get the rank promotion. But now, she was in the middle of training. She just didn't have enough time, as after the training, she'd study for the exams. So, she removed all thoughts related to the society and concentrated on training for now. And exactly one hour later, USA Young could finally hear the answer to the mystery from the butler that had come to take her home. You didn't know. I'm studying for the exams, you know. I'm just too busy studying and training, so. But it's for real. Really real. So, I guess you really didn't know. Two days ago, a new potion in the Goblin series called the Goblin's Purification, came out. And on the label, it was written from the alchemist affiliated with the monster. USA Young's expression was that of an utter shock as she leaned against the back of a chair. Chapter 39. Kim Sae Jean was carefully packing the members' gifts for USA Young inside a rectangular box. The contents were potions made by the goblin alchemist, the business cards, as well as a letter expressing his gratitude. SFX for mobile phone vibrating. As he was observing the status of the box that was rapidly becoming rather classy, the phone went off. And speaking of the devil, it was USA Young calling. His lips slightly arcing in a grin, he picked up the phone. Hello. It's me, Appa. Is it true? From a certain point onwards, the way she called him went a slight change. S.A.E. Jean was seriously chuffed about that. This was the proof their friendship had deepened, after all. What is? You mean, the alchemist? It was two days ago when the potion A Goblin's Purification went on sale and the world finding out about the goblin alchemist joining his society. But USA Young was a blood descendant of the Dawn Dynasty, so there was just no way she was not aware of this important fact. Yes, that. So, it's true. How? No, that's not it, what? Ah, uh, he. How did you get to meet the goblin alchemist? Well, she genuinely didn't know. Her voice was trembling from the shock. Well, that. It's a private matter so I can't talk about it. You know how it is. How sensitive alchemists are towards. Their privacy. He debated on whether to tell her the truth or not. But in the end, he just made SHT up since he figured that the situation wasn't right for him to come out and say, well actually, I'm the goblin alchemist here. Yeah. If that's so, well. I guess it can't be helped. Ah, uh, right. I'm wrapping your presents right now. They should arrive at your place by tomorrow. Really? Thanks. No probs. Ah, uh, by the way. S.A.E. Jean dropped the phone hurriedly and went back to wrapping the gift box. It seemed like some sort of sound was leaking out from the phone, but he ignored them, since he found gift wrapping more fun. It was decided that the grand finale of the blacksmith tournament would be held at the large lecture hall located in the building of the Dawn Knight's Order. And now, today was the much-awaited final round of judging, with over 500 audience members as well as five professional judges all invited here to participate in the process. Inside the waiting area backstage, the pro judges were sitting together, discussing among themselves the weapons submitted for the finals. I hear the orc is not going to show up for today as well. TSK, TSK. We say nice things about him for a little bit, and he's become so arrogant already. Famous in Korea for his fussy personality, 
Master Craftsman Yu Zhou Hyung spoke in a slightly dissatisfied voice. We don't know that. It could very well be that he's uncomfortable with appearing in public. Let's hold off our judgments until later on, shall we? TL, the author literally said, let's not try to view with our colored glasses on. Another judge, the chairman of the Blacksmiths Association, Kim Taehyung admonished Yu Zhou Hyung in a benevolent voice. That's right. It's also possible that he's focusing solely on crafting weapons. I'm already getting hyped thinking about what he has in store for us today. This time it was Kim Yurin. S. Turn. Her smile was so dazzlingly charming that it had the power to make the face of a particularly fussy old man flush in a healthy color. Kim. If that's the case. However, I really do think that Kim Taesane will walk away a winner today. He has come very much prepared. The stuff he brought today made me seriously wonder whether he had received his father's help or not. Really? What about Mr. Ork? Ork. It wasn't a detailed look-see, but I did get a quick peek at it. However, even though it looks like a good quality item. It kind of seemed plain to me. Back then, hotly burning flames. Yeah, I didn't see any of those crazy special thingy add-ons this time. That's why, I think Kim Taesane boy will win this one. Yu Jo Hyung stroked his lengthy beard and continued to predict Kim Taesane's victory. Is there a something special about the weapon of the blacksmith Kim Taesane? Of course. Even I was really surprised. You will too, when you personally see it for yourself. Oh, right. That Kim Taesane boy looked like he really wanted to meet you. How about it? Will you have a dinner with him after today's event is all done and dusted? Suddenly, Yu Jo Hyung threw at her a request rather unexpectedly. Since she couldn't outright refuse a master craftsman just like that, Kim Yu Rin could only scratch the back of her neck and smiled weakly. You also saw him, no. He's a very good egg, that one. He's got a good personality, and. We will be starting with the rehearsals now. With a nice timing, the producer entered the room and unknowingly got in between her and Yu Jo Hyung. She promptly stood up from her seat. Her expression was one of relief. Oh. Already? Shall we get going? Watching the back of Kim Yu Rin hurriedly walk away, Yu Jo Hyung let out a fake cough as if he found the matter regrettable. Mm -hmm. When Kim Yu Rin opened the door and left the waiting room, an unexpected woman was waiting for her. A cute girl who was continuously checking her appearance on the small mirror. It was USA Young, who was becoming rather famous among the current crop of knights nowadays. Whatever was making her unhappy, USA Young's face was in a deep frown as she surveyed the reflected image until, she felt the pair of eyes gazing at her and, weak, she turned her head in a hurry. Oh. And she let out a small gasp. She quickly hid the mirror and slowly approached Kim Yurin. Seeing that her face was completely frozen stiff and her legs were trembling pitifully, one could easily tell that she was beyond being incredibly nervous right now. He, hello, no, no, H, how do you do? The nervousness had gripped her vocal cords and as the words struggled to break free, she ended up inadvertently shouting them aloud. In that moment, all focus was gathered here, and when she realized what she had done, her face became ashen. No 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 no, that is. Hello there. How do you do? I've heard a lot about you. Kim Yurin smiled warmly and offered her hand for a shake first, unperturbed. Ah. She was so mesmerizingly beautiful, even from another woman's point of view. That's why USA Young stared unconsciously at Kim Yurin before snapping awake and hurriedly taking the offered hand. I, 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 it's my pleasure. I, 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 I am, uh, my name is USA Young. Yes. She was acting quite different from the composed and thoughtful appearance she always put up until now, the one that didn't match up with her age. S.A. Young was so tightly wound up as she talked with Kim Yurin. Cold sweat was pouring out of her entire body, and her heart was pounding away like crazy. This situation was like a dream to her. The person she had admired the most in her life, was standing right before her. Yes. I've heard a lot of good things about you. You've accomplished something amazing, you're already a low mid-tier at such a young age. 
Ah, Yesiases, yes. Yes. Ah, I miss you Rins, biggest fan, me, USA Young. No, wait. I was in the elementary school, when I was really, really young, I became your fan. USA Young could not remember what happened afterwards. Only that, around five minutes later, she found herself walking towards the section for the audience panel while being supported by a stranger. The lengthy open invitational tournament was about to come to a close with the commencement of the grand finale. However, if it wasn't the first place or the second place finish, it didn't matter anymore. Even the professional judges and the participating blacksmiths thought this way. Hell, out of the eleven finalists, seven of them had already threw in the towel after realizing their severe lack of talents. And now, among these four items present here today, only one can climb to the glorious position of the victor's throne. As soon as the live broadcast began, the MC spoke the obligatory opening line. The audience members began clapping, and the five judges carefully studied the items covered in veil while maintaining a solemn attitude. These are the judges for this round. From the far left, we have the Raven Knight's Order's highest tier knight, Miss Kim Yurin. The MC made simple introductions for the five judges, and the judging process began in earnest right after that. The first item was a wooden sword made out of black wood, aka Ceylon ebony. It was a puzzling decision to make a sword out of a wood, but since the black wood could be infused with a lot of mana, as long as it was manufactured well, it was an item that could be rated above mid quality. It's good. But, it's a little regretful that it's too dependent on the knight's abilities. This black wooden sword was knocked out of the running with Kim Yurin's judgments. Next up, was a scimitar made out of corundum. With the blade's body bending like a snake and the smooth blade edge seemingly boasting an unmatched sharpness, if it was the last year's tournament. Then it'd be good enough to compete for the first place but this time, it could only earn the disappointing appraisal of its good but lacks any special traits and is just a bit too plain, dot. And now, this is it. This is blacksmith Kim Taesane's item. It was now the beginning of the real battle. Judges and audience members waited with slightly bated breaths as Kim Taesane approached his weapon with confident steps. Please, give us an explanation on your weapon. Kim Taesane nodded at the MC's words. Then, he removed the veil draped over his item. First, at the sight of elegant and luxurious appearance, both the audience and the judges let out a collective gasp of admiration. This is a bastard sword I made by combining malachite and adamantite. When mana is infused into the blade, mana will concentrate on the surface of the blade and then change into blue crystal. The explanations might have been simple, but this sword was the kind of a weapon that would truly shine when in hands of its wielder. Utterly confident, Kim Taesane lifted the sword up and brought it towards the judges. Ho ho! -oh. As expected of the master craftsman's apprentice, is that right? It's very good. Excellent. I can't find any faults. It is indeed a very good weapon. Is it alright to infuse it with mana? During all the praises of the judges, the highest tier knight Kim Yurin grabbed the hilt and asked. As that was what Taesain had wanted from the beginning, he nodded his head without hesitation. Of course. Go right ahead. With his consent, she poured her mana into the sword. As he had said, the blade with the blue mana shimmering on it, changed to a crystalline form. The already pretty exterior became even more fantastical, and there was clearly no need to even test the hardness of the mana crystal. This was, at minimum, a high-quality item. It's perfect. When Kim Yurin dazedly muttered, Kim Taesane nodded in pure satisfaction. Other judges didn't stray too far from her assessment, either. Especially Yu Jo Hyung, who had been praising Taesane even from the backstage, was now saying stuff like the boy had climbed up to the level of an artisan and poured out more thick praises. And, finally. This is the last item. As the rising tension was reaching the fever pitch, the turn for the orc blacksmith had finally come. Mr. Orc has decided not to attend the final round, unfortunately. He has said that it's because of personal issues. Since the orc blacksmith didn't show up, the MC took the reins of unveiling the item. He placed the veiled chest in the middle of the stage where all eyes from the audience members and the judges could see it clearly. And then, Shararak. 
Underneath the veil, a weapon lied. The adjective beautiful suited this weapon perfectly. On the hilt, blue and red colors danced in complete harmony, and on the surface of the blade, the intricate and artful carvings which were widely accepted as the trademark of the orc's forge K, were clearly visible. The pure white blade wasn't too long nor was it too short, making it perfect for both cutting and stabbing. The world fell into complete silence. It wasn't as extravagant as Kim Taesane's work, but as far as beauty was concerned, this one was superior by miles. As some wise old men once said, true beauty could be appreciated by anyone without the express needs for words, and just like that saying, this sword appeared deceptively simple on the surface, but its beauty was truly elegant and beguiling. It's gorgeous. When the silence continued on for two minutes, Kim Yurin forcibly opened her mouth to say something in order to avoid a broadcasting incident. You him. The exterior does look nice. However. It doesn't look any special from its looks only. Isn't the blacksmith supposed to come out here and start explaining? If this sword has no special traits, then it's not so much different from that corundum scimitar, no? Next up was Yu Jo Hyung. He was doing his best to maintain a dismissive facial expression. That is true. The orc blacksmith has said that, even though he can't appear physically, he will talk to us via telephone. Sir. If you're watching this live broadcast, please give us a call with the number on the screen. After 20 seconds of waiting, the producer gave a signal that the call had been connected. Hello, there. Is this the orc blacksmith? Yes, indeed, that's me. His voice was a pass. Its tone was quite bassy and warm, which made it pleasant to listen to. You have a nice voice, sir. Ha ha ha. Thank you very much. Even his smooth laughter sounded nice. The MC nodded his head and then asked the blacksmith on the phone to describe his weapon. This weapon does not possess a special trait like Mr. Kim Taesane's weapon. Even though the explanation had only just begun, one of the judges spat out a dissatisfied fake cough. There was no need for anyone to check that it was from Yu Jo Hyung. However, this weapon is carrying a sincere wish of mine. What is your wish, sir? The MC asked, clearly expectant. A weapon with a story attached to it was always going to be an easier sell. Note to editor, the author wrote here a weapon with a story is always right. Which one should I go with? I frankly like my interpretation more. My wish is that, I'd like to see my weapon grow together with its owner. When the weapon's owner grows stronger, then it is inevitable that the weapon has to be discarded. Since, if it's not thrown away, the weapon would end up halting the progress of its owner, so I believe the weapon would want to be thrown away as well. The orc blacksmith slowly spoke out. As his strangely pleasant voice spread around, the people gathered in the lecture hall for the finale became deeply immersed in his story. What happened next? Did your wish come true? Yes. Fortunately, my weapon can grow together with its owner now. In that moment, chaos broke out in the hall. A weapon that could grow. No one had ever heard of such a weapon before. I, is it possible to prove such a thing? It was Kim Taesane who shouted out first. He was feeling confident of his victory even after seeing the orc's item, so understandably, he was feeling genuinely on the edge right now. A weapon that can grow. What kind of nonsense are you trying to? Ha ha ha. Why not let one of the knights present their infused mana with the sword? The sword will emit a matching resonance with the infused mana. The orc blacksmith replied calmly. Kim Yurin stood up from her seat and grabbed the hilt. Kim Taesane stared at her with a deeply tense expression. All I have to do is to infuse mana with it. Yes. You'll sense the change. Yurin infused her mana with the sword. It was absorbed cleanly. And right away, she understood what this resonance the blacksmith was talking about. The blade was serenely humming in tune with her mana, as if it was singing a song. You shouldn't hold it for too long. It might recognize you as its new owner. At those words, Yurin quickly retracted her mana. It's incredible. Kim Yurin lifted her head to the sky and dazedly spoke. Kim Sae Jean, who was watching all this happen on TV, quietly chuckled to himself. 
The attributes he had bestowed to the weapon were sea level growth by absorption and owner recognition. Thanks to the horns of Trainos, he could imbue these two attributes to the sword that could perfectly recognize its owner and grow together with him or her. With a great timing, the TV cameras picked up on the face of USA Young, her eyes full of desire as she fixed her burning gaze on the weapon. Even the director seemed to know just who the new owner of this sword was going to be. Chapter, 40 And now the only thing left to do after all the weapon's introductions and the subsequent critiquing were over with, was the announcement of the final result. Kim Taesane was carrying a somewhat bitter smile, framed by a facial expression of a man who had already accepted his fate. He had put in a lot of effort to win. Some people might think less of him, but he also had played up for the cameras as well. He wanted to make sure of his chances with the audience members, in the case where the quality of his output would be only slightly worse than that of the orcs. He even used his father's name to enter. That's how much he wanted to win. As a son of Kim Taebek, a defeat didn't suit Kim Taesain at all. However, he was up against a weapon that could freaking grow. A notion he'd never even heard of in his entire life, a concept so utterly revolutionary. Considering that, it'd be weird if he had won this tournament instead. If he had won, then all the goodwill he built with the public would all be blown away in a blink. So, all he could do now was to just open-heartedly accept his defeat. The orc blacksmith was at least twice more talented than he was. Kim Taesane's pride wouldn't allow for anything higher than a twice, but still, he nodded his head and accepted his defeat today. And now. The winner is. The MC pointed towards the giant screen standing erect in the middle of the stage with a loud voice. The moment the orc blacksmith told the story of his sword, there was no tension left in the finals. Well, the result was inevitable, after all. That's why, when the winner was declared, everyone present here could quietly accept it. The winner is, the orc blacksmith's growing broadsword. Confetti exploded and from the floor, flames rose up. The fireworks on the stage went off loudly, but seeing that the winner wasn't up on the said stage ready to receive the trophy, it was rather an odd thing to witness. Well then. Now yes. And now, we will hear the thoughts of the winner, the orc blacksmith. Can you please give us a call? Although it was cumbersome, the producers couldn't do anything about it since the orc had requested for this type of arrangement beforehand. Fortunately, the blacksmith was quick to make his call. Sir, congratulations on your win. Ha ha thank you. I am really grateful. His voice sounded calm, but the happiness hidden beneath still managed to leak out a little. You could call this result an overwhelming victory, so how do you feel? Mm I wouldn't call it overwhelming. The other weapons competing against mine, you could easily spy their creator's dedication and hard work in them. The winner had to be chosen, but the value of their hard work is all equally high in my mind. It was a simple and humble reply. The MC was about to end it on that feel-good note, when Yu Joe Hyung suddenly raised his hand. Ah, a member of the judging panel wishes to ask you a question. Will that be fine with you? Yes, it's fine. Receiving the go-ahead, Yu Jo Hyung did one of his fake coughs first. By any chance, the attribute you spoke of the growth of the weapon when that attribute is proven to be nothing more than a falsehood. What will you do? You have stayed anonymous all this time and it's hard to place our trust in you. Isn't it possible that, in order to win the prize money, you are lying right now? Yes, that is possible. Although it was a pointed attack loaded with hostility, the orc blacksmith still calmly replied. And that's why I shall not ask for the prize money, nor for my weapons, until its new owner can unequivocally prove that it is indeed, real. It was an assured answer that cut off all suspicions. Yu Jo Hyung was still not satisfied, but since there was nothing he could retort against, he had to concede here. Oh, wait. Then, can I ask you something as well? This time, it was Kim Yurin. Yes, of course. Are you planning to craft more weapons and sell them from now on? If so, then, what are your plans on the circulation of your goods? She asked short and simple questions, but as a person sitting on a high position in her knight's order, they were of incredibly importance. Yes, I am planning on it. However, as for the circulation, I'll have to think about it first. 
I actually believe that, instead of making weapons and waiting for the right people to show up, a weapon should be crafted to match the individuals instead. As soon as she heard that, she could not hide her shock and licked her lips, salivating. Almost all the knights present here was doing the exact same thing as her. Most well-known blacksmiths, whether that be an artisan or a master, first crafted their weapons and then received the potential owner candidates for them. Hell, some rumors even said that one or two knights were bribing the blacksmiths in order to acquire the weapons. This was partly because there was ego involved, but also mostly because, it was indescribably difficult to tailor make a weapon to suit its user. As for the ego bit, blacksmiths were the type of people that would destroy a half year of their own hard work if it was not to their liking so, to make something that followed the tastes of others were a bit. T, that's great. Say, would you like to be my friend? These sincere words belonged to Kim Yurin and she was dead serious about her intentions. But the audience members and filming crew thought it was a humorous joke and they all burst out into a laughter. Staring at them with a confused expression, Kim Yurin was about to open her mouth to say she wasn't kidding, but before that, she got cut off by the loud shout from an audience member. Since there was no mic near this person, the voice ended up being small, but when hearing it, one could tell it was about the hot new story regarding the society, the monster. Ah, just now, that person asked a question even I was curious about. By any chance, do you know of the society, the monster? The one Mr. Goblin the alchemist had joined. Yes, I've heard of them. The MC asked without too much thought. Since the rumor was treated as completely groundless, his voice lacked much sincerity. Instead, a small amount of lightheartedness found its way in there. Since both you and him use a similar naming concept, people are wondering if you are planning to join this society as well. What are your thoughts regarding this matter? Is that so? Hmm. Unexpectedly, the orc blacksmith didn't answer right away. At this sudden delay in answer, even those who dismissed the rumor offhandedly had to wait with bated breaths and concentrate. The orc allowed the expectations to bubble on for another thirty seconds, until he finally chuckled and made his reply. It might be interesting to join them after all. If I do decide to join, then anyone wishing to purchase my wares should send their inquiries to the society, the monster. If there's nothing else, then, please excuse me. The call from the blacksmith ended with the words that said there was a possibility. And the entire lecture hall became deathly silent right after. Well, it was a fresh shock to the system, after all. SAE Jean hurriedly checked online all the articles and the reactions of the public that were uploaded in the blink of an eye. He was exhausted, but still, he found it fun to sift through the stuff put up by the shocked media and the public. The appearance of a treasure quality weapon. A growth type weapon, is it authentic? A weapon that follows its master who will be its new owner? The orc blacksmith presents a new paradigm shift. These were all rather extremely shameless clickbait Y headlines, but undoubtedly, they still held some strange persuasive power to make people click on them regardless. However, after some point in time had passed, articles about the weapon got buried in another topic altogether. And that topic was the orc blacksmith joining the monster. The reactions were explosive. It was unknown how they found out his address, but reporters began showing up in front of Kim S.A.E. Jean's house. Don't worry about it. I've sent people over. They will sort out the mess. Mm. Thanks, for everything. He was getting sick and tired of journalists camping outside his house and knock on his door every twenty minutes or so then, USA Yong called him with great timing. As expected of the Dawn Knight's order, just like she mentioned, the bodyguards arrived in less than three minutes and swept the annoying reporters away. But you also saw the program, right? Is it true that the orc blacksmith is joining our society? Oh, that? Uh, that is. Actually, the goblin alchemist said that he knew the orc blacksmith personally. So there is a connection, right, I'm not sure yet. I need to ask first. Once the lie started, it could not be stopped anymore and the more he lied, the more comfortable he felt about it. And when he thought about seeing all those shocked faces well, wasn't this a slightly rotten habit he was developing here? R, really? If he really joins the society later on, can I ask him for a favor? Well, why not? 
as long as there's enough compensation for it, that is. I've more than enough money for that purpose. Of course, you do. Their topic of conversation was the orc blacksmith. She yapped on and on about how she would be the new owner of the sword that could grow stronger. Oh, Anapa, can we have a meal together later on? Miss Kim Yurin asked me if we could eat together sometime. Out of the blue, USA Young changed the topic with a slightly excited voice. Mm. -hmm. Me too. Why, yes. Appa, too. Her reply sounded as if she was slightly unhappy about something. Maybe she wanted to enjoy a meal together with Kim Yurin all by herself or some such. Is it okay for me to go? Well, yes. Miss Kim Yurin specifically said, with Mr. Kim Sae Jean, too, so. Uh, I'll just inform her that Sae Jean Appa is just too busy and we will have to eat without you. I'm sure she will understand. Her voice sounded rather energetic as she said these words. So naturally, he felt quite mischievous and wanted to pull a prank on her. Ah, uh, is that so? It's fine. I can make it. A sudden bout of eerie silence descended on the line. Kim Sae Jean worked very hard to restrain the laughter that was threatening to leak out and continued to speak. When will it be? Next week Monday. Sae Young spat out unhappily. Got it. Well, see you then. He replied matter-of-factly and ended the call. Kim Sae Jean in the ebony wolf form suddenly opened his eyes. His golden eyes gleamed brightly. An indescribable aura was surrounding his body. As it gave off the serious case of an odious sensation, he quickly assumed the human form. He glanced at the clock. It was now 9 a.m. He went to bed at 1 a.m., so he had a normal sleep. Then. But why? Some parts of his body, here and there, were aching especially his joints and his nails, they were in dull pain. As if, there were bruises from receiving impacts. What is going on? Sae Jean tilted his head slightly, but didn't worry about it anymore. He just went downstairs to the basement and drank a vial of low mid-grade recovery potion instead. The aches and pain in his joints dissipated in an instant. Climbing back upstairs while feeling satisfied, he lay down on the couch and switched the TV on. The first item on the 9 o'clock morning news was about the orc blacksmith. Smiling contentedly, he listened to the news anchor's voice. The public, Knight's orders, and the leaders of financial and political world have all agreed that the new master craftsman who can represent the country will be born and have expressed their growing excitement. As he heard the anchor's unbridled praises, he could reaffirm the fevered reception and the excitement of the public at large he read online yesterday. And in this bliss, he slowly sank into a siesta. His body felt strangely fatigued. When he fell deep into the slumber, the news coverage changed suddenly. It was a breaking news. Oh, we have a breaking news. At three o'clock this morning, a crime of murder has been committed in the area of Haiyong Siang in Guangwan province. The evidence found in a victim's house and the unnatural state of the body prompted the investigators to speed up the autopsy, and as a result, the identity of the victim is now known as a vampire. Currently, the investigators are assuming that this is the work of the mercenary, Leakin.